Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we'll look at what happened in England on Christmas Eve 2020, when 26-year-old L.A. Edwards was with her friends at the Lighthouse Pub in Wallasey Village on the Whirl. Rather than a Christmas miracle, Ella had to confront real evil. Unfortunately, that evening marked the end of the beautiful young woman's life. Ella Edwards was 26 years old in 2019. She was a dental nurse as well as a cosmetologist at Nova Studio Beauty Salon. Her colleagues and many clients adored her. Here's how Tim Edwards, Elle's father, described her. How can I describe her to people who don't know her? She was wonderful, beautiful, kind, generous, always looking out for others, particularly her family, bubbly, and always had a good laugh. She set her own goals and was achieving them with a positive attitude. On the evening of December 24, 2022, Ellie and her sister went to the Lighthouse Pub after flying from Dubai to spend Christmas and New Year's with her family. She was supposed to meet her friends, and their surveillance cameras caught Ali's evening activities. She was in a good mood, hugging her friends and smiling. They danced, sang, and had a great time. However, someone who valued themselves above all decided to ruin this evening. Someone who did not value human life Police received multiple reports of a shooting shortly after 11, 50 p.m. Soon, police officers surrounded the area. Someone had fired at least 12 shots at the patrons of the pub, where Elle was meeting friends. Sue Coombs, detective superintendent, told a news conference on Christmas Day. Tragically, the victim, a 26-year-old woman, sustained a serious gunshot wound to the head. She was taken to Arrow Park Hospital, but unfortunately died shortly after. Her family has been notified, and they are dealing with this tragic loss on a day that should have been spent celebrating with friends. It is still very early in the investigation. However, we do not believe that the victim in this case has been targeted. She was out enjoying Christmas with her sister and friends, which should have been a relaxing time. What her family is currently going through is incomprehensible. Witnesses described a gunman firing shots into the pub's front entrance before fleeing in a dark vehicle. Ella Edwards was the victim of the shooting. The police did not believe Ella was the intended target of the attack, which also injured four men. A 28-year-old man from a nearby Beechwood was treated for serious injuries, while the other men aged 22 and 33 sustained non-life-threatening injuries. Ella's tragic death presented an unimaginable and heartbreaking challenge for her family. Tim Edwards awoke early on Christmas morning to the worst news any parent could ever hear. It didn't make sense to Tim. After all, he just spoke to his daughter a few hours ago. They discussed the meeting and decided to wrap Christmas presents together. Now the bereaved father sought answers, attempting to figure out how to go on. Meanwhile, the police were working tirelessly to apprehend and prosecute the criminal. They needed CTV footage and witnesses who could share important information on Facebook. Merseyside Police Detective Superintendent David McCarran stated that we have a number of officers at Wallasey Village who are conducting extensive investigations to determine what happened and take immediate action. I would urge anyone who was in the lighthouse in Wallasey Village last night and witnessed the incident or has mobile or CTV footage of what happened to contact us immediately as they may have vital information for our investigation. We believe the gunman left the pub parking lot in a dark colored vehicle possibly a dark-colored Mercedes, shortly after the shooting, and we would like to hear from anyone who witnessed this to contact us right away. The police knew the criminal had fled the scene in a dark Mercedes. They discovered this information after reviewing CTV footage. You can see Mercedes pulling into the parking lot next to the pub where Elle was with her friends. The driver parks the car to see who is inside the establishment and leave as soon as possible. The man observed everyone for a while. He then got out of the car and approached from the side to remain invisible. Moments later, he fired 12 shots, dashed to his Mercedes, and fled the crime scene. As a result, the police had to answer a few questions. Who was this man? Who was the target of the attack? What was the motivation? They began patrolling the streets near where the shooting occurred. Officers went from one door to the next, interviewing residents. Two days later, police announced the arrest of two suspects, but did not reveal their names. They were a 30-year-old man and a 19-year-old woman who were eventually released. According to the authority's statement, the arrested man did not fire the shots. The police spokesman stated unequivocally, we will not rest until the offenders are brought to justice. 
and by that I mean the person who pulled the trigger of the gun in the most indiscriminate manner, anyone who was responsible for arranging, facilitating, or harboring this individual, and anyone who continues to withhold information on who did this or where the weapon is. We will work tirelessly to find justice for L.A. and her family. The shooting was reportedly the result of a feud between two local rival gangs. It confirmed L.A. was a random victim and asked if he could directly link the shooting to a gang feud in Whirl. Critchley stated that there has been some escalation in this area over the last few months. The detectives determined that Jake Duffy and Kieran Salkeld were the intended targets of this attack, but we'll discuss them later, on December 29. The police arrested a third suspect in this case, but he was not the one who fired shots at the Lighthouse Pub's patrons. The man whose name was kept public was charged with conspiracy to commit a crime. The police were also able to locate the criminal's dark Mercedes, which he used to flee the crime scene, but the vehicle had some issues. Let's look at the CTV footage from the evening of December 31. A week following LA's death, the bright flashing light you see now is fire. The criminal knew that the police were only a few steps away from apprehending him, so he burned the Mercedes to destroy any evidence that the police might find there during a search. The Mercedes had become a pile of burned metal, but the police were able to identify it. It turned out that the criminal stole this car, most likely to use it to commit a crime. Almost two weeks later, on January 11, police announced the arrest of two additional suspects. They arrested a 22-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman in Central Wales. The man was named Connor Chapman, and he had a lengthy criminal record. These five photos show him at various times. In a matter of years, Chapman went from petty criminal to the main suspect in Lee Edwards' death. Here are a few of the offenses for which he has previously been arrested. Aggravated carjacking, threatening behavior, burglary, disorderly conduct, and a high-speed chase that ended with him hiding in the bushes and telling officers he was waiting for his mate. Growing up in the woods, he spent most of his time in Birkenhead with his grandparents. Chapman went to Woodchurch High School, but left before taking his exams. He first appeared in court in 2014 when he was around 14 years old for shoplifting. In 2016, the young man faced criminal charges for being on enclosed property and driving a stolen car. Next, he violated his conditional discharge by driving without a license or insurance. Then, in 2017, he was charged with car theft, illegal substance possession, and violating a criminal behavior order, which barred him from traveling to certain parts of the world. In 2018, the police detained him again for possessing a prohibited substance and carrying a cold weapon in public. During the same year, the general public became aware of Chapman's name after he first appeared strangely on the pages of local newspapers. After an unsuccessful attempt to flee a police chase, officers noticed the stolen Audi and attempted to stop it. But the driver disobeyed. Chapman, who was 18 at the time, was speeding at 60 MP in a 30 MP zone while attempting to escape. He flew into oncoming traffic and then crashed into a curb, forcing him to abandon the car and flee. When the police discovered him hiding in the nearby bushes, he stated, I'm waiting for my mate. Chapman's lawyer claims he is influenced by older peers and has struggled with his own health issues, such as ad had and other medical diagnoses. Chapman admitted to reckless driving, aggravated vehicle theft, driving while disqualified, and violating a criminal behavior order. The court sentenced him to eight months in a young offenders institute and a two-year and four-month driving ban, passing the sentence. Recorder Mary Lauren told him poignantly, you have a bad record despite your youth and you have been given every opportunity. You show no regard at all. Other people with this diagnosis do not behave in the same way that you do. They do not cause a nuisance to the public in the same way that you do. By the age of 18, he had 14 convictions for 30 offenses, as a result, it is reasonable to assume that this man had no intention of improving his situation. Unfortunately, there were no legal grounds to keep him isolated from society for a long time. In January 2020, the court sentenced him to 10 months in prison for possessing stolen goods and carrying a cold weapon in public. According to records, Merseyside police issued public appeals for information on his whereabouts on five separate occasions while he was a wanted man. Chapman once claimed that he was in custody more than he was out. By the age of 20, Chapman had 19 convictions for 43 offenses. In summer 2022, he got out of prison. Edwards passed away after about six months.
His first child was born while he was still in prison, and a second daughter was on her way. He told the jury that he wanted to start over and become a better person, but these were empty words. Chapman turned out to be a member of a local gang. He sold illegal drugs, robbed another home, and stole two electric motorcycles. But his most heinous and devastating crime was yet to occur. On December 24, 2022, during a dispute between organized crime groups based on the Wood Church and Beechwood Estates, Chapman armed himself with a Scorpion submachine gun. He waited for Kieran Salkeld and Jake Duffy, members of the rival gang outside Wallace's Lighthouse Pub for three hours. Chapman fired 12 shots just before midnight. Both Salkeld and Duffy were seriously injured, but they survived. Unfortunately, when Chapman fired the gun, Lee Edwards, who was enjoying the evening with close friends, was next to Sol when two bullets struck her in the head. She didn't know Salkeld or Duffy. She didn't know Salkeld or Duffy. She just happened to be present during an attack on them. On January 25, 2023, family, friends, and hundreds of others attended Lee Edwards' funeral. Locals lined the streets in the rain as mourners arrived for the 12.30 p.m. Service. The funeral procession was led by a hearse with a floral tribute stating that Ella's coffin was transported in a carriage pulled by four white horses. Pallbearers, including her heartbroken father, Tim, carried it into the church, topped with a floral display. Her grandfather, George, delivered a message to the mourners, encouraging them to leave the church with hope. The Lighthouse Pub was closed that day as a mark of respect. According to a statement posted on the pub's Facebook page, Ellie and her family have been on our minds for several weeks. This is especially true right now. May she rest peacefully. Tim stated that he hoped to establish a foundation in his daughter's name to help reduce gun violence. He stated that there are no winners in gun crime. If you pick up a gun, your future and the futures of those around you are over. It's dead simple. It's completely pointless and solves nothing. I want to see a positive outcome from this. Ellie's name will be used for positive purposes in the future. She cannot be forgotten. Connor Chapman was charged with numerous offenses, including causing the death of Lee Edwards, but he had an accomplice. Police charged 20-year-old Thomas with possessing a prohibited weapon and assisting an offender. The detectives discovered that after shooting at the Lighthouse Pub's guests, Chapman drove the stolen Mercedes to Barnston, Merseyside, where his longtime friend wearing it lived. The surveillance camera there captured Chapman walking down the road and picking up the crime scene weapon after it had fallen to the ground. Although the crime weapon was never found, police discovered Chapman's DNA in a mixed sample on a bullet casing discovered at the scene and a red glove recovered from Waring's home, which matched one worn by the gunman in a taxi ordered under a false name. Around 5 a.m., Chapman returned home to Woodchurch, Merseyside via a vague pickup point on Christmas morning. To cover up their heinous crime, the men drove to a remote location on New Year's Eve and set fire to a stolen Mercedes. Thomas Waring was found guilty on all charges. In July 2023, the court sentenced him to nine years in prison. Now I'd like to say a few words about Jake Duffy and Kieran Salkeld, who were the targets of the attack. They were both wounded but survived. In this case, they were the victims. However, a closer look at their way of life reveals that they were on a dangerous path. They were part of the Beechwood gang on December 23, 2023. Chapman had injured them the day before at the Lighthouse Pub. Duffy and Saul killed and beat up another criminal affiliated with a group that included Connor Chapman. While Chapman was awaiting sentencing in the shooting case, the two were already imprisoned for their crimes. Salkeld received a 27-month sentence for assault and nine months for being afraid to run concurrently. Duffy was sentenced to two years for assault and nine months for a fray that would run concurrently. The court has also issued injunctions against them, the full list of which is displayed on your screen. Commenting on the injunctions, Chief Inspector Tom Welch stated that gang-related activity has a profoundly negative impact on those who live or work in areas where these criminals conduct their business often recklessly and with complete disregard for others. The gang injunctions served on Duffy and Salkeld are part of our ongoing and relentless efforts to combat serious and organized crime in Birkenhead. Our local officers are well aware of the prohibitions detailed in these injunctions, and they will strictly enforce them. If either man violates the law, we can act quickly to arrest him and return him to court where he may face prison time.
We are using all available powers and legislation to disrupt and deter gang activity, but we can't do it alone. We need communities to report any criminal activity in their area so that we can get criminals off the streets. Together, we are always stronger. However, before the story of the shooting began, the court prohibited Chapman from entering the area surrounding the Lighthouse Pub. Nonetheless, he chose precisely this location to commit the crime that resulted in the death of the innocent young woman. Perhaps many countries around the world should have stricter laws and more effective methods for influencing people who pose a threat to society. This is my subjective opinion. However, you can express your personal opinion in the comments section. Connor Chapman denied everything. He claimed that the camera at the Lighthouse pub captured another man, not him. He claimed he was at home wrapping Christmas presents, but the evidence suggests otherwise. During the three and a half week trial, the jury heard about events leading up to the incident, including a feud between Chapman's Wood Church, a state-based gang, and a rival group centered on the Beechwood Estate, which is home to Saul and Duffy. Investigators discovered that after committing the crime, Chapman planned to flee to Spain by car ferry before he could do that. The police searched his grandparents' home, and the man knew they were close to catching him. As a result, he chose to flee to Wales, rather than risk his life on a car ferry. That is where the plainclothes officers later arrested him. During the trial, Chapman admitted to having access to the Mercedes seen on CTV footage, but stated that it was primarily used by him and other gang members to trade illegal drugs. He claimed other people had access to the Mercedes and that he wasn't driving it that evening. He admitted to burning the car, but said he did so after realizing someone from his gang had used it in the shootout. Outside court, LA's father, Tim, expressed his hope that his daughter's killer would never see Christmas again. If I'm lucky enough to be around for a long time, I'll do everything I can to ensure that he never leaves jail. He stated that the jury of seven women and five men reached a unanimous decision. Following three hours and 48 minutes of deliberation and three and a half weeks of trial at Liverpool Crown Court, they found Chapman guilty, passing sentence. Mr. Justice Goose informed him about what you did. Connor Chapman was both wicked and shocking. You murdered Ellie Edwards, ending her young life. You spent the days following the incident removing or destroying evidence that could identify you as the gunman. It's absolutely shocking. You meticulously planned a revenge attack in a gang rivalry. You had no regard for anyone else. The risks of what you did were both obvious and high. On July 7, 2023, the court sentenced Connor Chapman to life in prison with a minimum of 48 years before he could seek parole. During the verdict announcement, Ellie's family breathed a sigh of relief and whispered yes. Her father, Tim Edwards, also went on air to answer questions from journalists. Tim said some crucial words. I believe Elle's legacy will hopefully inspire people to be more positive. She was a caring person who would devote more of her time to others than to herself, if she can be remembered for that, as well as her warmth and the happy-go, lucky-lucky life she was leading at the age of 26. She would not want you to sit around moping and going downhill. She would not want that. She would not want that. She wants you to live your best life. That was how she approached or interacted with others. She would uplift your spirits. I was lucky to be her father, but we were also close friends. So there are a lot of good memories of laughing and doing stupid things together that you can't print. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The student disappeared on her way to the dormitory and at first the police thought that the solution was right in front of them. However, with each passing day of the investigation, they became more convinced that there were many tangled moments in this case, and it was only by chance in the end that the truth was uncovered. Amy Blau was born on October 1, 1969, in Homestead, Florida. She grew up in a loving family and had many friends, largely due to her cheerful and kind nature. When she was 14 years old, her father passed away. Despite this painful loss, Amy found the strength to maintain a positive outlook on life. After high school, she enrolled at Flagler College, located in St. Augustine, near Jacksonville. Although it was home to only 13,000 people, it was the oldest city in the USA. It was founded by Spanish explorers, so many architectural elements still differed dramatically from familiar American things. 
Amy loved studying at college and in three years she made many friends there by that time she was 21 years old and had only a little laugh before graduation on November 6, 1990 her friend Kim came to St. Augustine and they decided to go to a local bar popular among students Amy's roommate and best. Friend Kelly also went with them. The young women had a great time enjoying the long-awaited meeting. At some point, their mutual acquaintance, Sean Nolan, joined them. He and Amy had mutual sympathy, but they were not in a relationship in the evening. Kelly said that she felt sick and went back to the dorm, and a little later, Kim also left, leaving Sean and Amy alone. The next morning, the young women had to go to classes. However, when Kelly woke up, she found that Amy's bedroom door was wide open. She was not there. It seemed strange to her, but she decided that she would see Amy in class. However, the young woman never showed up. Kelly and Kim were worried about her absence and decided to talk to Sean, who stayed with her at the bar the night before. The guy worked at a place near the college, and the young women went to see him. His story seemed strange to them. At first, he said that he had a strong hangover, and it was difficult for him to remember the chronology of that night. After gathering his thoughts, he finally told them that after the bar, he and Amy went towards the beach to take a walk but soon they decided to go home. The guy called a taxi from the nearest payphone, and while they were waiting for the car, he and Amy had an argument. In the end, she went on foot to the dorm, which was only a few minutes away. Kelly was upset that the guy left Amy alone and didn't walk her to her dorm. At the same time, she became even more worried. Amy had nowhere else to go but the dorm, but she never showed up in her room. Her friend was afraid that something bad had happened to her and began to seriously suspect Sean's strange behavior only heightened her anxiety. It seemed like the guy was not at all worried that Amy had disappeared. Kelly decided to continue her search and went to the university campus, asking all her acquaintances. If they had seen Amy, the answer was the same. No one had met her that day and no one knew where she could be at around 6 p.m. Her friend decided to call the police. She informed investigators about the young woman's disappearance, and they began to check the information they called all local hospitals. But no one resembling Amy had been admitted. The taxi operators were also contacted, but none of the drivers had picked up the young woman that night. The police could not find any evidence that Amy had been in trouble or become a victim of a crime. Moreover, at the time, the young woman was already 21 years old so they did not officially declare her missing despite her friend's requests by that time Kelly was 100 sure that something bad had happened to Amy realizing that she could not convince the police to start searching. She decided to call Amy's mother later the young woman admitted that it was the hardest call of her life the next morning Amy's sister arrived in St. Augustine to participate in the search the first thing they did was go to the police station where they received the same response they couldn't start an investigation because there was no indication of a threat to life the investigators believed that the young woman had simply left for a couple of days without warning so the sisters along with kelly and other friends of the missing young woman decided to organize their own search operation they printed flyers with information about amy and began posting them all over the city soon a local television channel came to their aid spreading information about the young woman's disappearance all of this led to a large number of volunteers offering to participate in the search they split into groups and began combing both the city and the surrounding area volunteer search forests beaches abandoned houses but they were unable to find any clues this continued for three days until the police finally decided to start an investigation by that time the whole town was talking about amy's disappearance apparently putting pressure on the local police department and forcing them to take action the first thing they decided to do was talk to sean as he was the last person to see amy and here they encountered the first suspicious moment the guy told them a story that was different from the one Kelly and Kim heard. Sean said that he and Amy left the bar and headed towards the beach, but on the way they decided to split up and go home. He approached the payphone and called the taxi, but when he turned around, Amy was nowhere to be seen. After waiting for some time, he got in the taxi and went home. Investigators found the story strange. How could a young woman disappear from the street in a matter of seconds and Sean, who was standing a meter away from her, not notice. Moreover, why did he give his friends a different version of events? All of this was enough to start considering Sean, as a suspect, decided to verify his story and find the taxi driver who was supposed to take him home that night, and soon they succeeded. The only problem was that his story also differed from the two versions told by Sean. The driver claimed that he did indeed pick up the young man near the phone booth. However, when he arrived at the location, Sean was sleeping on a bench, and the taxi driver had to wake him up. There was no young woman present at the time. On the one hand, 
This provided the boy with an alibi, but on the other hand, he had for some reason shared his version of what had happened, which only raised suspicion with the detectives. Despite this, there was no evidence against him, so the police continued to search for new leads. Ten days had passed since Amy's disappearance. During that time, there had been no activity on her bank accounts, which only confirmed that she had not left on her own initiative. By that time, the residents of St. Augustine and the police began to suspect that Amy's disappearance might be related to another series of gruesome crimes, about which we have a separate video. In August of the same year, an unknown maniac killed five students in the city of Gainesville, which was 120 kilometers away. People began to fear that this criminal had moved to their town and that they were all in mortal danger. Investigators contacted colleagues from Gainesville and began to compare the cases, but soon they realized that there were many inconsistencies. The Gainesville killer attacked students in their homes and left their bodies there. In Amy's case, the police didn't even know if she was still alive or what had happened to her. Furthermore, at the time of her disappearance, the police had already arrested a man who was highly likely to be the killer. Several serious pieces of evidence pointed to him, therefore, soon the detective stopped looking for a connection between that series of crimes and Amy's disappearance. Meanwhile, the police department offered a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help find Amy. They immediately received hundreds of tips, but most of them were lead. This happens in any case where authorities offer money for information. People come up with various stories hoping to get an easy check. It was also about six potentially important leads. Witnesses reported seeing her in different parts of the city, and many of them added that she got into some cars. Out of all this, this one call was much more interesting. A man reported seeing Amy in the city center on the night of her disappearance. A fairly old car similar to a Chevrolet Camaro pulled up to her. There were two men inside, and after a brief conversation with them, Amy got into the passenger seat, and they drove off at that time. This was the most detailed lead in the hands of detectives, however, something in the witness's behavior made them suspicious after the call he agreed to come to the station answered all the questions and tried to help but for some. Reason the investigators treated him with suspicion detectives called it a police instinct and couldn't explain their doubts they offered him to take a lie detector test to verify his testimony, and the man agreed. They asked him only two questions whether he had anything to do with Amy's disappearance and whether he could take detectives to her the witness answered negatively, and the polygraph operator did not detect any signs of lying thus investigators understood that they finally had honest testimony. That could help find Amy the police began searching for all cars that fit the witness's descriptions, establishing the identities of the drivers, and checking their aliases for the night of the young woman's disappearance. All of this continued for several weeks, but the detective never managed to find a single potential suspect. Since then, there have been no leads in this case, but on January 1st, two months after Amy's disappearance, a disturbing call was made to the police. A man was walking his dog on the outskirts of St. Augustine. At some point, his dog noticed a pile of logs with bricks and started acting strangely barking and pulling on the leash trying to run there. The owner decided to see what has so upset his dog and was almost speechless when he saw a skeleton hand sticking out from under the pile. He immediately called the police and investigators began to extract the body due to the high degree of decomposition. They were unable to quickly establish her identity, but one detail immediately caught their attention. The body was wearing a green shirt just like Amy Blount on the night. She disappeared the body was wrapped in a sheet medical experts conducted a more detailed analysis and concluded that the deceased was a young woman she had received five sharp object wounds indicated by cuts on her shirt in addition two serious abrasions were found on the body investigators. Suspected that the victim was Amy so they immediately sent her dental records to experts who soon confirmed that it was indeed her friends and relatives of the young woman were devastated by the news they had hoped until the very end that Amy would return to them unharm. Now the police had to investigate her murder along with the discovery of the body they received their first lead Amy had been partially buried and covered with logs on the outskirts of a large private property upon learning the name of the owner of this plot they called him in for questioning for. Understandable reasons the man immediately became a suspect, however, after talking to him, the investigators began to doubt his involvement first. It was a huge plot of land without a fence, and anyone could enter it secondly. There were two residential trailers on the property whose owners paid the landowner for rent. He added that he constantly had problems with one of the tenants when they heard his name. The police were shocked. It was the same witness who had been polygraphed. The man was 22-year-old Timothy Gatchel. The police immediately asked the trailer owner to let them search the residence while the man was not at home and he agreed. 
The first thing the police saw was a sheet very similar to the one in which Amy's body was wrapped. Upon further investigation, they found long female hair stuck in the mechanism of a floor exercise machine It was the same color as Amy's hair. In addition, using special chemicals forensic experts discovered blood traces in the living room. A sheet of paper with the name Toby and a phone number were also found in the house. The landowner said that a guy with that name did often visit Timothy. The police allowed that this person might also be related to the murder and contacted him. Toby agreed to meet with the detectives and told them his story, according to Toby's words. On the night of Amy's disappearance, he and Timothy were driving around town, stopping at different bars. At some point, they saw Amy walking alone on the street. Timothy asked Toby to stop the car, got out, and approached the young woman. He invited her to join them, and she got into the car together. They went to Timothy's trailer and had a party. However, Toby's story started to sound strange like a detective story. At first, he claimed that he just dropped off Amy and Timothy near the trailer and immediately left. Then he changed his version and said that he went inside with them, had a beer, then went to the bathroom and left immediately without going into the living room and got into the car and left. Investigators doubted that he was completely honest with them. They didn't believe that Amy would go to the outskirts of the city with two unknown men at night in the morning she had to go to classes and was supposed to go to the dormitory right after the bar it looked like Toby constructed his story in such a way that he couldn't be made and an accomplice detectives did not rule out that Timothy and Toby might have actually abducted the young woman on the empty night street but could not prove it yet. Moreover Toby told something else. According to him, in the first week of the investigation, he saw flyers about Amy's disappearance and recognized her. When he asked Timothy what happened that night, he claimed that he took the young woman to the city center and dropped her off there. After that, she approached another car and soon got into it. Toby told him that he should share this information with the police. Despite the fact that his story raised serious doubts, the police had enough evidence to arrest Timothy. They arrived at his house and the man came out with his hands raised during the interrogation. He told the investigators the same story. When Toby left, he began to flirt with Amy, but she rejected him. Then he got angry and decided to take her back to the city considering that he did not have his own car. He took the owner of the land's pickup truck and drove her to the center where Amy allegedly got into another car. But the detectives immediately realized that this was a lie at that point. They already knew that the rental pickup truck had three flats and worn out tires for many months. The investigators immediately told him about it and Timothy became nervous. The detectives asked him, did you kill Amy? And the man replied, I don't know it seems so from that moment on he began to talk about the events of that night. According to him he didn't remember much of what happened at some point he tried to kiss Amy and the next thing he remembers is her holding a knife he allegedly got scared that she might attack him so he tried to take the weapon away from her after that Timothy didn't remember anything as if he had lost consciousness according to him this had happened to him before he had completely lost some memories when he came to he found the knife in his hand and Amy lying on the floor showing no signs of life scared he decided to get rid of the body Timothy went to the shed for the shovel and started digging a hole he then wrapped Amy in a sheet and buried her there covering the grave with logs and bricks after that he prayed to God went to clean up the blood in the room with his confession in hand Timothy was charged with murder but no evidence was found against Toby so he was only used as a witness on July 15 1991 a trial was held where the man planned to defend himself and receive a lesser punishment. He wanted to make it look like self-defense and use the story of memory loss. However, everything changed when the prosecutor addressed the judge and requested the death penalty. Almost immediately after that, Timothy stood up and said he was ready to confess the first-degree murder if the prosecution would drop the death penalty in favor of life imprisonment. After some brief consideration, the court agreed to these conditions and Timothy was sentenced to life in prison. Amy's relatives and friends supported this decision. They all harbored hatred toward the person who took her away from them and wanted him to spend the rest of his life in a prison cell. As for Toby, no charges were ever brought against him. Nevertheless, his story still seemed suspicious, and I wouldn't rule out the possibility that he was directly involved in the murder. Timothy remains behind bars to this day. He is currently 53 years old. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The dramatic story began in 1995.
The bodies of two lovers were discovered on the shores of Juliet Lake in Georgia. It took authorities nearly two years to identify and apprehend the criminal. The final word in this case was spoken 18 years after the crime was committed. Juliet is an unincorporated community and census, designated place in Monroe County, Georgia. Just a few days ago, the new year of 1995 arrived and many people were still in the holiday spirit. However, it was a difficult time for a local sheriff who had grown accustomed to believing that his job was easy. On January 3, a man called the police to report that he discovered two lifeless bodies while walking near Juliet Lake. The sheriff and his deputy went to the crime scene. You can get a sense of Juliet's size by looking at the sheriff's office. Nothing more serious than a fight or theft has occurred here. That's why the sheriff and his deputy were astounded by what they witnessed. There was a white Honda on the lake's shore with the man's body inside, and it wasn't far away. The body of a young woman lay on the ground. You didn't have to be an expert to recognize that both of them died from gunshot wounds. There were personal belongings of the victims inside the car, including their documents, which revealed that the male body in the driver's seat was 22-year-old Grant Patrick Hendrickson. Michelle Lee Cartagena, 19, was the second victim in this violent crime. The state police were notified of the incident. Soon, officers from the Major Crimes Unit arrived at the lake, along with forensic experts. The first thing detectives noticed, which could have been a motive for the crime, was Michelle's partially exposed body with her skirt pulled up. Based on the location of bullet holes on the car's body, detectives assumed that the criminal opened fire on the couple while they were inside. Grant was hit with three bullets. Unfortunately, he had no hope of survival. Michelle was shot twice and was presumably conscious when the criminal pulled her out of the car. The position of her body, with her legs spread wide open, indicated that the criminal may have wanted to take advantage of her helplessness, but did not, as life had left her. Forensic experts discovered dark mucus on the insides of her thighs, which turned out to be saliva containing chewing tobacco particles. The saliva samples were sent to the laboratory for analysis. During the investigation of the crime scene, the police discovered significant evidence, specifically bullet cases of two different calibers, 13 220, three caliber casings, and four 9mm casings. If two types of weapons were used in the crime, it is possible that there were two criminals. When Grant and Mikkel's families learned what had happened, they were both shocked. They had no idea who or why would want to do this to their children. Grant, like Michelle, was his parents' only child. Michelle Lee Cartagena was born May 2, 1975, in Monterey, California. She was a member of the school marching orchestra band, the top singles tennis player, the softball team captain, and a member of the National Honor Society. Michelle spent her free time volunteering with the Red Cross Society and the Animal Welfare Association, as well as visiting the elderly. Her father described her as a gifted and talented woman full of love and life, who aspired to be a doctor so that she could help others and contribute to society. Grant Patrick Hendrickson was born September 20, 1972, in Macon, Georgia. He enjoyed fishing, golfing, canoeing, and camping. He, like his girlfriend, was involved in community life and began volunteering at Macon's Museum of Arts and Sciences at the age of 15. Those who knew the couple assumed that their active lifestyles attracted them to one another. Who could have committed such a cold-blooded crime? Residents of Monroe County were concerned for their safety because the man who had dealt with a young couple by the lake was still free and could strike again. Michelle did attend Mercer University. Grant was in his fifth year while Michelle was in her second year. They'd been dating for a little more than a year and had already planned their future together. We are about to have a wedding. Detectives had to figure out who ruined their plans when their relatives couldn't name anyone who would wish them harm. The investigators traveled to Mercer University in Macon. I was talking to Grant and Michelle's classmates. The officers hoped to learn something useful for their investigation. Michelle and Grant were both in good standing at the university, had no conflicts with anyone, and were generally described as pleasant, caring individuals. The detectives suspected that the crime had been committed by a man who had feelings for Michelle but was rejected, but this theory was not confirmed and was pushed to the sidelines. As a result, visiting Mercer University provided the police with no information that could have assisted them in locating the criminal. Detectives discovered that Grant and Michelle visited a restaurant on January 2 while reconstructing the chronology of events. 
leading up to their deaths. Following a meal, they went to the cinema. After the film, they went to a vacation camp at Juliet Lake. This camp was open 24 hours a day and featured a boat launch, parking lot, small dock, and picnic tables. The public could use these plays for free, so there was no personnel or security. On the night of the crime, there were other people in various parts of the lake. Some of them claimed they heard loud popping noises, but because it was January 2, they mistook the sound for firecrackers. Someone also stated that he saw a 1980s Hendrickson leaving the parking lot at high speeds. Meanwhile, experts extracted DNA from saliva found on Michelle's thigh. However, at the time, the DNA database was in its infancy. The U.S. Congress passed the DNA Identification Act in 1994, allowing the FBI to create a national DNA database of convicted criminals, as well as separate databases containing information about missing people and forensic samples collected from crime scenes. That is why there was nothing to compare the DNA sample extracted from Mikkel's saliva to. It could only have yielded a match if directly compared to the criminal's DNA. The survey of employees at the restaurant and cinema that Grant and Michelle visited before their deaths yielded no results either. There were no conflicts or unusual circumstances at either location. The authorities speculated that Grant and Michelle could have been unintentional victims or had crossed paths not long before they died. The detectives saw no other explanations. The young couple studied diligently. We are not associated with any shady individuals and do not use illegal substances. And the fact that the criminal did not take any money or other valuables from the car indicates that the crime was motivated by something other than greed. The state forensic lab determined that the weapons used in the crime were most likely an R-15 rifle and a 9mm Ruger pistol. The police interviewed over 100 people, and a few dozen potential suspects were ruled out after voluntarily providing DNA samples for comparison. As a result, the investigation has come to a halt more than a year and a half after the crime in the fall of 1996. Agent Randy Upton of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation took over the case. After thoroughly studying the case, he decided to take a different approach and began looking for the criminal himself, as his predecessors had. But for his weapon, which he used in the attack on Grant and Michelle, Agent Upton went to Macon's largest gun store and requested a list of people who had purchased an R-15 rifle between 1985 and 1985. Now the agent had a list of 108 names. He began calling people on the list, telling them that they would be extremely helpful to the investigation if they allowed their weapon to be examined and provided a DNA sample for analysis. Most people readily agreed to cooperate. Following the appropriate tests, the list of potential suspects began to shrink. On November 27, 1996, Upton called Andrew Allen Cook, 22, who was also on the list, in conversation with Andrew. Agent Upton explained the purpose of his call and requested permission to examine Cook's rifle. Andrew replied that it was impossible because he sold it in April 1994, eight months before Grant and Michelle died. However, according to gun store records, Andrew Cook was unable to sell his rifle in April 1994 because he had purchased it in August of that year. Agent Upton realized his interlocutor was lying. When Upton asked Cook to provide his DNA sample, he said he needed to speak with his father, an FBI agent first. And then he hung up. Upton immediately realized that Andrew Cook could be the person he was looking for. It was discovered that five months after Grant and Michelle's deaths in May 1995, a Cook pawned his rifle at one of the gun stores. The police also discovered that in December 1993, a Cook's acquaintance purchased a Ruger pistol on his behalf because he was too young to do so himself. He sold the pistol to one of his friends in July 1995, just after pawning the rifle. To summarize what has been said, he got rid of both his rifle and pistol six months after the deaths of Grant and Michelle Andrew Cook, which was far from a coincidence. The more the police learned about Cook, the more they were confident that they were on the right track. As it turned out, shortly after Grant and Michelle's deaths, he not only disposed of his weapons, but also his car a 1987 Hendrickson. This vehicle fits the description of a car found near the crime scene. Cook worked in a diaper factory, which Agent Upton decided to visit. Andrew was not at work, but the agent spoke with a friend and colleague. According to court documents, a colleague reported that they recently discussed the worst thing they had ever done, and Andrew stated that he shot someone with a rifle. The colleague didn't believe the story but wanted to know why he did it. 
The cook responded that he wanted to see if he could get away with it. The colleague also stated that Andrew chewed tobacco frequently. Another friend testified that in late November 1996, the cook told him he needed to leave town because it was getting too hot. Agent Upton began looking for Andrew Cook, who had not lived in his parents' home in several years. Randy Upton contacted his father on December 4, 1996, and set up a meeting. John Cook was indeed an FBI agent with 29 years of experience. During the meeting, Agent Upton explained to John that he is investigating the crime committed at Juliet Lake, which is why he wishes to speak with his son Andrew, but cannot locate him. John became aware of Grant and Michelle's case through the media. He himself did not take part in the investigation. He told Upton that he does not consider his son a suspect, but he promised to find him and speak with him. Later that day, John was able to reach Andrew on the phone. He informed his son that the detective in charge of the Juliet Lake case was looking for him and inquired whether he knew anything about it. His son's response turned his entire life upside down. Andrew told Daddy, I can't tell you. You're one of them. You are a cop. When John Cook asked the next question, he prayed that his son would say no. Were you the shooter? He asked. After a brief pause, Andrew replied yes. He told his father that one night, while fishing at Juliet Lake, the couple drove there, and he got into an argument with the driver. According to him, Grant threatened him with a pistol. He became enraged, took his rifle, and did something that could not be undone. John Cook asked his son to contact the authorities, but Andrew replied that he would just disappear. John was stunned by his son's story. It was extremely difficult for him, but he remained professional. The next day, John went to the Monroe County Sheriff's Office and informed them about his son's confession. At the time, no one knew Andrew had been arrested in the neighboring county that morning for shooting deer and turkey outside of the hunting season. He introduced himself under an assumed name, but it became clear when Agent Upton learned that Andrew Cook had been arrested. He traveled to Jones County to speak with him. Upton was unaware of this the day before. Andrew confessed everything to his father. After arriving at the Jones County Sheriff's Office, Upton introduced himself and asked Andrew Cook to answer a few questions. He replied, two years have passed, and you still have nothing. I once owned a Honda, I once owned a rifle, and I used to have a Ruger, but now you're trying to set me up. He then stated that if they called his father and found him a lawyer, he would confess everything. Andrew was delivered to Monroe County. The sheriff allowed John Cook to speak with Andrew one-on-one. -on -one. When John hugged his son, both of them cried. John expressed his disbelief that Andrew had told him the truth, to which Andrew responded that he was not fishing that night and that when he arrived at the lake, the victim's car was already there. Grant and Michelle didn't notice how he approached the car with his rifle and opened fire. Then, he claims he fired a few more shots from his pistol before pulling the woman out of the car to confuse the cops. He spat on Michelle on purpose to ensure that the police couldn't find him using his name. Andrew Cook was charged in the case involving Grant Hendrickson and Michael Lee Cartagena. In addition to Andrew's confession, police have identified the current owners of the rifle and pistol he used during the crime. A forensic ballistic examination revealed that Michelle and Grant were killed with the same firearms. Andrew's DNA was also tested, and it matched the sample extracted from Michelle's saliva. The trial started in 1998. John Cook spoke at the trial. He repeatedly apologized to Grant's and Michelle's families, but he also stated that his apologies would not bring them peace. He claimed that he dedicated his entire life to his service and had no idea how evil had consumed his son. On March 19, 1998, Andrew Cook was found guilty. He was sentenced to death, and after Cook exhausted all of his appeals, the execution date was set for February 22, 2013. The State Board of Pardons and Paroles met three days before this date, on February 19, 2013, to consider a clemency appeal filed by Andrew's attorneys on his behalf. The attorneys attempted to persuade the board that Andrew is mentally ill and requires treatment. After considering the appeal, the state board decided against clemency. On the day of Andrew's execution, February 22, 2013, his family paid him a visit in prison to say goodbye. He was also able to order his final meal. He ordered steak, baked potatoes, fried shrimp, lemon pie, and soda. As he was strapped to a gurney in the death chamber, he said his final words, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna ask you to forgive me. I couldn't even do it myself. He thanked his family for their support and presence, and he apologized for taking so much away from them all. 
The injection was given at 11.08 p.m. 14 minutes later, Andrew Cook, 38, was pronounced dead. Following the execution, Grant's mother, Mary Hendrickson, stated that she had been waiting for justice for 18 years. She added, I believe that was the devil's work. When all this was going on, I was just thinking to myself, well, the devil will not win. He's not going to win my heart. He's not going to win my heart. He is not going to win. On June 21, 2023, the media reported that John Cook had died at the age of 81. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A first year student went out dancing with her friends and disappeared. Without a trace, several days later her car was found abandoned under a bridge. The police started an investigation, which eventually became one of the most high-profile and iconic cases in the entire state, although they did eventually uncover the truth. The case continues to haunt detectives to this day. 42 years later, Gina Renee Hall was born on August 24, 1961. In the American state of Virginia, she had an older sister named Vienna and loving parents. However, tragic events followed her in childhood. When she was two years old, she and her mother were involved in a serious car accident. As a result, Gina was seriously injured and suffered third-degree burns. She had to undergo a long course of treatment, but it was impossible to completely get rid of the burns. Her mother blamed herself for the accident, and over time things only got worse. The woman developed serious psychological problems, which eventually led to her leaving the family. Gina and her sister struggled to deal with this event, but their father did an excellent job of raising the children. Later, he remarried, and the girls gained his stepmother after finishing high school. Gina decided to attend a local college to become a nurse, but after the first semester she thought about changing schools. Her older sister was studying at Radford University, and Gina transferred there. This university offered more in-depth education in her chosen field, and was generally more prestigious. In addition, the young women could spend a lot of time together as they had been very close since childhood. Diana rented an apartment near the university, and Gina moved in with her from the first months of her studies. Gina had a group of friends with whom she spent a lot of free time. She was thrilled with the university and especially happy to be living with her sister again. Diana was finishing her final year at the time, while Gina was only in her first year during the summer break of 1980. Both young women decided to stay at the university and attend additional classes. Gina also wanted to spend more time with her sister before she graduated on June 28th. Gina took her last exam to finish her first year and decided to celebrate. She planned to go dancing at a club with her friends and sister, but Diana decided to stay home at the last minute. Gina was upset about it, but still went to the club with her friends around 10 p.m. She took Diana's Chevrolet Monte Carlo and drove to a nearby city where the club was located at 1 a.m. Diana woke up from a call on the home phone. It was Gina. And from her voice, her sister seemed slightly concerned about something. The young woman said that she was at a lake house with a guy named Steph, and she soon hung up. Diana thought it was strange at 18. Gina had never been involved with boys throughout her life. The young woman had complexes due to burns covering a significant part of her body, so she always avoided relationships with the opposite sex Diana thought her sister had gone there with other friends and did not attach much importance to. It the young woman woke up at around 6 a.m. and immediately went to her sister's room, but she was not there. The car was also missing from their parking spot. Diana began to worry seriously because Gina should have already returned home at around 7.30 a.m. an old friend of Gina's came to their apartment. He served in the army and returned home for a few days to see his friends and family. A few days before this, he and Gina agreed to meet this morning. Diana became even more worried her sister was irresponsible and punctual person, and she could not imagine her setting up a meeting with someone close. And not showing up, Diana called several of Gina's friends with whom she was that evening, but none of them saw the girl after the club. Then, with this young man from the army, they decided that Gina could have had an accident or someone kidnapped her. They got in the car and drove to the lake, inspecting the surrounding areas around the roads for the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. This task was complicated by the fact that they did not even roughly know which house Gina was in that night. 
After driving for several hours on different routes, they returned home, and Diana decided to contact the police as usual. In those days, the police were in no hurry to accept reports of a missing person. Gina was 18, so the operator advised waiting until the next day to file a report. In the evening, Diana also called her father and reported her sister missing. The man arrived the next morning, and they again turned to the police. This time, the report was accepted, but they still did not rush to conduct the full-scale surge. The police still thought that the young woman had just gone out and no danger threatened her. Then Diana, her father, and some of Gina's friends decided to go on their own search again. This time they were met with an alarming discovery driving near the bridge on the edge of Radford. They saw Diana's car next to the railway viaduct. The trunk was open and the doors were unlocked the first thing. Diana noticed was that the driver's seat was pushed all the way back, which seemed very strange to Regina was just over 150 centimeters tall, and she always had to move the driver's seat as close to the steering wheel as possible. Physically, Gina wouldn't be able to drive with the seat pushed all. The way back which led everyone to a very alarming thought someone else must have been behind the wheel. In addition, inside the car relatives noticed several broken handles and a red mark resembling blood was visible on the trunk lid. They reported their findings to the police and detectives examined. The car more thoroughly hairs were found inside that matched Gina's hair color and length near the location of the car. They also found one of Gina's shoes and a blue towel in 1980 DNA analysis was not yet practiced so the police could not determine whose blood was on the trunk door. Despite this, the detectives finally started to properly investigate the case because they believed that Gina was dead. However, at the same time, a mass shooting occurred nearby and most of the police were transferred to that case as a result a simple road patrolman with no experience in such matters was appointed as the lead detective. Soon after the car was found, another interesting fact emerged. It turned out that two different Police officers saw the car while driving by the first notice that around 5 a.m. on the night of Gina's disappearance, despite the car being parked with an open trunk. He did not suspect anything and thought the car belonged to a fisherman they really liked to park in that spot. Because it was close to the riverbank, the second police officer drove by a few hours later. He did not approach the car, but only ran its plates over the radio hearing that the car was not. In the system as stolen, the officer left the lead detective spoke with Diana and learned that Gina called her at 1 a.m. and said she was at a house by the lake at the time they did not know which exact house she was referring to or whose staff was there for the officers went there and knocked on every door. Unfortunately, this did not yield any results. Most of the houses were only used on weekends and the residents of the others did not see Gina. Meanwhile, divers began inspecting the river next to where Gina's car was found. It looked as though an unknown person had killed Gina brought her to the river and dumped her in the water. However, the divers encountered strong currents and almost zero visibility underwater leading them to speculate that if Gina's body was thrown into the water more than a day ago, it could have been carried far away. Meanwhile, Gina's father and sister held on to hope that she would be found alive. They didn't rely solely on the police and went to the local radio station to report her disappearance, hoping that someone in the community might have information or be a witness the detectives focused on finding that Stephen who was with Gina in the house by the lake he planned to question all of her friends who were at the club but before he could do so Stephen himself called the police station and showed up for questioning he turned out to be 28 year old Stephen Epperly Stephen explained that Bill one of Gina's friends and a member of their group invited him to the club that evening they danced and had a good time and then Stephen suggested going to Bill's parents house by the lake Bill's parents were away for a few weeks and asked their son to look after the house. Gina agreed and they drove to the house in her car Stephen drove and after arriving at the house Gina called her sister, then she and Stephen went swimming in the lake when they returned to the house Stephen tried to kiss her, but Gina refused saying that she wasn't ready because they had only met a few hours earlier they spent more time in the house before leaving at around 4 a.m. Gina drove Stephen to his house and then went home when Stephen heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio he decided to go to the police station and tell them about that night the detective asked Stephen to show him the house by the lake and they went there together on the way the detective tried to get as much information as possible from Stephen about that evening to understand what might have happened to Gina Stephen recalled that she had planned to meet an old friend who just returned from the army that morning he also remembered that shortly before they left the house bill and his girlfriend arrived the four of them talked briefly before Stephen and Gina left the detective also questioned Gina's other friends, who confirmed Stephen's story that she left the club with him after midnight. Bill told the detective that Steph approached him in this club and asked for the keys. Bill's friend warned him that Steph was planning to come to the house later with his girlfriend, and Steph left. 
However, something interesting happened next. The detectives asked Bill if he saw Gina when he arrived at the house, and Bill denied it. According to him, when he and his girlfriend arrived, Steph was standing in the laundry room, drying himself with a towel. He said that he and Gina would leave soon, and Bill and his girlfriend went to another room. The last thing they heard was the front door closing. None of them saw or heard Gina. The detective found this strange, as Steph had mentioned that Gina was talking to Bill and his girlfriend, but Bill denied it after checking Steph's criminal history. The detectives found nothing serious, there were only a few traffic fines, but when he asked his colleagues at the station if they were familiar with this name, several officers told him a number of troubling stories. Staff often got into fights in bars, and the police had to intervene regularly, but he was never charged in any of these cases. When Stephen was around 18 years old, the police visited his home several times because the young man attacked his younger sister and even his mother with his fists. In these cases, the family refused to press charges, so these incidents did not make it into his criminal record, but that's not all. The detective called several police stations located in other counties where Steph used to live. In one of them, he was told that once the guy broke into his ex-girlfriend's house and beat her and subjected her to violence, but the woman managed to escape. When her little child cried in the next room, Steph let the victim go to calm the child down. Instead, she ran out with the child to the police station. Despite all this, the young man somehow managed to avoid punishment. Sometime later, he deceitfully lured another young woman to his apartment, saying that they're going to a party with friends. Instead, when the young woman entered the room, he closed the door and subjected her to violence. The victim went to the police. But again, Steph somehow avoided punishment. With all this information in hand, the detectives began to suspect Steph. The police went to the house by the lake to conduct a search where they found several disturbing discoveries. When Bill spoke with the investigator, he said he did not notice anything strange in the house after Gina's disappearance, but as soon as the forensic team arrived, they found many troubling signs of a heinous crime. There was a large blood stain on the living room floor that had clearly been attempted to be cleaned. Blood stains were also found throughout the house, including on the refrigerator door, a dustpan, some shoes, and so on. In addition, the broken ankle bracelet Gina always wore was found in the house bill, and his parents noticed. The disappearance of several items from the house, including two blue towels, one of which the police found next to Gina's car, a bath mat, and a large number of paper towels, but the most interesting thing was that almost all of the cleaning supplies had disappeared from the house, which had previously been well stocked with them. The police found an empty bottle of bleach in the garbage container, along with long hair of the same color, as Gina's experts examined blood samples from the house. DNA analysis was still unavailable at that time, but they matched Gina's blood group. Learning all this, Bill shared additional information with investigators. He told them that he heard about Gina's disappearance on the radio and immediately thought that Steph might be involved. In addition to being with her that night, all their friends knew about his criminal tendencies and aggressive behavior Bill went to Steph's workplace and started asking him about that evening. Steph insisted that he had nothing to do with the young woman's disappearance, but then something interesting happened when Bill asked him to contact the police. Steph agreed but asked his friend not to tell anyone that he was with Gina that night. He also wondered how many people saw him leave the club with her. Bill also told something else about that night. When Gina left the club with Steph, she looked confused, apparently thinking that all her friends were going to the house by the lake and was in disarray. The next day, Bill and his friends had a barbecue in that house. None of them knew about Gina's disappearance at that time. While they were sitting outside, Steph volunteered to make drinks for everyone and went into the house. He spent a lot of time in there. And when he finally returned, he explained that he couldn't find the bottle opener. The detective thought that in fact Steve had been trying to clean up the blood stains all this time since he hadn't been able to do it completely at night. Despite no direct evidence linking staff to the crime, the detectives no longer doubted that he was the one behind the murder. According to his version, that evening at the club, he invited Gina to the lake and said that the other friends were also going there in the house. He tried to kiss her, but the young woman refused, and then the man attacked her, subjected her to violence, killed her and hid the body somewhere in the house. After that, for several hours, he tried to clean the blood and erase the traces of the struggle. When Bill came to the house with his girlfriend, Steph waited until they went into the room and moved Gina's body to the trunk of her own car. 
Then he drove her to the river, threw her into the water, and left the car there. The man did not even think to move the driver's seat closer to the steering wheel as it was originally installed. The big problem remained in this story. Gina's body was still not found in those years. Courts rarely sentenced criminals if there was no victim's body. Lawyers could always insist that without a body, it was impossible to consider a person dead with 100% certainty, and there was always a slight chance that the person was actually alive. Investigators continued to search for additional evidence, and two weeks after Gina's disappearance, they decided to re-examine the place where her car was found. This time they brought more officers and it paid off they found the young woman's clothing nearby covered in blood experts found several hairs on it, one of which matched Steph's hair. In addition, they found small particles of foreign fabric after conducting a series of necessary analysis they determined that these particles completely matched the carpet in the house by the lake. In addition to the clothes, they found a second towel missing from the house. However, the police admitted that all these things were thrown by the killer after the car was found as this particular place had already been inspected that day the detectives did not stop there in an attempt to obtain more evidence he contacted a dog handler and he came with his search dog to the place where the car was found then something that shocked all the present officers happened the dog took the trail and headed across the river on a bridge then it walked through the streets of radford almost circling the entire city when suddenly the dog approached one of the houses climbed down to the porch and gave the signal to the dog handler it was a house where stephen epperly and his relatives lived even the dog handler did not expect such a result he did not know who Steph was or what he was suspected of. The detective had hoped at best that the dog would lead them to some additional evidence or a body, but in the end, the dog led them to the porch of a possible suspect. Later that day, Steph was called in for questioning with the use of a polygraph. He continued to deny his guilt, but the polygraph operator repeatedly detected that he was lying. After the questioning, the investigators told him that their trained dog had just led them to his home. Stephen covered his face with his hands and said something like, What a good dog, Dot. However, without Gina's body, he still couldn't be charged with murder, and staff remained free. When the whole town learned about his previous crimes and the evidence against him in Gina's case, no one doubted his guilt. People came to his house and wrote threatening letters, and the man decided to move to a small town in an Ohio. Five days later, a 25-year-old woman disappeared not far from where Steph had settled, and a month later, her body was found in a cornfield. Local detectives knew that Stephen was suspected in Gina's murder, and he immediately became the prime suspect. However, his guilt could not be proven due to the lack of evidence. Bill continued to talk to staff and tell the police about their conversations when Stephen found out that Bill had a good lawyer he asked if he could represent him and even more disturbingly he asked Bill to ask him if the police could arrest him if the police that the chances of a guilty verdict in court were slim but after the other young woman's murder he decided to risk his career and arrested Stephen he was charged with murder and the case went to trial the situation was complicated by the fact that an inexperienced prosecutor was assigned to the case who had only been in the position for seven months. Others simply refused to participate in such a complex process where they had to prove a murder without a body. Surprisingly, the prosecutor did an excellent job. The trial lasted more than three months, and ultimately, the jury found Stephen Eberly guilty of Gina's murder. The prosecutor presented all available evidence and was able to convince the jury that the victim was dead and the staff was the killer. As a result, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This was not only the first conviction without a body in Virginia, but also the first time a court accepted a search dog's lead as evidence. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to prove Steph's involvement in the murder of another woman in Ohio. They also continued to search for Gina's body, but these efforts were halted in 1994. However, in 2016, 36 years after Gina's murder, a local resident came forward to the Radford police. He confessed that his family had been keeping a terrible secret all these years. In 1980, their grandfather, who lived on a farm outside of town, saw two men in a white van pulling a body out of a car near. A field detectives thought this could be Gina and resume their search. However, they were unable to find any remains, but the grandson's revelation led to new searches for Gina's remains. Her sister, Diana, played a big role in this continuing to hope for closure. In 2019, she met a forensic anthropologist who invented a unique method for finding DNA underground. His tool detected the presence of any human biological material and investigators used it in their search. After many months it bore fruit in 2020, they found Gina's remains in eight different locations. 
Along the river and lake these were mostly small pieces that would have been impossible to find without special equipment only in one case were they able to find a bone fragment that belonged to the young woman. As for staff, he is still serving his sentence, despite numerous appeals and attempts to be released early investigators believe he may have had many more victims, but they have been unable to find the necessary evidence over the years. Their only comfort is that he has been isolated from society and has not harmed anyone else. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we will talk about a story that happened in 2019. Jassy Correa planned to celebrate her 23rd birthday at one of Boston's entertainment venues. However, she did not return home after meeting up with friends. What happened to her was widely reported on American television channels. Jassy Gelsapire's Correa was born in Praia, the capital and largest city in Cabo Verde. Jassy and her father immigrated to the United States when she was three years old. They resided in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Boston became her home, where she grew up, attended school, and eventually became a devoted mother to her daughter, Gabriella. Jassy's personal life was not a fairy tale. Approximately a year before the events we'll discuss today, Gabrielle's father, Miguel Castro, attacked her. She wanted to leave, but Miguel refused. Instead, he beat her severely. Jassy later reported Miguel to the police, and the court eventually sentenced him to four years in prison. Jassy worked as a waitress at Boston's Del Frisco. She enjoyed dancing and was enthusiastic about photography. The young woman valued her time spent with her family, friends, and daughter. She enjoyed visiting the park with her young daughter. On the evening of Saturday, February 23, 2019, Jassy left her two-year-old daughter with her family to celebrate her birthday with friends. They chose the venue, a nightclub on Warrington Street in Boston's theater district. She wore her new orange jumpsuit and had a good evening. A few days later, her friend informed the police that she and Jassy had spent the night dancing and drinking champagne. After the nightclub closed, Jassy and her two friends went outside. As is often the case, the friends parted ways, leaving Jassy on her own. She didn't return home after that night. Her phone was turned off and all calls went to voicemail. There was no news from Jassy on Sunday morning. Nobody has seen her since she left the venue on Sunday morning. On Tuesday, February 26, her father, Joaquin Correa, went to the police station with a friend of Jassy to report that his 23-year-old daughter had gone missing. The police opened an investigation. The first thing the detectives needed to figure out was where Jassy went after leaving the club. Her family and friends distributed information flyers to passersby and throughout the city. I was hoping someone would share important information. Detectives speak with Jassy's friends who were with her that night. However, because they had no idea where she had gone, this did little to help the investigation. After leaving the nightclub, they said their goodbyes, with Jassy intending to return home. Police interviewed witnesses and examined CCTV footage from the club and surrounding streets. One of the recordings showed Jassy on the sidewalk on Fremont Street near the nightclub, where she spoke with several people at 2, 14 a.m. It was after she had left the nightclub. The footage also showed Jassy, who appeared to be under the influence of alcohol, getting into an Uber that she had not ordered. The young woman accidentally got into the wrong car. To put it mildly, the driver was upset about it. They began arguing, and he pushed her out of the car. What happened next was of particular interest to the investigators. She continued to argue with the driver after being forced out of the vehicle. At that point, an unknown man approached her and offered to take his hand. He took her aside briefly, and they began talking about something. Perhaps she wanted to leave, but this man refused to let go of her hands. In this video, you can see them standing on the sidewalk, and the man holding Jassy's hands pulls her towards him. Further investigation of the CTV footage revealed that Jassy left the area with this man, knowing how the story would end. One realizes she fell into the hands of a predator who decided to exploit the situation. The next video from the cameras shows Jassy jumping on the man's back and being carried to his car. They got in the car and left 14 minutes later. The police had to find answers to numerous questions. Who was this man? Where has he taken Jassy? Fortunately, they quickly learned his name and address. 
The man Jassy was with turned out to be Lewis Coleman, 32. He grew up in a good family and some sources say he had a master's degree in physics and had no legal issues. The police database contained no information indicating that Lewis Coleman owned a car. Coleman's mother, who lived in California, had a red 2016 Buick, which was exactly the type of car Coleman put Jassy in. Korea Coleman resided in Providence, Rhode Island, approximately 50 miles from the venue nightclub. The police arrived at his home, but the man was no longer present. See Steve Keeve cameras inside and outside the building confirmed both the police and Jassy's family's worst fears. Coleman's drive from the venue club to his apartment in Providence took about an hour, so he must have stopped somewhere because he returned to his apartment at 4, 15 a.m. on Sunday. He got Jassy into his car about two hours later. Coleman emailed his colleagues the next day, informing them that he would be away for a few more days. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to let you know that I am still out sick. I will be back in a few days, Coleman wrote. According to what he wrote, he needed time to hide the evidence of the crime. That's what he tried to do over the next two days. We'll now look at more cat TV footage to see what happened to Jassy after she left with Coleman. For ethical reasons, the police never released the first recording, which showed Coleman going to his apartment with Jassy. The following is how FBI Special Agent Thomas Zukaskus described what he witnessed on the recording. Coleman walked from the red sedan to the front of the building carrying a body with long hair and orange pants. I believe the footage shows Coleman carrying the victim into his apartment building. According to Zukaskus, the video from the building's lobby shows Coleman entering the building around 4.27 a.m. with a woman in his arms. Then he took the elevator up to the sixth floor. Jassy wasn't moving at the time. She was either unconscious or had already died. Coleman was caught on camera at Walmart on Tuesday, February 26, the same day that Jassy's father reported her missing to the police. The list of goods he purchased was very revealing. The receipts obtained by the police showed that he had purchased three Tyvek suits, duct tape for candles, electrical tape, a mask, surgical gloves, two pairs of safety goggles, a respirator, and the Klon Release bleach bath the next day. On the Klon Release bleach bath the next day, on February 27, Coleman returned to Walmart while relatives and friends distributed information flyers featuring Jassy's picture to passersby. The footage was shot at 9.22 p.m. He is shown wheeling a cart that contains very characteristic items. He purchased a large suitcase and a canister on February 27, 2019. Coleman was captured on video entering the apartment building around 9.58 p.m. with what appeared to be a large suitcase. The footage then shows Coleman wheeling the suitcase away from his apartment unit, towards the elevator, out of the building, and into the parking lot to his vehicle on February 28, 2019, at 2, 15 a.m. More comments are unnecessary for this footage. Simply watch it, and you will understand everything. Coleman appeared to have difficulty lifting the suitcase into his car's trunk. Around 2, 44 a.m., Coleman allegedly exited the building several times between 4 and 4, 2 a.m., carrying cardboard boxes, trash bags, a bottle of bleach, a computer tower, a black laptop case, and a small duffel bag. Jassy Correa has not left Coleman's apartment since the morning of February 24. The U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, Andrew Lelling, told reporters later that day, on February 28, 2019, the police obtained a search warrant for Coleman's apartment and they discovered two packages of hooded coveralls and two respirator masks. They also examined a sofa with four large cushions, one of which was missing a cover in a dumpster outside the apartment complex. They discovered white trash bags, a bag containing plastic sheets, men's bleach, stained jeans and a belt, a white nylon hooded cover, an unopened box of baking soda, clear safety goggles, duct tape packaging rubbing alcohol, Walmart bags with plastic gloves and an empty package from a car air. Freshener. I used three packs of purifying charcoal and a sponge. On the afternoon of February 28, 2019, police stopped Coleman's car near Wilmington, Delaware. Coleman was ordered out of the vehicle by the officers, who also inquired about the presence of any other passengers. According to some sources, Coleman responded, she is in the trunk. Officers discovered Jassy's body wrapped in a sofa cushion cover in the trunk of Coleman's vehicle, inside a black trash bag inside a large suitcase similar to the one Coleman brought into his apartment on February 27, 
2019, experts who examined the vehicle discovered two cracks in the windshield on the passenger side. It gave police reason to believe that the man assaulted Jassy in his car. They arrested Coleman and took him to a Delaware State Police barracks. Coleman had a large bandage covering the right side of his face. When asked about it, he allegedly said, it's from the girl. During the forensic examination, experts determined that Jassy died from strangulation and blunt force trauma. Furthermore, they discovered seminal fluid on her body, the DNA samples of which matched Coleman's. Prosecutors claim Coleman's DNA was also at Jassy's fingertips. At the same time, experts couldn't say where Jassy died. It could have occurred in either the car or Coleman's apartment. Jassy's death shocked her family. Her two-year-old daughter had also lost her mother, which was equally heartbreaking. Some Boston officials paid a visit to the Korea family and promised to seek justice for Jassy. As is customary, some people accuse Korea on social media of being alone on the street at such a late hour. Rachel Rollins, Suffolk District Attorney, expressed her thoughts on this. She claimed that Jassy was not in the wrong place at the right time. She was right. Every woman has the right to celebrate her birthday on a night out with friends. Let's not get into a debate over whether we should walk home alone or how many people we should call when we leave the club. If anything, we should remind the men in our lives that violence against women is not a woman's issue. It is a problem that men accept responsibility for in their own lives. The lives of their sons and their social lives with friends and colleagues, with friends and colleagues. On Saturday morning, March 9, 2019, morning family and community members gathered at St. Peter's Parish in Dorchester to say goodbye to Jassy Korea. Some loved ones dressed in all white, while others pinned buttons, shirts, and sweatshirts featuring Jassy's face and the phrase justice for Jassy as a family man. We express our sadness as friends and community, but we must also accept Jassy's death. We don't know, but God does and I have complete faith and trust in God that her death was not in vain," stated Michaela DeAndrade, Jassy's cousin and best friend. While delivering the first eulogy, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh promised to work to make the world a safer place for women. Young women deserve to go out at night to celebrate their birthdays with their friends and then return home to their children and families. Walsh stated that no family should ever go through what Jassy's family has. Korea's father, Joaquin Korea Jassy, thanked the congregation of more than 200 people inside the church. According to a cousin, Jassy's mother, who lived in Portugal and hadn't seen her daughter in 20 years, was also present. The parents appeared to be overcome with grief as they prepared to lay the 23-year-old to rest. There were no empty seats in the church, and many people lined the back wall. Joaquin Correa thanked the city for its support, as well as all of the various law enforcement agencies and departments that spared no effort or resources in carrying out their noble and risky mission in the three states involved. My dear Jassy, rest in paradise. He said, rest in peace, my beloved child. Lewis Coleman was charged with kidnapping, which led to his death. The charge of kidnapping resulting in death carries the death penalty or a life sentence. But in November 2019, Prosecutors announced that Coleman would not face capital punishment. During the trial, prosecutors presented a variety of evidence, including a video of Coleman dragging J.C. Correa's body into his Providence apartment and a history of his online searches in the days after her disappearance. FBI agents described Coleman's online searches in the days following the alleged kidnapping, which included how a person can fit in a suitcase and how to extract a tooth that is not loose. However, Coleman's legal team has argued that the evidence presented by the prosecution had little to no relevance to the charge against him. It is not a question of whether he handled himself appropriately following her death or whether he did anything illegal or inappropriate after that. And, frankly, that is where the majority of the government's evidence has been gathered. I would argue that none of these factors are determinative of the elements of the kidnapping allegation, according to attorney David whose several motions filed by the prosecution and defense detail what happened the night of Jassy. Korea's disappearance and the days before police discovered her lifeless body, both sides had different stories about what happened. However, the documents revealed disturbing details about the events leading up to Jassy's death. Prosecutors proved Coleman was at the same nightclub as Jassy and her friends, where he was chatting with a woman he had recently met. It was not Jassy. They talked, danced, and exchanged phone numbers. They texted each other while at the club, 
and when it closed, the defense and prosecution expressed opposing viewpoints. Prosecutors claimed Jassy was not the aggressor, and that Coleman killed her after duping her into believing he would drive her to a friend's apartment. Coleman's defense team argued that Jassy was aggressive after the Uber driver pushed her out of the car. At trial, defense lawyers attempted to argue that Jassy started the fight with Coleman on her own initiative, and that the crime was a spontaneous altercation, rather than a planned and executed stalking, kidnapping, and deprivation of life. Prosecutors said the defendant's argument appears to be that the victim, who weighed 119 pounds at the time of the autopsy, assaulted the defendant, who weighed 200 pounds when he was arrested. Coleman's lawyers attempted to downplay their client's involvement in the crime. After all, in addition to alcohol, the toxic illogical examination found traces of a variety of prohibited substances in Jassy's body. Coleman was convicted of one count of kidnapping with a fatal outcome in June 2022. The defense team filed a new motion, arguing that there is insufficient evidence to support a conviction. However, they were unable to influence the trial's outcome. In October 2022, the court sentenced Lewis Coleman, 36, to life in prison without parole for kidnapping and murdering Jassy Correa. The court also ordered him to pay her family approximately $60,000 in compensation. Jassy Correa, 22, was a vibrant and beautiful woman with a toddler daughter, Lewis Coleman, a complete stranger to her, abducted, raped, and strangled her to death. This sentence will never alleviate the pain and suffering that Lewis Coleman caused Jassy and Correa that night, as well as her loving family, her mother, father, brother, and so many others, every day since February 24, 2019, by his depravity and callous disregard for Ms. Correa's life, Lewis Coleman gave up his right to live freely, and society still believes that Lewis Coleman has shown no remorse. According to First Assistant US Attorney Joshua Levy, after luring 22-year-old Miss Correa into his car, we assaulted and killed her. Lewis Coleman did not even consider turning himself in. Rather, he devised a gruesome plan to conceal the assault, or he simply committed it. Today's sentence of life in prison is just, Levy said this in a statement, it is unclear where Lewis Coleman was taking Jassy's body and what he planned to do with it. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the quiet town of Aspen, Colorado, a chilling mystery unfolded on a cold winter's day in 2014. A heinous crime committed in secret shocked and stunned the community. An individual known and loved by many died tragically and unexpectedly, forever altering the tranquility of this picturesque mountain town. Nancy Fister's life story begins in Orofino, Idaho, in July 1956, with her birth. She grew up in the picturesque suburb of Basalt, Colorado, and attended Bayside High School. Nancy's family had a unique connection to the development of the Buttermilk Ski Resort. Her father, Art Fister, transformed the family cattle ranch into this well-known ski resort in 1958, making a large fortune in the process. Nancy's mother, Betty, has a remarkable background as well. She was a member of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots during World War IE. She began her college career at Brooklyn's Pratt Institute before dropping out and returning to her roots in Colorado at the age of 20. Back home, she continued to play an important role in managing her family's business, which was well known in the local tourism industry at the age of 29. Despite never being married, Nancy welcomed her daughter Julia into the world. At the age of 39, she gave birth to a son. Nancy Feister's life was defined by her dedication as a single mother, raising her two children in the log home her father lovingly built for her in 1991. On the fateful day of February 26, a visit to Nancy and her friend Kathy Carpenter's home took an unexpected and terrifying turn. It had been three days since they had last seen or spoken, and Kathy's concern had grown too strong to ignore. Kathy walked into Nancy's house and called out for her friend, desperate for a response. However, the eerie silence that greeted her sent chills down her spine. Her heart sank as she noticed a chilling detail. A small smear of blood on Nancy's headboard. The room itself was disorganized, with the covers thrown aside as if there had been a fight, but the most disturbing discovery was yet to come. Nancy's bedroom featured a large walk, in closet, 
and Kathy's concern grew when she discovered the door was locked. Desperate to learn the truth, she retrieved a spare key from the closet and cautiously opened the door. What she sensed was beyond her worst nightmares, a nauseating, unbearable stench. Inside the closet was a lifeless body. Kathy called 911 at 6.15 p.m., her voice trembling as she described the grisly discovery. She believed that the lifeless figure in the closet was Nancy herself. The arrival of the cops only confirmed Kathy's suspicions. Nancy's lifeless body was indeed hidden in the closet, shrouded in a heavy-duty trash bag from the neck down, with additional kitchen trash bags covering her head. The scene was a horrific display of violence. Nancy had been brutally beaten to death, her head showing signs of multiple blunt force traumas. An electrical extension cord had been cruelly wrapped around her neck, adding a chilling element to the crime. Despite the brutality of Nancy's attack, there was very little blood at the scene, with the exception of a small smear on the headboard. But when the investigators turned the mattress over, they discovered a large pool of blood soaked into the fabric. It soon became clear that whoever had attacked Nancy had taken the chilling step of flipping the mattress to conceal the gruesome aftermath before fleeing. The question that haunted both Kathy and the police was who could commit such a heinous and brutal act against Nancy. It was a question that sent shockwaves through their peaceful community, leaving them to deal with the unsettling realization that a heartless killer lived among them. Kathy Carpenter's revelation added another layer of complexity to an already perplexity to an already perplexing case. She informed the police about recent tensions between Nancy and her tenants, William Trey Styler and his wife, Nancy Styler. This information immediately cast doubt on the Stylers and sparked speculation about their possible involvement in Nancy's brutal murder. The day after Nancy's lifeless body was found, an autopsy was performed by Dr. Steve Ayers, the Pitkin County coroner. His findings shed light on the severity of the crime. Dr. Ayers determined that Nancy died from three or four vicious blows to the head delivered with a hard object with a slightly curved edge. Although he couldn't identify the exact weapon used, he could tell that the business end of the instrument was small, about an inch or two. The exact timeline of Nancy's death remained unclear. Dr. Ayers estimated that the fatal assault occurred between the evening of February 24th and the morning of February 25th. Nancy's injuries were concentrated between her right forehead and right temporal bone, indicating three or four severe blows. In addition, several bruises covered her left upper arm, right neck, and right jaw, painting a bleak picture of the brutal violence she endured. Dr. Ayers concluded that Nancy Foster's death was the result of a homicide. The investigation took a significant step forward, escalating the search for truth and justice. The focus was now squarely on uncovering the truth about the Stylers' involvement, as well as any other potential suspects who could hold the key to solving this chilling and deeply unsettling murder mystery. The police investigation took a critical turn when they looked into the complex relationships between Nancy Foster, the victim, and the Stylers. Her tenants made it clear that there was more to the story than what first appeared. Nancy Foster's decision to rent out her luxurious mountain home during her annual warm weather vacations became an important piece of the puzzle. Her ad, on in the Aspen Times, was straightforward, offering a three-bedroom home with three and a half bathrooms, strategically located on the mountainside. The only rule was no cats. This advertisement piqued the interest of Trey and Nancy Styler, who were considering a fresh start in Aspen, away from their troubles in Denver. At first glance, the Stylists seemed to be ideal tenants. Nancy Styler, a world-renowned expert, and Lily Paget, a retired anesthesiologist who was forced to leave his position due to a debilitating neurological disease, appeared to be responsible people who would take good care of the property. However, their seemingly peaceful lives had been upended by a series of setbacks. Lawsuits had depleted their savings, leaving them in financial distress. Trey's illness forced him to resign from his position as chief of staff at a Denver hospital, causing additional hardship. In a desperate attempt to reinvent themselves, they decided to relocate to Aspen, a wealthy and promising destination. Nancy Styler's medical background had led her to consider new possibilities she had taken Botox and laser treatment courses in the hopes of opening her own spa in Aspen. The presence of wealthy residents, celebrities, and tourists in the area made it an appealing prospect. When they came across Nancy Feister's advertisement, it appeared to be the ideal opportunity for them to establish themselves and make connections in their new community. So the stylists became Nancy Fister's tenants, 
The once promising landlord-tenant relationship had mysteriously deteriorated to the point where Nancy Foster died brutally in her own home. The police were now faced with the daunting task of unraveling the events that had led to this tragic outcome, attempting to determine the motives and circumstances surrounding Nancy Foster's disturbing murder. The police's conversation with Trey and Nancy Styler provided a vivid picture of their deteriorating relationship with Nancy Foster. It was clear that their initial enthusiasm for the tendency had faded, resulting in a deep animosity. Nancy Styler described their initial interactions with Nancy Feister as positive. They had quickly responded to her ad in October and were warmly welcomed into her home. Nancy Foster even expressed an interest in investing in their new business venture. However, the situation worsened after they moved in. The stylists claimed that Nancy Foster's behavior changed dramatically, becoming demanding, and, in their words, akin to being treated like a slave. As a result, when Nancy Feister left for Australia in November 2013, the stylists were relieved of her absence. During Nancy Foster's absence, during Nancy Foster's absence, she had asked her friend Kathy to collect rent and care for her labradoodle. However, by January 2014, tensions had risen. Nancy Feister began posting complaints on Facebook, alleging that the stylists had stopped paying their rent and owed her money for utilities. Nancy Styler acknowledged receiving several messages and emails from Nancy Fister during this time. In an unexpected turn of events, Nancy Foster informed the Stylers in February 2014 that she was returning three months earlier than planned and demanded that they vacate her home before she arrived. When Nancy Feister returned home, she discovered that some of the stylists' belongings, including spa equipment for their business, were still stored in her garage. When Nancy Foster returned, she wasted no time in addressing the situation. She entrusted Kathy with delivering a note to Trey outlining her claims that they owed her $14,000 for utilities and property damage and demanding payment. Nancy Foster allegedly threatened to seek a restraining order to keep the stylers off her property. Although the stylers questioned the legality of such an action, Nancy Styler's version of events indicates that they went to the house to retrieve their belongings after receiving Nancy Foster's note. Nancy Foster was not present at the time, so they entered the house to collect their belongings, staying until 4 p.m. The next morning, they returned to complete the task, but they still did not encounter Nancy Fister. However, during their visit, they noticed Nancy's dog was left alone in the house. Nancy Styler claimed to be unaware of what had happened to Nancy Feister, as they had not seen her during their visits to the property. The Nancy Foster case, which involved her complicated relationship with the Stylers and her disappearance, added intrigue to an already enigmatic story. Investigators were intent on determining what happened when Nancy confronted the Stylers about the alleged deaths. The police's initial release of Trey and Nancy Styler following a 12-hour interview raised concerns about their involvement in Nancy Foster's murder. Aside from Kathy's report of a dispute, there was no concrete evidence linking them to the crime. However, the discovery of crucial evidence soon after their release would cast new light on the case. The breakthrough came when a man collecting trash just 100 yards from the motel where the stylists were staying stumbled upon Nancy Foster's belongings. I learned about her murder from the news. He recognized the significance of the discovery and immediately notified the police. After investigating, law enforcement discovered the bag mentioned by the informant which contained some of Nancy Foster's personal belongings. Intriguingly, the Stylers Jaguar vehicle registration was found in the same bag, raising questions about why it was in Nancy's possession, but the discoveries did not end there. The police on Earth have an old hammer that they believe is the murder weapon. Testing revealed that the hammer contained traces of Nancy Fister's blood. Even more damning, Trey Styler DNA was discovered on the plastic bag containing the hammer. Furthermore, a key to Nancy's closet was discovered just a few yards from the Styler's motel room. With this new evidence, the police rearrested Trey and Nancy Styler, charging them with first-degree murder. It appeared that the pieces of the puzzle were finally coming together, pointing to their role in Nancy Fister's brutal death. However, a cloud of uncertainty hung over the case, and the police were open to the possibility of other people being involved or the Stylers being framed. Some of the evidence appeared to be strategically placed, raising suspicions of a hidden hand manipulating the situation. Furthermore, Trey's fragile physical condition as a result of his neurological ailment raised concerns about his ability to commit such heinous crimes alone. As the investigation progressed, 
The search for the full truth expanded to include the possibility that other players were involved in this chilling murder mystery. The arrest of Kathy Carpenter, a friend of Nancy Foster, and a local bank teller shocked the Aspen community. The investigation took an unexpected turn. As the police investigation progressed, they discovered a number of facts that raised questions about Kathy's involvement in the case, despite her friendship with Nancy Feister. There were underlying tensions because Kathy felt Nancy treated her more like a personal assistant, even though she had never been compensated for that role. The police suspected Kathy had made a connection with Nancy Styler, sharing stories about their common grievances against Nancy Foster. One particularly disturbing discovery was that Kathy went to Nancy's Alpine Bank safety deposit box and removed $6,000 of Nancy's money, as well as two family rings, just one day after discovering her lifeless body. When questioned about this, Kathy stated that Nancy had granted her legal access to the safe deposit box and that she had taken these items with the intent of delivering them to Nancy's daughter, Juliana. Despite the complexities of their relationship, Kathy remained devoted to Nancy and considered her a close friend. She admitted that Nancy could be demanding and frequently gave orders, but she also emphasized the enjoyable times they had together, which fueled the police's suspicions. According to records, Nancy Styler called Kathy three or four times on February 26, shortly before Nancy Foster's lifeless body was discovered. This communication pattern fueled the investigators' belief that the three individuals were somehow connected to Nancy Foster's murder. The twists and turns of Nancy Feister's tragic death continued with a shocking revelation. Just weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, Trey, a key figure in the investigation, made an unexpected decision. He approached the judge and expressed his willingness to confess to the crime. Trey's confession resulted in a shocking plea deal in which he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and accepted a 20-year prison sentence. Trey offered to reveal the horrific details of what had happened to Nancy Pfister. However, a critical and fateful aspect of this plea agreement was that Nancy Styler, Trey's wife, would be granted unconditional freedom from all charges relating to Nancy Foster's death. Before the judge, Trey said the words that sealed his fate. Your Honor, I am guilty. He went on to give a chilling account of what happened that fateful night. Trey confessed that he initially went to Nancy Fister's house to reason with her. When he left his motel room, his wife was sleeping, unaware of the approaching tragedy. As he entered Nancy Feister's unlocked home, he discovered her sleeping peacefully in her bedroom. The sight of Nancy sleeping peacefully became unbearable to Trey's already troubled mind. His life was unraveling, plagued by financial ruin, and Nancy Fister's relentless demands for money, combined with her retention of his spa equipment, left Nancy seemingly unaffected by the chaos, sleeping soundly in her bed. It was a tipping point for Trey, causing him to lose his grip on reality. In a shocking turn of events, Trey described going to the garage and retrieving a trash bag and a hammer. He returned to Nancy's bedroom and brutally bludgeoned her with the hammer, striking her repeatedly until she died, to reduce the evidence of the heinous crime. After Nancy died, he placed the bag over her head and carefully moved her body to a sheet on the floor. She dragged Nancy Feister's lifeless body into the closet, concealing it from the outside world, tying it with an extension cord tray. Trey's 20-year sentence, as stipulated in his plea agreement, marked the start of a dark chapter for him inside the prison walls. Simultaneously, Nancy Styler, now known as Nancy Styler, now known as Nancy Massey, made a dramatic escape from the shadows of her past. She changed her identity, moved to a different state, and filed for divorce from Trey. However, the narrative took another tragic turn. On August 6, 2015, Trey was discovered dead inside his prison cell, and the cause of death was determined to be suicide. Following her death, Nancy Styler Nancy Masson was able to collect a significant sum of $1 million from a life insurance policy. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Friday, June 9, 2017, Ying Jing Zhang, a 26-year-old from Nanping, China, was on his way to meet with the manager of an apartment complex to inspect a prospective residence. Having recently relocated to the United States in April 2017 to pursue further education, 
This marked a significant transition for Ying Ying Zhang. She had never been to the United States or traveled outside of China before. In her home country, she lived with her parents and younger brother, and she meticulously planned her life, including an engagement and plans for an October 2017 wedding when she returned to China. Yang Ying Jing's trip to the United States was inspired by an invitation from the University of Illinois, where she had previously earned a degree in China. The university invited her to visit as a scholar to continue her crop science research with a focus on photosynthesis in soybeans and corn. Her long-term goals included earning a doctorate and returning to China to teach. Yang Ying moved into an on-campus apartment at the University of Illinois and lived independently at first. However, she planned to move to a different apartment on the opposite side of campus in order to get a lower rent and possibly find a roommate. The timing for apartment hunting was ideal, as many students were in the process of relocating, with some having finished their classes and others returning home for the summer vacation. As a result, by June 9, only a few students remained on campus. Yin Jing Zhang spent the morning working before returning to her apartment for lunch. She had planned to meet with Ron Treadstone, the marketing manager for the One North apartment block, around 1.30 p.m. to secure a new residence. Ying Jing Zhang texted Ron Treadstone about a delay and said she'd meet him at 2, 10 p.m. Five minutes later, she left her apartment and boarded the Tuline Mati bus. Because she did not drive, she chose to take the bus from the south to the north side of campus. The bus route took her from the orchard to her on-campus residence at Springfield and Matthew Streets. Yin Jing Zhang disembarked there with the intention of connecting to the 22 Limited, which would take her to the north. However, when she got off the bus, she found herself on the north side of Springfield rather than the south side, where the connecting bus was located. Consequently, she missed the connection. Even though I waved and ran after the bus, it did not stop. She chased it to the next block, but her efforts were futile. Yin Jing Zhang then proceeded to the next bus stop, Clark and Goodwin Avenue, to wait for the next bus. At 2, 10 p.m., Ron Treadstone waited for Ying Jing Zhang, but she did not arrive. Concerned, he tried to contact her but got no response. Later that day, her professors attempted to locate her without success. Eventually, Professor Guan reported Ying Ying Zhang as missing to the police. Following the last sighting of hangings on campus, police collected CTV footage from the surrounding area. The video shows Yang Yang running after the bus and later waiting at the bus stop. However, before she could board the bus, she got into a black Saturn Astra that had pulled up alongside her. The driver's identity remained unknown as the license plate number was not visible in the footage. However, investigators discovered that only 26 cars of that specific model were registered in Champaign County and only 18 of those were hatchbacks, which matched the car scene captured on Cux TV. This reduced the number of people the police could track down the following Monday. Three days after Yang Ying's last known appearance, police began contacting the owners of the identified vehicles. One of the people they interviewed was Brent Allen Christensen, a 29-year-old who lived with his wife, Michelle Zickerman. Brent had previously attended the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point and the University of Wisconsin at Madison before being admitted to the University of Illinois' doctoral program in physics. During questioning, Brent informed the police that his wife was away on the weekend of June 9 when asked about his whereabouts between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. and 3 p.m. on that Friday. He claimed he could not remember. Brent willingly gave the police permission to search his car and apartment, which yielded nothing. The police ended their search and left. As the FBI and local police intensified their search for Ying Jing Zhang, a critical discovery was made while reviewing CTV footage from the incident. They discovered a flaw in the front hubcap of a black Saturn Astra that matched the description of Brent's car, which they also remembered having a sunroof, acting on this information. They obtained a warrant on Wednesday, June 14th, and seized Brent's vehicle and computer. Brent volunteered to accompany them to the police station as part of the investigation. During questioning at the station, Brent initially claimed to have spent the entire day playing video games on that particular Friday. However, the FBI confronted him with evidence indicating that he had picked up a girl. Brent's demeanor changed visibly, and he began shaking. He then admitted that he may have confused the days, but insisted that if he did pick up a girl, it wasn't Yang Zhang Zhang. According to Brent, the girl he gave a ride to appeared distressed, spoke in broken English, 
and asked for transportation to a location a few blocks north of where they were. Brent claimed that after making a wrong turn, the girl panicked and exited the car, and he had no idea where she was afterwards. A search of Brent's apartment uncovered three stains on his mattress, and further investigation with Luminol revealed an additional stain on a baseball bat. These items were sent for DNA testing, which revealed that, despite her marriage to Michelle Brent, she had a girlfriend named Tara Bullis. Law enforcement asked Tara to record Brent, and based on that recording and the evidence gathered during the apartment search, Brent was charged with kidnapping, which resulted in Yang Jiang's death, as well as making false statements to the FBI. Despite the FBI's belief that Yin Ying Zhang had to meet her fate, her remains remained undiscovered at the time, until December 2016. The prosecution portrayed Brent as a highly intelligent and accomplished individual. When they argued, he began living a double life. According to their argument, Brent developed an unsettling obsession with serial killers, particularly Ted Bundy, around that time. They specifically mentioned his interest in the novel American Psycho, which features a protagonist who lives a double life as a serial killer. The prosecution claimed that Brent's descent into criminal planning began in the spring of 2017. They presented evidence from his phone searches, which included queries about serial killers and downloads of images of women in bondage. Brent was discovered to have visited websites about kidnapping, abduction, and consensual abductions. The prosecution claims that by June 9, Brent's marriage had completely disintegrated. He had abandoned his doctoral studies and was struggling with heavy drinking and prescription drug use. The jury was informed about his troubled marriage, which led Brent and Michelle to opt for an open relationship, with each having their own romantic interests. In March 2017, Brent sought counseling for the dissolution of his marriage. During this session, he admitted to having dark and troubling thoughts, including plans to abduct and kill someone. While acknowledging that these thoughts were more like plans, he claimed to have moved on from them. The prosecution argued that Brad's story about overcoming his dark thoughts was fabricated. Instead, they claimed that on June 9, he actively pursued making his fantasies a reality. According to their case, Michael left her apartment early that morning to spend the weekend with her boyfriend, providing an opportunity for Brent to carry out his plans. Before 8 a.m., Brent stopped by the Schnucks grocery store near his apartment and bought a bottle of Admiral Nelson spiced rum. Around 9.30 a.m., Brent approaches Emily Hogan, a graduate student near a campus bus stop. He claimed to be an undercover cop, showed her his badge, and asked her to answer a few questions. When he asked her to get into his car, she declined because she felt suspicious. Emily reported the incident to the police and issued a warning on Facebook, warning other students to be wary of a man impersonating a police officer. Or later, at 1.30 p.m., Brendan drove around campus once more. I saw Yin Jing Zhang running after the bus while driving in the opposite direction. He turned around and pulled up alongside her at the bus stop, yanking Zhang into the car, and she was never seen again. Notably, Yang Ying Ying phone was disabled at 2.28 p.m., highlighting the gravity of the situation. The court heard chilling details as Brent recounted the horrifying events surrounding his disappearance while being recorded by his girlfriend Tara during a memorial walk for Yin Jing Zhang on June 29. Despite being questioned by authorities after Ying Jing Zhang was reported missing, Brent attended the memorial walk in terror and unintentionally shared the shocking account during their conversation. In the recorded conversation, Brent described Yang Ying Zhang's fierce struggle for her life, describing her refusal to surrender as valiant and almost supernatural. He went on to describe the horrific sequence of events, revealing that he kidnapped Ying Jing Zhang, bowed her hands, and led her to his apartment and bedroom, where he sexually assaulted her. Disturbingly, he described how he became bored with the initial actions and strangled her for an agonizing 10 minutes. Brent went on to explain that he used a baseball bat to deliver a devastating blow to Yang Ying head, striking her as hard as he could. He then carried her into the bathroom and placed her in the bathtub. In a grisly turn of events, Brent revealed that he stabbed Ying Jing Zhang, who attempted to defend herself by grasping the knife. He killed her with the same knife. The court proceedings revealed more disturbing details, including the fact that Brent meticulously cleaned the apartment after committing the heinous act against Ying Jing Zhang. On Sunday, June 11th, he purchased cleaning supplies such as Drano and Swiffer pads in an attempt to erase any traces of the crime. 
He disposed of her hanging belongings, including her clothes and backpack, and continued to tell Tara that she was missing and would never be found. In the recorded conversation, Brent shockingly claimed that Yin Jiang Zhang was not his first victim, claiming that he started killing women at the age of 19 and that she was his 13th victim. However, despite police and FBI investigations, no evidence supporting Brent's claim of previous killings was discovered. Despite Brent's efforts to thoroughly clean the apartment, a forensic examination revealed traces of Yang Yang blood on a variety of surfaces, including the mattress, baseball bat bed, baseboard drywall, and underneath the bedroom carpet. The prosecution urged the jury to convict Brent of seeking the death penalty. They claimed that his actions, combined with his revealed thoughts during counseling, the recorded conversation with Terror, and his activities on the website FetLife, where he detailed plans for abduction and assault, constituted a premeditated kidnapping. Notably, just three days before Ying Yang Zhang went missing, Brent ordered a large green duffel bag from Amazon, and it was delivered to his apartment. The defense's argument revolved around the admission that Brent was responsible for Yang Ying Zhang's death, which they stated clearly in their opening statement. However, they argued that the prosecution's case did not provide a complete picture of the events or Brent's mental state. Their goal was to present a more complete picture to the jury during the trial, emphasizing Brent's life was at stake and arguing against the death penalty. The defense focused on Brent's mental state, urging the jury to consider it during their deliberations. They informed the jury that Brent was heavily involved in alcohol and Vicatan use, and that he was dealing with dark thoughts. They emphasized his academic decline, which ranged from receiving top grades in the first three semesters of university to failing all subjects in the fourth. His personal life was in disarray, with his beloved wife Michelle filing for divorce after meeting someone else, Ryan Vela. During the trial, the defense revealed that Michelle was Brent's only confidant when they moved to Champagne. They revealed that Michelle had given Brent an ultimatum to stop drinking or face her departure. In response, Brent sought counseling right away, motivated by the prospect of losing his wife. During the counseling sessions, he admitted that alcohol and prohibited substances had a negative impact on his life, leading to negative thoughts about himself and others. The defense also mentioned Brent's participation in a counseling session on March 30, which resulted in a referral to a local addiction treatment center. During the trial, Brent's family and friends described him as a highly intelligent individual with a bright future. However, over the course of a few months, his life changed dramatically and he frequently expressed feelings of failure. The defense emphasized his mental health issues. Although the mental illness defense was eventually dropped before the trial began, the defense made a passionate appeal to the jury, imploring them to recognize that the Yang Ying murder, while unquestionably horrific, was only one tragic incident in Brent's otherwise bright and promising life. They asked the jury to spare his life. Although the jury convicted Brent of kidnapping and making false statements to the FBI, they were unable to reach a unanimous decision on the death penalty. As a result, he was sentenced to life in federal prison with no possibility of parole. The Yinjing family was deeply distressed by the circumstances surrounding the trial. Not only did they deal with the disappearance of their only daughter, who was brutally assaulted, raped, and murdered away from home, but the agony continued as her remains remained undiscovered. Her mother, Liang Yai, confronted Brent at a pre-trial hearing, demanding that he reveal what he had done to her daughter. However, Brent refused to share any information. Liang Yai found the emotional weight of the situation to be overwhelming, and she was unable to attend the trial on a regular basis. Following Brent's sentencing, as the family stood outside the court, Liang Yai struggled to stand unaided and needed assistance from a relative. The brutality inflicted on her daughter and their family had a huge toll and the grief was palpable. All the Ying Ying family wanted was to find her and bring her back to China. In November 2018, Brent admitted to putting hanging dismembered bodies in three garbage bags and dumping them in the dumpster outside his apartment. Unfortunately, the dumpster's contents were collected and transported to a landfill in Vermilion County. The sheer scale of the search makes it highly unlikely that her remains will ever be discovered. The area is approximately 50 yards wide and has at least 30 feet of garbage. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Gloomy love. Teenage years are the most difficult of all stages of development. You are no longer a child, but you are not yet an adult. This time, the body experiences a massive hormonal overhaul. This transitional period is further complicated by the fact that yesterday's obedient child has become unstable and rebellious. A teenager's worldview is a picture of contrasts in black and white shades. The dominant color in teenagers' judgments and actions is heavily influenced by their surroundings. The story we're about to tell took place in Medicine Hat, in the southeast of Alberta, Canada. The Richardson family suffered unspeakable cruelty and betrayal, and their tragedy captured national attention. Once again, the Gothic subculture came under fire. In town, the Richardson family was regarded as exemplary. Deborah and Mark, along with their two children, Tyler, eight, and Jasmine, 12, lived in a beautiful and cozy home. They were very hospitable and sociable, as are all Canadians, their home was frequently full of guests, and the atmosphere was based on love and respect. Everything was going well until the eldest daughter reached puberty. The calm girl transformed beyond recognition. First and foremost, Jasmine's personality shifted. She became bold and frivolous. Conflicts between her and her parents began to arise, and her academic performance declined. Second, her music and clothing preferences changed. She used to enjoy modern pop, but now prefers heavy rock bright colors and clothing were replaced by shades of gray and black and her dressing style became provocative. Jasmine wanted to appeal to boys, so she started emphasizing her rounded features. Her interactions with former friends declined noticeably. She began to spend more time alone in front of her computer screen and the door to her room was frequently closed. With the advent of the internet at home, she became interested in gothic themes, dark poetry, criminal psychology, and human anatomy. Miss Richardson even identified as a witch and preached the Wiccan religion. For this purpose, she visited various similar websites and discovered a circle of friends who shared her interests. The greeting on her social media page read, Welcome to my tragic world. It appeared to be a typical adolescence, complete with excessive dramaticism and mysticism. However, the girl's relationship with her family grew increasingly distant. In her profile, she used a fictitious name and stated her age as 15. She preferred older interlocutors and aspired to be like them. During this difficult time, her parents tried to support her by suggesting that they spend time together. They searched for common ground activities. However, she found this uninteresting. Jasmine thought her younger brother was an annoying nuisance. She spoke to him less and less, but she could spend hours on end on the computer talking to strangers. Deborah and Mark recognized that their current state was only temporary. She would grow up and gain wisdom. As a result, they were very accepting of her new hobbies. Jasmine one day expressed an interest in attending a punk rock concert. Her parents agreed. If only they knew what this excursion would lead to. Early 2006. Jasmine Richardson attended a local youth band concert, pursuing her own interests, knowing that he would be present. The boy who had been stirring her heart for months, Jeremy Allen Steinke, was also fascinated by gothic culture. They met on a vampire enthusiast website and occasionally communicated. Jeremy portrayed himself as a 300-year-old werewolf looking for blood, to prove it. He wore a vial of blood around his neck, but it was unclear whether the fluid was human or animal in origin. Nonetheless, the boy clearly considered himself unique, which Jasmine found appealing. The young people's feelings for each other grew stronger after meeting at the concert. Steinke eventually asked her out, and she happily agreed that everything would be fine, except that Jeremy was 23 years old. The couple knew her parents would not approve of their relationship, so they kept it a secret. Furthermore, his troubled past will not endear him to them. The young man was poor, living in a trailer with his mother and sister. His relationship with his mother was strained due to her heavy drinking. Jeremy had to deal with her constant stream of volatile partners, many of whom beat him in drunken rages. As a result, by the age of 13 he was struggling academically and had a fragile mental health. Steinke was tempted to commit suicide when he couldn't bear such a life, but he was saved just in time. Later, doctors diagnosed him with depression and hyperactivity. He dropped out of school after being bullied. Over time, Jeremy imagined himself immortal and began visiting websites with similar themes. His online profile included topics such as pain, self-harm, blood, and razor blades. Except for their friends, 
No one knew about the couple's forbidden relationship, which they found strange. Their communication would have remained private had the Richardsons not begun monitoring their daughter's excessive internet usage. Deborah and Mark discovered Jasmine was communicating with strangers, which alarmed them as any parent would. They therefore decided to remove the computer from the girl's reach. Furthermore, they were surprised to learn that she had fallen for an adult man with questionable interests. His nickname, Soul Eater, spoke volumes. As a result, Jasmine and Jeremy's relationship was forbidden in order to help their daughter break free from this toxic relationship. Deborah and Mark saw two psychologists and sincerely believed that counseling would improve their parent-child relationship. It worked out well for them. Jasmine demonstrated compliance and appeared to be returning to normal life, as if everything was behind her. She received her computer back. This became Richardson's final fateful decision, resulting in their demise. Saturday, April 22, 2006. Mrs. Richardson was getting ready for bed when she heard a noise in the basement. Rats again, she thought. As she descended, she turned on the light and noticed someone wearing a ski mask. He stood opposite her and looked at her. She screamed out, startled. The stranger rushed towards her, covering her mouth. His efforts were vain. Debra struggled and screamed louder. He stepped back, drew his knife and stabbed her in the chest, then again and again. When Mark heard his wife scream, he dashed down and grabbed the first thing he could find a screwdriver. He had been fixing an outlet that day and, by chance, had left the tool out. When he entered the basement, he was confronted with a horrifying scene, his wife lying in a pool of blood with someone standing beside her. Mark immediately attacked the intruder, but was stabbed in the stomach, followed by more stabs as the agonizing pain subsided and his eyes closed. Mr. Richardson asked quietly, why because your daughter wanted it? The attacker responded, upstairs. Tyler was the only one remaining. The boy sat on his bed wearing his pajamas, too afraid to move. The approaching footsteps became louder and the bedroom door opened several days before the murder. Jasmine was overjoyed. Her parents believed in her remorse, which allowed them to communicate again. Mobile phones were just becoming popular at the time, so the computer was the only way to communicate. When Miss Richardson regained internet access, she immediately wrote to Jeremy it all begins with them disappearing and ends with us remaining together, she told him. During her visits to the psychologist, the young lady devised a terrible plan. It solidified after several days of punishment. Surprisingly, Steinke Co. found it enticing, but emphasized the importance of being creative and paying attention to detail. The couple knew they couldn't be together as long as the Richardsons were alive. Later, Jasmine's friends recalled how frequently she mentioned her parents, particularly how much she disliked them. Therefore, she wanted to end their lives. However, nobody took Jasmine's words seriously. Saturday, April 22, 2006. Garrett walked across the street to his friend Tyler's house. The boy wanted to play. Despite the cold weather, it was pleasant outside. This was the spring of that year. Garrett approached the house and noticed that the blinds were still closed. Nobody answered his knock at the door. Strangely, he assumed the Richardsons would be home. Their car was parked in the driveway. The child looked into the living room window, hoping to see someone, but there was no one there. Garrett then decided to walk around to the back of the basement, where he frequently plays with Tyler while peeking through the window, and he noticed something strange on the floor. It appeared as two silhouettes in a pool of blood. The boy informed his mother, who was skeptical, so she decided to check on the family across the street. They approached the house together. Garrett pointed to the window he'd looked through earlier. The woman looked inside and recoiled in horror. She immediately contacted emergency services. Something happened at the Richardsons. They appeared to be lying on the basement floor, covered in blood. A neighbor reported. The police arrived promptly. They broke down the front door and descended to the location where Garrett and his mother had seen something. When the officers entered the dark basement, they had difficulty recognizing the people lying on the ground. Their bodies were mutilated and bleeding. However, there was no doubt. It was Mark and Deborah Richardson, and they had died. Blood was all over the floor, walls and ceiling, a bloody mess. There was no other way to describe what lay before them. Later, the police searched the house. In the upstairs children's room, they discovered a small child. The boy lay in bed among toys covered in blood and visible knife wounds. The child's throat was severely cut. Medicine had had never witnessed such horror. One officer said it would take me decades to forget what I witnessed today. After searching the house, 
police discovered that one family member was missing. Richardson's eldest daughter was gone. Officers are concerned she may be in danger. Everything indicated that the attack took place in the basement and child's room. The rest of the house was undisturbed. And at first glance, nothing was amiss. The state of the body suggested that the crime had occurred the night before. Apparently, the perpetrator broke into the house and assaulted the boy and his parents. So what happened to Jasmine? And where was she? The police began to develop theories about what had occurred. Perhaps by chance the girl was safe outside the house, where the perpetrator had abducted her and was now harming her, or a ransom demand from relatives would arrive in due course. However, as time passed, there were no obvious answers. Detectives quickly turned to the media, requesting assistance in the search for the missing girl. They hoped Jasmine would make contact or that someone would provide useful information. Meanwhile, the investigation into the crime continued. Investigators spoke with relatives, friends, and colleagues about every aspect of the slain family's life. Were there any adversaries or enemies capable of such heinous acts? However, as the investigation progressed, the situation became clearer. There was no reason to wish death upon anyone in the Richardson family. With the exception of the eldest daughter, they were truly wonderful people, faithful spouses and loving parents. The officers discovered that the girl had been causing a lot of trouble lately. This time, the investigation aimed to find a person of interest. It was entirely possible that the girl was aware of the crime or had been involved in it. Given the suspect's age, the media could no longer publish her real name under Canadian law. As a result, news outlets began to refer to Jasmine Richardson as Junior. When her relationship with Jeremy Steinke was revealed, the couple was declared wanted. Initially, the search for the young lovers began among their friends and acquaintances, believing they were hiding with them. However, while this lead proved to be a dead end for the police, they did discover something intriguing. Several hours after the crime, the young couple was seen at a restaurant and a party hosted by an acquaintance. Someone in their circle of friends mentioned that Jasmine appeared unchanged. There was no evidence she had been abducted or was in shock. She was drinking and having fun. When friends asked how they got away from her parents, Jasmine laughed and Jeremy and I just took care of them. Yes, the boy agreed. I cut them up like fish. The party guests laughed, believing it was a cruel joke, not realizing that the statement was true. A comic found in Jasmine's school locker confirmed her involvement in the crime, as it detailed how she would deal with each of her family members, with her boyfriend acting as her accomplice. Photographs of the suspects were widely distributed. It was only a matter of time before a citizen came forward with information on their whereabouts. Soon enough, information arrived. A couple was spotted in the community of Leader, Saskatchewan, about 130 kilometers from Medicine Hat. They got caught off guard. Jasmine Richardson and Jeremy Steinke were discovered sleeping peacefully inside a pickup truck. They were escorted to the police station without resistance. Naturally, the couple was interrogated separately, beginning with Jasmine. She revealed that she was deeply in love with Steinke, and he reciprocated her feelings. However, their age and social status differences served as a barrier. Jasmine believes the Richardsons would never have accepted their relationship. As a result, Jeremy committed the ultimate act of love. He ended her parents' lives, giving them the opportunity to be together. When detectives asked if Jasmine was involved in the crime, she replied, I wasn't home when it happened, I wasn't sure what had happened. When I found out, I accepted it. I loved Jeremy so much that I ran away with him. Detectives needed to figure out who was the main instigator because breaking the suspects proved difficult. The investigation employed a cunning strategy. They placed an informant in the cell with Jeremy and he skillfully extracted details that contradicted Jasmine's statements. Jeremy admitted to the informant that the plan to end her parents' lives was Jasmine's idea. He wasn't initially supportive, but he agreed after they discovered the forbidden love and took her computer. I cared for Deborah and Mark Richardson, while Jasmine looked after her younger brother on her own. She begged me to leave Tyler for her. I was pleased to settle scores with all of them. Jeremy made a cruel revelation. Following the confession, Investigators confronted Miss Richardson with the recording. She had no choice but to confess everything, admitting that she stabbed her younger brother out of mercy, not wanting to leave him as an orphan. Later, the couple shared their social media profiles and passwords with the investigators, who began looking into their correspondence. 
They exchanged thousands of messages confirming Jeremy's statements. Jasmine devised the plan on her own. Steinke claimed that Jasmine was the only person who understood and approved of his tastes. He feared losing her as he replaced the society from which he felt alienated. He contributed to the realization of the dreadful idea. I want to cut their throats. They will regret what they have done. Especially when I know they're gone. They will pay for the insults. Finally, there will be silence and their blood will be the payment. Jeremy supported his beloved. His friends also claimed that just a few hours before the attack, they watched the 1994 film Natural Born Killers, which depicts a couple committing nine heinous murders. This story inspired their friend, who said he wanted to carry out a similar plan with his girlfriend. I think it's the greatest love story of all time. Steinke made this claim based on sufficient evidence. The suspects have been charged with three counts of homicide. The detectives pieced together the accused's confessions, witness testimonies and other case evidence to form a more complete picture of the crime. Jeremy was intoxicated prior to the act. Jasmine led him inside the house and directed him to the basement, where he assaulted her mother. Deborah was the first to die with 12 stab wounds to her body. The deepest wound pierced her chest, measuring 12 centimeters and striking her heart with rage. Jeremy mercilessly continued his assault on Mark, who received 24 wounds, nine of which were in the back. The family patriarch, like his wife, bled out on the basement floor. Tyler Richardson was the last to die. While Steinke dealt with the parents downstairs, Jasmine stabbed her younger brother five times upstairs. After finishing, Jeremy went upstairs to assist his girlfriend with the child, coldly slicing the boy's throat as if carving a pumpkin. After that, Jeremy went home to wash off the blood, while Jasmine took a taxi to the restaurant where the couple had planned to meet. After discussing the night's events, they went to a party. Kate Lancaster, a friend of Jeremy's, assisted them in disposing of the evidence and traveling to Saskatchewan. Words are insufficient to describe the horror they created. The couple went on their murderous spree with such ease and nonchalance, as if possessed by an otherworldly force. It is shocking that no one expressed regret or remorse for their actions during interrogation or while in custody. While detained, they wrote letters to each other, referring to themselves as legends and immortals. Steinke was able to propose to Richardson in a single letter, which he gladly accepted. However, their mad love began to fade like last year's snow during the trial. They shifted the blame to each other. Jasmine Richardson was the first person to go on trial in June 2007. She pleaded not guilty, claiming to have been in a zombie-like state and unable to act while Jeremy murdered her family. She also claimed that she only injured her younger brother and that Steinke was responsible for his death. Jasmine insisted that their discussions about ending her parents' lives were only hypothetical, but they appealed to Jeremy so much that he forced her to make them a reality. Miss Richardson was sentenced to only 10 years in prison for three counts of homicide, thanks to the nuances of Canadian juvenile criminal justice law, which states that people under the age of 14 cannot be sentenced to more than 10 years. The sentence was intended more to rehabilitate and restore the girl's psyche than to punish her. When Jeremy Steinke's trial began in 2008, he insisted that he had no intention of killing his girlfriend's parents. However, when he was found in the basement, he felt compelled to attack. He claimed he did not hurt Tyler, implying Jasmine was to blame while he simply watched from the doorway. The defense claimed that Jasmine intentionally seduced him in order to free her from her parents' strict control. Some friends testified that Jeremy had asked for their help with the act because he was so afraid of losing Jasmine that he was willing to do anything. The lawyers also requested that the charges be reduced to manslaughter, claiming Steinke was under the influence of drugs at the time of the incident. Steinke's inconsistent inconsistencies were revealed. When asked by the prosecution why he committed the act, he stated, when you find your other half, you do whatever it takes for them. Throughout the trial, he remained unconcerned, but broke down when his mother, Jacqueline May, testified in his defense. She admitted to bearing significant guilt for his upbringing, as he was frequently attacked by her partners, beaten, and rejected. Steinke was found guilty on three counts of first-degree homicide and sentenced to three life sentences. He would be eligible for parole no sooner than 25 years later, in 2033. Casey Lancaster's charges of complicity in the act were dropped in Medicine Hat Court, however, she was found guilty of obstruction of justice, sentenced to a year of house arrest, and prohibited from consuming drugs or alcohol. While in custody, Jeremy Steinke changed his name to Jackson May. 
Jasmine Richardson's 10-year sentence included four years in a psychiatric facility where she was diagnosed with conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder, which indicate a refusal to follow rules and socially unacceptable behavior that is typically associated with children rather than adults. This highlighted her psychological immaturity and instability throughout her relationship with Steinke. Medical professionals reported genuine remorse in her final years of conditional community supervision and attendance at special programs. After serving her full sentence, she was released in 2016. Jasmine Richardson currently lives in Canada under an assumed name her true identity is still hidden from the media. Her return sparked heated public debate, with some claiming she deserved a second chance and others believing she deserved a harsher sentence. Nonetheless, Medicine Hat residents would prefer not to have Miss Richardson as a neighbor again, given the brutality of her crime. It's unclear whether Jasmine has truly changed after spending her formative years in detention. Time will tell. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. This story revolves around a monstrous tragedy that led to the death of an elderly couple right in the backyard of their own home, becoming one of the most sensational incidents ever to occur in Palm Beach County, Florida. The public and media were deeply stirred by what had happened when the police arrived at the crime scene. They were shocked by what they saw, and although the perpetrator was caught red-handed, they still haven't faced appropriate punishment. Austin Haroff was born on December 21, 1996, into a family of medical professionals. His father was a dentist, and his mother was a pharmacist. They lived in their own house in a prestigious area in Palm Beach County, Florida. In 2010, when Austin was 13 years old, his parents divorced, and soon after each of them found a new partner. Austin and his sister Haley, who was a year younger, stayed with their mother and her new husband while their father moved nearby with his new partner. Despite the divorce, the families maintained an amicable relationship and the children quickly adapted to the new. Circumstances at school Austin performed well academically, excelling in all subjects, and he was involved in wrestling given his robust build and tall stature. He also played American football for the school team, despite participating in such intense sports that required roughness and aggression. Austin was a very kind and empathetic guy earning him the nickname Happy Boy. His coaches even tried to rile him up a bit to channel his energy on the football field in his senior years. Austin received an invitation to a four-year preemed program at a university because he wanted to pursue a career in, in Medici following in in the footsteps his parents. Footsteps in his first year, everything seemed to be going more than well for Austin. He excelled in his studies, worked as a dental assistant, started bodybuilding, and began dating a girl. However, Despite his successes, he encountered serious psychological difficulties that became increasingly challenging for him to handle. Austin felt that due to his shyness and lack of self-assurance, his peers didn't take him seriously. He began experiencing more frequent bouts of depression, noticing confusion in his thoughts, and experiencing sleep disturbances. Sleeping only two hours a night and seeing images of monsters and demon-like figures upon waking up, he also developed a fear of darkness. Austin started believing that he was chosen by higher powers to fight evil. Superpowers at times, he even felt he was half human and half animal. Due to constant stress, Austin began abusing alcohol and illicit substances, becoming nervous, irritable, and plagued by intrusive thoughts. At this time, his internet searches included queries such as how to tell if you're going crazy and think you're going crazy. A beginner's guide to psychosis when Austin came home to Florida for vacation, his close relatives immediately noticed something was off with him. He moved from his room to the garage, explaining that he was scared to sleep in the house, claiming it was inhabited by evil forces and ghosts. Instead of sleeping, he patrolled the house at night, checking rooms, and every two hours he loudly knocked on family members' bedroom doors, proclaiming he was protecting them from demons in the house. His parents were genuinely concerned about his condition, but instead of seeking medical help, they simply locked themselves inside at night to prevent Austin from entering their rooms. His behavior became increasingly bizarre. His mood swung sharply sometimes he was kind and sweet, then suddenly turned angry and aggressive he would wear warm clothes in the heat, refusing to take them off all day engaged in strange conversations with friends about his immortality, 
and once to prove this he dashed onto a busy highway during a walk his sister miraculously pulled him back onto the sidewalk just in time his mother started suspecting him of taking illegal substances and when she directly confronted him about it he denied everything insisting he led a healthy lifestyle on the evening of august 15th 2016 austin his sister and her friend were having dinner at a restaurant with their father and his spouse around 7 45 pm austin began behaving very strangely he would abruptly get up from the table and walk outside only to return almost Immediately this happened several times until after some time he got up again and left without saying a word to anyone eventually Austin returned to the restaurant and sat back at the table with the same group at some point an argument broke out between the father and son and forcefully pushing. His father away Austin abruptly stood up and headed for the exit his sister and her friend tried to catch up with Austin but when they followed him outside they couldn't find him Austin's father called the police explained the situation and asked for their help in finding him that same evening a call for help was made to the 911 service by Jeff Pfizer reporting an attack by an unknown young man on him and his neighbors Michelle Mishkin and John. Stevens the police arrived at the scene within minutes, their sirens blaring as they pulled up close to the cars parked at the Stevens home. Officer Kristen was the first to step out of the car and circle around them, freezing in shock. Sheriff's deputy Dan attempted to approach the cars from another angle but found it impossible due to the ground being covered in blood. Following Kristen around the cars and coming up close to her, he saw a person lying on the ground with arms split out, eyes open and softly pleading for help. That person was John Stevens, and on top of him, gripping him in a deadly hold, lay the young man who was attempting to bite his victim's face. It was clear that the attacker's actions were threatening and immediate action was necessary to free the victim. However, Kristen couldn't use her weapon for fear of hitting John Stevens, who was beneath the as salient, therefore the officer used a stun gun on the young man, but it proved ineffective as the attacker seemed oblivious and continued tearing flesh from the victim's body police officers attempted to. Pry Austin off John striking him on the torso, yet he was unresponsive and continued to grip the victim's body tightly. Soon a group of officers with service dogs arrived. One of the dogs lunged at the attacker, seizing his right arm, but the young man seemingly impervious to pain. Wrenched it free, sustaining a deep laceration in the process, it was only on the third attempt that the dog managed to pull the s away from the victim, and the officer flipped him onto his back. Subsequently, it took the assistance of two more officers to handcuff him. After this, the police began examining the crime scene and discovered Michelle, who had already passed away apart from John Stevens, who was still alive at the time they found her deceased, having succumbed to injuries inflicted by a blunt object. Later, John was transported to the hospital where he passed away way he had numerous stab wounds but the primary cause of blood loss was from facial injuries. The police began investigating the circumstances leading to the tragedy they examined the crime scene and before taking the injured Jeff Fisher who had called the police and was also the victim of the attack to the hospital they interviewed him Jeff recounted that it was late in the evening and he was preparing to go to bed when he heard strange noises coming from the lawn of his neighbors across the street through an open window he heard a woman's heart-wrenching scream got dressed and rushed outside shortly before this 53-year-old Michelle Mishkin was sitting on her open terrace facing the street watching TV while her 59-year-old husband John Stevens was out walking the dog as Jeff dashed out of his house he headed straight for the neighbor's house approaching closer he saw a fairly large built young man banging on the door of a car parked on the driveway on the Open terrace, the neighbor witnessed Michelle standing opposite the assailant frozen in horror at that moment. The young man grabbed the woman, threw her to the ground, and began kicking her. Jeff ran up close to the attacker, attempting to push him away from the woman. But at the last moment, the assailant evaded the attempt and struck Jeff in the face. Despite this, Jeff managed to stay on his feet and struck the attacker, causing him to fall to the ground, injuring his face and drawing blood. As he got up enraged by the pain, the attacker pulled out a knife and stabbed Jeff altogether. The as salient stabbed Jeff all. Wounded Jeff decided to distract the attacker by running as fast as he could back to his own house, thinking the attacker would follow him once inside. Jeff locked all the doors and called the police, hoping he had momentarily verted the attacker's attention from Michelle. Jeff waited for the police to arrive. Listening to the sounds coming from the street, however, the only thing he could hear were sounds resembling growls and grunts of some animals. Soon, the police identified him as none other than 19-year-old Austin. Harov, after leaving the restaurant, he walked about four miles and attacked Michelle Mishin, who was at that moment on the open terrace of her house. Detectives speculated that at the moment when the neighbor ran to call the police, Michelle's husband, John Stevens, returned from walking the dog and upon. 
Seeing the attacker tried to save his wife but became a victim himself after the police subdued Austin, he suddenly lost consciousness and was rushed to the hospital where he slipped into a coma for 11 days. Doctors suspected he might have ingested certain chemicals affecting his body, but toxicology tests on his blood found nothing. Two months later, he was discharged from the hospital and placed in custody pending investigation. During questioning, Austin's statements were incoherent. He sometimes claimed he couldn't remember anything from that night. While at other times he rambled about seeing zombies on the road and using a knife in self-defense, he mentioned constant hallucinations of ghosts, demons, and voices in his head. A psychiatric evaluation determined that Austin was in a severe psychotic state during and after the attack. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Philip Resnick at the University Hospitals of Cleveland in Ohio confirmed that Austin Haru suffers from bipolar disorder, acute manic episodes with psychotic symptoms, and clinical manifestations of lycanthropy also known as werewolf syndrome, while in prison. Austin gave an interview to TV host Phil McGraw, better known as Dr. Phil, expressing deep remorse for the incident. He cried and expressed regret for taking the lives of two innocent people, hoping the victim's families could forgive him. Austin faced charges of first-degree murder in the deaths of Michelle Mishkin and John Stevens, as well as attempted first-degree murder for the attack on Jeff Fisher. A trial was anticipated, but a judge decided to place him in a psychiatric facility. Until medical professionals determined he was no longer a threat to society, the decision shocked the public and the victim's families, as they hoped Austin Hero would soon face legal accountability. Yet the judge's ruling delayed the judicial process until it was determined that Austin was not a danger to society only three years after the incident on November 6, 2019. A hearing in the case of the murders of Michelle Michin and John Stevens took place. Austin Harov, who had been under forced treatment for schizophrenia, appeared. Surprisingly, the court couldn't reach a final decision on his guilt, and he remains in prison awaiting the next hearing. Austin's father, Wade Haru, shared that a few days before the incident, his son had been behaving strangely and talking about being pursued by demons. Wade concluded that his son likely suffered from an inherited mental illness as they had relatives who struggled with schizophrenia perhaps if the family had sought qualified medical help in time. Such a heinous crime might not have occurred. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The events in this video occur in the year 2021. Bobby Ann McLeod. 18 of Great Britain, informed her parents that she was leaving home to meet her boyfriend. But hours later, it was clear she had vanished. Her family contacted the police, and the following day, a massive search began, culminating in the gruesome discovery. Bobby, Anne, her parents, Donna and Adrienne, and brother Lee lived in Plymouth. Plymouth is a lively coastal town in southwest England. It has a rich history and maritime heritage that dates back centuries. Plymouth, with its stunning waterfront and vibrant downtown, is a popular destination for both tourists and locals. On November 20, 2021, at around 5.45 p.m., Bobby, Anne walked out of her Plymouth home and went to the nearest bus stop on Sheepstore Road. As she left, she told her father how much she loved him and that she was going downtown to meet her boyfriend and mutual friends. Bobby, Anne only needed a few minutes to get to the bus stop. She was familiar with the route because she had traveled it numerous times. It had been an hour and a half since Bobby, and left the house. Her mother, Donna, texted her to see if she was okay. If she had arrived at her destination without receiving an answer, a concerned Donna attempted to contact her daughter, but Bobby, and was also not answering her phone, and that was completely useless. It took another hour or so before Bobby, Anne's boyfriend called her parents to see if their daughter was home. He was concerned because Bobby Ann had not shown up for her date and all of his phone calls had been unsuccessful. Bobby, Ann's parents became concerned when they called all of their daughter's known friends and discovered that no one knew where she was. They immediately contacted the police and reported her missing. It was already past 9 p.m. The next day is November 21. Police initiated a search of the area, which included McLeod's family and volunteers. Leaflets featuring Bobby Ann were distributed throughout the city. Her disappearance was covered on social media and in the mainstream media. Her brother, Lee McLeod, posted on his social media page, 
I'm begging every single person in Plymouth to help me search everywhere, searching for everything. Please, everyone. If you hear or see anything, please let me know. Police quickly discovered that Bobby, Anne had not boarded any of the buses scheduled for downtown. However, while interviewing people, the officers discovered that a local resident had driven by the bus stop the previous evening and seen Bobby Ann there. The implication was that she had definitely arrived at the bus stop, but had not boarded for some reason. The evidence that she was at the bus stop was quickly corroborated. The bus stop area was cordoned off after they discovered wireless headphones in the walkway behind it that were identified as Bobby's. Police officers were literally on their knees, searching the entire area for potential evidence. Evidence was also searched along the girls' route from home to the bus stop, as well as all nearby streets. Given that Bobby, Anne was at the bus stop but never boarded the bus, that her headphones were discovered near the bus stop, and a number of other details that police did not reveal, authorities began to suspect that the girl had been abducted. The police encouraged anyone with information relevant to the investigation to come forward. A large number of officers participated in the search, doing everything they could to locate Bobby Ann as soon as possible. Investigators attempted to track down the location of her cell phone, which revealed that it was within city limits, but they were unable to determine exactly where all calls to Bobby and Ann's number were routed to voicemail. The police confiscated the girl's phone that same day. It was given to the police by the bus driver who was on the route where Bobby Ann went missing. As it turned out, a local resident arrived at the same bus stop at 7, 15 p.m. the previous evening and discovered the phone and an AirPod case there. At 7.23, a bus arrived and the man handed the items he discovered to the driver, assuming the owner would look for them. The next day, the bus driver noticed Bobby and was missing and last seen standing at the bus stop. He contacted the police and handed over the phone and AirPods case. The next day is November 22. Police families and volunteers searched the woodlands and roads surrounding Bobby, Ann's home, but no clues were found. The following evening, November 23, police announced that a woman's body had been discovered at Bob's and Beach, approximately eight miles from the bus stop. It was discovered in a forested area, about a half mile from the beach. During the McLeod family's identification process, the worst was confirmed. Bobby, Ann's body was discovered and her death devastated family and friends. The family thanked everyone who attended Bobby Ann's memorial vigil, which was held near the bus stop where she was last seen. Donna McLeod, Barbie's mother, sobbed as she paid tribute to her daughter and thanked friends, family, and the community for their support. Surrounded by other family members, her voice trembled as she finished a prepared statement. She stated, I would like to thank everyone for coming on behalf of the family. It's nice that everyone is banding together in these circumstances. Unfortunately, our beloved Bobby, Anne, has been taken from us, but she will never be forgotten. I would like everyone to hold their candles up. This is for Bobby, Anne. This was followed by a moment of silence as the entire audience raised their candles in unison. Lee MacLeod, Bobby, Anne's brother, shared a heartbreaking childhood photo of the two of them to pay tribute to his beautiful and talented sister. The image depicted the two siblings smiling in their primary school uniforms. Mr. MacLeod wrote in a message alongside the picture, Until we meet again, sis, I love you. You did not deserve to be such a beautiful and talented girl, let alone to be my little sister. The adventures and journeys we took will always be remembered. Now you can rest easy. When the police discovered the body, it was naked. However, the medical examiner concluded that there was no evidence that Bobby Anne had been raped before her death. She suffered serious injuries to her head and face, including 14 lacerations. It is unclear how long the police would have searched for Bobby, Anne's body, if not for one event. On November 23, the exact day the body was discovered, a man entered the downtown police station. This occurred at 1.17 p.m. Upon entering, he asked to speak with someone and informed them that he had information about the missing girl and wanted to assist the police and her family. When a detective arrived, the man admitted to having done it. He confessed to kidnapping and killing Bobby, Ann and provided some details about the crime after indicating the location of the body on a map. Police officers who hoped Bobby on a map. Police officers who hoped Bobby immediately. Unfortunately, their hopes were not fulfilled. When the inspectors made their way through the dense undergrowth, they discovered the body, which was naked and face down. There was no doubt the girl had died. 
The man who confessed to the horrific crime was a 24-year-old Kodiak Island resident. He was the son of an ex-military man who remained with his mother following his parents' divorce. In fact, he lived just a few miles from the bus stop where Bobby Ann was last seen. Kodiak Island was detained as a suspect. A lawyer spoke on his behalf saying, I accept full responsibility for Bobby and his death. Ackland also stated in the statement that he had never met the victim before that fateful evening and confirmed that he was the one who kidnapped her from the bus stop. Police seized his car, phone, computer, and several other items from anyone familiar with Kodiak Island. He was a nice guy, guitarist and songwriter for the local NDA rock band recruiter. No one knew Ackland was interested in serial killers from all over the world, in addition to music. His personal idols included Joseph D'Angelo Jr., Andre Gicatillo, Ivan Milat, Fred West, and Tommy Sells. Ted Bundy, however, was number one in Ackland's personal ranking, with an unknown number of victims but at least 30. Ackland focused on Ted Bundy and his atrocities. Investigators discovered 3,216 images on Ackland's phone, many of which were disturbing, dark, and reminiscent of horror films. In the days and weeks prior to Bobby Ann's death, Ackland searched the internet for information on serial killer crimes. He also looked for remote areas on Dartmoor and potential weapons. On the day of Bobby, Ann's abduction, Ackland was browsing the website of an online sports store, looking at baseball bats, ski masks, and waterproof clothing. It is important to note that, despite his clandestine hobbies, Kodiak Island had never drawn the attention of the police, nor had he ever been in trouble with the law. Apparently, he became so obsessed with his secret hobby that he committed a serious crime. It has been discovered that Bobby Ann was an unintentional victim who, by a cruel coincidence, found herself in the path of Ackland, who, like a vicious beast, went hunting for prey that evening. The events of that evening went as follows. Bobby, Ann arrived at the bus stop around 6, 15 p.m. Ackland, who was driving his Ford Fiesta around the neighborhood, told detectives he saw her at the stop. Bobby, Ann resembled his ex-girlfriend in appearance, but Cody claims that was not the emotional trigger that drove him to attack. He was simply looking for a victim to carry out his long-term plans. The police concluded that even if Ackland had not met Bobby Ann, he would have carried out his plan. The victim could have been any gender. That is what the police believed. When Ackland saw Bobby Ann, he stopped his car on the road behind the bus stop. After watching her for a few minutes and ensuring that no one else was present, Ackland took his pre-purchased hammer, crept up to Bobby, Ann, and struck her twice in the head. Then I assumed she was dead. Ackland returned to his car and prepared to leave the scene. Unfortunately, as he drove away, he noticed Bobby. Anne was still alive and trying to get up, so he returned to the bus stop, moved her semi-conscious body into his car, and drove her 20 miles to the Belver Forest parking lot and Dartmoor at 7.45 p.m. He came to a halt in this parking lot, which is nestled in the heart of a forest. He intended to leave the body there but discovered Bobby there, but discovered Bobby Anne was still alive and conscious. Unfortunately, Ackland did not think twice. He did not seek help or transport Bobby Ann to the hospital. Instead, he helped her get out of the car. Miss McLeod told him I was scared and he responded, so am I. I've never done this before. Struck her 12 times on the head in an attempt to destroy evidence. Ackland burned Bobby's purse. After pounding Bobby, Anne MacLeod with a claw hammer a dozen times, Cody Ackland was amazed that the 18-year-old could still make noise. Later, when he told the police he thought, wow, hats off to you, he had one final chance to save Bobby Am's life. However, once again, Ackland declined. Instead, he claimed he had put an end to the girl's suffering. He then loaded the body into his car's trunk and drove almost 30 miles to Bovis. He hid his body after taking off his shoes, clothes, and jewelry. Around 10 p.m., Ackland arrived home and went to bed. The next day, he drove to Tamerton Foliot, north of Plymouth, and threw the hammer into the Tamar, as well as a carrier bag containing his and her blood-stained clothing, into nearby allotments on Coombe Lane. The hammer was never found, despite a thorough police search. On the same day, November 21, Ackland went to a pizza place with friends, attended his band's rehearsal, and spent the majority of the night at the pub, Everyone who saw Cody that day commented on his unusually upbeat mood. He was enjoying joking and hugging his friends, which was unusual for him. 
The next day, November 22, Ackland continued to have fun by buying popcorn and going to the movies. While he watched the movie, the police family and volunteers searched for Bobby Ann, and Ackland used his phone to keep up with the latest news. On November 23, Cody was at his non-music job. According to the English papers, he worked for a car service company. After leaving for lunch, Ackland sent a message to a chat room where members of the music group recruited a word he'd written, I love you both. At the same time, he texted his mother telling her how much he loved her and then went to the police station to confess to the crime. Ackland's bandmates issued a statement on Facebook stating that they would disband the group immediately as a show of respect to the late teenager. It also stated that the remaining members of recruiter Josh Ross, Josh and Mike are all shocked and in complete disbelief at the tragic events of the last few days. Our thoughts and prayers are with Bobby Ann McLeod's family and friends, who must be devastated by her passing. As a mark of respect, we have decided not to continue as a band and will disband with immediate effect. We will not make any additional comments at this time. In addition to Ackland's confession, the police had a plethora of physical evidence, including Bobby Ann's DNA discovered in his car and sneakers recovered from his home. As for motive, Detective Mike West, who led the investigation, stated that Acklin refused to elaborate on his motive and avoided answering the question of why he killed Bobby Ann. At the same time, the detective did not rule out the possibility that, after reflecting on his actions, Acklin might become more forthcoming and provide more information in the future. He would later tell a psychiatrist that the feelings of depression he had experienced prior to murdering Miss McLeod had vanished and he was no longer filled with resentment, as if this violent act was a manifestation of these feelings. The trial took place in May 2022. Ray Tolly Ackland's attorney stated that psychiatrists determined his client was not suffering from mental illness, but rather had struggled during childhood. Ackland was diagnosed with adhd dyslexia, depression, and anxiety. And by the age of 19, he had suffered from depression for seven years. Mr. Tolly stated that Ackland had received little comfort from his home or school life, and that his father and other male role models had not offered much succor or support. On sentencing, Judge Robert Linford informed Ackland that his act was determined savagery and that he was satisfied with the evidence that he intended to kill. This poor person endured a long and terrible ordeal. She had her entire life ahead of her, until you brutally and savagely ended it, he said. You were clearly planning murder and you committed murder. Cody Ackland, 24, has been sentenced to life in prison. He will serve 31 years in prison before becoming eligible for parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Tuesday, January 14, 2014, just before noon, law enforcement officers were dispatched to a residence in Frisco, Texas, USA, to conduct a welfare check on Anna Moses, a 43-year-old woman living independently. Her boyfriend, Michael Stodnick, expressed concern when he couldn't reach her. They were scheduled to meet for a date the night before, but when Michael arrived at Anna's house at 7.30 p.m., it was dark or the lights were turned off and her car was not in the driveway. This was unusual because Anna usually left her car in the driveway except for inclement weather when she parked it in the garage. Michael rang the doorbell, called, and texted, but received no response. Following his initial attempt to contact Anna, Michael drove to a nearby Starbucks and waited 15 minutes. He returned to Anna's house and found no apparent change, so he decided to go home. The next morning, Michael tried again to reach Anna via text messages and phone calls, but received no response. Concerned, he contacted some of her friends, who also reported not hearing from her at 9 a.m. On the morning of January 14, Michael returned to Anna's house and discovered that her trash bins were still at the front and packages remained unopened on her doorstep. Despite having a house key, Michael refrained from entering because he was unfamiliar with the alarm code. The situation indicated that Anna had not returned home from work on the 13th. Michael contacted the police and requested a welfare check after becoming concerned about Anna's well-being. The police advised him to contact the University of Texas at Dallas Police, which was Anna's last known location. Anna worked as a statistical analyst in the UDA strategy department and had worked all day on January 13th. Michael went to the campus and spoke with the police, but they did not appear concerned. 
They only took Anna's disappearance seriously after her boss reported her missing. His boss also informed them that she had not been at work on the morning of January 14. Following this report, a 911 call was placed, prompting the police to arrive, but as residents nothing seemed out of place. There was no evidence of forced entry. They contacted Anna's son, Igor, who had a key and met them at the house. The alarm was disarmed at 12 or 5 p.m., according to the alarm log for the first time since January 13 morning. The question remained where was Anna? The police searched several rooms and found Anna's lifeless body in the garage, where she had been fatally shot. Despite her death, she remained dressed in her coat and scarf. Surprisingly, nothing seemed to be missing other than her car. Her purse containing money was discovered next to her, and mail was scattered around her. Notably, an empty Taco Bell sack with a quesadilla wrapper was on the ground nearby. Anna had seven gunshot wounds distributed as follows. One in the neck, two in the chest, three in the back, and one that did not break the skin, with the bullet lodged in her clothing. She also had abrasions on her left hand and a minor abrasion on her right hand, which could be the result of a fall or defensive wounds. Surprisingly, the police discovered 11 cartridge cases in the garage, which contradicted the initial count of seven. Interestingly, there were no bullet holes in the garage. This led the police to suspect that the crime scene had been staged to give the appearance of a robbery. Notably, no fingerprints were found on the patio door or the interior garage door. The police believe Anna was murdered on the evening of January 13 as she returned home from her job at the University of Texas at Dallas. The crucial question remains, who is responsible for Anna's murder? The investigation into Anna's death generated more questions than answers. Originally from Russia, she moved to the United States after meeting Robert Moses. Their union led to marriage, and Robert was formally adopted by his son, Igor. Initially, the family appeared close-knit, with Robert and Igor having a strong bond. However, as the years passed and Anna gained confidence in her new American life, she began to engage in activities separate from Robert, causing strains in their relationship, and his interactions with other men contributed to the breakdown of her marriage. One of these connections was with Dr. John Wheeler Kowski, a colleague who would generously provide her with financial assistance when necessary. Anna also spent time with Jerry Casper, a man who shared her passion for opera and musicals. Jerry was so taken with Anna that he dedicated books of poetry to her. Despite this, he claimed there was nothing romantic between him and Anna because he was married. During their investigation, the police spoke with one of Anna's friends, Dr. Jacques, a Christian who worked at the University of Texas at Dallas. Dr. Christian described an incident that occurred on December 15, 2012, between Anna and her ex-husband Robert. According to Dr. Christian, Anna was in great distress and contacted her, claiming that she was trapped inside a closet with her two dogs. The police were called, but the incident was reported as an error. Dr. Christian stated that Anna appeared genuinely afraid of Robert, recalling an encounter in which Anna was visibly shaken and expressed concern that he would kill me tonight. Anna and Robert finalized their divorce in March 2013. Despite the separation, Robert remained in the house while Robert moved to a home shared with three other divorced men, most notably their son Igor, who maintained close ties with both parents and paid frequent visits to them. Despite their divorce, Robert continued to assist Anna with household repairs as needed. Surprisingly, Anna did not tell any friends or family about her lingering fears about Robert following the divorce. In fact, she appeared content and happy, having found companionship through online dating. Anna had been in a year-long relationship with Michael, whom she met through Match. Come. When questioned by the police, Robert gave his version of events on January 13. He claimed to have spent the day watching football at home before visiting Twin Peaks Bar. Surveillance footage confirmed his timeline with him entering the bar at 7.06 p.m. and leaving at 7.57 p.m. During the questioning, the police discovered a small cut on Robert's right hand, just above the knuckle of his ring finger, with blood seeping through the bandage. Despite this, Robert cooperated with the investigation, providing a DNA sample and allowing the police to search his room. During the search of Robert's belongings, several firearms were discovered, including a Ruger long rifle, a black pocket pistol, and a black Browning Buckmark target pistol. However, extensive testing eliminated these firearms as the murder weapon. The day after Anna's body was discovered, her car was found a few blocks away from her home, 
Upon inspection, the police discovered blood on the driver's seat, as well as muddy footprints on the car's hood and on top of the vehicle. Inside the car, a Red Bull can on the backseat passenger side and a cigarette butt on the floorboard raised suspicions because Anna was not known to smoke or drink energy drinks. The police believe that the blood found in the car was consistent with the type of injury on Robert's right hand. Subsequent DNA testing revealed that the blood in Anna's car matched Robert's DNA sample. When asked about the blood, Robert initially claimed ignorance, saying he couldn't think of a reason for its presence. He later admitted to being in Anna's car on January 28, 2015, explaining that he was fixing a broken water pipe in the garage at the time. Following these findings, Robert was charged with murder. The prosecution built its case on the assertion that Robert was the only person with the motive, means, and opportunity to commit Anna's murder, claiming that everything pointed to him. It points to nowhere else. Their disagreements revolved around the belief that Robert murdered Anna for personal financial gain. The court learned of this on January 13. Anna left for work at 8.23 a.m., as she usually does, and setting the house alarm before she leaves. She spent the day at work, with a tea break around 2 p.m. Alongside Dr. Wheeler Kowski, Anna finished her workday at 5 p.m., her usual departure time. At 5.2 p.m., video surveillance captured her walking into the parking garage at work. At 5.7 p.m., Anna drove away from the garage, stopping at a Taco Bell drive, through to buy a chicken course, Dilia. Crucially, surveillance near an elementary school near Anna's house captured a car resembling Anna's passing by at 5.44 p.m. This begs the question, if Anna drove home with someone waiting for her inside the garage, the prosecution's case was heavily based on establishing the timing of Anna's death, which the police claimed occurred between 5.50 p.m. and 5.50 p.m. and 5.55 p.m. testimonies in court included statements from people who live on the street where Anna's car was discovered. Stephen Brockway testified that on January 14, around 1 p.m., at 1.40 p.m., he and a friend were moving a trailer and there were no cars parked nearby. He returned around 3 p.m. and noticed an SUV parked there. Another neighbor reported seeing a blue Chevrolet truck on the street around 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Based on this information, the police concluded that Anna's car was most likely left there after 6 p.m. On January 14, it was revealed in court that the police had interviewed the other men in Anna's life, specifically Michael and Jerry. Both men willingly provided DNA samples for investigation but Michael denied possessing any firearms. Jerry, on the other hand, admitted to owning a 9mm Glock and a two-point target pistol. Although the police did not recover these weapons, the court learned from toll records that Jerry left his Arlington workplace around 5, 18 p.m. on January 13 and exited the Renner Road toll booth at 6 p.m. This information, when combined with the police's belief about Anna's death time, suggested that Jerry was not in a position to be responsible for the crime at the time it occurred. These details were presented to the court in order to rule out any other possible suspects. The court was informed that Dr. Wheelerkowski had been excluded as a suspect based on toll records confirming he was in Garland Robert on his way home at 5.47 p.m. Furthermore, the type of firearm he owned, a .40 caliber Glock, did not match the gun used to kill Anna. DNA testing of the Red Bull can and cigarette butt found in Anna's car revealed that the DNA belonged to an unknown male. Despite entering the profile into the combined DNA index system, there were no matches. The prosecution emphasized the financial motive, claiming that Robert stood to benefit financially from Anna's death. A review of his financial records revealed that several credit cards were nearly maxed out. During police interviews, Robert allegedly expressed a strong interest in Anna's finances. Michael informed the police that shortly after Anna's death, Robert inquired about her financial situation and approached Anna's mother to inquire about the location of Anna's jewelry. Dr. Christian testified that she overheard Robert saying that it would be beneficial if he lived in Anna's house to avoid the cost of maintaining two homes. Tatiana Heber, another Anna friend, described Robert as a businessman who was interested in Anna's bank accounts, passwords, and other documents. The court learned that Frank Shuvra, Anna's independent executor advised Igor to set up a trust, but Robert told him to deposit the money in a bank account. Instead, Igor was named the beneficiary of Anna's $750,000 life insurance policy. On February 4, 2015, 
Anna's estate deposited $25,000 into Robert and Igor's joint bank account. Igor claimed that the money was used to pay off the car he was driving, which Robert had previously owned and had since transferred to Igor. The proceeds were also used to pay off Anna's mortgage. The defense claimed that in their focus on Robert, the police failed to thoroughly investigate other men in Anna's life. They stated that the items discovered in Anna's car, as well as the footprints, did not match Robert's DNA, and that the weapon used to murder Anna had yet to be found. In Robert's defense, it was argued that he was not financially impacted by Anna's death. Robert claimed that his move into Anna's house was solely to assist Igor, who was the beneficiary of his life insurance. Igor supported this claim, testifying that Robert's decision to move in was his own, motivated by a desire for assistance in managing bills and household responsibilities. The trial revealed that Anna took excellent care of Igor, doing everything for him, so it was not uncommon for him to seek assistance with bill payment. Igor testified about the blood stain discovered in Anna's car, claiming that it had been there for years and was not a new or fresh stain. The defense also questioned the accuracy of the time of death. The medical examiner stated during the trial that Anna's stomach contents had been nearly completely digested. The defense argued that if she had eaten the quesadilla and died before 6 p.m., there would have been more identifiable food remnants in her stomach. This raises the possibility that she was murdered later, providing an alibi for Robert and some of Anna's other male acquaintances. Despite the defense's arguments, a Collin County jury found Robert Arthur Moses guilty of first-degree murder of his ex-wife Anna over finances and their relationship in late 2016, sentencing him to life in prison after more than eight hours of deliberation. In court, prosecutors referred to the then 64-year-old as a calculating killer, claiming that Anna 43 was targeted and ambushed at the time she died. She was shot in her prime and no one should ever fear him again. Following his conviction, he filed an appeal to challenge the court's decision. Robert's appeal focused on a lack of evidence, claiming that the conviction was based solely on conjecture and speculation. The appeal centered on specific pieces of evidence, including the chicken quesadilla from Taco Bell and the unexplained large sum of money in Anna's savings account at the time of her death. Concerning the Chicken Quest idea, the appeal focused on Dr. Williams' testimony, which challenged the established time of Anna's death. Dr. Rohor acknowledged that if Anna had eaten a chicken quesadilla on her way home at 5. 45 p.m. It is reasonable to expect the stomach contents to be partially digested after being shot 10 minutes later. However, he testified that he could not recognize any type of food in Anna's stomach contents, casting doubt on the timeline's accuracy. The appeal argued that the uncertainty about the digestion of the chicken quesadilla calls into question the accuracy of Anna's time of death, implying that she was killed after 7 p.m. Is true, this assertion would provide an alibi for Robert, who was reportedly at the Twin Peaks bar at the time. Furthermore, the appeal highlighted Anna's substantial savings account, emphasizing the significant increase in funds over a 23-month period despite the fact that her spending records showed she spent the majority of her income. The appeal faulted the police for failing to investigate the source of the funds. However, the state appeals court rejected Robert's arguments regarding the quesadilla. The court stated that no one knew what happened to it, or if Anna consumed it. Regarding Anna's savings, the court noted that prosecutors brought it up during the trial, claiming that some of the money came from a former romantic interest who wanted to help Anna. Despite the appeal, the court upheld Robert's conviction, and he is still incarcerated. The rejection of the appeal upholds the previous judgment and preserves the trial outcome. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Michelle Marie Summers was born in 1957 as the daughter of Milton and Helen Summers. Michelle grew up in Concord, California, where she played the violin, acted, cheered, and was the homecoming queen, excelling academically with straight as. Michelle was also a devoted follower of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Her diverse experiences included being an exchange student in Switzerland, pursuing a modeling career and winning the title of Miss Concord in 1976. On April 11, 2007, Michelle McNeil, 
a 50-year-old Pleasant Grove, Utah USA resident, was recovering at home from surgery. Michelle's daughter, Alexis Summers, initially cared for her after she was released from the hospital, but her husband, Dr. Martin McNeil, eventually took over her care. Michelle and Martin met at an event for young Mormon singles, and they married when Michelle was only 21 years old. They are still married nearly three decades later. Martin, a practicing psychiatrist, and Michelle, a former beauty queen turned model, shared a desire for children, eventually expanding their family to include four biological children within a short five-year period after marriage, as well as adopting four children, three of whom are from Ukraine. Martin escorted his young daughters to school on April 11th, leaving four adult children and four minor children at home the previous day. Alexis, who had left to resume medical school, called Michelle at 8.45 a.m. to check on her health. Michelle assured Alexis that she was doing fine. Michelle had a facelift just over a week earlier, on April 3, and was on prescription medication with instructions to rest. Alexis had cared for her for a few days before returning to school, and Michelle told her she felt fine and planned to pick up the girls later that day. After dropping the girls off at school, Martin went to work, where he received an award and asked a photographer to take a picture of him. After the award ceremony, he picked up his daughter at 11, 30 a.m. and drove them home. When they returned, calls to Michelle went unanswered, prompting Martin and his daughter to look for her throughout the house. They discovered Michelle submerged in the bathtub, fully clothed. Martin instructed his daughter to seek help, and she dashed to a neighbor's house. Martin dialed 911 and informed the dispatcher that he was performing CPR. He also informed a colleague that he was running a code on his wife. When Alexis called Martin, he delivered the distressing news. Your mother is in the bathtub and she is not breathing. Concerned neighbors rushed into the bathroom to help and noticed Martin bent over Michelle's face. Michelle lay face up, her head under the faucet and her legs and feet inside the bathtub. With the help of the neighbors, Michelle was lifted from the bathtub and Martin began keep here. Once paramedics arrived, they took over the resuscitation efforts. During this process, Michelle made a gurgling sound and expelled a large amount of fluid from her mouth several times. Martin told the paramedics that he hadn't been away from the house for long and that Michelle may have overdosed on pain medication and slipped in the tub, hitting her head. Martin discovered Michelle slumped over the bathtub with her lower body outside. Michelle was declared dead on arrival at the hospital. Dr. Maureen Fricker, the medical examiner, concluded that Michelle's death was natural and caused by cardiovascular disease, specifically hypertension and myocarditis. Within nine days of Michelle's funeral, Gypsy Gillian Willis moved into Martin's home. Martin initially told his children that he had hired her as a nanny to look after the remaining four young children at home. However, Martin's adult children were concerned about the situation when Alexis asked about his relationship with a gypsy, Martin told her to leave the house. It was later discovered that Gypsy was not working as a nanny. Instead, she remained reserved. Riding with Martin as his partner, they went to Wyoming together, where Gypsy introduced Martin to her family as her fiancé and even took the name Julian McNeil. Martin unexpectedly proposed to a gypsy just three months after his wife died. Alexis, her sister Rachel, and Michelle's sister, Linda Clothes, had suspicions about the purported natural cause of Michelle's death and convinced that Michelle's death and been murdered urged the police to reinvestigate the case. Reaching out to various Utah newspapers, the governor's office, and authorities requires persistent efforts, which eventually leads to Michelle's case being reopened. A toxicologist examined the autopsy toxicology report and discovered that Michael's blood contained concentrations of Valium per coquet for Narogen and Ambien that were sufficient to render her severely obtunded and difficult to arouse. The medical examiner, Dr. Todd Gray, reviewed the report and changed the cause of death from natural to undetermined. Michelle's cause of death was reclassified as a combination of heart disease and drug toxicity, which differed from the previously attributed heart disease. As the investigation into Martin's background progressed, it revealed a life founded on deception, Martin committed fraud in his 20s, writing forged checks to fund his lavish lifestyle. His criminal record included convictions for forgery and grand theft, which resulted in a 180-day prison sentence. Following his release, Martin enrolled in medical school using two falsified transcripts. He had submitted someone else's transcript during the application process. 
Furthermore, police discovered that Martin had falsely claimed to be schizophrenic in order to get a discharge from the military. Following his discharge, he received $3,000 per month from Veterans Affairs for more than three decades, and the police looked into the case further. Following Michelle's death, Martin attempted to arrange the adoption of the three children they had adopted from Ukraine. To facilitate this, he devised a deceptive plan involving one of his daughters, 16-year-old Giselle McNeil, disguised as a summer vacation. He sent Giselle back to you. During her absence, Martin and Gypsy assumed her identity. Gypsy obtained a fraudulent social security number, Idaho cards, and birth certificate, and the two went to court, successfully changing Giselle's birth date by 20 years. Martin and Gypsy were convicted of identity theft and other federal charges, and both pleaded guilty to state fraud charges after Martin served three years in prison. He was later charged with murder, first, degree felony, and obstruction of justice, tan degree felony, and obstruction of justice, scan degree felony. The prosecution claimed Martin committed premeditated murder against his wife. They claimed that he coerced Michelle into getting a facelift as part of a meticulously planned murder. According to the prosecution, Martin persuaded the surgeon who performed the facelift to prescribe specific medications required to carry out the crime. Martin allegedly drugged Michelle after her cosmetic surgery and then drowned her in their bathtub. The prosecution claimed Martin's motive was a desire to be with his mistress, a gypsy. The court learned that Martin actively encouraged Michelle to have a facelift despite her lack of prior interest in the procedure. Martin's behavior changed dramatically when he turned 50. According to testimony, including a renewed commitment to exercise, weight loss, and tanning salon visits, Michelle, concerned about a potential affair, questioned him about his sudden obsession with his appearance. Martin responded by suggesting that she focus on her appearance and consider a facelift. Michelle confided in her daughter Alexis in March 2007, fearing that Martin was having an affair. Michelle investigated Martin's phone records and discovered a frequently dialed number, raising suspicions of infidelity. When she confronted him, Martin dismissed her concerns as baseless. In an attempt to divert her attention, he offered to pay for Michelle's facelift and suggested they go on a two-week cruise afterwards. Contrary to Martin's claims, the prosecution claimed that he had been having an affair since November 2005. Gypsy Willis, the woman he later claimed to have met only after Michelle's funeral, where he purportedly hired her as the children's nanny. The two met online first, and Gypsy confirmed that she was aware of Martin's marital status. The prosecution claims that Martin began plotting Michelle's murder months before her death in order to facilitate his relationship with a Gypsy. They claimed he feigned illness to establish an alibi, making it appear unlikely that he would physically attack his wife. Martin discussed conflicting health concerns with various people who walked with a limp and used a cane. At church, he told the congregation that he had cancer and had less than a year to live. Meanwhile, he told colleagues a variety of stories about his health, ranging from peripheral neuropathy in his toe to cancer in his big toe and neurological problems similar to Mesu's. The prosecution then detailed Michelle's surgery and the events that followed, emphasizing that it was Martin's post-death actions that raised serious concerns in the case. In March 2007, Martin set up meetings with a plastic surgeon for Michelle, who actively participated in the consultations and appointments. Despite her nervousness, Michelle agreed to have the surgery. Martin accompanied Michelle to a visit with a primary care physician prior to the procedure to ensure her safety. During this visit, Michelle's primary care physician discussed her high blood pressure and suggested postponing the surgery. Despite this advice, Martin and Michelle went to see the surgeon for a preoperative evaluation, accompanied by Alexis. Before the appointment, Alexis noticed Martin jotting down medications he wished the doctor would prescribe. On her way to the appointment, Michelle expressed her desire to postpone the surgery in order to better manage her blood pressure. Martin, incensed by the suggestion, retorted if you don't have the surgery, you won't get it. Typically after a facelift, a pain reliever, antibiotic sleeping medication, anti-inflammatory, and eye ointment have all been prescribed. Martin, on the other hand, asked the surgeon for more and stronger medications, such as oxycodone, a stronger pain reliever, liquid Lortab, a larger dose of Finnegan and Valium, and an anti-anxiety medication. The surgeon agreed to Michelle's requests, but cautioned her to take each pill separately and not all at once. 
Michelle had the surgery two days later, despite the fact that it was supposed to take only one day. She expressed a desire to stay overnight at the hospital. Martin, however, expressed his displeasure and insisted that she return home. The surgeon intervened and insisted Michelle stay overnight. She was finally allowed to return home the next day. When Michelle returned home, Alexis noticed that she appeared overly sedated. When she inquired about it, Martin explained that he may have given too much medication. Alexis, concerned for her mother's well-being, offered to take charge of Michelle's medication. Michelle herself told Alexis that Martin had given her too much medication, causing her to vomit, to prevent potential medication overuse. Michelle asked Alexis to let her feel each pill so she could identify them, as she still had bandages on and couldn't see at that point in her recovery. Michelle's recovery improved over the next few days. After her bandages were removed, she regained independence and mobility. She even began reducing the prescribed dosages of her medications. Despite Michelle's improving condition, Martin requested that the surgeon refill her Percocet and Phenergen prescriptions. The surgeon complied with the request. Alexis returned to school, confident that Michelle was recovering well and capable of managing on her own. Unfortunately, Michelle was discovered dead the following day. The jury learned about the strange circumstances surrounding Michelle's discovery in the bathroom. Martin's youngest daughter reported that on the day Michelle died, Martin picked her up from school, and when they returned home, they discovered Michelle fully clothed in the bathtub. According to reports, Martin dialed 911. However, they provided a false address and abruptly hung up. During the second call, he stated, My wife has fallen in the bathtub. She is unconscious. She is underwater. Martin informed the dispatcher that he was unable to lift Michelle and was draining the bathtub before hanging up. The dispatcher called back, but Martin hung up on witnesses, including neighbors who had seen Michelle in the bathtub. One neighbor testified that they performed chest compressions while Martin leaned over Michelle's head to administer rescue breaths, but they did not see his mouth come into contact with Michelle's mouth. Only when the paramedics took over KP did Michelle's color change and a gurgling sound emerge. The jury was informed of discrepancies between Martin's account of how Michelle was discovered and others' recollections. Martin claimed she was hunched over the bathtub, with her lower half not submerged, which contradicted his daughter's and neighbor's descriptions. Furthermore, the emergency room doctor found no injuries on Michelle consistent with a fall into the bathtub. Alexis returns home after learning about Michelle's death. She discovered that Michelle's medication, as well as the hospital bed and blankets, had gone missing. In the garage, Alexis discovered a pile of wet towels, clothing, and the bathroom rug. Martin's son Damien and his girlfriend Eileen returned to the house following Michelle's death. Martin asked Eileen to flush Michelle's pills down the toilet. Eileen testified that she complied and observed that some of the pill bottles were nearly empty. Contrary to Martin's claim of blood everywhere, she found no blood in the bathroom. The court heard that on the day Michelle died, Martin communicated extensively with the gypsy speaking twice on the phone and exchanging 30 text messages. During the trial, the prosecution presented a cardiologist who testified that Michelle's heart inflammation was mild and did not pose a significant risk of cardiac death. In addition, a forensic pathology expert testified that there was no evidence of myocarditis, calling into question the initial cause of death determination. Instead, the experts hypothesized that drowning was the cause of death, citing five key points. First, during CPR, Michelle regurgitated large amounts of water, indicating that she had swallowed it. Second, water was found in Michelle's airway, indicating that she had inhaled a large amount of water. Third, Michelle's lungs weighed twice as much as typical lungs. The fourth fluid was discovered in Michelle's lung chambers. Fifth, Michelle's blood demonstrated a significant dilution of the phenomenon associated with inhaling water, which then enters blood vessels and circulates throughout the body. During the trial, the prosecution presented testimony from five jailhouse informants, one of whom claimed to have seen a television show about Martin while in prison and informed him about it, initially hesitant to go into detail. According to the inmate, Martin later admitted to giving Michelle sleeping pills and oxycodone, he then allegedly admitted to placing her in the bathtub and holding her head underwater for a short period of time. Another inmate inquired about Michelle's fate, to which Martin allegedly replied that the bitch drowned. The remaining inmates testified that Martin brags about his ability to avoid detection 
and expresses confidence that authorities will never be able to prove his crimes. The defense claimed that Michelle's death was due to natural causes, pointing out the various medical examiners involved in the case. None of them could definitively conclude that Michelle's death was the result of homicide. The defense claimed Michelle had a heart attack, causing her to fall headfirst into the bathtub. The autopsy revealed an enlarged heart, narrowing of the heart arteries and evidence of liver and kidney deterioration. Despite the defense's argument, more than six years after Michelle's death on September 19, 2014, McNeil was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years to life in prison for first-degree murder, plus an additional term of 1 to 15 years for obstruction of justice. In contrast, Gypsy was not charged with murder. While some members of Michelle's family suspected her involvement, the Gypsy insisted that she had no knowledge of any plans to harm Michelle. Martin appealed his conviction. And finally, McNeil, 61, committed suicide in prison on April 9, 2017. He is now two and a half years into his sentence. He was discovered dead in an outside yard near the prison's greenhouse. According to a report from the Unified Police Department, McNeil killed himself with a hose and a natural gas line that served as fuel for a greenhouse heater. Michelle's case could have been closed if her family had not been so persistent. Despite the challenges of reopening the case, they refused to give up until the truth was revealed. The family suspected foul play after Michelle's death, believing Martin had murdered her. Even Michelle had a sense that something was wrong during her lifetime. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The incident in late summer 2016 at Spring Creek Park sparked widespread public outrage. How many similar tragedies must occur before New York City officials listen to citizens, please? Locals had repeatedly alerted authorities to the presence of unsettling individuals in the park. Some of them would form groups, while others wandered alone. Regardless, their appearance conveyed a sense of danger. Unfortunately, it took a crime for the city administration to finally intervene and address this issue. Furthermore, the event sparked numerous discussions and topics about the safety of female runners, particularly those who run alone. According to a survey, 54% of women are anxious when they go out, fearing verbal harassment or physical attacks. The story of Karina Vitrano is both terrifying and perplexing. First and foremost, nothing appeared to be missing on the fateful day. The woman was attacked in broad daylight in a populated area. Second, her death has a mystical quality to it. Third, the investigation of the case and the sentencing of the perpetrator raised numerous questions. On Tuesday, August 2, 2016, Karina planned to meet her father after work because they wanted to spend time together. Since Ms. Vitrano had moved, family gatherings had become uncommon because everyone was preoccupied with their own affairs. In addition, the young woman was working two jobs. Philip picked up his daughter and took her home. When Karina was about to leave, the family gathered to share their thoughts on the previous week. She asked her father if he wanted to go jogging with her, something they did frequently, covering several miles together. Her father said he couldn't do it this time. You see, my back hurts so much that nothing helps. Perhaps a new prescription is needed. Maybe it's the change in weather, as Mr. Vetrano explained perhaps I should call you a cab. The weather was gorgeous, the heat had subsided, and there was a fresh scent in the air. Consequently, Karina declined the offer. Furthermore, she was preparing for the upcoming marathon. The young woman had just broken up with her boyfriend and wanted to distract herself. A jog would clearly benefit her. That evening marked the last time the parents saw their youngest daughter. At 5.45 p.m., she left the house for a jog. Her first stop was Spring Creek Park, a cozy, peaceful spot buried in greenery, a true oasis amidst the city's infrastructure. However, only a portion of the park was open for walking. The rest was covered in thickets and swamps. Mr. Vetrano asked his daughter to stick to her usual route to avoid unfamiliar paths and people. Unfortunately, Karina ignored his advice. In search of solitude, she decided to visit a grassy, deserted area. Karina's thoughts were suddenly interrupted. She fell down after feeling a sharp pain in the back of her head. 
This rash decision resulted in the young woman's death. A terrifying uncertainty entered the Vetrano home. It had been two hours since they said goodbye to their youngest daughter. She should have been home by now, or at least answering the phone calls from her parents, who were desperately trying to reach her, and she had promised to keep her phone to herself. The anxiety was increasing. Her father sensed something was wrong and sought assistance from his neighbor, the chief of the New York City Police Department. They were on friendly terms, and the high-ranking official knew Philip would not make a fuss about anything. Following that, Karina Vetrana was reported missing. Police began looking for the young woman by combing the park and surrounding streets. As a result, experienced canine units were called in. As is well known, the first 24 hours following a person's disappearance are critical and most informative. As a result, law enforcement used all of their available resources before nightfall. At the same time, Mr. Vetrano, accompanied by a group of volunteers, searched for his daughter on his own. He scoured the park from end to end, combing the pads and wading through the thick grass. As dusk fell, the man was making phone calls when he noticed a light in the grass. As he approached, he recognized Karina's cell phone. Maybe she lost her phone and didn't tell us. Philip hoped. The family patriarch approached the police officers, deciding to make his way through the thicket. Stepping into the grass, he discovered something soft. A partially undressed female corpse lay face down. Philip turned it over and noticed a familiar face. A desperate scream erupted from his father's chest. It was Karina she hadn't lost her phone as he assumed his little girl wasn't answering her phone because she had been robbed of her life. Mr. Vetrano was overcome with emotion as he realized what had happened. When the police heard the screaming and yelling, they rushed to him. They dragged Philippe away from his daughter's body, attempting to convey that this was now a crime scene. Everything in the area was considered evidence. To prevent evidence from being tampered with, law enforcement officers asked the deceased's father not to touch anything on the way home. Mr. Vetrano thought a lot. He was tormented about how to inform his wife of their daughter's death. Images from the past flashed before his eyes. He remembered the birth of their second daughter on July 12, 1986, in Queens. Philip had been proud of her from a young age because she was obedient and polite. He vividly remembered taking her to her first day of school and how well she did in class. Such education enabled her to obtain a higher degree. Karina received her Master of Speech Pathology degree from St. John's University. She had always wanted to help children and has worked with autistic children. His daughter was multifaceted. She loved to travel and write. She loved sports, particularly running, and their shared passion brought them together. She was his inspiration. The father remembered how jealous he was of her suitors. He desperately wanted her to be truly loved, hoping that she would eventually build a strong family like he and Kathy did and give him wonderful grandchildren. The return journey became an eternity. At the entrance to the house, Mr. Vetrano paused to take a deep breath. I need to be strong to support my family. I need to pull myself together. The man commanded himself. His wife greeted him on the threshold. Fortunately, he did not have to explain anything to her. She recognized everything on her husband's face. Kathy cried, approached her husband, and hugged him. Karina's family and friends quickly learned of the incident. They struggled to recover from their shock. Believing in the young woman's unexpected death was difficult, let alone accepting its violent nature. Ms. Vetrano had been brutally attacked. This was the investigator's conclusion. At first glance, it was clear that the woman had resisted, even to the death. Her fists stayed clenched. Her once young and healthy body was covered in bruises and abrasions, and her athletic clothing had been torn. An autopsy revealed that a blunt object, most likely a stone, had damaged the back of the victim's skull. However, the death was due to asphyxiation. A distinct mark was visible on the woman's neck. The forensic examination revealed the crime's intimate nature. The expert's findings confirmed the police's initial suspicions earth and grass were discovered under the victim's fingernails, most likely in an attempt to free herself from her attacker's grip and escape. Specialists examined her mouth and discovered her teeth knocked out and cracked in areas where she had clearly bitten to defend herself. Even the woman's neck had numerous scratches. She was grabbing with her hands, attempting to force her attacker to let go of her. Karina did not want to die and fought tirelessly for her life. Karina Vetrano, his youngest daughter, had many interests, but she particularly enjoyed writing. 
In 2013, she appeared in a short film directed by her friend and screenwriter Petros Georgiadis, which was based on a poem she wrote about paradox. In her blogs, the girl frequently addressed complex issues, including love and death. Following the tragedy, new information was leaked to the media. Another jogger's body was discovered in tall grass in Princeton, Massachusetts. The woman, who appeared to be out for a walk in a secluded area, met a similar fate. At first glance, the cases appeared identical. Could there be another serial offender in America? Geneticists took up the case and were tasked with comparing DNA samples collected from crime scenes. As luck would have it, identified samples were discovered on both victims. Contrary to police expectations, the analysis found no link between the crimes. It turned out that the DNA samples belonged to different individuals. The story about the DNA material taken from under her fingernails on her back and Karina Vetrano's phone is especially intriguing. Experts determined that the DNA was sufficient for analysis, despite its small size. For a long time, this DNA was the only lead in the investigation, providing an opportunity to identify the perpetrator. It is known that the majority of life-ending crimes are committed by someone close to the victim, so the police could not rule out any possibility. The victim's father provided his DNA because he was the first to discover his daughter's body. However, the timing of this procedure was poor. It occurred on the day of Korea's funeral. Later, all of the woman's relatives underwent a DNA test, which revealed no matches. Detectives decided to interview Karina, his family and friends to see if Mrs. Vetrano had any enemies or bad intentions. It turned out there were none everyone admired and loved her. The investigators then developed a new version. The deed was committed with ulterior motives. Someone met the beautiful Karina in a remote location and attacked her, succumbing to base motivations at a loss. The investigation asked the public for help by offering a $10,000 reward for information that could lead to the perpetrator. The initiative received widespread support. Detectives investigated 250 leads, ran 600 genetic tests, and compiled over 1,700 reports, all to no avail. The perpetrator appeared to have never committed crimes before, or had never been caught doing so, complicating the investigation even further. On August 31, 2016, a utility worker approached the police station and provided information. Mr. Toronto died while in a restricted area of the park when he saw a man emerge from the bushes and run north. Based on his testimony, the NYPD created and distributed a sketch of the suspect in December 2016. However, it considered the possibility that the person depicted in the sketch was a passerby who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, the release of the suspected perpetrator's sketch yielded no new information, and the investigation reached another lengthy stalemate on December 4, 2016. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has joined the investigation into the death of Karina Vetrano. Initially, they created a psychological profile for the perpetrator. According to FBI experts, the individual was very familiar with the area, particularly the park where the incident occurred, raising the possibility that the assailant lived or still lives nearby. However, fearing capture, he now avoids the area. He clearly understood that the quiet, partially overgrown terrain was ideal for concealing his actions. Based on this theory, the police conducted screenings of local African-American men, but the results were not as desired. Chanel Lewis' life was not particularly unique in comparison to that of other young African-Americans. He lived in one of Brooklyn's low-income housing developments, about four or five miles from Spring Creek Park. Chanel was unemployed and lived with his mother, three sisters, and their children. Perhaps the only thing that distinguished him was his diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. Despite this, he graduated from a private school for students with emotional and behavioral issues. Chanel's former classmates remembered her as a quiet loner. The kids constantly picked on him. One of them admitted that the girls intimidated and punched him. He had no friends. Another peer stated that Louis occasionally fought back, but not effectively. He was frequently mocked for his clothing and appearance. Chanel always wore a hoodie, smirked, and walked away from difficult situations, earning him the nickname African Lizard. Chanel, however, is described as a smart kid with good grades by a fellow student, 17-year-old Danielle Nunes. He liked to show me funny videos on the bus, she remembered. I never saw him being cruel. According to some sources, the young man once stated that he wanted to cut all of the girls who approached him in middle school. What would happen if I brought a knife to school? 
doctor. Edward Dana, the executive director of the school where Chanel was transferred, commented on this. We had no reports of threats at middle school. He received no disciplinary sanctions while attending our school. I never heard him make threats to other students. Nonetheless, Chanel was a traumatized adolescent who frequently faced bullying. He aspired to work in social services, assisting those in distress. When conflicts arose at home, he would wander the streets and frequent the park. Lewis had several minor encounters with the police in Spring Creek, one of which involved urinating in public. In May 2016, Another incident occurred when a local merchant reported Louis for loitering in his shop with a crowbar. Responding officers checked Chanel's identification and released him because he had no prior incidents. However, the police kept this information, which would later play an important role in the investigation into Karina Vetrano's death in February 2017. Detective John Russo, who was involved in the investigation, recalled something significant. He had seen a young man in a hoodie wandering around the park several times before. John even attempted to follow him after becoming intrigued by the individual's behavior. The young man walked slowly, pausing for extended periods in front of houses near the park, as if scouting for potential burglaries. However, Rousseau lost sight of him when he called his colleagues the next day in response to a store owner's report. The police discovered a teenager who matched the description. We're two months into the investigation. John Rousseau recalled this wanderer believing he had seen or heard something relevant. After Detective Russo reviewed the young man's file, investigators focused on Chanel Lewis. Chanel's peculiarities piqued interest. The police began to inquire about him among acquaintances and teachers, and it was discovered that he had allegedly expressed a desire to harm girls. This news raised concerns and suspicions. With no other leads, officers decided to focus on Lewis. It was later discovered that Chanel was not at home when Karina died. After an argument with his family, he went to the park. When he returned, he looked disheveled, with torn clothes and visible bruises and abrasions. When his mother inquired about what had happened, Lewis claimed that he had been attacked. His account matched the timeline and a witness description of a man fleeing the park. Additionally, on August 3, 2016, Lewis's father, a former school principal, took him to the hospital for treatment of severe wounds, the majority of which were cuts, as well as an injured hand. The investigators examined the medical records from that day and found the story credible. However, they saw things differently, noticing parallels between the events involving Chanel Lewis and Karina Vetrano. Chanel was brought to the police station on February 4, 2017, where he voluntarily provided his DNA for analysis. Would the perpetrator willingly do this? Detectives wondered. The interrogation began in the morning of February 5th. Louis admitted that he was at the park around 5 p.m. On August 2, 2016, he clarified that he was walking on dirt pads, not through the thickets, while listening to music. He admitted to seeing a young woman jogging with her phone in hand. When detectives asked if anything happened when he met her, Chanel nodded quietly and said, yes, everyone was stunned. His response was ambiguous, implying confusion. I was angry. One thing led to another. What happened was finally stated clearly investigators were wary of this semi-admission, fearing it would cast doubt on jurors during a trial. They waited for Chanel to explain. I was walking through the park, trying to distract myself from a family argument. When I met a woman who was alone, I decided to follow her. When she passed by me, I grabbed her shoulders, threw her to the ground, and hit her face about five times to keep her from screaming. My punches knocked out several of her teeth, injuring my hand, Chanel said. He also stated that the struggle lasted approximately five minutes. Ms. Vetrano vigorously resisted scratching and biting to avoid attracting attention. Louis dragged her from the path into the tall grass where he tried to undress and assault her. She was taken aback but refused to give in. Chanel then strangled her until he realized she was dead. When asked if he knew the victim before, he replied, I did not know her before this. Everything happened by chance. With Ants, the motivation for the act became even more unexpected and bizarre. Chanel's hatred and uncontrollable aggression were apparently triggered by hours of loud music played by a neighborhood gang member. These negative emotions were unleashed on the unfortunate woman, a strange motivation for an act. The investigator's confusion was dispelled when DNA comparison results matched perfectly microscopic traces found on the victim's body in Chanel's phone. As a result, the police and prosecutor concluded that the case was solved and ready for trial. However, the motive seemed implausible. 
Chanel may have noticed Karina before, as he frequented the park and might have seen her with her father. He liked her and chose to approach her. However, after being rejected, he became enraged and attacked her, and the situation spiraled out of control. This scenario could have been more understandable. On November 5, 2018, the trial against Chanel Lewis began. Despite his earlier statements to the authorities, Lewis pleaded not guilty, a stance shared by his family, denying any involvement in the crime. The prosecution charged Louis with homicide and sexual assault, and he faces a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. The debate over Louis's guilt played out not only in court, but also in the media. Lewis and his defense team sparked controversy by citing alleged legal violations during his arrest, as well as allegations of racial bias and discrimination by various news outlets. However, the judge dismissed the allegations as baseless, emphasizing that the investigation followed legal procedures. The prosecution presented tangible evidence and DNA analysis results. The defense claimed the evidence was insufficient and contaminated. Given the large number of people present at the crime scene, including the victim's father who discovered her body, forensic biologist Linda Rossano estimated that the likelihood of the DNA belonging to someone other than Louis was one in six trillion. The prosecutor also presented Louis phone records, revealing his internet searches on second chances and forgiveness in Catholicism, which prompted the question, what sin did Chanel want to atone for? The release of Louis confession video sparked more controversy, with his lawyers claiming he was under immense pressure, resulting in a coerced confession. They suspected the police of fabricating evidence, claiming that the recording began only after Lewis was coerced and that the search of his home violated protocol. The defense argued that the investigation into Karina Vetrano's death was initially botched. As public pressure grew for an arrest, Louise became a scapegoat. The jury was struck by the defense's compelling arguments. After hearing both sides, they were unable to reach a final decision. On November 21, 2018, the judge declared a mistrial, with a retrial originally scheduled for January 22, 2019, but later pushed back to March 2019. Chanel Lewis was found guilty of Karina Vetrano's death and sentenced to life in prison without parole on July 23, 2019, following five hours of deliberations. The defense's delay tactics included citing an anonymous source for alleged juror misconduct, implying jury pressure and a conspiracy, and some referring to the trial as a lynching. The seemingly straightforward case initially sparked widespread prejudice and fear in society. Karina Vetrano's death moved many people, serving as a sobering reminder for women to be cautious. Did justice prevail? In any case, a young woman was killed, and Chanel Lewis was sentenced to life in prison. Both families have lost their children. The hope remains that the truth was discovered. Otherwise, an innocent man is incarcerated while the perpetrator goes free. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we'll look at a story from 2016. Michelle Lang, 25, had always wanted to study in Australia and one day she realized her dream. Unfortunately, her story did not have a happy conclusion. Meng Mei Lang, also known by her middle name Michelle, was born on January 29, 1991 in Chengdu, Sichuan Province, China. Michelle grew up to be a kind, responsible, and respectful young lady. Michelle had a very close relationship with her parents, so it was devastating for her when her father died in an earthquake in 2008. She excelled in school and aspired to live in Australia. Her mother, Mei Zhang Leung, remained supportive throughout and believed that if her daughter received an education in Australia, she would have a bright future. Michelle began attending the University of Technology, Sydney, in 2011. This enabled her to travel to Australia and realize her long-held dream. Michelle's aunt, her mother's sister, lives in Australia and has offered her a room in her apartment. She also had a daughter who was two years younger than Michelle. Michelle's aunt, who was 44 at the time, married Derek Barrett, a man 20 years her junior. Derek was a temporary unemployed professional who was only three years older than Michelle. Michelle, 
Her aunt, cousin, and Derek have since lived together in suburban Campsie, New South Wales. The first few years went well Michelle excelled in her studies, made new friends, and found a part-time job. Begin in 2016. Michelle's aunt frequently visited Wollongong for work, and Michelle, her cousin, and Derek continued to live in an apartment in Campsie. Michelle's aunt left for another business trip in April 2016, with a return date of April 24th. Michelle, 25, had been out with friends three days before that date. Around noon, she took a bus from the University of Technology Sydney to a downtown shopping mall. Around 3 p.m., security cameras captured Michelle shopping on Pitt Street in Sydney's Central Business District. She was alone, and the footage showed she was fine, unconcerned about anything. The vision also showed her taking a train from St. James to Campsie, arriving around 4.30 p.m. Michelle Lang was last seen alive at the Campsie train station. However, she used her cell phone to communicate with friends and family until late that evening. Those who spoke with Michelle that evening reported no anxiety or unusual tones in her voice. Derek drove to the train station on Sunday, April 24th, to meet his wife after she returned from a business trip. And when Michelle asked Derek about her niece, he said he hadn't seen her in two days. Derek was unemployed at the time, so he spent his time on the computer and slept late. So he claimed he and Michelle had not seen each other. He also mentioned that Michelle had been spending a lot of time with her girlfriends and going to nightclubs recently. Michelle's cousin often stayed overnight at friends' houses, so she didn't see her for a few days. Michelle hadn't been seen since April 22nd, and her phone was turned off. This was unusual because she communicated with friends and family members living in China on a daily basis. It was also odd that Michelle didn't log into her social media accounts. The truth is that if someone who was previously an active user of social media and spent several hours per day on it suddenly stops logging into their accounts, there is a good chance that something has gone wrong. Michelle's aunt searched her room, trying to figure out where she had gone. The room was in perfect condition. Michelle's belongings were all in their proper places, and it appeared that she had simply vanished. The next day, Michelle's aunt and husband, Derek, went to the police station to file a missing persons report. They also informed the Chinese embassy about Michelle's disappearance at the police station. Derek told them about the last time he saw Michelle, and her aunt explained that she had just returned from a business trip yesterday and they had been unable to locate Michelle on their own, much to the disappointment of everyone who cared about Michelle. Her body had already been discovered when the police report was filed the day before, around 10.30 a.m. On Sunday, April 24th, several people called the police after seeing a body floating in the water near Snapper Point. That's approximately 80 miles from Campsie. The same day, some Australian media outlets reported the discovery of a woman's body. According to the report, a woman's body was found face down inside a blowhole on the New South Wales central coast. Police said the death was suspicious and a crime scene was set up yesterday at Snapper Point in the Munmora State Recreation Area. The unidentified woman was found near Mooney Beach between Gosford and Newcastle. She is described as Asian in appearance between the ages of 20 and 35, and stands about 170 centimeters tall. A post-mortem examination will be performed to determine the cause of death. A rescue helicopter spokesman said it was unclear how long the woman had been there or how she ended up in the water. Detective Chief Inspector Gary Jubilin of the New South Wales Homicide Unit stated, we are creative in the way that we recapture the area and what has happened in the area so we're looking through CCTV footage to see if we can find anything like that. I won't say what we discovered, but we're getting a pretty good idea of what happened in that area. During that time, he stated, now that the police had received a report of Michelle's disappearance, they quickly cross-referenced this information with a woman whose body had been discovered at Snapper Point and whose identity had yet to be determined. Michelle's relatives were devastated to learn that she had been discovered dead. Inspector Jubilin stated that police had informed M.S. Ling's family, who live both in Australia and overseas, of the news. We spoke with Michelle's auntie, who she lives with. Then I called Michelle's brother, who lives with her in China. He said it was terrible news to deliver, and you can imagine how upset they were. 
Police have asked anyone with information about Michelle's weekend activities to come forward and report it so that detectives can determine who is responsible for this heinous crime as quickly as quickly as possible. When the body was retrieved from the water, there were several injuries indicating that Michelle had been severely assaulted. During the autopsy, the medical examiner found over 30 stab wounds on her body. She fought for her life and attempted to fight back against the perpetrator, resulting in defensive wounds to her arms. Michelle's mother flew to Australia a few days after learning of her daughter's death, still unable to accept her loss. Even today, we cannot accept that she has left us and that we are still in great pain. Miss Lang stated that the time when Meng Mei and I lived happily together would never come back. She said, you cannot imagine how painful it is for me. The saddest thing in life is losing someone you care deeply about. While investigating the case, the detective spoke with Michelle's aunt and husband because she lived in their apartment and they were the most familiar with her. Derek stated that he last saw Michelle on the evening of Thursday, April 21st. Following dinner, they watched a movie before Michelle went to bed in her room on Friday, April 22nd. When he awoke, Michelle had left the house. He woke up late, so it was not surprising that she had already left. According to him, Michelle had not yet returned when he went to bed, so he assumed she was out having fun with friends. The following day, he awoke late, and Michelle was still missing. He wasn't sure if she was coming home, so he texted her, asking where she was and if she was all right, but the message went unread. Michelle's aunt didn't say anything because she was on a business trip. Steele. According to some Australian media, Michelle's aunt told the detective that she checked Michelle's Facebook correspondence on her laptop and discovered that her niece had recently dated an Australian guy, whom she described as having golden hair, pale skin, and fierce eyes. As a result, the police assumed Michelle had gone on a date with a man she met online. However, that version was quickly pushed aside. In fact, investigators had already identified a suspect in Michelle Lung's death. Derek Barrett was the last person who saw her alive. The police were skeptical of his claims about waking up late and not seeing Michelle. They called him in for questioning and began asking him about his relationship with Michelle when he last saw her and so on. Derek then refused to answer the questions and requested a lawyer, after which he was informed that he had been arrested as a suspect. The truth is that investigators checked his cell phone signal and discovered that he had been in the same area where Michelle's body was found on April 24th. This information contradicted the man's claim that he had not visited Snapper Point that day. A police officer also obtained camera footage of a car matching Barrett's description in the early hours of April 24th, near Snapper Point. However, the image was blurry and Barrett began to claim it wasn't his car which the police denied. The detectives discovered video footage of Derek Barrett paying for gas and purchasing beverages at a gas station on his way to Snapper Point. The image is of good quality and clearly shows Barrett. When told that he was lying about what he was doing on April 24th, he began to claim that he had memory problems and couldn't recall specific periods of time because he frequently used illegal substances. Barrett's phone was seized and handed over to experts for analysis and recovery of previously deleted data. What was discovered on the phone proved beyond doubt that Derek Barrett Barrett was not only involved in Michelle's death, but also had an unhealthy interest in her. His own stepdaughter was also the focus of his desire. A 15-minute video from September 2014 shows his wife's daughter, his stepdaughter, taking a shower. Derek installed a hidden camera in the shared bathroom concealing it behind toiletries. In another video, investigators saw Derek enter his stepdaughter's room while she slept, stand next to her bed, and express his satisfaction. After some time, Derek Barrett's attention shifted from his stepdaughter to his niece. Experts recovered a half-hour video of Michelle taking a shower from his phone. In another video, Derek satisfied himself by standing next to Michelle's bed while she slept. The phone also contained images taken shortly before Michelle died. We now know that Michelle returned home around 5 p.m. On April 21st, she sent her last text message around midnight, and no one has heard from or seen her since. Derek Barrett began carrying out his insidious plan shortly after midnight. 
He attacked, so Michelle tied her up and taped her mouth shut. In pictures on his phone, investigators saw Michelle, bound and naked, lying on a bed, terrified. Michelle had not yet sustained the injuries that caused her death, according to the 17 photos. Derek's last picture was taken around 8 a.m. Michelle was still alive around 4 p.m. On April 22nd, that same day, when Derek's stepdaughter returned home, she had no idea her cousin was tied up in the next room. When questioned by investigators about that day, she stated that she had been home for approximately three hours before leaving again. She didn't hear Michelle's call for help. Experts were unable to determine the precise time of death. So, it's unclear whether Michelle was alive at the time, but she was definitely present in the apartment. She spent the entire three hours at home. Derek was in the bathroom with the shower the following day, April 23rd. Derek left the apartment four times to remove trash bags. This was captured on surveillance cameras. Michelle was reportedly dead by this point, and Derek was cleaning the house. Michelle's aunt Derek's wife told investigators that when she returned home from a business trip, it was spotless, but she didn't think much about it at the time. At 3.19 a.m. On April 24th, Derek drove to Snapper Point. On the way, he stopped at a gas station to buy drinks and fill up his car with gas. When he arrived at Snapper Point, he disposed of Michelle's body and took some photos around 9 a.m. An hour and a half later, Police received information from eyewitnesses who saw the body in the water. Derek visited his parents in the meantime, who did not notice anything unusual about his behavior, and then returned home to Campsy. Derek Barrett was indicted on 27 counts, including unlawful imprisonment, secret videotaping, and murdering Michelle Lang. It is worth noting, in particular, that he was not accused of soliciting for lustful purposes. Derek, like many criminals, began to complain about his difficult childhood, including being bullied at school. Some people believe that a difficult childhood is an excuse for their abusive behavior. The trial started in October 2017. The psychiatrist who examined Derek concluded that he could be held fully accountable for his actions. A psychiatrist testified that Barrett told him, I lost everything because of a stupid weekend Derek wrote a letter of apology to his wife and Michelle's family, stating, No words can begin to describe the emotional pain I have caused you and your family. I can only imagine what you're going through after your loss. Every single moment of my life. I wish I could go back in time and undo that terrible day. My own problems spilled over into the family home, and they paid the price. In some small way, all I can do is dedicate my life to making amends for what I have done. Tam Mei Jiang, in her mother's translated victim impact statement, requested that the judge sentence this vicious rapist, malicious torturer, and cold-hearted murderer to life in prison. In April 2016, the death of Hamong may have caused great pain to my entire family, and as a single mother attempting to support her daughter, who was an international student in Sydney, she stated that my healthy mother was in such grief that she also died. Not long after learning of Meng Mei's death, my family was dealt such devastating blows that we are still suffering irreversibly. Derek Barrett pleaded guilty after being charged with multiple counts. In December 2017, he was sentenced to 46 years in prison, with the possibility of parole at 34 years and six months. Barrett sat with his head down during his sentencing, barely reacting, he was supposed to become eligible for parole in 2050. But circumstances changed. Detective Gary Jubelin spoke to the media outside court, welcoming the lengthy sentence. The courts recognized the gravity of the offense with the sentence imposed on Mr. Barrett, he stated, from an investigative standpoint, it is satisfying that we have justice, but there is no joy in a situation like this. It's just a very sad case. Michelle's family asked the judge to sentence Barrett to life in prison, so they were dissatisfied with the outcome. The story does not end there. However, another event occurred, forcing Barrett back into the courtroom and causing additional distress for Michelle's family. For years after the crime, a woman discovered a USB drive in the hands of her elderly mother, who suffered from dementia. The elderly woman was not related to Derek Barrett and lived about six miles from where he lived before being arrested in 2016. Because of her memory issues, 
She couldn't recall where she obtained the USB drive. It's still a mystery. Her daughter decided to view the contents of the flash drive on her computer. The video she saw shocked her, so she immediately called the cops. Derek Barrett was identified by investigators as the man who repeatedly satisfied his desire and treated Michelle as an object rather than a person in the videos. The footage was captured on April 22nd and 23rd, 2016. An offender who enjoyed hurting, humiliating, and degrading MS, Ling defiled her personal integrity cruelly. According to the police statement, the new videos were discovered and reported to Michelle's mother. This caused her even more distress, and she claimed that when the police informed her of the contents of the videos, she began to faint. Barrett set up two video cameras in Michelle's room to record his actions from various perspectives. Supreme Court Justice Helen Wilson, who handed down Barrett's original maximum sentence of 46 years, told the court that if she had known the full extent of his crimes in 2017, she would have sentenced him to life in prison. Judge Wilson described the disgusting contents of the nine videos discovered on the USB drive. She said a compilation of the videos provided by police lasted about 60 minutes and began with Barrett entering his bedroom. She was clearly shocked and alarmed by his entry into her bedroom and didn't want him there. The recordings clearly show that Justice Wilson intended to relive that enjoyment later. She claimed that the offender went to great lengths to make the USB stick and that his disposal of it indicated a desire not to be caught. After new evidence was discovered, Derek Barrett was charged with Michelle Lang's carnal abuse. Barrett pleaded guilty and made no statements. In March 2021, he was sentenced to another 20 years in prison. Unfortunately, both of his sentences will run concurrently. Nevertheless, he will be eligible for parole two years later than originally planned. He will be released from prison no earlier than October 27, 2052. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Jared Bridegan case from love to the end of life. No matter how long a couple has been together or how happy their marriage was, divorces frequently result in the breakdown of amicable, or at least respectful, relationships. However, former husbands and wives may part ways as true adversaries close partners intentionally make each other's lives miserable, inflict harm, or wish for the other's death. In rare cases, it goes beyond mere wishes and escalates into actual physical confrontations. Today, we'll look at such a case. To begin, it is important to note that the case involving the death of 33-year-old Jared Bridegan, a Microsoft employee and father of four young children, has yet to be concluded. Currently, three people have been arrested on charges of conspiracy to commit a planned confrontation that resulted in Reagan's death, and they will face the death penalty. This sensational story, which unfolded in the sunny state of Florida, has, without a doubt, shaken the entire country. The protagonists are parents with multiple children. Once married, the motive for the crime is alarmingly simple, a refusal to split jointly acquired assets and custody of their children. However, the approach to ending Brigham's life is reminiscent of a complex detective plot. Let's look at how former spouses and deeply religious people turned into the worst of enemies and why it all ended so tragically. Who was Jared Bridegan? Jared J. Bridegan was born in 1989 in Florida into a modest family as the second of two sons. He grew up with his older brother Adam, with whom he was practically inseparable since childhood. The brother's parents were devout followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Bowden later referred to Jared as her first true love. However, their relationship did not lead to marriage because cohabitation was frowned upon in their religious community. As a result, when Jared graduated from Florida Arts High School in 2007 and decided to continue his education in another state, they parted ways. Jared moved to Utah, where he attended college and met his future first wife. At a friend's birthday party in 2009, Jared Bridegan, then 20, met Shanna Gardner. She was two years old and came from a wealthy family. She was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as previously stated. Shana was born in 1987, 
Her parents, Starling and Shelley Gardner, were co-founders of Stampin' Up!, a major company that manufactured and sold decorative and craft items. By 2010, their family business, headquartered in Salt Lake City, was reported to generate $100 million in annual revenue. Shauna has a sister named Sarah, who is currently a manager in the family business. As the heir to such a wealthy family, Shauna grew up in luxury and was used to living a leisurely life, never having to work in her trained profession as a chef. She was described as enthusiastic and fickle. According to Mallory, who was mentioned earlier, Jared was initially uninterested in his new acquaintance. Shauna, on the other hand, went out of her way to entice him with her extravagant lifestyle, implying that together they could travel the world and do whatever they wanted because her parents would financially support them. Family life and the birth of twins. The couple became engaged just a few months after their first meeting, and less than a year later, in early 2010, they celebrated a lavish wedding in a temple in Salt Lake City, Utah, with the Gardner family covering all expenses for the ceremony and reception. The couple's religious beliefs, which frowned on cohabitation and long engagements, influenced their quick decision to marry. Following their wedding, the newlyweds relocated to Utah, where the bride's parents assisted them in purchasing a comfortable home valued at approximately $1 million. Each spouse also owned their own Mercedes. Despite the fact that Jared was still a student and Shannon was not working, the couple traveled extensively around the world, posting numerous photos of their exciting trips, expensive purchases, and leisure activities on their social media accounts. According to close friends, Shannon's parents gave the couple around $10,000 per month for various expenses and gave them full access to their accounts. Furthermore, after Jared finished his degree, his in-laws generously gave him $100,000 to launch his own business. In 2013, the couple gave birth to twins, Abigail and Liam. The family relocated to Connecticut for a while, but Liam was soon diagnosed with a heart condition and lung issues. Doctors advised the child to move closer to the sea, citing health benefits. The Brits moved to Florida, where they purchased a two-story comfortable home near the coast in Ponte Vedra Beach, south of Jacksonville. Shana was actively managing her own social media blog at the time, portraying herself as a loving wife, a caring mother of twins, a professional chef, and a woman who enjoyed travel and sports. She took fitness seriously, going to the gym almost every day. Seeing her dedication, Jared decided to surprise his beloved by hiring a personal trainer for her. Following the scandalous divorce shortly after moving, clear issues arose in the marriage, despite the couple's stubborn insistence that everything was fine. Shana became disillusioned with their religion and almost stopped attending church, while her husband remained a devout and exemplary member. This difference in religious commitment resulted in disagreements, misunderstandings, and tension. Shana reportedly became disillusioned with Jared, whom she saw as too lazy, having gained weight, and only half-heartedly attempting to get his business off the ground. After completing online programming and design courses, Jared secured a position at Microsoft and began earning independently. After a few years, he was promoted to senior manager. Nonetheless, the couple grew apart and disagreements became commonplace in their home. The situation worsened when Jared discovered intimate conversations between his wife and her personal fitness trainer, According to some sources, Shana had an affair, which the trainer confirmed over the phone with Jared, though Shana strongly denied these allegations. Jared then emailed Mallory Bowden, lamenting how his wife had become distant and emotionally attached to her gym trainer. Despite this, he expressed a willingness to forgive the infidelity and keep their family intact for the sake of their children. The couple began a contentious and scandalous divorce process in 2015, nearly six years after they married. They had a heated argument about shared assets and custody rights for their children. Jared publicly accused his ex-wife of infidelity, which she categorically denied, claiming that the marriage had simply lost its romance. In response, she accused him of being cruel and defensive. Shana refused to divide their home, cars, and bank accounts, claiming that nearly everything they had acquired over the years had been purchased or gifted by her parents. Jared had only begun working less than a year before, having previously focused on his studies and failed to establish his business with funds from his in-laws. Jared challenged this viewpoint, claiming at least half of their Florida home. Custody of the twins sparked numerous disputes. Shana claimed that whenever Jared was with the children, he tried to turn them against her. He allegedly coached them on what to say about their mother and recorded their statements for use in court. 
Jared, for his part, accused his ex-wife of extensive surveillance, including the installation of hidden cameras in their home, the tapping of his phone calls, and the placement of a tracker in his car to monitor his movements. Shauna sought sole custody of the children, as well as exclusive ownership of their seaside home. She also claimed Jared threatened to take all of the money from their children's trust funds for personal use. Jared responded by alleging that his ex-wife evaded taxes by working off the books at her parents' company and receiving tens of thousands of dollars. By the end of 2015, the court had ordered joint custody of the children. But that did not put an end to Jared and Shana's disputes. Even after their divorce was officially finalized, they continued to appear in court for nearly seven years, culminating in the tragic end of their story. By this point, both had moved on to start new families and have additional children. In 2016, Jared met Christina, a Microsoft employee who lived and worked in North Carolina. Initially, their interactions were strictly professional, but they gradually became closer. A few months later, Christina relocated to Florida to be with Jared. They married in February 2019, having met in the fall of 2017. They welcomed their first child, a daughter named Bexley, in August 2021. Shauna remarried in 2018, marrying Mario Fernandez, a man a year younger than her who owned a real estate business. That same year, they welcomed their son, Michael. The family lived in the same house Shauna had shared with her first husband, Jared, which had been the site of their court battles. The arrival of new families did not calm the tensions between the ex-spouses, who continued to file lawsuits against one another with new demands. Jared insisted that Shannon's new husband, Mario, should not be allowed to be with the twins while their mother was away. In contrast, he wanted his new wife, Christina, to be fully involved in the upbringing of his older children. The last court meeting between Jared and Shana took place four months before Jared's death and was extremely tense. They exchanged more mutual accusations and argued over their property rights. Shana claimed that Jared was preventing her from using the family's larger, more comfortable vehicle to transport the children because he was more concerned with humiliating the mother than with his own children's comfort and safety. At this point, the court granted Shauna exclusive use of the larger vehicle and ordered Jared to pay her $600 as compensation. The tragic end to a secluded road for the ex-spouse's agreement. On Wednesdays, Jared picked up the twins for a family dinner, which included their younger sister, Bexley. Christina occasionally joined them, but after the birth of London, she spent the majority of her time with the newborn, preferring not to leave him with babysitters. Jared picked up the children on Wednesday, February 22, 2022, and took them to a coastal cafe per his routine. After dinner and a stroll, he dropped the twins off at their mother's house and returned home via his usual route. The journey typically took about 40 minutes, with part of it spent on a deserted stretch of road with no street lights. Bride again came across an unexpected obstacle while driving slowly and cautiously, aware of his three-year-old daughter asleep in her car seat. It was about 9 p.m. and the sun had set when he noticed a tire in his lane in the headlights. He came to a stop, turned on his hazard lights, and got out to move the tire to the side of the road. That's when the shots went off. Jared had no chance of escaping. The perpetrator, acting with deadly precision, fired several close-range shots before fleeing the scene. The child sleeping in the car was unharmed. A passerby heard the shots and approached cautiously, discovering Jared lying in a pool of blood. He immediately contacted the police and paramedics. Unfortunately, it was too late to save the victim. The investigation and initial suspicions Christina called her husband just minutes before the incident, and he said he had just dropped off the children and would be home in 15 minutes. However, 30 minutes had passed into an hour, and Jared was nowhere to be found and stopped answering his phone, anxiously dialing his phone number again. Christina was greeted by a police officer, who informed her of the incident and requested her immediate arrival at the Jacksonville Beach Police Station. The investigation team at the scene determined that Jared's vehicle came to a halt due to a road obstacle, specifically a tire. They concluded that he got out of his car to remove the obstacle but was then shot. His three-year-old daughter, who was asleep in the car, was unharmed, indicating that the mysterious shooter did not target her. Furthermore, there were no valuables missing from the vehicle. A wallet containing cash, a phone, and a tablet were left, effectively ruling out the robbery theory almost immediately. When asked if her husband had any known enemies, antagonists, or recent conflicts, 
Christina stated that she was unaware of anyone wishing harm on her husband except his first wife, Shauna. However, she avoided making direct accusations in the absence of incontrovertible evidence. The absence of cameras resulted in a lack of surveillance footage, according to police. Whereas on the stretch of road where the incident occurred, a witness who heard Tay. However, they did hear the sound of a car speeding away. There was nothing visible in the darkness. Investigators found Christina's suggestion of Shannon's involvement in the crime plausible. However, detectives knew she was unlikely to act directly, especially given her solid alibi of being at home with her husband, twins, younger son, and her parents who were visiting. The police decided to check the nearby surveillance cameras. The video captured an old, dark blue Ford F-150 with brown trim entering the area about 15 minutes before the incident. Again, a few minutes after the witness reported the shots, Detectives asked the public for assistance in identifying the vehicle of interest. The Jared family made television appeals, urging anyone with any information about the case to come forward. The first suspect arrested, Shauna, and her current husband, Mario, were repeatedly questioned but denied any involvement in the murder. Shauna did not hide the fact that her relationship with her ex-husband was complicated, but she insisted that she would never harm the father of her children. She also told the media how the nine-year-old twins reacted to the news of their father's death. According to her, Abigail cried uncontrollably for several hours. Liam was stunned and silent for a long time. It's worth noting that neither the ex-wife nor the older children attended Jared's funeral. Christina had told Shanna that her presence at the farewell ceremony was extremely unwelcome, to which Shanna responded that if she wasn't allowed to attend, neither would the twins. The first suspect was arrested in January 2023, nearly a year after Mr. Briggins' murder. The police had remained silent about the investigation's progress, only stating that it required significant resources and effort. After a lengthy search for the dark blue Ford F-150, Lux smiled on the investigation when the vehicle was involved in an accident but fled the scene before police arrived. This time, the incident occurred in a crowded area with a large number of witnesses, and the offender was identified the same day thanks to multiple camera footage. The car was owned by Henry Tenen, a 62-year-old unemployed man with prior convictions. He was charged with second-degree premeditated murder with a firearm, involvement in a criminal conspiracy with the intent to commit murder, and planning an ambush with an obstruction for the victim. Jacksonville Beach Police Chief Jonathan Paul Smith and City Prosecutor Melissa Nelson announced the charges at a press conference. Tenen was also revealed to have not acted alone and was testifying against his accomplices, though no other names were released at the time to protect the integrity of the ongoing investigation. Given the gravity of the charges against him and the lengthy prison term he faced, the tenant decided to make a deal with law enforcement, hoping that his cooperation would be considered favorably during sentencing and potentially reduce his punishment. The criminal trio discovered information that quickly leaked to the press that the accused Tenen was renting a small house with a friend owned by Mario Fernandez. Tenen's housemate was also brought in for questioning, but he was unable to provide any useful information about the case. He had no personal dealings with the owner of their rental, instead passing his share of the rent through Henry. However, a thorough search of the house revealed a hidden pistol in the accused room, which ballistic tests determined to be the murder weapon. This further implicated 10 people in the crime. On March 16, 2023, Mario Fernandez was arrested after pleading guilty and agreeing to testify against Mario, whom he identified as the crime's contractor. Fernandez was charged with first-degree murder, criminal conspiracy, and incitement to commit a serious crime. Rumors circulated that Shauna was the mastermind of the murder. This was supported by her former lover, a fitness trainer, who revealed that she had a long-standing dislike for her then husband and wished for his death. A tattoo artist Shana frequented also testified, recalling Shana complaining about her ex-husband's endless legal battles, wishing to silence him forever, and asking if she knew anyone who could assist. Shana repeated her inquiry months later, clearly indicating her seriousness, after it was initially misinterpreted as a grim joke. Shana Gardner Fernandez vehemently denied all allegations made against her. She stated her intention to stay in town and assist with the investigation. However, a few months after her husband's arrest, she relocated to Washington with the twins and her youngest son on August 17, 2023. She was facing the same charges as her current husband, who was arrested in her Washington apartment. 
she was extradited to Florida, where she would face trial alongside the criminal trio. Her actions were motivated by complicated relationships with her ex-husband, a desire to avoid sharing custody of their two children, and a desire to own all disputed assets outright. As of now, the ongoing legal battle continues, and legal proceedings against all conspirators are underway. Tainan has pleaded guilty to all charges, is fully cooperating with the investigation, and is hoping for leniency. According to reports, he faces at least 15 years in prison, which is a long time for someone his age and could be equivalent to a life sentence. Mario Fernandez has only partially admitted his guilt and, exercising his legal rights, has declined to testify against his wife. Shanna Gardner Fernandez, on the other hand, has vehemently denied all charges against her. Nonetheless, prosecutors are seeking the death penalty or life in prison with no possibility of parole for the couple. Shannon's three children are currently in the care of their maternal grandparents, Starling and Shelley Gardner, and Aunt Sarah. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Every person in this world wishes to find his or her true love, with whom he hopes to live until the end of his life. Unfortunately, not every love story ends happily. Karen and Gordon Anderson's youngest child, Haley Anderson's youngest child, Haley Anderson, was born in Westbury. After graduating from high school, she studied nursing at Binghamton University Medical Center. Haley worked part-time at a coffee shop for the first three years of her studies before securing a position in the emergency department of a Long Island hospital. Haley has always wanted to work in a hospital to help people who are described as strong, independent, kind, and always smiling. Haley had a large number of friends. She was a fan of the hippie subculture, believing that youth should be spent engaging in entertainment and developing open relationships. Haley and her roommates spent the late hours of Thursday, March 8, 2018, playing board games and drinking. The gathering ended just before 4 a.m. Then, they all went to bed. When Haley's roommate, Josie Arden, woke up a few hours later, she wasn't surprised that Haley wasn't in bed, given their independent college lifestyles. However, as the day progressed and Haley failed to show up for a planned meeting with Josie and other friends at a bar, concerns grew. Notably, Haley had not posted anything on social media all day, and calls and messages to her cell phone had gone unanswered. Worried Josie and another roommate used the Find My Friends app to locate Haley's iPhone, which led them to a home on Oak Street. This was the home of Orlando Tercero, another nursing student who had a brief on and off relationship with Haley that lasted just over a year. Orlando, a Miami native with Nicaraguan roots, was known for his academic diligence during the week and for partying with Sean on weekends. Josie, along with her roommate, Michaela Tobley, went to Oak Street to find out where Haley was. Earlier that day, the police were called to Orlando's home on Oak Street after his sister requested a welfare check in response to a distressing text message she received from him. When the police arrived, there was no response and the house appeared to be unoccupied. So they left, discovering nothing amiss. When Josie and Michael arrived, they knocked on the door but received no response and the house appeared deserted. Despite this, they chose to remain motivated by their concern for Haley's well-being. When they noticed Orlando's car was missing, they checked their tracking app, which showed Haley's phone was still inside. Josie helped Michaela enter through an open window to find Haley in Orlando's bedroom, partially covered by bedclothes. Although they couldn't be certain her power made them suspect she was dead, they quickly dialed 911 and both police and emergency personnel arrived, confirming Haley's tragic death. The cause was determined to be strangulation, and Orlando was not found. Haley and Orlando had an on and off relationship with Haley eventually choosing to end it. While she wished to maintain a friendship, Orlando desired a more serious relationship. Over the course of about a year, Orlando sought a serious relationship, which Haley did not reciprocate, preferring not to be tied down during her college years. The investigation revealed a troubling incident six months before Haley's tragic discovery. Orlando was seen shouting at Haley during a party on September 15, 2017, after learning she had reconciled with her ex-boyfriend, Kevin Ocampo. Unhappy with this development, Orlando insisted on an exclusive relationship, which Haley declined, stating her desire to remain friends. 
Kevin slept over at Haley's apartment the next morning. When he left, he discovered that Haley's car tires had been slashed. When Haley reported the incident to the police, Orlando denied any involvement. Given that the damages exceeded $600, felony charges may be pursued to keep Orlando from suffering severe consequences. Haley chose not to press charges on the condition that he pay for the damaged tires. Haley's friends told the police that Orlando was obsessed with her, paying another visit to Eldred, driving by her apartment, and appearing to keep a constant eye on her. Despite this, Haley maintained contact with him because she didn't want him to feel excluded, and she still liked him. As the investigation delved into the events surrounding Haley's board game night with friends, the focus shifted to how she ended up at Orlando's house. Surveillance cameras near and outside Orlando's home were critical. According to the footage, Haley and Orlando entered his house together, with Haley appearing fine and willing. Hours later, Orlando was seen leaving the house alone, disposing of garbage, and then going to a nearby pharmacy to buy sleeping pills like Quill and Melatonin before returning home. Following footage showed Orlando leaving again. Seven hours later, I was descending into the house's basement. Police suspected that at this point, Orlando attempted to commit suicide with hooks and a rope, resulting in injuries. The presence of blood on the basement floor supported this theory. They discovered what they thought was a suicide note written in Spanish with the English translation read, I am deeply sorry about this. I never believed I was capable of doing this. Father, I'll see you soon. Orlando's father died five years ago. They believed the note was more than just a suicide note. However, a confession from surveillance footage showed Orlando leaving the house later with a suitcase, and authorities tracked his movements to G-Cake International Airport. He was discovered to have boarded a flight to Nicaragua using his dual citizenship, while his mother remained in the country. Despite his dual citizenship, us authorities charged Orlando with second-degree murder in the hopes of starting extradition proceedings. Extradition, on the other hand, was not mandatory in Nicaragua due to his citizenship, Nonetheless, Nicaragua launched a massive search for Orlando and found him in a hospital in the city of Leon. Only five days after Haley's death, he was seeking medical attention for injuries sustained during his suicide attempt. The extradition process was a year-long exchange between us and Nicaraguan authorities. Eventually, Nicaraguan authorities concluded that they had gathered sufficient evidence to charge Orlando and proceed with the trial. Contrary to us expectations, the trial would take place in Nicaragua, with charges that differed from those in the United States. Orlando was charged with femicide, a hate crime in Nicaragua that involves the murder of a woman because of her gender and previous relationship with a perpetrator. The differences were also evident in the courtroom proceedings. In Nicaragua, there was no jury. Instead, a judge heard arguments from both the prosecution and the defense before rendering a decision. Also, Orlando was not required to enter a plea. According to the prosecution's case, Haley willingly entered Orlando's home, and he strangled her to death shortly after, possibly while she was sleeping. The prosecution argued that Orlando's obsession with Haley had reached a dangerous level, and that if he couldn't have her, no one else should. They hypothesized that Orlando strangled Haley out of jealousy over her rejection of a serious relationship. This alleged rage had apparently been building up for six months, beginning at a party where Orlando discovered Haley had reunited with her ex-boyfriend. Witnesses from the United States testified via teleconference, recounting Orlando's obsessive behavior toward Haley, which included driving by and calling her apartment, as well as details about the slash tires incident. The judge viewed surveillance footage from outside Orlando's house, which showed him entering with Haley and leaving alone. The court also heard about Orlando's attempted suicide and the note he left for his family, which added context to Haley's tragic death. Dr. James Terzi, the pathologist who performed Haley's autopsy testified that her death was caused by asphyxiation from neck compression. The court learned that Haley was asphyxiated by manual neck compression with an element of ligature strangulation visible due to the involvement of the necklace she was wearing. According to the prosecution, Haley was killed because she refused to be in a relationship with Orlando. He strongly disagreed with the defense press's conclusion that Orlando had no recollection of what happened that night. They claimed that Orlando was temporarily insane at the time Haley died as a result of his alcohol consumption. The defense only called one witness, psychiatrist Dr. Ronald Lopez Aguila, to testify about Orlando's mental health. Dr. Lopez Aguilar informed the court that Orlando claimed to have no recollection of the murder. 
Orlando claimed that he drank heavily that night and awoke to find Haley dead, with no knowledge of what had happened. The psychiatrist also told the court that it was impossible to know Orlando's state of mind at the time of the murder. However, in terms of his current mental state, Dr. Lopez Aguilar claimed that there were no discernible issues. The defense contended that Orlando, who is not known for violence, may have been provoked, complicating our understanding of the events leading up to Haley's tragic death. After a 90-minute deliberation, Judge Fabiola Betancourt issued a verdict, finding Orlando guilty. She stated that Orlando's actions stemmed from his refusal to recognize Haley's autonomy in making relationship decisions. Judge Betancourt determined that Orlando killed Haley as a form of punishment for rejecting him. She sentenced Orlando to 30 years in prison for femicide, emphasizing all women's fundamental right to life. Broome County District Attorney Steve Cornwell, who has closely followed the case, remarked on the unprecedented collaboration between two governments and law enforcement agencies. Despite initial concerns, us authorities were pleased with the seriousness of the trial, emphasizing that it was not a mere spectacle, but a genuine legal proceeding. Orlando chose to appeal his conviction, which was heard by three Nicaraguan magistrates. The defense argued that Orlando was drunk and temporarily insane at the time of his murder. They did, however, request a new psychiatric evaluation for the appeal, preferring a forensic psychiatrist with experience in temporary insanity defenses over a court appointed psychiatrist, as was the case during the trial. During the appeal, the defense argued that Orlando should not have been charged with femicide, claiming that if convicted of second-degree murder in the United States, his sentence would have been shorter than the 30 years he received for femicide. They asked for a review of the sentence on this basis. However, the magistrates denied Orlando's request for a new psychiatrist and declined to reduce his sentence. He was ordered to remain in prison, serving the 30-year sentence imposed during the trial. Law enforcement officials in the United States have stated unequivocally that if Orlando is ever released and returns to the country, he will be arrested for second-degree murder. Karen and Gordon Anderson, Haley's parents, thanked the court for its decision. Karen admitted that she had not seen any remorse from Orlando, only regret for not being able to reduce his sentence. She stated that while she felt 30 years was insufficient, she appreciated the court's efforts to convict him to the fullest extent of the law. Gordon said he believed justice had been served and thanked the Nicaraguan court system. He stressed the importance of remembering Haley as a caring individual. She was a vibrant individual. She was a vibrant individual with a zest for life who was dedicated to spreading happiness and love. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today we'll look at a story from 2004 in New Jersey, USA. Brittany Gregory was born on April 1, 1988 in Brick Township, the youngest of five children in her family. Her parents divorced and she was left to live with her father, but she remained close to all of her siblings, particularly her sister Brianna, who was four years older than her. Brittany excelled in school, and her teachers expected her to become a scholar. Her unusual dream, however, was to become a forensic scientist and investigate crime scene evidence. Brittany enjoyed being the baby of the family. Her mother described her as spoiled but not vain or arrogant. She celebrated her 16th birthday in April by keeping her mother's promise to let her get her belly button pierced. She adored pop star Britney Spears and had posters of her up in her bedroom. She enjoyed cartoons, particularly SpongeBob SquarePants. She also couldn't get enough of TV shows about forensic science, which she wanted to pursue. She and her mother used to watch the same shows and then call each other to discuss what they were watching. In 2004, Brittany, 16, and her older sister, Brianna, 20, lived in a small house near their school with their father, Joe Don, and his new girlfriend, Lori Peterson. Brittany's father's house was the last one on the street, and it was near a wooded lot. Brittany had been dating 18-year-old John Fitzgerald for nearly two years. He was a nice guy who Brittany's family liked. They had a great relationship and were considered the ideal couple, at around 8.30 p.m. On Sunday, 
July 11, 2004, Brittany's mother Deborah and sister Brianna drove to the town of South Toms River, about 15 miles from Brittany's home, to visit her older brother and his wife, who had recently had a daughter. That evening, Brittany called her mother from her cell phone and requested a ride to her boyfriend John's house. The girl's voice was extremely upset, indicating potential trouble. Her mother explained that she was out of town and unable to drive Brittany, but that her sister Brianna could be there in about an hour. Brittany agreed, saying she'd wait for her. Brianna was free about 45 minutes after Brittany called, so she called her, but her sister did not answer. Brianna assumed Brittany was asleep or that someone else had brought her to John's. When Brianna returned home in the morning, she discovered Brittany was not there, but her belongings, including her phone, were still there. Brianna speculated that Brittany had spent the night at her boyfriend's house, but it seemed strange that she hadn't told anyone and had left her cell phone at home. It was not like her. Looking for answers, Brianna began calling all of Brittany's friends to see if they had seen her, but no one knew anything. Brianna decided to call John after unsuccessful attempts to contact her sister. He said he last spoke with Brittany on the phone Sunday morning, and they hadn't seen or spoken to each other since Brittany's father's friend Lori Peterson, who lived with them, said she returned home around 10 p.m. Brittany was not present on Sunday night. Brianna sensed something was wrong and went straight to the police station to report Brittany missing. The police initially dismissed Brianna's concerns about her sister's disappearance. They assumed the girl had simply run away from home or was out with friends. But Brianna persuaded the officers that she had already contacted all of her sister's friends and spoken with her boyfriend. But no one knew where Brittany might be. Brianna was certain her sister couldn't have run away from home because she was an honor student who spent the majority of her time in the library. Brittany never left the house without warning, and she left all of her belongings, including money and a phone, at home. Brianna persuaded the cops that her sister could not have run away from home on her own. The officers started their search. They first went to Brittany's house to inspect her room and look for clues. They ensured that Brittany's purse, containing her phone ID and makeup, was left in her room. The police found nothing suspicious in her room. They interviewed everyone who lived in the house and concluded that no one close to Brittany was involved in her disappearance. The police then began searching the area around the house. They inspected all of the houses in the area, walked around the property, and spoke with neighbors. They looked for witnesses who could have seen or heard something. The officers noticed that the house was at the end of the street, with a wooded area across the street, except for one woman who reported seeing Brittany walking down the street toward her house late Friday night when it was already dark. None of the neighbors saw anything suspicious. This occurred two days before Brittany's disappearance, and while the information appeared insignificant, investigators paid attention to it. This information contradicted the image of a modest girl who spent the majority of her time in the library and did not leave without her parents' permission. What made Brittany stay out so late? And was she allowed to go out at that time? The police were eager to determine whether Brittany was a true home girl, as her sister had described her. Numerous police interviews with her family, neighbors, and teachers revealed that no one had negative things to say about the girl. Everyone spoke highly of her. Brianna told the police that Brittany and her boyfriend John had a strained relationship recently. The couple had been arguing frequently, and on the day of her disappearance, Brittany and John had another fight. Brittany was upset, and she planned to visit John that evening to make amends. The investigators decided to look into John's identity more closely. They invited him to the police station to see if he saw Brittany on the day she went missing. John said his last phone call with Brittany was on Sunday morning. At the time, he was at the beach with friends, and Brittany was disappointed that he went without her. They argued about it and haven't spoken since. He also revealed that he had broken up with Brittany a few days ago, but she was unable to accept it. Even though she knew he was already dating another girl, John insisted that he had no plans to go out with Brittany that night and had no idea she was coming to his house. The rumor that Brittany kissed another guy at the party sparked their breakup. Despite the fact that he did not see it, John decided to end his relationship with her and start dating another girl. He last saw Brittany on July 10, the day before she vanished. She gave him a letter expressing her desire to reconcile. The detectives asked John for permission to read the letter Brittany had written and he handed it to them. Brittany apologizes in the letter for her behavior as well as for breaking John's heart. She also asked him to stay friends. John appeared genuinely concerned and worried that Brittany had not yet been found. The police found no evidence linking John to Brittany's disappearance, and after passing a lie detector test, he was removed from the suspect list. 
However, John did provide the detectives with one important detail. He claimed that Brittany frequently came to his house via the woods behind her father's house, and the story of Brittany's disappearance became increasingly complicated. Detectives began to wonder if Brittany attempted to reach John's house that night, which was about a mile from her father's house through the woods. It was already dark, and she might get lost or fall somewhere along the way. The police began a search in the woods where Brittany most likely passed. She may have walked along a path that began near her house. Being in the woods at night was frightening and dangerous. The question of why a young girl was not afraid to walk through the woods in the dark was perplexing. The search in the forest lasted three days, but nothing was discovered. When it appeared that the investigation had come to an end, the police were contacted by a woman who had been with her brother in a nearby park. The night Brittany disappeared, it was quiet and deserted, with only one car. The woman drove a Chevrolet pickup truck with distinctive wheels, and she noticed and remembered the car's license plate. Investigators discovered that the car was registered to Anthony Geiger, a 23-year-old. To determine Anthony's connection to Brittany's disappearance, police began investigating his past and discovered that he was Bobby Joe's ex-boyfriend. Brittany's sister, Bobby Joe, told detectives that they split up about a month ago because Anthony was overly jealous and focused too much on Brittany. She also stated that she began to suspect Anthony, who was 23 years old, had feelings for her younger sister, Brittany, and ultimately decided to end her relationship with him. Brittany's friends said Anthony always looked at her strangely and tried to flirt with her. They last met at lunch, when Anthony attempted to flirt with Brittany again. Detectives began to suspect Anthony of kidnapping Brittany and brought him in for questioning. During the interrogation, Anthony denied being in the neighborhood where Brittany lived on the evening of July 11. According to him, he did not arrive until the following day, July 12, when the police had already begun searching for the girl. He did not deny that he was on good terms with her and saw her frequently at parties and other gatherings, but he insisted that they were just friends and that he did not flirt with her. Anthony also stated that he knew Brittany was too young for him and that he only cared about her as a friend. Anthony testified that he spent the evening of July 11 at home with his new girlfriend. Although Anthony's girlfriend confirmed his alibi, investigators still suspected him because his house was close to Brittany's. Investigators returned to examine the letter Brittany had written to John and discovered disturbing signs that she was saying goodbye to her loved one. They became concerned that Brittany might be harming herself after ending her relationship with her boyfriend. Brittany's parents, however, rejected this version, believing that their daughter was intelligent and determined and that her breakup with her boyfriend would not prevent her from pursuing her dreams. They thought Brittany was overly passionate about life. After the investigation stalled again, the police decided to use the media to contact the public in search of potential witnesses. In addition, police officers from other areas joined the investigation to help. Brittany's parents also decided to take an active role in the search because they were tired of doing nothing but waiting. They decided it was time to take action and began going door to door, asking people in the neighborhood. But it did not work. The police decided to return to where it all began, Brittany's home. Even if she had decided to walk through the woods to meet her boyfriend, it remained unclear why she had left her phone in her room. Could she have been kidnapped right outside the house? If so, did she know the person? Did she trust him? Did she trust him? During a thorough search of the house, the police discovered something important in Brittany's room. Her personal diary, which contained a handwritten letter. The contents of this letter were extremely important to the police because they pierced the veil of secrecy surrounding family relationships. Brittany described her life, her relationships with her friends and boyfriend, her education, and how she prioritized her family. In particular, she wrote that she comes from a dysfunctional family, that she visits her older brother in jail every Sunday, that her mother is a drug addict who abandoned her when she was nine, and that she now lives with her father, with whom she is not particularly close, and his girlfriends. She also stated that she is not perfect and has done things she is not proud of. However, she does not want to be like her parents and wishes to succeed in life. She aspires to be a forensic scientist who helps solve crimes. After reading this letter, the police expanded their suspect pool and focused on Brittany's family, who had not previously been considered suspects. Detectives began checking on each member of Brittany's family and discovered that a male massage parlor was operating from her home. Lori Peterson, a friend of Brittany's father, serves various men every day. 
but everyone in the neighborhood knew she didn't give massages, but rather offered intimate services for a fee. It turned out that many people were aware of it, and Lori did not keep it a secret, handing out business cards throughout the area. Neighbors also reported that suspicious individuals frequently gathered at Brittany's father's home to use illegal substances for the police. This suggested that the atmosphere in Brittany's home was dysfunctional. Lori's services were sought by a number of men, the majority of whom she had never met. It was possible that one of her clients had taken Brittany from the house. More than 100 police officers began working to identify everyone who had visited Joe Dunn's house in the previous month. It was an extremely difficult task. However, a week after Brittany disappeared on July 18, police announced the arrest of a murder suspect. Brittany's family was shocked to hear the news because she had been reported missing and her body had yet to be found. When a picture of the suspect appeared on television, Brittany's mother, Deborah, recognized him. It turned out to be her longtime friend, 38-year-old Jack Fuller Jr., who had attended all of the family gatherings and had known them for 20 years. His daughter was engaged to Brittany's brother, who was incarcerated. Deborah was in shock. Why was Jack arrested and charged with murder when Brittany's body had never been found? The family couldn't believe Jack could have been involved in this case, given that his children were friends with Brittany. They hoped Brittany was still alive. Fuller, a hardened criminal, spent the majority of his adult life threatening his Howell neighbors. According to court documents and interviews, he broke into cars, houses, and garden sheds, used and sold drugs, threatened a man with a baseball bat, fought with police, and lied about his identity after being arrested for drunk driving. He has been arrested over a dozen times in the last decade alone. He has spent time in state prison for theft and parole violations. Neighbors claim that many of his crimes went unreported because people were afraid of him. The last time he was tried, he was tried. He was sentenced to five and a half years in prison and released a year before Brittany went missing. Brittany's parents assumed Jack would steal money or jewelry to buy drugs, but they didn't think he'd hurt their daughter. Shortly after Fuller's arrest, it became clear how the police had linked him to Brittany's disappearance. It all began with a call to the police station. The caller stated that he had met Jack a few days prior, who had complained to him about back pain that had developed after burying the girl's body in sandy soil. Jack assured him that the location where he had hidden the body would never be discovered, and he asked how deep the body should be buried so that the animals would not smell it. The police invited the informant to the station, suggested that he wear a listening device while meeting with Jack Fuller, and questioned him about the crimes, including the murder. The informant agreed, and during the meeting, Fuller revealed that he had buried the girl's body in a remote location and would never be discovered. He confessed to the murder, but never mentioned Brittany's name. In addition, Fuller stated that he needed to kill someone else who knew too much, referring to his friend Tommy, who was in the car and did not hear these remarks. The detectives were confident that Tommy knew something important that could aid in the investigation, or Jack Fuller would not have wanted to get rid of him. They went to Tommy's house and took him to the station for questioning, but he refused to cooperate, claiming that he knew nothing. The detectives knew he was lying, to prove their point. They played a recorded conversation in which Jack expresses his desire to kill Tommy because he knows too much. Tommy realizes he is in danger and agrees to cooperate with the police. He tells them that the night Brittany vanished, he and Jack were driving around the neighborhood while smoking crack. They came to a halt in front of Brittany's home, and Jack decided to go inside to speak with her father about some issues. When he entered the house, there was only Brittany. Five minutes later, Jack returned to the car with Brittany, who sat in the back. Tommy expressed confusion and inquired as to what was going on. Brittany didn't say anything. She lowered her gaze and Jack explained that he was about to take Tommy home. Tommy claimed Jack drove him home. When he got out of the car, Brittany, who was sitting in the back, also got out and took the front passenger seat. And then he and Jack drove away. When they met the next day, Jack said nothing about the previous day's events. They stopped at a car wash where Jack washed his car both inside and out. This was unusual because he had never attempted it before. The car wash attendant even made a joke about it. But Jack became enraged and told him to mind his own business or he'd risk his life. Tommy explained that when he learned about Brittany's disappearance, he suspected Jack was involved and asked him directly what he was doing with her. Jack became enraged by the question and stated that he had taken her home and left rudely, instructing him not to ask again if he did not want trouble. Tommy assumed Jack had taken Brittany to the woods to rape her because he intended to use Lori's intimate services that evening. 
But she wasn't at home. The detectives realize Jack is just the man for them. When they arrived to arrest him, Jack was holding a can of gasoline and appeared to be preparing to burn his car. Was he planning to burn the car to destroy the evidence? Yes, it appeared that he was conducting the search. Blood was discovered in the car, and forensics determined that it was Brittany's. When the police discovered that Jack had visited a car wash after his trip with Brittany, they went there and confiscated the vacuum cleaner he was using. A criminologist discovered sand particles stuck together by blood inside a vacuum cleaner. Testing confirmed that it was Brittany's blood. Despite the evidence in front of the police, Jack refused to confess to Brittany's kidnapping and murder. Detectives interviewed all of Jack's acquaintances, and the majority of them were convinced that he was capable of murder. Many described him as a man who could handle anything. Despite the fact that Jack never worked, he was always financially secure. During the investigation, it was discovered that on the night of Brittany's disappearance, one of the patrol officers observed a car parked on the side of the road near the woods. That was Jack Fuller's car. Brittany had gone missing, but this was unknown at the time. When the officer approached Jack, he explained that he was looking for his dog, which had run off into the woods. Given this information, the search for the body concentrated on the area where the officer spotted Jack's car. The search, which involved police officers, canine units, helicopters, and volunteers, was ultimately unsuccessful. Investigators suspected Brittany was desperate for someone to drive her to her boyfriend's house that night. When Jack arrived at her house, she asked him to do it. Jack agreed to transport her wherever she needed to go. Instead, he took his friend Tommy home and decided to exploit the situation by raping and killing Brittany. To prove it, her body had to be discovered. While the police were attempting to question Jack and extract a confession, another witness came forward. A woman called the cops, claiming that if Jack Fuller really killed Brittany, she might know where he hid her remains. This woman was a former drug addict who Jack once held hostage for months before escaping. During that time, she had grown to know Jack Welch and knew all of his secrets, including where he went and what he did. He frequently visited the same places and accompanied her. One day, he showed her a location near a power line and told her it was an excellent place to bury her because no one would ever find a body there. The detectives didn't believe the woman at first and began questioning her. She stated that the site was in Lakewood and the soil was sandy. The police immediately remembered the words of an informant who told them how Jack had complained to him about how difficult it was to bury a body in sandy soil. The authorities decided to conduct a search in the area the woman had mentioned. It was only three miles from Brittany's home. After several days of searching, no results were found. However, the police continued their search after experts discovered a perfect match between the sand from Fuller's vacuum cleaner at the car wash and the soil in the area. Every day, more than 100 people combed the dense forest that borders Monmouth and Ocean counties. Brittany's grave was discovered on Tuesday morning, July 27, 2004, 15 days after she had been reported missing. She was discovered by three New Jersey canine officers who had brought their dogs on a weekend search to assist. The young girl's naked body was discovered in a hole, accompanied by a necklace bearing Brittany's name. The detectives knew right away that they had finally found her. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy confirmed that it was Brittany Gregory's body, but he was unable to determine the exact cause of death due to the girl's strangulation and head trauma. I'm not going to deny that there was trauma to her head, but that was not the cause of death said Ocean County Executive Assistant Prosecutor Robert Gasser. The body had decomposed for two weeks, and the medical examiner says he cannot rule out strangulation or suffocation. Gasser stated that Brittany's body showed no obvious signs of sexual assault. However, the medical examiner did not rule out the possibility of rape. After consulting with his attorney, Jack Fuller agreed to a plea bargain. Brittany's family also agreed to the settlement to avoid a lengthy and difficult trial. Brittany's mother stated that she opposed the death penalty for Jack because it would be too easy for him. She wanted him to spend the rest of his life in prison, suffering and regretting his actions. Jack stated that Brittany asked him to take her to her boyfriend's house, and he agreed. He took Tommy home first, then planned to take Brittany to see her boyfriend. But first, he stopped on the side of the road and began smoking. This infuriated Brittany, who began yelling at him and slapping him on the arm. This irritated him, and he started punching Brittany. He admitted to punching her in the face and head at least twice after she tried to stop him from smoking again. Following the beating, Brittany began to make gasping and gurgling sounds. 
Fuller continued to get high as blood flowed from her nose and mouth. Brittany stopped breathing when he finally turned his attention to her. He realized she had died and decided to dispose of her body. However, his story was not believed because the medical examiner discovered evidence of strangulation on Brittany's body that Fuller had not mentioned. Furthermore, he did not explain why he had removed all of Brittany's clothing. The prosecution suspected that the crime was sexually motivated. On February 9, 2005, the Ocean County Grand Jury indicted Fuller on murder charges. On October 18, 2005, Fuller pleaded guilty to purposely and knowingly causing serious bodily injury that resulted in death. On January 13, 2006, he received a 30-year sentence without the possibility of parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Today's story is a poignant reminder of life's fragility and the devastating consequences of rash actions. Let this tragedy serve as a call to compassion, guiding collective efforts to prevent similar sorrow from befalling other families. Emily Longley was born on February 22, 1994, in the London Hospital. She was the first child in Mark and Caroline Longley's young family. Mark's friends teased him about becoming a father at 26. He felt completely unprepared for parenthood. He was present at the birth, and when the nurse cleaned the baby and handed her to him, he gently held her in his arms, her tiny head resting in his palms and her legs barely reaching his elbow. The girl opened her eyes and looked at her father. In that moment, Mark knew fatherhood would not be a problem for him. A few years later, the Longleys welcomed their second daughter, Hannah. The two blonde sisters adored each other and brought joy to their father. He was confident that keeping the kids warm and safe would show them how much he loved them. The girls grew up surrounded by their parents' unconditional love. They had an example of prosperity and happiness right in front of them. Mark Longley worked as a journalist for a local paper. Caroline was a teacher, and the girls had a bright future ahead of them, just as any parent would want for their children. Emily and Hannah Long Lee's lives were turned upside down 10 years later when their parents decided to relocate from their hometown of Bournemouth to the scenic landscapes of New Zealand. This was a huge change for everyone, as moving to another country was a big step. This difficult decision was made for Emily's health, based on the doctor's recommendation that she needed a change in climate. The longtime family traveled halfway around the world in the hopes of providing a better life for their daughters. As a result of its geographical features, New Zealand's climate varies. Most of New Zealand has a temperate maritime climate with four distinct seasons. The winters here are mild, and the summers are relatively cool. The Pacific Ocean and mountain ranges are significant contributors. The English family found the environment and atmosphere ideal. A new chapter has begun in the lives of the Long Leaves and their daughters. Emily attended a prestigious private school, and her life went on peacefully until she was metaphorically stabbed in the back by former classmates. Her friend Sarah Lee Turblanche caused a stir at school when she revealed that Emily had fallen in with the wrong crowd and was involved with banned substances. Sarah gave the school newspaper an interview about a party at Emily's house. After overcoming initial disappointments and betrayals, Emily returned to England at the end of 2010 to further her education. She moved in with her grandparents, Ronald and Zosie Longley, in a large detached cottage near the promenade in South Beach in Bournemouth, and enrolled in a British college, hoping for a new beginning in her life. Emily, who had struggled in school, adapted to a more relaxed student life and thrived. Emily made progress, balancing her studies at Brockenhurst College in Hampshire with a job at the Topshop clothing store. Well, at 16. Emily Longley was a vibrant, cheerful, and ambitious young woman with stunning blonde beauty. Her radiant appearance helped her achieve early success in the modeling industry. Emily's captivating charm and irresistible charisma set her apart in her community. In December 2010, at a party she met 19-year-old Elliot Vince Turner. Elliot was the only son of Lee Turner, a wealthy and successful jeweler. He worked at his father's jewelry store in Bournemouth, and lived with his family in the affluent Queen's Park neighborhood. He was a member of the firm, a group of affluent young men who frequented local bars and clubs in Bournemouth and Poole. Elliot Turner, who drew the attention of many women, 
appeared almost obsessed with them. Nonetheless, they quickly became a couple. Elliot was deeply committed to his girlfriend, who had begun modeling and earning her first income. She began to attract the attention of many men, and Elliot's jealousy of Emily grew intense. Within four months, their relationship had devolved into a battleground of constant disagreements and mutual grievances. Emotional abuse became the norm in this tumultuous relationship, characterized by Elliot's worrying behavior and unending jealousy. If he didn't like her outfit, he would accuse her of looking like a call girl. He hacked her Facebook account to track her activities and conversations. He also showed up and announced when she was not present. He used his strength and anger to intimidate Emily after she wrote him a note saying, Stop acting so aggressive, however. Each incident was followed by remorse and apologies, only for the cycle to continue. Elliot eventually went from verbal threats to physical actions. He grabbed her throat and punched her in public several times. He then justified his actions, blaming Emily for his uncontrollable emotional outbursts. Emily became concerned for her life as a result of the constant arguments and fights. She took a break and went on a holiday with her parents to New Zealand. This was the Longleys' best Easter holiday ever. Hannah and Emily hung out as they had done in the past. They walked a lot, laughed a lot, and spent a lot of time together, as if they were expecting to say goodbye soon. Her father hugged her tightly as they said their goodbyes. She agreed to return in September for the Rugby World Cup. Already aboard the plane, she sent her father a message. It was so nice to see you. I love you. They had had a special bond between father and daughter since she was born. Emily was last seen alive by her family. She went back to the UK, intending to end her relationship with Elliot. This occurred. But unfortunately, at the expense of a promising young woman's life. Elliot met his girlfriend not with flowers, but with a new set of accusations and disagreements. Elliot came across photos of Emily with two shirtless young men on social media before she returned from New Zealand. Jealous, he invited her to spend the night at his house. Despite their disagreement, Emily agreed to return to Elliot's family home to talk about their problems, comforted by the presence of Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita. Her arrival at the house was met with a barrage of jealousy and insults. The young couple frequently yelled and argued. A half hour of yelling was followed by silence. On May 7, 2011, Emergency services received a call that 17-year-old Emily Longley had been discovered unconscious in bed. Nina Turner called after discovering the girl in her son's bedroom. Rescuers arrived on the scene and were only able to confirm her death. Following the girl's death, neighbors noticed Turner sitting in the ambulance with his head in his hands. Elliot Turner was arrested immediately following Emily's death, but he was later released on bail pending further investigation. The investigation began following the tragic incident. Turner J.R., consumed by guilt, wrote a confession. His parents, determined not to lose their only son, intentionally withheld critical evidence, delaying the investigation. On the night of the incident, Anita Turner, 51, and Lee Turner, 53, removed a coat from their son's house, retrieved the confession letter from its pocket, and doused it with bleach, destroying vital evidence. During the investigation, it was decided to secretly install listening devices in the expansive Turner family home on May 18th. After gathering evidence from a family discussion about fabricating evidence and concerns about lying to police, the police searched the household computers for additional evidence, which they discovered. A look at the browser's search history revealed searches for death by strangulation and how to avoid a murder charge. In July, all three family members were arrested and charged with being involved in the incident and intentionally concealing evidence. Elliot Turner denied any involvement, blaming Emily for his troubles. A forensic reconstruction of the incident revealed that Elliot and Emily engaged in a struggle on that fateful day. Elliot used force to subdue her, pressing her face down on the bed with a pillow. He then threw away the pillow and continued to strangle her with his hands. When she fell silent, he stood up and exited the room. Pathologists examined Emily's body and discovered injuries consistent with strangulation. Elliot had scratches on his arm, and Emily's fingertips contained his DNA, indicating a struggle between them. Elliot's behavior toward Emily was described in court as threatening, aggressive, violent, controlling, and possessive. These concerning characteristics worsened, and on a fateful night in May 2011, a heated argument broke out between the couple over Emily's choice of outfit and her photos with unknown men. The wealthy family could not afford to lose their son and damage their reputation. 
Elliot's hired lawyers vigorously defended him. The defense tried to downplay the tormentor's role in the young woman's death, claiming she may have used drugs. However, the Dorset police conducted an independent, toxic, and illogical examination that revealed no drugs or other prohibited substances in the victim's bloodstream. The affluent jeweler and his wife, who disposed of evidence to help cover up how their jealous son ended the life of the aspiring New Zealand model Emily Longley. At 20 years old, Elliot Turner was found guilty by a jury at Winchester Crown Court and may have killed 17-year-old Emily in his bed after a fit of jealous rage. Judge Dobbs stated during his sentencing that he intimidated, stalked, threatened, and assaulted Emily in order to maintain control over her as his trophy girlfriend. The judge also advised Elliot to abandon thoughts of Champagne Bentleys and girls as he sentenced him to life in prison, stating that he must serve at least 16 years before being eligible for parole. His parents are live 54 and Nita 51. We were sentenced in the same court after being convicted of obstructing justice by concealing evidence. They concealed the crime by destroying their son's confession letter and removing critical evidence from their Bournemouth home. Their son was sentenced to nine months in prison for obstructing justice by concealing evidence. The prosecution claimed Turner suffocated Emily with a pillow before strangling her after she returned to his home to discuss their situation following a heated argument that night. Emily's father, Mark Longley, called Elliot Turner evil and expressed his wish that Turner would suffer every day in prison. Elliot Turner was found guilty of ending her life in May 2012 and sentenced to life in prison. His parents, Anita Turner and Lee Turner, were both imprisoned. They were sentenced to 27 months in prison for misleading the police about the incident and destroying their son's confession note. Because it was a homicide investigation, the police kept her body, and it wasn't until September that she could be brought home in a closed casket. The Turners were released in 2013. Turner's reduced sentence appeal was denied the same year. However, British judges ruled otherwise during hearings in the High Court of London. It's clear that, due to wounded pride, he harbored thoughts of ending her life for a long time, eventually leading to her death. Lord Chief Justice Royce Justice Globe stated in his verdict that Simon Jones, one of the successful prosecutors, stated following the sentence that Emily's death was the result of domestic violence. Elliot stated, I never wanted to hurt her. I was simply defending myself. Elliot Turner, Emily Long Lee's perpetrator, is currently serving a life sentence in a Kent prison for the brutal murder of the young aspiring model. The court determined that he would not be eligible for parole for at least 16 years. Turner, according to the Daily Star, has decorated the walls of his prison cell with photos of Emily, indicating a disturbing and possibly obsessive relationship with his victim. Surprisingly, while behind bars, Turner reportedly expressed his desire to return to a life of champagne, Bentleys and birds. Such an attitude raises concerns about his lack of remorse and the possibility of continuing harmful behavior after release. Furthermore, Elliot's parents, Lee and Anita Turner, were imprisoned for perverting justice by destroying their son's confession letter and tampering with evidence at the crime scene. This emphasizes the gravity of the situation and the collective impact of the Turner family's actions on the pursuit of justice for Emily Longley. Following the conclusion of the trial, Emily's father began to investigate domestic violence. He portrayed Elliot as an abuser using patterns and behaviors. He was constantly thinking about ending her life. It was simply a matter of time. To love someone means not attempting to control their lives, calling them derogatory names or isolating them from their friends. That is not love. A woman is treated as a trophy. Such relationships are solely focused on retrieving the man from Emily's father's memories. He treated Emily cruelly before she returned to New Zealand, but she did not tell us anything. I'm not sure why, but if she had, things might have turned out differently. Now I don't think of Turner or his family. He is in prison, and I hope he suffers every day. If I think too much about what he did, my anger rises, and it is the type of anger that can consume you. He never thought about the people who had loved, cherished, and raised Emily for the previous 17 years. He stood behind her, wrapped his arms around her neck, and took her life. Even now, years later, it's difficult to believe anyone could do this to Emily. After the tragedy, Emily's parents divorced. However, they continue to struggle with anniversaries and birthdays. Easter is particularly difficult because it was the family's last holiday together. On May 6, 2011, Emily was still alive. 
She was chatting on Facebook with her father just a few hours before the incident occurred. She appeared normal and happy with no hint of fear. On May 7th, everything changed. Emily's father awoke after receiving a phone call. He did not respond right away. By the time he awoke, he had several missed calls from his ex-wife, Caroline, as well as multiple messages on his cell phone. Texts from her were not uncommon, but the volume of calls and messages was concerning. Finally, he picked up an incoming call. It was his younger daughter, Hannah, crying inconsolably on the other end in the background. He could hear his ex-wife screaming, Emily is gone, Emily's gone. He broke down while sitting on the same couch Emily had sat on just a week before. What was she going to do after college? This could not be true. How could such a vibrant young girl be gone? He couldn't remember anything else about that night. According to Emily's father's recollections, he did not sleep until he boarded the plane for England. I recall being driven to Auckland, stopping in a small town to refuel, and seeing Emily's photograph on the front page of the Herald. I thought I was going to get sick right there in the station while reading the headline, or at the airport. People were throwing their copies in the trash, and I wanted to tell them who she was and that they should keep the newspaper. It felt like an eternity before Mark Longley arrived in England. He was still shocked, unable to believe that his visit to his once loved England was to identify his beloved daughter Emily. He still hoped there had been an error. They took him straight to the morgue, where Emily's body lay. He stood in a room with Caroline, a police officer, and the mortician, who pointed to a window and announced that the body was in the next room. The mortician pointed to the window the light would turn on, allowing them to enter the room when they were ready. The light turned on. Mark and Caroline, their hands cold with horror, stood unable to cross the threshold of that room. They were prepared to scream that it was not their daughter, but it was her. Emily was lying on the gurney, covered in a purple sheet, and appeared to be sleeping. Her father approached and touched her face. Emily's father remembered her skin as smooth but icy cold, with a beautiful alabaster hue. I wanted to flee and pretend I hadn't witnessed it. But I stood there, holding her hand, staring at the face I had studied so closely when she was born. Except now, her eyes were closed, and I realized this was no joke. She wasn't going to sit up and say, Boo Emily, my daughter, had left. In the midst of such horror, all tomorrows become yesterday. When a flood of emotions pours down, bombarding and overwhelming the soul, you realize your complete helplessness. Emily's parents saw her for the last time that day in the morgue. The pain of losing someone does not get any easier. Time does not heal. It simply teaches you to live with it. Everyone always commented on Emily's beauty, and it continues to be discussed. She had a wonderful, warm, and loving side to her personality. She would approach you, wrap her long arms around you, and give you a tight hug. But most of all, Emily's family misses the woman she could have become. They will never know how her life would have turned out. A life denied to her. Years later, Emily's father remarried. He has a wonderful wife, Hillary, and a lovely son, Hunter, who is growing up in their household. Hannah, Emily's younger sister, has graduated from university and established her own life, free of domestic violence. Their greatest regret is that Emily is not present to share the joyful moments with them. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Love Quadrangle has sharp corners. If Dave Krupa had known how his online dating would turn out, he would not have registered on a dating site. He would have continued to live his old life with his girlfriend Amy Flora and their two children. Maybe he would have legalized the 12-year relationship after all, especially since Amy and Dave remained close friends after their breakup. They took periodic vacations with their children, fulfilling their parental responsibilities to perfection. That was in 2011. And by the summer of 2012, Dave was ready to begin a new relationship. Only the man was not looking for a commitment and preferred to remain single. He wanted to meet women who were open to a casual relationship and did not have long-term goals. With these thoughts, he went to a dating site where everyone is looking for something unique. The modern world has brought with it new technologies that allow you to communicate at a distance, avoiding many nuances, the awkwardness of the first acquaintance, the appearance at the same time, and the fear of being rejected. 
meeting someone you're interested in has become much easier. It is sufficient to select the intended partner based on a set of characteristics specified by him in the questionnaire leaving the house for this is unnecessary however, who is hiding behind a cute avatar profile is unknown, and whether he corresponds to those features that describe him and the true goals of dating are not always voiced in advance and discovered later in the relationship. Carrie Leia Farver was born on November 30, 1974, in Macedonia, Nebraska, USA. She had previously failed relationships. Her son, Max Maxwell, was raised entirely by her. Initially, the child served as both a reward and a challenge for her. Despite her strong feelings for the baby she wants, she spent a month in bed, deep in depression. Kari's mother, Nancy Rainey, cared for the child despite her difficult relationship with the child's father. Unsettled living conditions contributed to the appearance of a young, 20-year-old woman in such a heightened psychological state. Doctors eventually diagnosed Farver with bipolar disorder. People with this diagnosis are like two halves of the same coin. The individual experiences extremes his mood becomes either too good or too bad. Euphoria, increased efficiency, and extreme friendliness give way to depression, bitterness, impotence, and other negative emotions. The disease severely disrupts a person's normal life. However, in the early 2000s, Kari's doctor discovered an effective treatment for her, allowing her to live a normal life. The question of whether she wanted to settle her personal life is rhetorical. On the one hand, undoubtedly, what woman does not desire a worthy companion? On the other hand, why tie yourself to someone who could later become the source of many problems and misfortunes? Carrie grew up in a loving family, had an active lifestyle, participated in sports, and aspired to become a doctor. However, dreams were not permitted to materialize. At her first practice at the medical college, the girl lost consciousness when she saw blood. As a result, she decided not to put her own or her patient's health at risk. She studied to be a programmer. In the fall of 2012, Carrie was offered a good job in Omaha, a neighboring city. She couldn't pass up the opportunities that lay ahead of her, so she accepted the offer. Since Max was in middle school, he did not want to leave his familiar surroundings and relocate with his mother. He continued to live with his grandmother in Macedonia. Amy Long, Carrie Farver's friend, recalled how she couldn't help but be noticed. When she walked into a room, everyone focused on her and her radiant smile. Perhaps that's what Dave Krupa liked about her on that November day in 2012. Carrie met Dave at the auto repair shop where he works. While looking at Carrie's Ford Explorer, he realized he was very attracted to her. She was showing me something inside the car, and we were standing there, very close, with some tension. Dave later recalled how quickly the date arrived. And then they went up to Dave's house, only to have their privacy invaded by numerous calls and messages from a certain Liz, who later stopped by the man's apartment to pick up something left for her earlier. David informed Kari that this was his former partner, Liz Goliar, whom he met on a dating site about six months ago and had been dating for a while. He also explained that the woman was extremely clingy, which was the cause of their breakup. Kari was very understanding, so she was not surprised when she noticed another woman in the man's apartment. After all, everyone has a unique handle on this suitcase from the past that occasionally makes itself known. So Kari remained unconcerned but Liz was clearly disturbed to see a strange woman in Dave's home. Two weeks after moving in, Carrie started dating Dave. They had previously discussed their relationship and agreed to a brief, unencumbered affair. Shanna Elizabeth Goliar, also known as Liz, was the first person Dave met online in 2012. Liz was born in 1975 in Michigan. Dave liked her at first she claimed that she was not looking for a serious relationship, especially since she was a mother and that she should spend the majority of her time with her children rather than men. By the way, they both had children of similar ages. Dave repeatedly stated that Liz was unlikely to be a real-life partner for him. She wasn't well-read or educated, which was important in a man-woman relationship. They had few topics of conversation, and the relationship was more focused on the horizontal. Liz became curious about what Dave was doing in her absence and who he was seeing, but the man repeatedly reminded her that they were in an open relationship and she shouldn't be concerned. Dave also told her that she could do whatever she wanted and that he did not stop her from dating other men. However, Liz appears to be dissatisfied with this. She began to pester Dave more and more. Liz was most envious of Dave's children and their mother, 
Amy, she couldn't understand how they maintained a warm relationship after their breakup. Liz's actions eventually drove Dave away. Then Carrie appeared on the horizon. Carrie was beautiful and intelligent. Dave could talk to her for hours and they agreed on everything. I felt as if I had hit the jackpot. Dave claimed and Liz, sensing that the man was drifting away from her, began to remind him of himself through increased activity. She texted, emailed, and called. He wasn't about to stop seeing Carrie or anyone else for her. Carrie and Dave started spending more and more nights together. Dave allowed himself to do this because it was convenient for Carrie to get to work, and he liked her company. Carrie pretended she wasn't looking for anything serious and was simply enjoying herself. In December 2015, Liz was shot. The woman probably guessed who it was. Fortunately, the wound did not prove fatal. This cannot continue any longer. I need to do something about it. Liz reflected. On November 13, 2012, I will leave for work. Carrie kissed Dave and agreed to see him later. It was the last time he saw her at 9.45 a.m. The contents of a text message from Carrie caught Dave off guard at work. She texted him that she wanted to live with him permanently. Crop was very perplexed by the correspondence he couldn't understand Farver's abrupt shift in mood. They had agreed beforehand that they would not rush into a relationship. They were as happy as they were today. However, the message conveyed a different story. Dave gently replied that he was not prepared for such a change. Kari's counter message was unpleasant. A lot of profanity. He explained the message. I wasn't sure what to think. I was shocked. When he returned to the apartment, he discovered that all of Kari's belongings that she had brought him were gone. Apparently, that is why he believed the woman had abandoned him. The same day, Carrie deleted him from her Facebook friends list. That appears to be the end of it. However, Dave began receiving text messages and emails from Carrie multiple times per day. They contained curses and threats that would ruin his life. There were so many of them, and everyone was rude. Carrie also failed to show up for work, which was unusual given her reputation for punctuality. Carrie Farver sent strange messages to Dave Krupa, her mother, and her 15-year-old son. She wrote that she had found a job in Kansas and planned to take Max with her, but she wants to be alone right now because she is worried about her failed romance. In May 2013, Carrie and her Facebook profile published a lengthy post titled, I've answered enough questions to prove to everyone that I've had enough. You can either believe I'm your daughter, mother, sister, and lifelong friend, or just leave me alone. I left of my own free will, and all I can think about is how everyone was criticizing me for doing what I had to. I do not miss it. I really don't want to go home right now. I am a grown woman. And if I want to leave the house, I can. So when I'm ready, I'll come home. I apologize for simply walking away after causing harm to everyone. Time has passed. However, Carrie never showed up. The woman's mother realized something was wrong with her daughter when she missed her own birthday, Max's birthday, and other family gatherings. The last straw was her father's funeral. After a while, Liz Goliar began receiving messages from Carrie. She insulted and humiliated the woman in them, and some of the messages included a threat to avoid Dave. Liz decided to contact the man so that he could explain her friend's strange behavior. He informed her that he was in the exact same situation. Curry bombarded him with messages and emails. They've got it. The woman accused her ex-lover of all sins, referred to him as a lecturer, and promised vengeance for all the pain he had caused her in response. Sometimes the messages were ominous, informing her of Dave's current activities. Dave and Liz grew closer as a result of their shared situation. He felt even more guilty about the inconvenience he'd caused her. Carrie's constant messages became increasingly threatening. The text was illogical and filled with grammatical errors. Kari's mother insisted that her daughter had never been angry and that she had always written letters and other documents properly. Carrie was meticulous about spelling and style. Did Kari's bipolar disorder progress to something more after a second trigger? Could it be that she had experienced more severe mental abnormalities? Kari's actions had no explanation other than her out of control mental state. The presence of a separate self-consciousness and ego is the most obvious sign of dissociative identity disorder, also known as split personality. At the same time, each of them has a unique memory, thinking style, and even tendencies towards specific actions. Could this explain Kari's strange behavior and altered writing style? Everything indicated the woman's instability. This is why the police did not consider Kari Farver missing.
Liz and Dave's pursuit was the primary concern. They attempted to track Kari using her cell phone. However, it was all in vain. The signals were being blocked. Liz and Dave were still getting hundreds of text messages and emails. Even when they were together, their phones would occasionally receive threatening messages simultaneously. The couple continued to date, but they were uncomfortable around Liz, who became more demanding. Carrie continued to claim that she was fine with their no-commitment relationship, but every time they fought with Liz and ended his relationship with her, she texted more frequently. We were both victims. Liz explains that Dave and I shared something that no one else did. Common problems brought the young people closer together, and they returned to each other time and again. In January 2013, Dave found Kari's car in his front yard. Surprisingly, the fingerprints on the steering wheel did not belong to Kari, and the car was generally clean, with no suspicious traces found. The police later handed over the car to Farver's parents. Kari continued to write to Liz and Dave, eventually sending pictures of their children and threatening to harm them if Dave didn't leave Liz alone. Time passed with no results. Kari's maniacal stalking continued. As Dave continued to socialize with other women, Liz's jealousy irritated him even more. He grew tired of what was going on in his life and eventually mustered the courage to end his relationship with Liz. Soon afterwards, another tragedy happened. Liz Goliar reported a house fire in August 2013 that killed all of her pets, which included a snake, a cat, and two dogs. Liz informed the police that she suspected Carrie was to blame for what happened. The woman had repeatedly threatened her through texts and emails. The incident was a watershed moment in the investigation into Kari's disappearance. Carrie Farver was placed on a federal wanted list, and it was determined that each of the tens of thousands of messages would be thoroughly investigated. Dave and Liz's cell phones were seized by law enforcement. Krupa believed he was in danger, so he purchased a gun for protection. There was a reason why someone broke into the auto repair shop where he worked and threw a brick through his window. Kari seemed to be angry at everyone in Dave's life. After a while, Kari began sending threatening messages to his children's mother, Amy Flora. Because the man spent so much time with his children, he also saw Amy frequently. The police grew suspicious. Why would a man who had only dated for less than two weeks and three years now stalk him and his ex-girlfriends? It didn't make sense. Carrie Farver's relatives were also relentlessly searching for the missing woman, using every resource available to them. And eventually, in the spring of 2015, the efforts paid off. Detectives Ryan Avis and Jim Doty offered to help solve Carrie Farver's disappearance. They discovered no evidence that Carrie was alive. Here's what one of them told ABC News, it's not normal for adults to simply pick up and leave without spending anything. Nobody noticed her, and no one heard her voice. It simply doesn't make sense. She had a good income and a nice home. I've concluded that I cannot prove she is alive. Detectives worked with Anthony Kawa, the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office's digital forensics administrator, to review content downloaded from Krupa and Goliar's phones in 2013. According to Kawa, Kari Farver sent Dave over 50,000 texts and 15,000 emails over a three-year period. Kawa went on to say that whoever was impersonating Carrie became increasingly sophisticated in their efforts to hide their IP address and their true identity. Someone obviously knew what they were doing, as they were either familiar with or had access to a variety of computer programs. In December 2015, Liz Goliar contacted the police again, reporting that she had been shot in the leg on the doorstep of her own home. She said it was Amy Flora, not Kari. She was the person she recognized as her attacker. Dave was also missing a gun that Amy might have had access to. Could this woman be responsible for Kari's disappearance? There was a lead in the investigation. It clarified why everyone connected to Dave Krupp was being harassed. It's possible that Amy, who hasn't settled her personal life since her breakup with her children's father, decided to exact revenge by eliminating all competitors. This is especially true given Dave and Amy's long-standing positive relationship. The joint children brought them closer together, while foreign women clearly prevented them from reconciling. Amy was questioned by the police, who responded quickly. But, to everyone's surprise, she had an alibi. She had not been at Liz's house during the shooting. This was confirmed by multiple people, so no arrests were made. The investigation became increasingly confusing. At the same time, new information was obtained from specialists who were processing data from Liz's cell phone. 
Ishikawa discovered fake email addresses with variations of Farver's names from Goliar's phone, revealing valuable information. Investigators also discovered an app she used to schedule text messages to be sent at specific times. This could explain why she and Dave were receiving messages from Carrie around the same time Kawa became suspicious of Liz Goliar. When Liz's fingerprints were compared to those found on Kari's steering wheel, the puzzle began to fall into place. They were the perfect match. It was clear who the culprit was. The killer had been around for years, and no one knew who else had been affected by her actions. One thing was clear the case needed to be closed as soon as possible. The only thing left to do was avoid scaring Liz away or better yet, catch her red-handed. Something had to be done to knock the woman off balance. The detectives decided to fabricate a story about allegedly believing Liz. Amy is still the primary suspect. Liz took the bait. She was overjoyed that she would finally be able to get rid of another rival who was interfering with her relationship with Dave. Shortly after, Liz Goliar handed the police an email she claimed was from Amy. Amy admitted to kidnapping Carrie in that email, which also included details about the crime. According to the confession, Carrie was stabbed in the stomach or chest before being disposed of. The letter also included information about Carrie's car and home, which was not made public. The details were chilling because they were graphic, and an investigative spokeswoman claimed Liz gave detectives information that only a true criminal could have. Thus, she inadvertently confessed to Carrie Farver's murder. The letter clearly stated that the crime had occurred in the car. As a result, it was decided to conduct another examination of the victim's car. After the specialist removed the seat covers and fabric, they discovered a blood stain belonging to the missing Carrie Farver. How did Liz manage to poison messages on Carrie's behalf while avoiding suspicion? According to some sources, Liz Goliar led a double life, dating both Dave and a man named Garrett. The latter lived on an IP address that was identified as the origin of messages bearing Carrie's name. During our conversation, we discovered that he had been dating Shanna Goliar, also known as Liz, for quite some time. Out of kindness, the man invited Shanna to live with him and his children after the fire. However, the two's relationship became complicated and deteriorated significantly after they started living together. Garrett would watch over Goliar's children while she secluded herself in her room or went elsewhere. The man was astounded by what the police told him. Goliar spent 40 to 50 hours per week pretending to be the missing woman. Her room was a mess, but no significant evidence was discovered. However, investigators discovered several cell phones and electronics in her last apartment in late December 2016. Shanna Goliar is charged with first-degree murder. The county prosecutor discussed the complexities of the court investigation. The majority of murders are dark. This crime was so bizarre that it would take some convincing to believe it happened. There is no way anyone would have let their dog die in a fire they started themselves. There is no way anyone would have shot themselves in the thigh. However, Shanna Goliar did it to avoid suspicion. James Martin Davis, Shanna Goliar's attorney, hoped the case would fall apart because it relied primarily on circumstantial evidence. Kari's body was never discovered, nor was the crime weapon. Goliar never confessed. There was no evidence that Kari died at all. The defense team chose a mistrial, which means that a judge, not a jury, will determine Shanna's guilt. Mountains of complicated electronic evidence were presented alongside physical evidence. However, the prosecution insisted that the amount of blood found on Kari's car's passenger seat was consistent with a stabbing confession obtained from the IP address where Shanna lived. Investigators were able to establish Shanna's direct involvement in Kari's murder. Deleted images, including a photo of a human foot with a Chinese symbol tattooed on it, were recovered from a tablet in Dave's possession after analyzing the memory card she was using at the time Carrie went missing. The foot clearly belonged to a man who had died many years before. In addition, Carrie had a similar tattoo. Later, the woman's mother confirmed that the tattoo actually belonged to her daughter. The photograph confirmed Shanna Goliar's conviction. The judge convicted her of first-degree murder and sentenced her to life in prison with no possibility of parole. He stated that Carrie Farver did not disappear voluntarily. It is extremely unfortunate that she was murdered. Authorities believe Shanna was murdered. Carrie allowed her body to decompose before burning the remains to eliminate any trace of evidence. She decided to get rid of her rival, most likely out of jealousy. After disposing of her, she purposefully took her cell phone to make Farver look insane and regain Dave's trust. 
When her plans were successful, Shanna wanted to free her lover from Amy as well, but she became so engrossed in the game that she ended up falling into a trap of her own design. It's a bloody love square, to say the least. Goliar was also found guilty of setting fire to her own home in August 2013, which she tried desperately to blame on Carrie, because the fire not only destroyed the house but also killed pets. She received another 20 years in prison. The woman is currently incarcerated at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women. Shanna maintains her innocence. Dave admitted to receiving thousands of emails and text messages signed by Carrie over the years. However, he never noticed her stalking him while they were together, which Shanna cannot claim. He also stated, I want her to leave and not do this to anyone else. Justice has been served. For a long time, Kari Farver's name was on everyone's mind. She was innocently accused of stalking people and burning down Shanna's house. Carrie is now recognized as a victim, and her good name has been restored. Kari's mother wanted her daughter to be remembered as a fun, intelligent, and talented woman. So what happened to Carrie's son Maxwell Farver of Macedonia? According to his LinkedIn profile, he followed in his mother's footsteps and became a computer programmer. He graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in software engineering and data science before marrying. It's unlikely that he was able to forget what happened, but he could have found solace in the family he built as a result of his past. Dave Krupa has now decided to live away from the limelight. In fact, he does not have a public account on any social media platform. The chilling crime story is a brutal reminder of the tangled complexities that can arise in human relationships as a result of various forms of manipulation which can sometimes go to extreme lengths to maintain control of the situation. It is a story about how vulnerable we can be in our familiar surroundings without understanding the true nature of humans. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Pike County Carnage The crime committed against eight Roden family members became one of Ohio's most notorious and complex cases. Overnight, the motto all for one, one for all proved fatal for each family member. Only minor children were spared from the widespread violence. The investigation spanned 10 states in the United States and detectives conducted over 600 interviews resulting in approximately 700 witness statements. Several theories were proposed, including self-harm retaliation by illegal drug dealers and cult sacrifices. Attorney General Mike DeWine suspected local residents of withholding critical information. The investigation appeared to have reached a dead end until a solution appeared on the surface. As it turns out, the most complex situations are frequently rooted in simplicity. This story shows how familial bonds turned into a bloodbath. In Pike County, Ohio, USA, it all started with a crush. Hannah Mae Roden was 13 when she met Edward Jake Wagner, who was 18 years old. The young man asked her to the prom. They became inseparable after that evening, and their relationship elicited mixed feelings. Unquestionably, the love that grew between them was visible to the naked eye. On the other hand, the age gap raised numerous questions and concerns. However, the young couple's parents did not interfere with their relationship. After all, everybody was young once. Over time, the Roden and Wagner families began spending weekends and parties together. Love was passionate and carefree. Hannah announced her pregnancy at the age of 15. Jake was overjoyed when he heard the news. He anticipated how excited his family would be about the new addition. Wagner highly valued traditions and lineage, which is why he adored his children, who represented the continuation of their lineage. Even ancestral names were passed down through generations. Jake's father was named George Wagner III, and his brother George Wagner for the Rodens had a more straightforward, less ostentatious approach to children. However, this did not diminish their family values. Hannah's parents, Christopher and Dana Roden, remained close and united after their divorce. They adored their three children and worked tirelessly to ensure their well-being. Unlike Wagner, the Rodens had a modest income. Christopher, 40, worked as a handyman at the Big Bear Lake family complex. Dana was 37 years old and worked as a nurse's aide at a youth rehabilitation center. Nonetheless, they instilled humanity and diligence in Christopher, Jr. 
Hannah and Clarence Frankie were overjoyed with the arrival of little Sophie. To commemorate her birthday, a large party was planned. Soon after, Jake suggested that Hannah move in with him and his family, claiming that it would make their lives more comfortable. Living in a trailer makes it difficult to argue this point. His logic appeared sound, but Hannah declined. By then, she had a better understanding of her partner and saw the invitation as an attempt to limit her independence. Furthermore, the caring and attentive young man had developed suspicion and aggression. Jake had used physical aggression on several occasions, and his rough behavior soured Hannah's feelings for him. Her refusal became a source of contention for Wagner. Now, both Sophie's parents were determined to gain full custody of the girl. The families started advocating for their own interests. Driven by his desire, Jake threatened his beloved after she refused to sign a document transferring custody rights to him and his brother. In a fit of rage, he intended to message her, stating that if necessary, he would take the daughter by force. If you truly loved her, you would not be able to resist. He claimed that you would have given her up long ago to be raised in a safe environment. For some reason, he thought the rodents were a danger to Sophie. Such conversations continued for two years during which Jake became increasingly tyrannical. Hannah grew tired of being in complete control and ended the relationship in March 2015. Furthermore, she had learned something alarming Jake's brother, George IV, had taken custody of a son by threatening the boy's mother with a weapon. This confirmed that the Wagners saw moral and physical coercion as acceptable ways to protect themselves and their daughter from this unscrupulous family, and the young Roden decided to distance herself. She intended to raise her daughter alone while working as a nurse's assistant and finishing school. The situation deteriorated when everyone learned of Hannah's second pregnancy. Jake questioned her claim that the child was from another man. He attempted to find out if she was seeing anyone else. So in December 2015, he hacked her social media accounts but discovered nothing incriminating. At the end of his search, he discovered that the woman was communicating with Georgia about her former mother-in-law, which piqued his interest. A court case was soon to follow, during which the Wagners had numerous interactions with the woman. They'll have to kill me before they can take custody of my daughter, Hannah stated in her message. Jake infuriated his family when he revealed the details of the correspondence. Then his maternal grandmother, Rita Newcomb, 65, forged an important custody document. Furthermore, during a court hearing to determine the granddaughter's residence, Christopher Roden and George Wagner, the third, had a heated argument. The family's relationship eventually deteriorated completely. The Wagner family soon came up with a terrible idea. Hannah was so uncooperative that they felt compelled to eliminate her, as well as the entire Roden family, who could potentially claim custody of Sophie. This insane thought evolved into a monstrous plan that was finalized by Christmas 2016. People's thoughts during the holiday season are typically focused on love and creation, which is not true for the Wagner couple who organized the vote. It was decided whether they would carry out their plan, and all family members agreed. The only thing left to do was assign roles and prepare. Five months were spent investigating the Roten homes and surveillance cameras. They pay special attention to their daily routines and work schedules. Everyone involved in the criminal plot was accountable for something. For example, Angela Wagner purchased sneakers for all family members to wear at a specific time. To keep victims from seeking help, she purchased a special communication blocking device and intended to secretly install it on the Roden TS phones to minimize noise. George III suggested creating homemade silencers. He also handled the transportation on the night of the crime, attempting to secure a van that would not attract attention. Sophie was to remain safe at home with Angela because the court had granted Hannah and Jake joint custody. The Wagners chose a time when it was their turn to care for the girl meticulously planning every detail to ensure a perfect execution. On the night of April 21st, 2016, George Wagner, I, I, I decided to pay Christopher Roden a visit, allegedly to offer him a job opportunity that would improve his financial situation. The job offer was simply a ruse to gain unwitting access to the house. Roden Sr. opened the door in the morning of April 22nd, 2016. At approximately 8 p.m., Bobby Joe Manley's sister, Dana Roden entered Christopher's trailer. She has done this every day since he offered her a job. Bobby cared for the Roden family's animals. She noticed someone inside, which was unusual for the time when everyone was going about their business. Christopher and his cousin Gary, 
38, lay in a pool of blood inside the trailer. The men lived together in horror. She picked up the phone and called emergency services, reporting what she had seen and requesting assistance at 4077 Union Hill Road. Barbie, shocked, went to the homes of her other relatives. She gave a loud knock on one of their doors. Soon, a three-year-old boy named Clarence Roden appeared. She asked where his parents were, but he did not respond, instead pointing to the bed. Entering the house, she screamed at the sight of Clarence, 20, and his wife, Hannah Hazel. The couple had died, and their six-month-old baby was alive but splattered with his parents' blood. Following Bobby's 911 call, the police went straight to the given address. As they approached the road and property, a neighbor stopped them. Sensing trouble, he requested that the officers check additional addresses of the family members. He was correct. In the third trailer, police discovered bloody bodies. The victims were identified as Dana. Hannah is 19 years old and Christopher is 16. The attackers spared Hannah's youngest child, a baby girl who was only a few days old. Another victim was discovered later Kenneth, the elder Roden's brother, aged 44, who lived a 15-minute walk away from the others. By 2 p.m., eight victims had been identified. Christopher Dana, Clarence, Hannah Hazel, Christopher Jr., Hannah May, Kenneth, and Gary. The only survivors were small children, a three-year-old, a six-month-old baby, and a newborn only four days old, as well as two-year-old Sophie, who was at the Wagner's home at the time of the incident. After examining the bodies, police concluded that all of the victims had died in their sleep from gunshot wounds. Detectives eventually pieced together the events of that night. The patriarch of the family was awake when the attackers broke into the house, as evidenced by a wound on his right arm. Christopher attempted to defend himself but received nine shots to the head, torso, and limbs. Dana Roden had five bullets removed from her neck and head. The remaining members of the family were killed by gunshot wounds to the head. Gary was shot five times. Christopher Jr. was shot four times. Clarence and his wife Hannah were shot three times each. Hannah May was shot twice and Kenneth was shot once. The assailants fired 32 shots in total, including some posthumously. In addition, bruises were discovered on some of the bodies, indicating physical abuse. Because no one in the vicinity heard anything, investigators concluded that the perpetrators used silencers, indicating a well-planned and executed act. The victims were clearly not at random. Someone sought vengeance on the entire family. During the search, police discovered five different types of Remington shell casings, as well as an unused bullet from another gun model. Furthermore, the scattered nature of the trailer suggested that more than one person committed the crime. Leonard Manley Dana's father claimed the criminals were aware of the rodents well, or the dogs would have been barking all over the pike. The question of who would dare to commit such an act kept police officers busy. The Attorney General's office contributed more than $20,000 to the road and family's funeral. The deceased were interred in multiple stages. Gary was the first victim buried on April 28, 2016, in South Shore, Kentucky. Hannah Hazel followed him, and her farewell was held on May 1st in the village of Otway, Scioto County, Ohio. The other victims were buried on May 3rd in West Portsmouth, the same county. Many locals came to bid the family farewell and pay their respects. The surviving children were placed in the custody of relatives. A wave of panic swept through the neighborhood. The police urged the rodents' relatives to exercise caution and advised all Pike residents to stay away from their homes at night. The cold-blooded mass murderer enraged residents across the state, who demanded that the investigation's findings be made public and the perpetrators apprehended as soon as possible. Jeff Ruby, a Cincinnati businessman, offered $25,000 for information that could help arrest and convict those responsible for the murder, but he later declined the offer. The investigative task force working on the Roden case included over 100 people. Following the funerals, as part of the investigation, three trailers belonging to the deceased family were towed away. The next day, several more vehicles met the same fate and were transported to a secure facility. This was done to protect the deceased's personal belongings while also preserving evidence. Following the investigation, the family's cars and farm equipment were scheduled to be returned to the victim's relatives. Forensic experts joined the investigation. Trailers were meticulously inspected. However, no DNA from the suspects was discovered in any of them. 
Cameras were installed in the mobile homes, but they too provided no information because they had been disabled. The perpetrators meticulously planned every detail of the crime. It appeared that there were no significant leads until detectives discovered one. Three crime scenes in one location yielded approximately 200 cannabis plants. Officers suspected the cannabis was grown for sale rather than personal use, prompting speculation about the involvement of Mexican drug traffickers. However, the amount of cannabis discovered was insufficient to support an attack by an entire cartel. In January 2017, a close relative of the road and family was arrested for drug trafficking, which was deemed an unrelated incident. Leonard Manley claimed that his daughter had no involvement in the cannabis operations. They're trying to drag Dana through the mud, which I don't like, he asserted. Some family members confirmed that Christopher and Kenneth Roden, the older brothers, grew marijuana, but they were unaware of any large-scale production. The theory of a family feud over illegally obtained funds was also refuted. Along with the prohibited substances, specialized equipment for breeding chickens for cockfighting and cages with fighting cocks were discovered at the Roden T. It quickly became clear that illegal cockfighting was not the cause of the homicides. Months passed without uncovering the true motive for the crime. On April 13, 2017, local authorities announced that there was insufficient evidence to make any arrests. Nonetheless, Prosecutor Rob Young stated that the investigation was ongoing, implying that they had some leads they were not yet ready to share. Another year passed, and the second anniversary of the mass murder received little attention, with no coverage in the local press and no sheriff or prosecutor attending the memorial service. The community concluded that the investigation had unexpectedly stalled. On May 12, 2017, a SWAT team raided a home in Pike County, about 10 miles from the crime scene, initially looking for suspects but later revealing that they were gathering evidence. Detectives also searched a house in Adams County that Jake Wagner once owned, but had sold by June 20, 2017. The investigation shifted the spotlight to the Wagner family 26-year-old Jake, 27-year-old Georgia, the third, 47-year-old Georgia, the fourth, and 48-year-old Angela, who lived 15 miles away from the victims. The Wagners relocated to Kenai, Alaska, citing difficulties in settling in the area. They claimed to have loved the road and their family, and that their deaths caused them great grief. Rob Young's words from a year ago proved correct, as the investigation had made a breakthrough and was now looking for information from the public on the Wagner's discussions about firearms, ammunition, vehicles, and so on, two years earlier. It wasn't long before the suspects, desperate for money, returned to Ohio, where detectives had gathered enough evidence to make arrests, including proof Jake had hacked Hannah's account. During the examination of the Wagner family's devices, search queries for guardianship were discovered. It was also discovered that Angela had bought sneakers for the entire family just a few weeks before the crime. The tread pattern on one of these matched that of one of the trailers. The officers believed Angela was the mastermind of the horrific scheme, with Jake serving as the primary executor. According to the investigation, all family members were involved in the criminal act. On November 13, 2018, the Attorney General announced the arrest of the Wagner couple and their sons. They were charged with planning and carrying out life-ending procedures. Angela's mother, Rita Newcomb, is 65 years old, as is Frederick Wagner. George III's mother was also arrested. They were charged with perjury and obstructing justice. Rita Newcomb underwent handwriting analysis in 2019, proving her involvement in the forgery of Sophie's guardianship document. Later, to avoid imprisonment, she agreed to a plea deal. The charges against Federica Wagner were dropped in June 2019. The other Wagner has remained incarcerated after refusing to cooperate with the investigation. They denied any involvement in the rodents' deaths and expressed sorrow for their loss, hoping that the true perpetrators would be apprehended. However, on April 22, 2021, five years after the tragic incident, Jake decided to reach an agreement with the prosecution. The agreement stated that he would reveal details of the crime in exchange for all family members receiving life sentences rather than the death penalty. Wagner Jr. admitted to killing five out of eight people. He pleaded guilty to 23 criminal charges, including eight counts of aggravated crime. The remaining charges were burglary, conspiracy, illegal possession of dangerous ammunition, and forgery of evidence and documents, interception of telegrams and oral communications, unauthorized use of property, 
obstructing justice, participating in corrupt activities, and engaging in unlawful intimate relations with a young woman. He stated that eliminating the mother was the only way to ensure custody of his daughter. By killing Hannah, he felt compelled to do the same to the other rodents, fearing they would seek vengeance and refuse to give up the girl. Angela was the next person to stand trial. On September 10th, she pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit aggravated felony, robbery, and evidence tampering. She also agreed to testify against the remaining defendants. In exchange, the charge of killing a person was dropped. Angela was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The trial of George Wagner started on August 28, 2022. The man denied any involvement in the crimes and claimed he was completely unaware. In contrast, the prosecution argued that he was involved in the planning, execution, and concealment of the crimes. Georgia Fourth was ultimately found guilty of 22 counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The trial of George III is scheduled for February 2024. Despite the fact that his entire family has been convicted, he maintains his innocence and will most likely face the same fate as his older son. This person's harmonious relationship ended in tragedy Wagner's collective madness is beyond comprehension and forgiveness. Their actions rendered three children orphaned. What happens to Sophie when she grows up and realizes what happened during their struggle for custody and a false sense of security? Wagner deprived the young girl of loving parents, relatives, and a peaceful existence. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we'll look at a story that happened in Pennsylvania in the year 2017. On June 28, 2017, witnesses began calling 911 to report a car accident on one of the highways. When police arrived on the scene, they discovered a Chevy Malibu that had gone off the road. Unfortunately, the driver Bianca Robertson, 18, did not survive. However, her death was not an accident, as initially assumed. Bianca Nicole Robertson was born on October 17, 1998, in Pennsylvania. She graduated from Bayard Rustin High School in Westchester with all A's. Bianca was a member of the Black Student Union at Rustin, where she also received several awards and was on the honor roll her senior year. She received a four-year merit scholarship to Jacksonville University in Jacksonville. Florida and plans to major in criminal justice and become an FBI forensic agent. She has previously been a Girl Scout, a cheerleader, and a basketball player. She studied flute, violin, clarinet, and guitar. She was also an artist. Bianca, who lived with her mother and maternal grandmother, Josephine Perry, was excited to experience the freedoms and challenges of dorm life. Her mother explained that, unfortunately, all of her plans failed. On June 28, 2017, Bianca, her mother and grandmother went shopping at Walmart. Bianca was preparing to relocate to Florida and looking forward to a new chapter in her life. After purchasing everything, Bianca and her family went to the parking lot. They all got into separate cars. They intended to meet at home later, but her mother and grandmother had other plans, and Bianca immediately returned home. She had to drive approximately 10 miles. Bianca was very familiar with this road. However, this was the young woman's last car ride. About 10 minutes after she left the Walmart parking lot, witnesses to the accident began calling 911. The first responders arrived at the scene right away. Bianca Robertson was the driver of the Chevrolet Malibu. The paramedics were unable to help her, and she was pronounced dead on the scene. At first glance, Bianca's head injuries appeared to be the result of a severe blow when the car veered off the road. Many people driving along the highway at the time of the accident came to a stop near the scene before the police and ambulance arrived. After interviewing eyewitnesses, the police discovered one crucial detail. One of the witnesses claimed Bianca went off the road after colliding with a red pickup truck, which then fled the scene without stopping. I hope it isn't Bianca. That was what the grandmother told herself as she drove past the car crash scene, intended to meet her granddaughter at home. She had no idea that the traffic she was stuck in was caused by a crash involving her granddaughter. When Bianca's grandmother returned home, two police officers had already arrived to report the car accident that claimed her granddaughter's life. Bianca's mother, Michelle, could not believe what was happening to her. 
The death of a child is one of the most devastating events that parents can experience. Michelle, a nurse in Delaware County, said she never imagined anything like this would happen. After losing her 22-year-old son, Michael James Rowley, to a heart condition in 2013, she hoped her pain would ease. Instead, it's doubled. I'm not even sure who I am right now. I'm just existing, Michelle said. They were my breath. My reason is to get up. I don't have any children right now. Michelle Robertson has lost her second child, and this is heartbreaking. She claimed she did not leave the house for quite some time and was constantly crying. Michelle and Rodney Robertson, who divorced in 2006, have become amicable co-parents thanks to Bianca. Our divorce was not pleasant, Rodney admits. Bianca didn't like the way I was talking to her mother, so she corrected me. Because we loved her, it caused everything to calm down. Bianca was devoted to her family, and she particularly enjoyed being her daddy's girl. If I had a favorite, it would be Bianca who, as her father put it, was looking forward to being on her own. Bianca's parents said she was pleased to be getting closer to realizing her dream of becoming a forensic specialist for the FBI. She was focused on her future, and nothing was going to stand in her way, said Bianca's father, who proudly stated that his daughter had received a four-year merit scholarship to Jacksonville University, one of the four schools to which she applied, and one of the three to which she was accepted. She was also accepted at Coastal Carolina and the University of Georgia. Detectives requested CCT footage to confirm Bianca's claim that her car veered off the road after colliding with a red pickup truck. After all, if Bianca's death was caused by a collision with another vehicle, it was more than just an accident. It was a crime. If this was the case, the police had to find the perpetrator. But what they quickly discovered was even more shocking. While the detectives waited for the footage, there was another watershed moment in this case. Everyone assumed Bianca died after going off the road and hitting her head. However, during the autopsy, forensic experts determined that the cause of her death was not a car accident. They discovered a bullet in Bianca's head. It drastically altered everything. What appeared to be an accident, followed by a collision with a red pickup truck, turned out to be death from a gunshot to the head. After receiving the autopsy report, the detectives visited Bianca's family. They had to inform Bianca, her parents, that her death was not an accident. It was an even bigger surprise for everyone, particularly her mother. Michelle was puzzled. Why would anyone do that to her daughter? The family was unable to identify anyone who could wish Bianca harm. She had a friendly relationship with everyone. Robertson needed answers, and investigators were doing everything they could to find the person responsible for Bianca's death. The detectives found nothing suspicious while reviewing footage from cameras at Walmart, where Bianca and her family had gone on the day of her death. They scrutinized every move Bianca and her family made, from getting out of their cars to leaving the parking lot. The detectives ruled out the possibility that someone at Walmart chased Bianca and fatally shot her. After all, she did not get into any fights while shopping at Walmart. They simply bought what they needed, loaded it into Bianca's car and left. It is possible that Bianca died as a result of an incident that occurred while she was driving down the highway toward her home. We loaded all of the bags into Bianca's car, her mother explained, referring to the 2009 Chevy Malibu the family purchased from CarMax for her 16th birthday. Bianca did not ask for much, but when she did, she asked for big things, such as a car, according to her mother, who added that Bianca had chosen the car when she received her permit. She got what she wanted, Michelle Robertson stated. I do not call it spoiled, I call it loved. But Bianca was willing to work for her goals. She got her first job at McDonald's at the age of 15. She left fast food after two weeks to work as a dietary aide at the Whitehorse Village Retirement Community in Delaware County. Michelle said she has a stack of letters and cards from residents who loved Bianca. Soon after, the police obtained the traffic surveillance footage. There were no cameras near where Bianca veered off the road, but one was about a mile away. Let us look at Google Maps. Here's where Bianca got off the road. As you can see, the two lanes merge into one at this point. When the investigators watched the recording, they discovered evidence that confirmed Bianca's story about a disagreement with the driver of the red pickup truck. The video captured their cars driving side by side. They're approaching the point where the two lanes merge into one. Perhaps the conflict arose because one did not yield to the other. Knowing the outcome of the confrontation, the investigators suspected that the driver of the red pickup truck fired the fatal shot. Unfortunately, 
The footage was of low quality. The pickup truck's license plates were obscured, as was the driver's face. However, from that point forward, the driver of the red pickup truck was the primary and sole suspect in Bianca Robertson's death. Detectives needed to identify this man, but all they had at the time was a blurry image. None of Bianca's family members knew anyone with a red pickup truck. The police returned to speak with those who were present at the scene of the incident and those who dialed 911. None of them noticed the license plate on this car. Friends and stuff, rangers young and old, too many to count, have reached out to the Robertsons in support, beginning with a vigil two days after her death. They've heard from teachers who have known Bianca for years. Bianca changed my mind about how I would teach. According to one educator, Michelle Bianca was our save the world child. Michelle confronted Bianca, saying that if a parent put a child out, she would sneak them into our house. Bianca might say something like, Mom, wouldn't you want someone to do the same for me? Bianca once saw a car accident and asked her mother if they could stop and help. If she noticed someone dining alone, her first thought was to invite them to the family table. The investigators determined the direction of the pickup truck's movement after the incident by reviewing recordings from cameras located further away from where Bianca's car crashed. They needed a higher quality recording to determine the car's make, model, and license plate. The police also asked the media to spread information about the red pickup truck, hoping that the public could help identify its owner. Detectives determined that following an incident, the driver of a red pickup truck turned onto Paoli Pike. They began walking around the neighborhood, visiting houses and shopping centers. I was looking for cameras that could have recorded the pickup truck. They discovered one surveillance camera, and the footage was of high quality this time. While analyzing the recording, the detective noticed a red pickup truck driving down the road about five minutes after witnesses called 911 to report an accident involving Bianca Robertson's car, but the license plate could not be seen. Furthermore, it was unclear whether it was the same car or another that matched the description. While the investigators searched for additional recordings and moved from one door to the next, another breakthrough occurred in the case. Two days after the incident, a woman called the police and said she had seen the car they were looking for. She also saw the face of the person sitting behind the wheel. This woman stated that her red pickup truck overtook her, came to a stop at the Paoli Pike intersection, and then turned left. This information was critical to the investigation because it limited the search area. Furthermore, it indicated that the pickup truck in this video was not the vehicle they were looking for. It was simply a similar looking truck. The woman who contacted police assisted the forensic artist in creating the suspect sketch she described him as a white male between the ages of 25 and 35 and 35, with brown hair and a stubble beard. The police were hoping that someone would recognize this person and report it to them. They presented the suspect sketch to Bianca's family. However, they didn't know anyone who resembled the sketch. The investigators also began to suspect that Bianca's death was a hate crime. Knowing that the red pickup truck had turned left at this intersection, the detectives went around the shops and houses on this street hoping to find a high-quality recording that could answer some questions. Soon, they discovered what they were looking for. The owner of the house, which is less than half a mile from the intersection, provided the police with a recording from a surveillance camera pointed at his driveway. After calculating the approximate time it would take to get there from the crime scene, the police quickly located the required vehicle. Although the footage was of higher quality than the previous one, the angle of view prevented law enforcement officers from identifying the vehicle or the driver. The police worked hard to find another recording from the camera at a closer distance, and luck was on their side. Although they couldn't see the license plate, they did notice the car's distinguishing features. The vehicle had a sticker on the right side window, a vertical dent on the passenger door, and damage to the hood. These distinguishing characteristics could greatly simplify the search for this vehicle. The police wanted to expedite the process. As a result, they used the media to request assistance from the general public. They offered a $5,000 reward for information that could help them locate the truck or its driver. The investigators were confident that someone would recognize this particular vehicle. Three days after Bianca Robertson died, a lawyer called the police station and said he had a client who wanted to turn himself in, mentioning the latter's involvement in the incident that resulted in the death of 18-year-old Bianca Robertson. This incident occurred on Wednesday, around 5.30 p.m. Bianca Robertson, 
I am 18 years old and recently graduated from Westchester Ruston High School. I am on my way to Jacksonville University. Her entire summer and life were spent in front of her loving family. She was driving on Route 100. Route 100. Route 100 is a two-lane highway that connects to Route 100 Spur just a few miles away before merging with Route 202. And where it merges, it reduces from two lanes to one. That is the same merge that people in southeastern Pennsylvania perform thousands of times per day. People all over the world do this without issue. But last Wednesday, as Bianca was merging from two lanes to one, a man in a red pickup truck joined her and they were jockeying for position, which irritated him. So he pulled out his gun and shot Bianca in the head. The driver of the red pickup truck was identified as David Desper, 28, of Pennsylvania. He arrived at the police station with his lawyer. Desper refused to testify but consented to a search of his home. He also told them where his pickup truck was. Desper was arrested and charged with killing Bianca Robertson. The police found the pickup truck at the location indicated by Desper stickers on the side windows and the rims made it clear that it was the vehicle they were looking for. During a search of Desper's home, investigators discovered the gun used to shoot Bianca Robertson in the head. The police were certain they had found the culprit. However, the motive for this crime was unknown. On July 7, over 800 heartbroken family, friends, and community supporters gathered at St. Paul's Baptist Church in the borough of Westchester, 25 miles west of Philadelphia, for her homegoing service. During the funeral service, a church banner read patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Among those who paid tribute were her brothers, officials from Bayard Rustin High School, where she had recently graduated as chief admissions officer at Jacksonville University, where she was set to enroll in the fall, and friends. What emerged was a portrait of an extraordinary young woman, with speaker after speaker after speaker praising her brilliance and virtues. In his eulogy, Pastor Wayne Croft Sr. compared the shooter to George Zimmerman and Michael Dunn. Zimmerman killed black teenager Trayvon Martin in Florida in 2012. Zimmerman was acquitted of murder in 2013. In 2012, Dunn fatally shot Jordan Davis, another black teenage male, in Florida. A verbal altercation over music in the teenager's car escalated when he fired shots into the vehicle while it was driving away. He was convicted and sentenced to life plus 90 years in prison. The black community is unconcerned about whether Bianca's murder was motivated by rage or racism. All we know is that we have lost another bright young black star. The pastor announced that another good sister had passed away. At the September 2018 trial, they asked David Desper to explain his motivation for committing the crime. Instead of responding to this question, he asked for forgiveness from the Robertson family. Bianca's parents were not looking forward to confronting her alleged killer. Rodney had ordered t-shirts featuring Bianca's face on the front for family and friends to wear as they gathered at the Chester County Government Services Center. They also had bracelets engraved with the words, Bianca Robertson, a rose in God's garden, and a banner reading justice for Bianca Nicole Robertson, who was murdered on Wednesday, June 28, 2017. I'm not sure how I'll react when I see him. My daughter was shot by the man who held the gun. I know I won't do anything stupid. Rodney claimed Desper simply stole her dreams. He did not have that. Right, Michelle claimed I couldn't get her back. I need to get her back, and I can't. I need to comfort her, but I can't. I'm her mother and I can't do that while he's still here. She shed more tears, and he was able to talk to his parents and hug them. He is 28. She's just a teen, a baby. The prosecutor suggested that the traffic jam was caused by Bianca's failure to yield to Desper when the two lanes merged. He then rolled down the passenger, side window, and pulled the trigger. Recognizing the consequences of his actions, Desper fled the scene, leaving his pickup truck with a friend in Pennsylvania and attempting to flee to Delaware. However, when his sketch and the distinctive features of his pickup truck made the news, he decided to hire a lawyer and turn himself in. The police investigated his social media accounts and interviewed his friends, but found no evidence of a bias-motivated crime. As a result, they did not charge the man with a hate crime. District Attorney Hogan added that there was no evidence that we were aware that this was a race or hate crime. Many people disagree with that assertion. Before the sentencing, the defense described Desper as a harmless, almost juvenile 28-year-old who enjoyed playing with cars in his spare time. 
They called him a big kid and claimed that Desper essentially gave the government the case by turning himself in. According to the defense, Desper was driving home when a car unexpectedly approached him. He took the gun and shot it. They claimed there was no monster or threat. If you're a 28-year-old man driving a car with a loaded firearm, you're not a big kid, argued prosecutor Chris Miller. It turned out that Desper's mother had shared a Facebook post about police searching for the man who killed Bianca Robertson. She later realized it was her own son. Wendy Desper expressed her love for Bianca's family and prayed for her. I apologize for what my son did. She said this while her son sobbed. Rodney Robertson struggled to speak through tears as he confronted his daughter's murderer. My questions to the defendant are simple. Why in God's name did you shoot my daughter because she was young and black? Because she was a girl? You wanted to be the first on the road because you had a bad day? All of my dreams for Bianca were coming true. He continued until the day the defendant murdered my daughter. All I had of Bianca were my memories. David Desper admitted to third degree deprivation of life. The court sentenced him to 40 years in prison with the option of applying for parole in 20 years. Judge Anne Marie Wheatcraft wiped away tears as she announced the sentence, telling Desper, I don't believe you were afraid. I believe it was anger. County Judge Anne Marie Wheatcraft imposed the maximum sentence for that level of homicide, which ranged from 20 to 40 years. Desper attempted to appeal his sentence, but it was denied. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. In the tranquil coastal town of St. Augustine, Florida, July 8th, 2010, was a day that those who knew her would never forget. A solitary beach house served as the backdrop for a perplexing mystery. Friends and family struggled to understand the mysterious disappearance of a 45-year-old woman who had been a fixture in their lives. Her presence, last seen at a neighborhood gathering on July 6th, appeared to have faded into the shadows, leaving a trail of unsettling questions. Brittany Tavar, 45, a resident of St. Augustine, Florida, had a heart as big as the ocean and a smile that could brighten even the darkest day. Brittany had a large family with many siblings, but they all lived far away on the other side of the country. They loved her despite the distance, but life's twists and turns had separated them. People who knew Brittany spoke of her fondly. She was known for her kindness, generous spirit, and unwavering respect for everyone she met. Brittany had a talent for assisting others, which defined her in an intriguing twist of fate. Brittany had once set her sights on Hollywood, hoping to discover her dreams amidst the city's glitz and glamour. After her Hollywood venture failed, Brittany returned to St. Augustine, her hometown. She forged a new path here, eventually becoming a photographer and real estate agent. Her camera lens captured the beauty of the town, and her friendly demeanor helped others. Brittany's love of making friends was what truly set her apart. She had a knack for turning strangers into friends, and her network in St. Augustine quickly expanded. People from all walks of life were drawn to her infectious personality. However, life is unpredictable, and Brittany had no idea what was going to happen next. Brittany's last appearance in the community was on the evening of July 6th, just two days before her mysterious disappearance. She was upbeat as she mingled with neighbors and friends at the lively party. Later that evening, around 9 p.m., she made a routine stop at a nearby gas station to fuel her Toyota RAV4. However, after this seemingly routine pit stop, Brittany became an elusive mystery when friends worried about her disappearance went to her house. It appeared normal from the outside. There appeared to be no activity inside the house. Her car was noticeably absent, prompting a few of them to speculate that she had temporarily left her home for a few days. Her family was concerned, however, because they knew it was unusual for her to leave without informing anyone. Police did not launch an investigation right away because nothing seemed out of place and there was no evidence of foul play or that Brittany had suffered any harm. Friends and her partner, Tim Martin, gained entry to her home through a locksmith and upon closer inspection, a strange scene unfolded before their eyes. The house had an almost unnatural cleanliness, as if it had been thoroughly scrubbed, leaving a distinct odor of cleaning products particularly Bleach, Brittany's two small white Beachon Fries dogs, Cobert and Huey, were also missing, but her cats remained inside the house. The hum of the air conditioning system in the background added to the mystery, which was unusual for Brittany, 
who was normally concerned about power consumption and would not leave it on even if she was only going away for a few days. Brittany's friends told the police that she had expressed concern and fear to them. She had spoken with some of them about her concerns. This unease stemmed from a contentious dispute she had with her neighbor, and what had once been a cordial relationship had devolved into a cauldron of hostility, marked by physical skirmishes, legal skirmishes, legal skirmishes, and Brittany's fervent attempts to obtain a permanent restraining order against Anna. The timing of Brittany's disappearance was especially puzzling because it coincided with a critical court hearing in this long-running dispute. Brittany meticulously gathered evidence and prepared for her upcoming trial, making her sudden disappearance even more perplexing to those who knew her well. She was looking forward to her appearance in court and did not want to miss it. Brittany and Anne had previously been close friends, bonding, over shared memories and camaraderie. However, Anne's idyllic friendship began to unravel when her boyfriend crossed the Atlantic from Ireland, prompting her to seek accommodations for her roommate in order to make room for her view. Brittany, ever accommodating, agreed to house Anne's roommate, but later changed her mind. This abrupt reversal heightened tensions between Brittany and Anne, laying the groundwork for a contentious dispute. The conflict escalated to alarming proportions, culminating in a shocking physical altercation that resulted in Brittany's arrest on battery charges. Her once welcoming demeanor had changed to one of resolute determination to seek legal protection against Anne's perceived threats. Brittany carried a video camera with her at all times, documenting every interaction with Anne in order to gather irrefutable evidence for the impending court battle. Among these clashes, the day Brittany disappeared emerged as a watershed moment. She had long anticipated the day she would appear in court for the civil suit seeking a permanent restraining order against Anne. She had worked hard to gather evidence and prepare to present her case to her friends and family. The idea of Brittany willingly missing this critical hearing seemed implausible. While Anne naturally became a person of interest in the eyes of investigators, initial inquiries indicated she had a credible alibi. A few days after Brittany's last sighting, her two beloved dogs, Colbert and Huey, were discovered wandering separately in Hopkins, South Carolina, adding an unexpected twist to the case. In the midst of this neighborly feud, another aspect of Brittany's personality emerged, a compassionate spirit who had opened her home to at least eight different homeless people over the years. Brittany welcomed them warmly, offering shelter in exchange for their assistance with various household tasks. Among them was Joseph Dean Roberts, a 26-year-old who had recently lived with Brittany. Brittany had only met Joseph a few weeks before her mysterious disappearance at a local Barnes and Noble bookstore. Despite their brief interactions, Joseph had shared his harrowing story with her. He had become homeless after losing his job at the Kangaroo gas station on St. Augustine Beach. Brittany, known for her boundless kindness, extended her hand and offered him a place to stay. Joseph's first impressions painted him as an unassuming average young man, which was confirmed by his friends. They saw no reason for concern, believing him to be a typical house guest. However, Joseph had a tragic backstory, telling Brittany's friends that he had lost his parents and that his living situation had become hostile, prompting him to seek refuge under her roof. Brittany went above and beyond when she moved in by purchasing a computer. They shared ambitions to start a web design business together, which reflected Brittany's adventurous spirit. The police, who were always eager to try new things, became increasingly interested in Joseph as they learned more about his relationship with Brittany and the events surrounding her disappearance. He was pulled over for speeding in Brittany's car in Evanston, Wyoming, the day after her disappearance. Strangely, he was released without being questioned about her location. However, as the investigation progressed, a more sinister pattern emerged implicating Joseph in the disturbing chain of events as investigators dug deeper into Brittany Genevieve Tavara's mysterious disappearance. Joseph Dean Roberts emerged as a key figure in the unfolding mystery. His actions and connections to Brittany sparked suspicion, leaving a trail of questions that demanded answers. Joseph had become a person of interest for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, he was the last known person to be with Brittany on the evening of July 6th, just before her disappearance. Second, he'd been in possession of Brittany's car shortly after she went missing, which was a disturbing fact that could not be ignored. The circumstances surrounding his encounter with law enforcement in Evanston, Wyoming, were quite perplexing. 
On July 11th, he was pulled over for speeding while driving Brittany's car. Despite being alone and in possession of her vehicle, the police officer who stopped him made no connection to Brittany's disappearance and released him with a warning. Joseph's actions did not end at the traffic stop. Later that day, he was seen at a Walmart in Ontario, buying items that raised eyebrows. He acquired a tent, a black t-shirt, and tan cargo shorts. These unusual purchases fueled the growing suspicion of Joseph's involvement in Brittany's disappearance. The investigation took an alarming turn when it was discovered that Brittany's credit card was still being used, despite the fact that she had vanished without a trace. Authorities closely examined the credit card transactions and discovered a troubling pattern. Brittany's card had been used in multiple states, including North Carolina, Idaho, and Oregon. This financial trail painted a picture of someone taking advantage of Brittany's possessions, fueling fears that she was in serious danger. With mounting evidence and growing concerns about Joseph's potential involvement, authorities took a proactive approach and issued a public alert. The message was clear. Joseph Dean Roberts was a person of interest in Brittany's disappearance, and he should not be underestimated. Law enforcement warned that he could be armed and dangerous, prompting a nationwide search. The hope of finding Brittany alive persisted, but the details revealed a chilling and ominous picture. The search for Joseph Dean Roberts intensified, motivated by a desire for answers and justice in this haunting mystery. In the never-ending search for answers in Brittany, Genevieve Tavar's disappearance reached a watershed moment on October 12th, when Joseph Dean Roberts was arrested in Seattle for shoplifting. This seemingly unrelated incident would cast an ominous shadow over the ongoing investigation, eventually revealing the grim truth about Brittany's fate while Joseph was in custody. Florida authorities rushed to Seattle to question him about Brittany's disappearance. Their hope remained steadfast that Brittany was still alive and awaiting rescue. They had no idea that the chilling revelation that was about to unfold would put an end to that glimmer of hope. During questioning, Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who had shared Brittany's life and home in the weeks preceding her disappearance, began to reveal the chilling details of what happened that fateful night. According to Joseph's confession, a heated argument broke out between him and Brittany on the night of July 6, 2010. The tension rose, reaching a terrifying climax as anger turned to violence. In a moment of brutality, Joseph had resorted to using a hammer to strike Brittany in the head several times, but she had not died immediately. Joseph recounted with chilling detachment that Brittany was still alive, albeit briefly, in a gruesome twist. Joseph described taking a knife from the kitchen, intending to silence the woman who had once provided him with shelter and kindness. Joseph used a sharp object to deliver the fatal blow to the neck. The aftermath of this heinous crime was a scene of unspeakable horror. There was blood everywhere. Joseph needed to act quickly to cover his tracks, so he used bleach and a slew of towels to remove the heinous evidence of his crime. The amount of blood was so large that it required six trash bags to contain the aftermath. In a chilling twist of fate, Joseph's original plan was to hide Brittany's lifeless body in the attic. However, he quickly realized that her remains were too heavy to carry up the stairs. Instead, he resorted to wrapping her lifeless body in sheets and garbage bags, leaving her tragically unrecognizable. Brittany's body was then placed in her own car. However, the question remained, why had Joseph chosen to accompany Brittany's beloved dogs on his sinister journey to conceal his heinous crime? Joseph's twisted logic came to light. He understood that leaving the dogs at Brittany's house would raise suspicions. He needed to buy time, diverting attention away from the atrocities he had committed. Brittany's life was ended. Joseph set out on a grim journey with her body hidden in her own car and her once loved pets by his side. He drove Brittany's car, carrying her remains, and abandoned her body in a desolate wooded area near Interstate 95. Joseph attempted to bury her, but the difficult terrain made the effort futile. Instead, her body was exposed. In a disturbingly casual revelation, Joseph admitted that after completing this macabre task, he returned home when asked if he had gone to sleep. His response was chillingly straightforward. Yes, I did. Following this eerie interlude, Joseph embarked on a cross-country journey, crossing state lines. While leaving Brittany's car in a Seattle library parking lot, a stark reminder of the disturbing nature of his actions, the release of these gruesome details sent shockwaves through the investigation and the community, which had hoped for Brittany's safe return. Her body, which was severely decomposed, had to be identified using dental records, 
She died as a result of apparent blunt force trauma. It was a horrifying reminder of the brutality she'd experienced. Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who had shared her home and her trust, had thrown Brittany into a nightmare from which she would never recover. Following Joseph Dean Roberts' chilling confession, the mystery surrounding Brittany and Genevieve Taver's disappearance begins to unravel. The police discovered that everything Joseph had told Brittany was a lie. He had spent several months living in the woods near the bookstore where they had met. Law enforcement believed Joseph had a habit of wandering along Florida's beaches, attempting to persuade women to give him a place to stay. The strategy had been successful on numerous occasions. Brittany was not the first woman to offer him shelter, and those who had welcomed him into their homes at first thought he was harmless and, in some cases, pitied his situation. However, a troubling shift in his behavior usually occurred soon after moving in. For example, a woman Joseph worked with at the Kangaroo gas station offered him a room to rent in her home. From August 2008 until January 2009, he appeared pleasant and honest at first, despite his inability to afford a motel. He even discussed his mental health issues, such as depression and angry outburst, such as depression and angry outburst. However, within a few weeks, his behavior deteriorated. He became disinterested, neglected personal hygiene, and began using illegal substances in the home. When she discovered this, she immediately asked him to leave, and he left the same day. A month later, another gas station employee named Cheryl Davenport offered Joseph a place to stay after he was fired for theft. Cheryl thought of him as a friend, and she was aware that his mental health issues had caused strained relationships with his family. In exchange for housing, she asked him to care for her three young children. Unfortunately, the destructive pattern repeated itself. Joseph stopped bathing and resumed his prohibited substance use, prompting Cheryl to ask him to leave. During this time, Joseph moved in with Brittany in tragic circumstances. Before she had the chance to request his departure, he committed a heinous act of violence, brutally killing her. Brittany was unaware of Joseph's history of severe anger issues, which led to this horrific tragedy. Joseph's account of Brittany's brutal murder prompted his immediate arrest. The gravity of the crime he had committed was obvious, and the legal system moved quickly to hold him accountable for his heinous actions. Joseph initially pleaded not guilty to first, degree murder, setting the stage for a trial to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. However, as the case progressed, legal discussions and arguments became more prominent. Questions about Joseph's state of mind, the circumstances surrounding the crime, and the pursuit of justice led to a watershed moment in the case. Ultimately, the prosecution and defense reached a significant agreement and accepted a guilty plea to a lesser charge. Joseph Dean Roberts, the man who killed Brittany in an unspeakable act of violence, has pleaded guilty to second degree murder. This plea represented a significant turning point in the case. The court accepted the plea and sentenced him to a 30-year term in a Florida state correctional facility. While this outcome may not have provided the full measure of justice that Brittany's loved ones had hoped for, it did ensure that Joseph was held accountable for his heinous crime. He would spend decades in prison, paying for the life he had taken and the anguish he had caused Brittany's family, friends, and the community that had rallied in her memory Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. A woman was found dead in her own home and the police quickly solved the case but what happened next is more reminiscent of a twisted detective movie than a real-life story. There are so many unexpected twists and shaky moments in this case that it is rightfully considered one of the most intriguing in history. Donna Brown was born on November 10, 1963, in Miami. She grew up in a large and friendly family with two younger sisters whom she got along with very well. When Donna was young, her parents divorced and she remained living with her mother. Despite this, her father remained actively involved in his daughter's lives, and they remained quite close after finishing school. Donna received medical training and became a surgical assistant at a local hospital. Her colleagues quickly grew to love her because she took her work seriously and was also a kind and open person. Her life was going quite well, but Donna wanted to start her own family for complete happiness. 
In the late 1980s, Donna went on a date with a man named Mark Winger, and she almost immediately knew she had met her match, who was charming and intelligent, worked as a nuclear engineer, and dreamed of having a large family. They began dating and decided to get married in 1989. Shortly after that, Mark received a job offer at a nuclear facility in Springfield, Illinois. It was a big step up the career ladder for him, and he and Donna decided to move there. The couple settled in a nice neighborhood, and soon after the move, Donna got a job at a local hospital. They only liked children for complete happiness, but all their attempts were unsuccessful. At some point, Donna learned that she was medically unable to conceive, and it was a devastating blow for her. Both she and Mark dreamed of a large family, and all the conditions of their lives were favorable for it, but fate decided otherwise. The couple began to consider adoption but kept postponing this serious step. This continued until 1995 when everything changed and one day a pregnant underage girl was admitted to the hospital where Donna worked, and she wanted to give her child to a loving family Mark, and Donna immediately decided to adopt the baby in June right after the birth they adopted a girl and named. Her Bailey Elizabeth Winger the day they took her home coincided with the anniversary of their engagement the couple, and all the relatives were happy that they finally had a child in August of the same year Donna went to Florida with her three-month-old daughter, the visitor parents, and introduced them to their granddaughter. The family had a great time and sometime later the woman returned home she flew to the nearest airport which was two hours away from Springfield and then hired a taxi to her city through a special company. This trip greatly spoiled Donna's mood because the driver behaved quite inadequately the whole way he talked about how several personalities lived in him and they forced him to do various terrible things such as killing people. In addition, the driver talked about how he regularly participated in orgies and even invited Donna to participate in them. The man also violated traffic rules and drove the car quite dangerously. When Donna got home, she told her husband about it, and he was furious. Mark called the company the driver worked for and demanded that he be fired. It turned out that the driver was 27-year-old Roger Harrington, and after the complaint, the management decided to suspend him from work, but that wasn't the end of it. During the next week, an unknown man called Winger's home phone refused to identify himself and asked for Donna. She and her husband suspected that the caller was Roger, and she was seriously concerned about her safety given that the man knew their home address. She was afraid that Roger might harm her. On August 29th, a distress call was made to the Springfield Police Department. Mark Winger was in a panic and reported that an unknown man had broken into their home and attacked Donna with a hammer. Mark, shocked and terrified, took his gun and shot the intruder. When the officers arrived at the scene, they found two bodies on the floor with Mark in a state of panic. The police officers detected the faint pulse from both individuals on the floor and called an ambulance while trying to obtain information from Mark. But what had happened? Although Mark could barely speak, the detectives managed to piece together a rough idea of what had occurred. Mark explained that he was using the treadmill in the basement when he heard a noise upstairs. He went upstairs to the main floor and found his three-month-old daughter unattended on the bed. When he went to another room, he saw an unknown man attacking his wife with a hammer. Mark panicked and grabbed his gun, shooting the attacker before calling the police. While waiting for the ambulance, one of the officers found a wallet in the attacker's jacket with documents belonging to Roger Harrington. The detective knew this person well. Roger lived in a trailer park in Springfield and had a criminal history mostly related to minor offenses. He also had mental health issues and was generally known to be quite aggressive. Both Roger and Donna were taken to the hospital, where they died without regaining consciousness. Meanwhile, the police examined the crime scene, collecting evidence. Next to the bodies was a bloodied hammer, while Mark's gun was found on a table nearby, along with a pack of cigarettes and a paper cup of coffee. Mark told the detectives that the cigarettes and coffee were likely brought by the killer, and the hammer was from his tool set as he was planning to hang some pictures that day, so he prepared it and left it in the living room near the winger's home. Roger's car was found, and detectives discovered a note inside that contained Donna's home address, Mark's name, and the time of 4.30 p.m. When asked if he knew the attacker, Mark initially denied it, but when the police mentioned Roger's name, Mark realized with horror that the driver was the same person. He told the detectives the story of how they knew Roger, his strange behavior towards Donna, and the creepy calls to their home number. The investigators spoke with acquaintances and relatives of Donna who were aware of her fears. She had repeatedly complained to them that she was seriously concerned about Roger, 
and was afraid that he might come to her house one day and seek revenge because he lost his job after she complained to their superiors. Donna even wrote down all the details of her trip with Roger on a piece of paper in case she had to go to the police. The police found this paper at their house, and the investigation lasted for two days before the case was closed. No charges were brought against Mark for shooting Roger because his actions were classified as self-defense. He continued to be in a state of shock, and his relatives flew to Springfield to support him and help take care of his daughter. Donna's relatives also provided him with all kinds of assistance. Months went by and Mark continued to struggle with the loss of his wife, and his family began to notice negative changes in his behavior. He began drinking heavily, although he had never consumed alcohol before these events. He also often visited local bars. His relatives tried to support him in every way possible and help take care of Bailey, but ultimately they had to return to their own cities. Donna's parents understood that it would be difficult for Mark to take care of his daughter, so they suggested finding a nanny. In the end, Mark hired a woman named Rebecca, who specialized in round-the-clock childcare, so she spent most of her time at their house. Rebecca took care of the girl and got along great with her. Mark gradually began to recover, stabbed, drank, and returned to work. This went on for several months, and during this time a romance developed between him and Rebecca. She hardly ever left his house, and they spent time together with Bailey constantly communicating. Eventually, this led to mutual sympathy. Rebecca also sincerely loved the girl, and a strong bond was formed between them. In 1996, a woman became pregnant, and Mark was given another chance to start a big and strong family. Rebecca also monitored this, and the couple got married in October. Mark and Donna's relatives were surprised that he started a new relationship just a few months after his wife's death, but ultimately supported him as the new family was beneficial, not only to him but also to Bailey. All the relatives sympathized with Rebecca, seeing her sincere love and care for the girl. Mark decided to sell his house because it constantly reminded him of Donna's death, and after what had happened, he did not want to raise children there. He and Rebecca decided to buy a house with a large plot of land outside the city, renovate it, and start to build their new life. Soon they had a daughter and over the next few years they had another daughter and a son thus Mark and Rebecca raised four children and the man's dream of a large family came true over time Mark became more distant from Donna's relatives who tried to be present in their granddaughter's life. The problem was that Bailey didn't remember Donna at all and considered Rebecca her mother Mark didn't want the girl to know about the tragic past of their family from an early age and ultimately he forbade down his parents from calling her their granddaughter they tried to persuade him but in the end they gave up all attempts the relatives understood that it might be better for the girl to grow up away from what had happened. In the following years Mark and Rebecca happily lived in their new home raised their children and made plans for the future the tragedy of the past gradually faded but its echoes continued to haunt the family in 1999 mine Mark decided to sue the company that hired Roger Harrington as a driver in Mark's opinion this company did not make any effort to check this person's sanity and as a result it led to the murder of his wife the company did not want to admit its guilt and Mark hired a lawyer to determine their guilt the court decided to study all the materials of the case and the evidence which were handed over to the lawyers while they were preparing for the trial something completely unexpected happened in February of the same year a woman named Deanne Schultz came to the police and told detectives a shocking story Deanne was Donna's best friend and worked with her at the hospital when Donna had a child Deanne actively helped her take care of the girl, but Diane's story turned everything upside down. She confessed to the police that she had been having an affair with Mark for several months, which they had kept hidden from their spouses. It all started three months before Donna's death, around the same time the couple adopted a daughter. Mark and Deanne were secretly seeing each other, but this was just the tip of the iceberg. The woman told detectives that Mark wanted to get rid of his wife to be with her one day. He said it would be so much easier if Donna just died. He then began to persuade Diane to help him with a plan, but he did not reveal the details. Mark said that all Diane needed to do was go to their house, find his wife's body, and call the police. The woman thought Mark couldn't be serious and was just joking, but he continued to share troubling things with her. After Donna complained to him about Roger Harrington's behavior, he told Deanne about it and said he had planned to frame the driver he added that he just needed to figure out how to lure him into the house a week before the murder he called Deanne and asked if she would still love him no matter 
what to which she answered yes a few days after Donna's murder friends and family gathered at their house to support Mark when he was alone with Diane, he said. It seems like the police believe me I did it for us. The woman was shocked, but Mark demanded that she not tell anyone, and she obeyed they. Continued to secretly see each other, and even exchanged rings planning to get married in the foreseeable future, but in the following months Mark started a romantic relationship with the nanny and eventually broke up with Deanne. She was devastated she had kept this terrible secret from Mark and he had traded her for someone else. Diane never dared to tell the police about everything, realizing that part of the blame was on her. Over the next few years, the woman repeatedly tried to take her own life, and only after three and a half years did she finally overcome herself and go to the police station. The detectives were completely shocked. All this time, Mark had been considered a victim and even a hero who tried to save his beloved wife from a terrible killer. But Diane's story changed everything, and the police looked at the case from a completely different angle. The investigators decided to re-examine the evidence, but they were met with an unpleasant surprise. All of it had been handed over to lawyers who were preparing Mark's case against the transportation company. It would take time to retrieve them, but some materials from the case remained at the station. The photographs from the crime scene the lead detective looked at them and realized with horror that they had missed some obvious things all these years the investigation had been quickly closed after the murder, has no one doubted Roger's guilt but now as the detectives out these photos for the first time he realized that the positioning of the bodies did not match Mark's story at all he had. Told them that when he entered the room Donna was lying on the floor and the perpetrator was striking her with a hammer from above, and then he shot him and Roger fell next to the woman in reality however his body was lying in the opposite direction, and he physically could not have fallen in that. Direction the detective realized the Mark's story was a lie, and it made him rethink a whole series of moments that now made much more sense. First of all, no one ever figured out how Roger got into the house. There were no signs of a break-in, and Donna certainly would not have opened the door for him. But if you remember the note inside Roger's car, everything falls into place it at Mark's name, and the time which looked like a reminder of. A meeting remembering Diane's story detective concluded that Mark had somehow invited Roger to their home on some pretext, and let him in after which he shot him secondly in Roger's car, they found a knife and several other items that he could have used for the murder but he did not take them with him and used Mark's hammer which the man took out of the closet on that very day and left him plain sight all of this sounded completely illogical if you assume that Roger came to the house to kill someone. Moreover, he left a pack of cigarettes and a paper cup of coffee on their table, a very strange thing for a person who came there to kill. The detective listened to the recording of the 911 call made by Mark and was once again shot. Mark told the operator that he had shot the attacker once, after which there was a male mumble in the background as if someone was trying to speak. Mark told the operator that his daughter was crying and he needed to go to her, after which she hung up however, there was no hint of a child's crying on the recording. A more realistic scenario was that Mark did not shoot Roger once and on hearing the gunshot Donna rant, her husband hit her with a hammer. After that, he called the police and pretended to be panicked, reporting what had happened. Suddenly, Roger woke up and tried to say something, and those sounds were recorded on the call. Mark lied about his daughter crying, hung up, and shot Roger again. In support of this version, there was another fact that the investigators completely ignored. Mark and Donna's neighbors said during the questioning that they heard two shots, however. About five minutes had passed between them, which did not fit with Mark's story but completely matched the more realistic version in which he was the killer. But that wasn't all during the initial investigation, which lasted only two days. The experts did not even examine the evidence. However, now that Mark decided to sue the transportation company, they hired lawyers and were going to win this case. The lawyers requested an independent examination of the clothing of all three participants in those events. The results spoke for themselves, blood spatters and traces indicated that Mark's story had nothing to do with reality. According to him, Roger was hitting Donna with a hammer, but there was not a drop of her blood on his clothes, not even the smallest well. There was plenty of blood from his wife on Mark's clothes, which directly indicated that he had killed his wife. The police took the evidence from the lawyers and conducted their own analysis, which showed exactly the same result. In the end, the police reopened the investigation, but this time it was about a double murder in which Mark became a suspect. His family was in shock, and no one believed that the man was capable of such a brutal crime. Donna's relatives were skeptical of the suspicions against Mark until they heard all the information that the detective said uncovered. 
The only ones who insisted on Roger's innocence from the first day were his friends and family members. They were all aware of his minor criminal history, but did not believe he was capable of murder. Moreover, their neighbor Roger, with whom they shared a rental, initially gave the police important information that they overlooked. It all looked as if Mark had scheduled a meeting with him, but the police did not attach much importance to it. Rebecca experienced the greatest shock from the whole situation. She knew Mark as a loving and caring father who had never shown any aggression during their time together. She refused to believe that this person could be his wife with a hammer and frame someone else after several weeks of investigation. The police decided to arrest Mark and he was arrested right at work. The case was sent to court. Mark was granted a $1 million bail. He cannot raise that amount, so he remained in custody awaiting trial. The trial did not begin until three years later in May 2002. All his close ones, and even Donna's relatives, hoped that this would be a big misunderstanding and that the court would prove Mark's innocence. None of them were prepared for the opposite, and his lawyers insisted on the truthfulness of Mark's version. They noted that the crime scene photos could have been taken after the medics moved Roger's body. Considering that the doctor's actions were not documented, it was possible to prove or disprove this possibility. In addition, the lawyers emphasized Roger's criminal history, his mental problems, and his inappropriate behavior with Donna during the trip. Deanne Schultz became the main witness in this case. By law, she could have been punished for keeping Mark's secret all these years, but the judge decided to grant her full immunity. In exchange for her testimony, the male lawyers tried to discredit Diane in every possible way, pointing out that she had attempted suicide multiple times, which could indicate psychological problems. The defense also suggested that she had made it all love out of jealousy, seeking revenge on Mark. The prosecution insisted that the evidence in Diane's testimony unequivocally pointed to his guilt, as her motive lay in the mistress's story. Mark lost interest in Donna long before they adopted Bailey. He had been having secret affairs with her best friend, but he could not divorce him because he would have to split their expensive home and other assets, which was unacceptable to him. After Roger gave Donna a ride from the airport, Mark saw the perfect opportunity and decided to act as terrible as it sounds. Mark was lucky to have encountered a man with a criminal record and mental illness who claimed to hear voices telling him to kill people. After Roger complained to management, to have encountered a man with a criminal record and mental illness who claimed to hear voices telling him to kill people. After Roger complained to management, he lost his job, which became the perfect motive when both the prosecution and defense laid their cards on the table, leaving only the jury's decision to wait. Despite the compelling evidence against Marv, there were still doubts about his guilt among both his family members and Donna's relatives. None of them could imagine a loving father and respected member of society as a killer. Nevertheless, the jury unanimously found him guilty of the double murder. In the end, Mark received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, and Roger was posthumously exonerated. Rebecca could now believe that her husband had actually killed Donna. It took her a long time to impartially consider all the evidence of his guilt until she finally came to terms with the fact that he was truly a murderer. The chief detectives apologized repeatedly to Donna's and Roger's families for the sloppy initial investigation. He admitted his guilt in accepting the most logical version of events as the only correct one, overlooking all the contradictions. If you think that's the end of the story, then I have another unexpected turn for you. Even after the conviction, many doubted whether Mark had actually done it, but in 2006, those doubts were dispelled in Mark's prison cell, where they found 19 pages of handwritten text in which she was plotting to kill Deanne and another person. Mark wanted to hire a hitman stray from prison through other inmates or people on the outside. His desire to kill Deanne was understandable. He wanted to avenge the woman for revealing all his secrets to the police. The second person on the list was a man named Jeffrey Gelman. His childhood friend detectives quickly discovered the reason for such a decision. Mark asked him for $1 million in bail, but the friend refused to provide such a sum from these handwritten pages. It followed that Mark wanted to kidnap the man to get a solid ransom for him and then kill him. Why he needed money for life imprisonment was unclear. Perhaps he planned to eventually get out or escape. But in the end, the man faced another trial and received an additional 35 years in prison. She was planning a double murder. And after that, no one doubted that Mark was the one who killed Donna. Rebecca raised four children alone, and they all know what kind of monster their father is. They changed their last names and do not plan to communicate with Mark in 2019. Rebecca decided that Bailey should renew contact with Donna's relatives, 
who had not seen her since she was three years old. Bailey was already 24 at the time and she went to Florida and had a great time with them. They still communicate and the young woman learns more about Donna from them. As for Mark, he is still in prison and denies his guilt. Perhaps he would never have been held accountable for what he did if it weren't for two factors that happened almost simultaneously. The first is the testimony of his former mistress. She could no longer keep this secret, especially watching how the killer creates a new family and raises children. The second factor is Mark's greed almost four years after the murder he decided to sue his employer Roger Harrington for a substantial sum even though he was earning very good money himself apparently he did not expect third-party experts to study the evidence much more carefully than the local detectives interestingly the end decided to turn to the police including after learning about this lawsuit it became one of the last straws and the woman who revealed Mark's terrible secret share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more Imagine waking up one day and discovering that someone you know has vanished without a word. That's what happened to Tina Sandoval in a Colorado town 1995. Her story is reminiscent of a gripping mystery, complete with strange behavior and a failed marriage. In this story, we'll go over her strange disappearance and the shocking truth that surfaced more than 20 years later, leaving everyone stunned. Christina Tina Marie Tournay Sandoval got her start in Windsor, Colorado. Michael and Mary Ellen Tournay welcomed their child on March 17, 1972. She was a determined and energetic young woman who excelled in many areas of her life. Tina graduated from Windsor High School where she not only studied, but also competed in track, volleyball, basketball, and knowledge bowl. Her talents extended beyond sports. She played trumpet in the school band and sang in the choir. As the second child among her parents' nine children, she naturally assumed the role of caring for her siblings, instilling in her a strong sense of compassion for others. Tina's nurturing instinct drove her to pursue a career in nursing, and after high school, she earned an associate's degree in nursing from Iefam's Community College. During her college years, she met John Sandoval, who wanted to be a radiology technician. Tina's commitment to her education was unwavering. She also furthered her education by earning a B's in nursing from the University of Northern Colorado. To fund her education, she worked as a licensed practical nurse on weekends at Northern Colorado Medical Center. Tina's commitment to excellence was reflected in her academic achievements. She graduated from Ankh in May 1995, ranking in the top fives of her nursing class. Tina started her nursing career in the oncology department of the North Colorado Medical Center. Tina's personal life was marked by her marriage to John Sandoval, which took place on December 31, 1991, in the picture Skuck, Colorado Rocky Mountains. However, their marriage was fraught with difficulties, and Tina filed for divorce less than two years after their wedding. Her determination to move on with her life and a positive outlook on the future prompted her to move into a new apartment and resume dating. Susan Ternay, Tina's sister, became increasingly worried on October 19th, Tina informed Susan of her plans to meet John at his home after her shift that day. Tina found the meeting significant because it revolved around John's need to sign certain documents and pay an IRS debt as part of the final steps in their divorce process. However, the situation was tense because John was opposed to Tina's divorce and did not want her to date anyone else. Furthermore, Tina was concerned about the meeting because of some troubling incidents in the past involving John, making her nervous about her encounter with him. Tina contacted Susan, requesting her presence at the meeting. Unfortunately, Susan had work commitments that day and was unable to accompany her sister. In lieu of her actual presence, Susan asked Tina to call her right after the meeting with John to give her an update on how things went. Susan waited anxiously for Tina's call all day, but it never came. Still at work and growing increasingly concerned, Susan decided to involve their mother, Mary Ternea. Mary went to Tina's apartment to check on her only to find that she wasn't there. Mary went to John's house where he lived with his aunt because she sensed something was wrong. Unfortunately, John wasn't home at the time. Mary's concern grew when she noticed Tina's jacket in the kitchen, indicating that she had been there at some point. Fearing for her daughter's safety, Mary immediately reported Tina missing to the police that night. The investigation into Tina's disappearance took a troubling turn as the police dug deeper into the case. When they arrived at Tina's apartment, Everything appeared to be in order, which matched their expectations. 
Tina appeared to have returned home after a shift change and then left again. Inside the apartment, her nurse's uniform was discovered, indicating that she had actually been there. However, a troubling mystery loomed because her car was nowhere to be found. It prompted authorities to launch a search of the area around 3 a.m. On October 20, Tina's car was found parked only four blocks from John's house. The situation became more sinister when a police dog tracked Tina's scent from the driver's seat of her car to John's house. John Sandoval was a familiar figure to law enforcement, having previously been convicted of harassment and burglary, which resulted in several interactions with police. When the police arrived at John's house, he attempted to flee by jumping out of a bedroom window. It took physical restraint to subdue and apprehend him. During the arrest, fresh scratches were discovered on John's torso and neck. John was initially arrested on trespassing and unrelated charges. However, the police knew they needed to question him about Tina's disappearance. At this early stage of the investigation, it was unclear what specific charges would be brought against him in connection with her disappearance. When questioned by the police about Tina, John claimed he had no knowledge of her location. A search of his home and car began, revealing disturbing items. Among the finds were a white five-gallon bucket and a new shovel with mud on the spade. Furthermore, Tina's credit cards were discovered in John's possession, as well as a loaded 9M handgun rope and flashlight found inside his vehicle. Despite the mounting evidence and the search for answers, John refused to cooperate with the investigation. Tina's family and colleagues provided the police with critical information about her mental state and the reasons for her divorce filing. They revealed Tina was extremely nervous about her meeting with John on that particular day. Given her disturbing revelations about his behavior, she explained to her co-workers that John had voyeurism, a psychological disorder that caused him to engage in disturbing behavior. According to Tina, if John saw an attractive woman out in public, he would follow her home and conduct a prolonged observation that could last several days. Furthermore, he would leave their house in the middle of the night to engage in voyeuristic activities like peering through the windows of women's homes. On occasion, he would enter these homes and hide in concealed locations, such as cupboards, to keep a close eye on his victims. Tina also revealed that during these intrusions, John would steal women's underwear and take them home, in an especially distressing detail. Tina told her family and colleagues that she was not immune to John's voyeuristic behavior. She confirmed that he had watched her, and she described seeing his car parked outside her new apartment for hours at a time, which heightened her fears and concerns about her safety. Tina had discussed her concerns about John with her family, which she revealed when she informed him of her intention to file for divorce. He responded with a disturbing threat. John had placed a pistol to his own head, resulting in a terrifying and potentially dangerous situation. This disturbing incident fueled Tina's concerns about her husband's potential for harm. She had also told her doctor that she was concerned that John might endanger her safety. Despite these deeply troubling indicators and other circumstantial evidence, the district attorney at the time believed that more concrete evidence was needed to arrest and charge John, and the investigators faced significant obstacles. Tina's location remained unknown. The circumstances surrounding her disappearance were unclear, and no witnesses could shed light on the situation. Given John's employment at a cemetery and his knowledge of burial procedures, authorities conducted a thorough search for Tina in a variety of locations, including reservoirs and woodlands. Law enforcement also conducted a grim search of several graves in the area. The graves were carefully examined to see if they contained Tina's remains. While the investigation was thorough, none of the efforts produced conclusive evidence. The case eventually went cold, leaving numerous unanswered questions. Tina's death certificate was issued in 2002 by the state of Colorado, after a judge determined in December 2001 that there was sufficient evidence to believe she was deceased. Despite the passage of time, the police maintained their belief that John was involved in Tina's disappearance. He had been a suspect since Tina was reported missing, and that had not changed. However, belief alone was insufficient to secure charges, primarily because Tina's body had never been discovered, leaving a critical gap in the evidence needed for a prosecution. In June 2009, a new district attorney appointed to the position decided to re-examine the evidence, which marked a significant turning point in the case. Despite the absence of new evidence, he decided to charge John Sandoval with first-degree murder. This decision was based on the belief that the circumstantial evidence accumulated over time was compelling and could lead to a conviction. 
Even though Tina's exact fate and the location of her remains were unknown, John was officially charged with first-degree murder. After being charged, John entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution's case revolved around the claim that wild Tina had never been found. They were convinced she was dead. After leaving work on the morning of October 19, 1995, all of her activities came to an abrupt halt. There had been no activity on her credit cards, bank account, nursing license, earnings, or social security since that date. Tina did not have a passport, and there was no evidence that she had changed her name, which would necessitate a legal petition to the court. Tina was portrayed in court by the prosecution as a responsible and dependable young woman who consistently attended work and paid her bills on time. She had recently signed a lease for a new apartment, indicating that she had no plans to relocate or start over elsewhere. As a result, the prosecution claimed that the only plausible explanation for her unexplained absence was that she had been the victim of foul play, specifically murder, and that all evidence pointed to her husband, John Sandoval, as the most likely perpetrator. The prosecution's case was based primarily on circumstantial evidence. Because there was no body or physical evidence directly linking John to Tina's disappearance, they were prepared to present the testimony of 137 witnesses to substantiate their case, claiming that John not only killed Tina, but also disposed of her body. Throughout the trial, the jury learned about John's voyeuristic tendencies and pattern of following and stalking women, which added another layer of evidence for the prosecution to consider. The defense claimed that John Sandoval was not involved in Tina's disappearance and questioned whether she was even dead, speculating that she may have left town to start a new life and framing her as a runaway. The jury, however, did not agree with the defense's arguments. After seven hours of deliberation, they convicted John of the crime. As a result, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. However, John's conviction was overturned in March 2016 because of procedural errors discovered by the Colorado Court of Appeals. In the face of a second trial, John agreed to a plea deal. He asked for the deal, which allowed him to plead guilty to a lesser charge of second-degree murder in exchange for revealing the location of Tina's body. Tina's family had long suspected she was dead, and this revelation confirmed their fears. John then led authorities to Greeley's Sunset Memorial Garden Cemetery specifically the grave of Second World War veteran Arthur Hurt, who was one of three open graves on the day Tina went missing. John had buried Tina's remains about two feet below Arthur's grave, concealed by a comforter covered in a tarp and sealed with duct tape. Unfortunately, cemetery workers mistakenly buried Arthur over Tina's remains after John had hidden her there. As part of the plea agreement, John was sentenced to 25 years in prison plus five years on parole. This sentence was retroactively dated to August 2010, when he was originally convicted of first-degree murder. During the sentencing hearing, John apologized and offered his condolences to Tina's grieving family. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Michelle Young was born in 1977 in the thriving and harmonious city of New York. She had an outgoing personality from a young age and aspired to work in finance. After graduating from high school, Michelle took a significant step toward realizing her dream by enrolling in a university in Rayleigh. By 2001, she had achieved financial success and met a man who had a significant impact on her personal life. Michelle met Jason Young on her 24th birthday while out celebrating with friends. Jason, who graduated from the same university, had a similar academic background and interests as Michelle. This connection led to a romantic relationship, which culminated in their marriage. On Friday, November 3, 2006, Jason Young requested that his sister-in-law, Meredith Fisher, visit his home and retrieve some eBay printouts. The goal was to keep his 29-year-old wife, Michelle Young, from discovering them. Jason informed Meredith that he had printed materials about coach bags and planned to purchase one for Michelle as an anniversary gift. However, he forgot to put them away and was concerned that Michelle would come across them. At the time, Jason was on a business trip. Meredith agreed to pick up the printouts, which she was told were in the home office upstairs. Jason, Michelle, and their two-year-old daughter Cassidy lived together on a birch leaf drive in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
where Michelle is five months pregnant with their second child, a baby boy. Meredith arrived at the house around 1 p.m. and went through the broken garage door before entering the unlocked kitchen door. When she entered the house, she noticed how cold it was. Michelle's car was in the garage, and Meredith discovered Michelle's purse and keys on the kitchen counter. Concerned, she called Michelle's name but received no response. Despite hearing Michelle's dog, Mr. G whimpering, Meredith couldn't find him and was unsure of his location. As she walked upstairs, Meredith noticed what she thought was red hair dye near the top of the stairs. When she reached the top, she discovered her sister lying face down on the floor. Contrary to her initial assumption, the red substance was blood, not hair dye. Meredith discovered Michelle's body in a pool of blood after she had been brutally beaten to death. After calling 911, Meredith discovered Cassidy Michelle's two-year-old daughter hiding under the bed covers, physically unharmed. Cassidy requested bandages, mentioning that her mother had boo-boos all over. Meredith mentioned Cassidy's claim that there might be someone else in the house to the operator. When asked about Michelle's issues, Meredith mentioned occasional fights between Michelle and her husband, Jason, but clarified that they were not overly severe. She also informed the operator that there were blood footprints throughout the house, including those left by Michelle's daughter. When paramedics arrived, Michelle was confirmed dead, and it was clear that she had been dead for some time. Cassidy Michelle's daughter was examined and found to have dried blood on her toes and the bottom of her pajama pants. Fortunately, she had received no physical injuries. Meredith promptly informed her mother, Linda Fisher, of Michelle's tragic death. Linda, in turn, contacted Jason's mother, Pat Young, to deliver the devastating news. Meanwhile, Jason was traveling from Virginia to Pat's house in Brevard. When he arrived, his stepfather told him about Michelle. Meredith then called Jason, revealing that Michelle's death had been ruled a homicide. When Jason learned of his wife's death, he hurriedly drove to Raleigh with some family members. During the journey, friends informed him that the police had inquired about any marital problems Michelle may have had, and he chose to remain silent until he obtained legal representation. Jason declined to answer police questions when he arrived in Raleigh. Citing his counsel's advice, the police discovered traces of blood on the doorknob connecting the kitchen to the garage, which was later confirmed to be Michelle's. Despite a broken garage door that had been in that condition for some time, there was no sign of forced entry. Notably, Michelle's jewelry box had two drawers removed, and several valuable items, including her wedding and engagement rings, were missing. However, the house was not otherwise damaged or ransacked. Michael's lifeless body was found dressed in sweatpants and a zip-up sweatshirt. Her body showed signs of discoloration, coldness, and stiffness. The scene revealed a large amount of her blood with stains on the bedroom walls and inside the closet. Michelle was found next to a closet labeled his closet, and a small doll was discovered beside her head. The police wanted to question Jason about his whereabouts on the night of November 2 and early November 3. Despite Jason's reluctance and refusal to cooperate, investigators discovered that on November 2, he left the rally and headed to Virginia for a sales call scheduled for 10 a.m. on November 3rd. In Clintwood, Michael planned to spend the evening of November 2 with her friend Shelley. Shelley said she arrived at Michelle's house around 6.30 p.m. and found Jason still there when he offered to join them for dinner. Jason declined, mentioning that he planned to eat at Cracker Barrel on his way to Galax, Virginia. Jason had reserved a room in Galax for the night, intending to drive to Clint Woods the following morning for the sales call. Shelley told the police that after Jason left, Michelle bathed Cassidy and put her to bed, after which they watched Grey's Anatomy. During their time together, Michelle told Shelley about recent disagreements with Jason, particularly about holiday plans. Michelle wanted her mother Linda to stay with them from Thanksgiving to Christmas, which Jason was not thrilled about. According to investigations, Jason called Michelle seven times that night. Shelly Michelle's friend told the police about her unsettling feeling of being watched that night, prompting her to ask Michelle to accompany her to her car when she left around 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on November 3 between 3.30 and 4 a.m. A resident delivered newspapers in the area. They reported seeing a light-colored SUV parked in Michelle's yard or on the street in front of her house. Another resident passed by around 6.15 a.m. I noticed an empty SUV parked at the edge of the driveway. Police investigated Jason's movements and discovered that he left his rally residence on November 2 to travel to Virginia. Around 7.30 p.m., 
Jason stopped at a gas station in Raleigh and called his mother, Pat Young, to let her know he was going to check with Michelle about staying at Pat's house on Friday night. Pat lived in Brevard when Jason returned from his business trip, and Jason planned to pick up some furniture she had offered him after calling his mother. Jason continued his journey to Virginia, stopping for food at a Cracker Barrel restaurant in Greensboro at 9.25 p.m. He later checked into a Hampton Inn at 10.54 p.m. and entered his room with a key card at 10.56 p.m. Although he used express checkout the following morning, his exact departure time from the hotel remained unknown. Jason made a call to his mother at 7.40 a.m. On November 3, he arrived in Virginia via a cell tower near Wytheville. He arrived at the sales call and Clint would be 30 minutes late. Despite surveillance footage on the key card showing that Jason did not leave his hotel room after midnight, the police were skeptical. Further examination of the footage led them to suspect tampering, believing Jason may have driven back to Raleigh after midnight to commit the crime against Michelle before returning to Virginia. Investigators discovered internet searches on Young's computer for the anatomy of a knockout, head trauma blackout, head blown knockout, and head trauma, though the exact timing of the searches was unknown. Two years after Michelle's body was discovered, Jason was charged with first-degree murder and pleaded not guilty. The prosecution based its case on the claim that Jason and Michelle had marital and financial difficulties, with Jason allegedly wanting to end the marriage. Several affairs were revealed during the trial, as well as evidence of strained relationships. The prosecution claims that after checking into the Hampton Inn in Hillsville, Virginia, Jason left the hotel during the night's return to Raleigh and committed the murder. They claimed he hacked the hotel surveillance camera and stopped for gas at a station between Hillsville and Raleigh. The prosecution presented to the jury the theory that Michelle was strangled and beaten to death, leaving her two-year-old daughter Cassidy alone in the house with her mother's lifeless body for an extended period of time. Cassidy's small, bloody footprints were found scattered throughout the home. During the trial, the jury was shown surveillance footage from the Hampton Inn beginning at 10.49 p.m. On November 2nd, however, the footage went black at 11.20 p.m., leading the prosecution to believe Jason tampered with the camera. They claimed that he did so to prop open the security door, allowing him to leave without using his key card. A hotel employee discovered that the first floor emergency door leading from the western stairwell to the hotel's exterior had been propped open with a small red rock. Normally, this door was locked until 11 p.m. Keith discovered that the camera in the stairwell closest to the propped open door was not working, despite the fact that the other cameras were operational. The camera's last image was captured at 11, 20 p.m. on November 2nd. Although staff members later plugged the camera back in at 5.50 a.m., on November 3rd, someone redirected it to the ceiling between 6.34 a.m. and 6.30, 5 a.m. The prosecution claimed that this sequence of events indicated that Jason unplugged the camera and left the door ajar, giving himself an alibi while returning home to commit the crime against his wife. The prosecution claimed that Jason stopped at a gas station in North Carolina around 5 a.m. on his way back to Virginia. The gas attendant testified in court, stating that she believed the person who visited the station that morning was Jason. She vividly remembered the encounter, explaining, I don't forget anything like that when someone is cussing and fussing at me. According to Gracie's testimony, a man in a white SUV parked at the farthest pump repeatedly attempted to pump gas. Frustrated, he entered the store and verbally abused Gracie because the pump was not working. She informed him that at that early hour, customers were required to provide money or identification before using the gas pumps to resolve the situation. The man handed her $20, pumped $15 worth of gas into his car, and then drove away without returning to the store for change. Grace's account was used as evidence to support the prosecution's claim. During the trial, details about Jason and Michelle's marriage were revealed. Some acquaintances believed that Michelle's pregnancy with their first child was the primary reason for their union. Meredith Fisher, Michelle's sister-in-law, testified that she advised her to leave Jason but Michelle did not pursue a divorce. Three weeks before Michelle's death, Jason allegedly told a friend he was done. The court also learned that the couple had frequent disagreements about Michelle's mother, Linda. Linda frequently paid extended visits to her daughter and expressed a desire to relocate to North Carolina in order to spend more time with Michelle and her granddaughter. 
Linda even offered to remodel their home to accommodate her presence. While Michelle was satisfied with the arrangement, Jason was not. Linda Michelle's mother testified in court about the moment she learned her daughter had died. Linda claims that her other daughter, Meredith, called and stated unequivocally that mom Michelle had died. Linda initially asked if Michelle had simply passed out, but Meredith confirmed that she had died. Linda described trying to contact Jason, but her calls went unanswered and he never returned them. Linda's testimony revealed a volatile relationship between Jason and Michelle, with Linda witnessing numerous fights and Jason allegedly belittling Michelle. Linda told the court that she advised Michelle to leave Jason, but Michelle was determined to save their marriage. According to Linda, Michelle told her that Jason did not make love to her and had a perverted approach to intimacy. Linda also testified that Jason would have female friends stay at his house, when Michelle was away on business, she expressed her sorrow. Linda told the jury she had a lot to offer. There was so much about Michelle other than the fact that she lived in North Carolina. Stay a cheerleader. I mean, she had that pep, that energy, that vivaciousness. You know, she loved life and he stole it from her. He simply took it away from her. After Michelle's funeral, Jason moved in with his parents and their daughter Cassidy. Linda hired a lawyer to help her arrange visits with Cassidy. Following legal proceedings, Meredith was granted full custody. Linda believed Jason did not want any further questions asked. During the trial, one of Jason's female friends, Carolyn Sauer B, testified that she had known him since they were teenagers. She went to see him in the fall of 2006, just 10 days before Michelle died, and confessed to having sexual relations with Jason on the living room couch one night while Michelle was out of town. Carol also claimed that Jason took her wedding ring, pretended to swallow it, and then returned it the next day. Michelle Money, another female friend and Michelle Young's college sorority sister, testified in court as well. Michelle Money believed her husband was unfaithful, and she revealed that she met Jason at his wedding. Their contact increased near the end of September 2006. Jason also visited Michelle Money in Orlando in Orlando in October of that year, during which time they had a sexual relationship. Jason reportedly told a friend that he loved Michelle Money. They remained in constant communication throughout October, exchanging messages 980 times in one month, the day before Michelle was murdered. They communicated 50, one times in one day. Jason's last contact on November 2nd was Michelle Money, who was also the first person he called on November 3rd. Michelle Money testified that we would have regular conversations about work, life, and children. The court also heard about Michelle's severe injuries. Dr. Thomas Clark, who conducted the autopsy, testified that Michelle died from blunt force trauma to her head, having received at least 30 blows, the most serious of which was inflicted by a heavy blunt object with a rounded surface, resulting in crescent, shaped skull fractures. Dr. Clark also discovered signs of strangulation in Michelle, who had a broken jaw, skull fractures, brain hemorrhaging, lacerations, abrasions, and dislodged teeth. The court was told that there was no evidence that Jason had previously physically assaulted Michael. However, the prosecution told the jury that even if this were true, it did not rule out the possibility that he assaulted her on the particular night in question. Their argument was based on the belief that Jason was capable of physical violence, and they called his former fiance, Genevieve Carr, as a witness. Genevieve testified that she had been a victim of domestic violence at Jason's hands. One notable incident she described occurred at a Texas wedding when Jason, who was intoxicated, forcibly removed her engagement ring during an argument over his level of intoxication. Genevieve said the ring was too small and tight on her finger. When she couldn't remove it, Jason, agitated, yanked it off forcefully. She recounted to the court, I'd never seen him like this before. His eyes were completely deserted and glazed over, as if he didn't notice me. Genevieve claimed that the incident mentioned earlier was not an isolated occurrence. She described another incident in which Jason, enraged, punched the windshield of her car with his bare hand, causing damage. Furthermore, he punched a wall in their apartment, causing additional property damage. After several years of no contact, Genevieve received an email from Jason on September 12, 2006, expressing his feelings for her. The defense argued that the prosecution lacked credible evidence against their client. They stated that Jason's DNA and fingerprints were naturally found in the bedroom, but none of them were bloodstained. Furthermore, no blood was found in his car, clothes, or the Virginia hotel room where he stayed. 
During the police investigation, Jason was discovered to have no cuts, bruises, or other injuries on his hands or body, with the exception of a bruised and broken tooth. When given the opportunity to testify, Jason admitted that he was not a perfect husband, but said he was actively working to improve his marriage. He vehemently denied being involved in Michelle's murder. The court learned of the existing issues in Jason and Michelle's marriage, but we also learned that Jason genuinely loved his wife and was determined to make the relay chips outnumber the excitement surrounding their baby boy's impending birth. Emails exchanged on October 24, 2006, demonstrated Jason's willingness to attend counseling sessions. Jason did not believe their arguments were more frequent than those in other couples. The defense argued that Jason would not have had enough time to travel back to Raleigh, commit the murder, and return to Virginia. Given that the hotel was about 160 miles from their home, Jason had recently started a new job selling electronic health records software, and he was in Virginia because his employer had scheduled an early morning sales call for Clint on November 3. To avoid driving from Raleigh on the day of the call, Jason decided to stay overnight, nervous about the upcoming meeting. He spent the evening reviewing the demonstration software he planned to use during the presentation. In court, Jason claimed that he left his hotel room to get his laptop charger from his car, but realized he had left the keycard inside. He propped the exit door open, returned to his room, and then left to smoke a cigar. He also stopped by the front desk to get a copy of USA Today. He propped the exit door open once more for a cigar break. When asked about being 30 minutes late for a sales call, Clint and Jason claimed he got lost. Regarding the internet searches discovered on his computer, Jason explained that they were done at a different time and were related to an accident he witnessed. Despite the jury's deliberation, they were unable to reach a unanimous decision, resulting in a hung jury with an 8-4 vote for acquittal. Jason faced a second trial in which he did not testify, but a video of his testimony from the previous trial was shown. The second jury deliberated for six hours before convicting him of first-degree murder. Jason was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Jason appealed his conviction. During the appeal hearing, his new legal team argued that his trial attorney should have objected more strongly when the judge allowed jurors to hear about Jason's failure to respond to a civil wrongful death lawsuit in which he was found responsible for his wife's murder. Between the two criminal trials, Michelle's family filed a civil lawsuit against Jason in which he was found to be responsible for Michelle's death. Jason's attorney argued that the jury should not have been informed of this information. They also claimed that the same judge, Superior Court Judge Donald Stevens, presided over both the civil case and the second criminal trial, possibly biasing the jury against Jason. The appellate court agreed with Jason's arguments. A unanimous panel of the Court of Appeals reversed his conviction and ordered a new trial, which would have been his third. However, before the third trial could begin, a State Court of Appeals panel overturned the Court of Appeals decision. As a result, Jason did not face a third trial, and his conviction for first-degree murder was upheld in the civil wrongful death suit. Michelle's family received $15, 5 cents million in damages. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. On a typical Sunday evening in Dallas, Texas, a young woman named Zoe Hastings went missing on her way to church class. Her disappearance prompted a disturbing investigation and trial. Zoe Hastings was born on November 21, 1996, to Jim and Cheryl Hastings. So she was an excellent big sister, sending a lot of time with her younger brother and sisters. Zoe Hastings' parents described her as someone who made it a daily goal to make others happy. She was extremely talented in the spring of 2014. Zoe Hastings graduated from Booker Washington High School for the Performing and Visual Arts. Her interests centered on visual arts and theater. While studying there, she dabbled in acting and costume design. He was also very proud of her work as a lifeguard at the pool. And by the end of the summer, she had been promoted to supervisor. Zoe Hastings was also a graduate of Theological Seminary at the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ and was deeply committed to her faith. She considered an offer from six top Texas universities, which included the opportunity to serve on an 18-month mission trip for the church. She genuinely cared about others, sometimes neglecting her own needs. 
She liked to give small gifts. Zoe Hastings aspired to be a doctor and to assist people in gaining theoretical knowledge by watching documentaries and surgical videos. On that fateful Sunday, October 11, 2015, Zoe Hastings set out to attend a Bible study class at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Dallas, Texas. Zoe, a young and enthusiastic 18-year-old, had recently graduated and was looking forward to a mission trip with her church in November. Her departure that afternoon was no different from any other day. She bid her parents farewell and promised to return home for their traditional family dinner. Dinner together was a treasured tradition. But Zoe's excitement about her upcoming mission trip caused her to prioritize the Bible study class that day. So we left her house around 4.30 p.m., driving the family minivan with the Bible study class beginning at 5 p.m. Her parents expected her to return around 6.30 p.m. Her parents expected her to return around 6.30 p.m. and became increasingly concerned as time passed with no sign of their daughter. Not only was her absence unusual, but she also missed the 5 p.m. Bible study class, which added to their concern. They are anxious. Jim and Cheryl attempted to contact Zoe Hastings via text messages and numerous phone calls. However, their efforts were met with silence. They contacted friends in the hopes of finding out where she was, but none of them could provide any information. To make matters worse, the Hastings family discovered that Zoe Hastings did not show up for the Bible study class. As the hours passed and there was no sign of Zoe, her parents decided to contact the police at 10 p.m. However, by midnight, the authorities had not responded to their call. Fearing for their daughter's safety, they took action and filed a missing persons report while continuing their search. The breakthrough came in the early hours of Monday morning when Zoe's parents discovered she needed to find my iPhone app, which was installed on her phone app, which was installed on her phone. They used this tool to track her phone's location which led them to a nearby creek only a five-minute drive from their house. They rushed to the scene full of urgency. They found a scene of chaos and concern. Police paramedics and flashing lights surrounded the area, which was cordoned off with police tape. Zoe Hastings' minivan was discovered in a precarious and alarming position, nose down in the creek bed, nearly vertically submerged in water. The tragic events that occurred on that fateful Sunday evening and early Monday morning shed light on a disturbing series of incidents. The chain of events began when Kurt Rem, a concerned member of the public, was walking his dog near Easton Road and Lippitt Avenue. He came across a man who approached him urgently, reporting a car crash involving a young girl in the creek. The stranger, visibly shaken, asked Kurt to join him in investigating the scene. Together, they went down to the creek, and the man informed Kurt that the girl would later identify Kurt immediately dialed 911 after Zoe Hastings tragically died, fearing the worst. However, the mysterious man who had initially alerted him fled the scene before police arrived. Upon their arrival, the police discovered Zoe Hastings' lifeless body. She lay face down in a pool of blood about 10 to 20 feet from the driver's door of the minivan. The initial assumption that her death was caused by the crash was quickly dispelled when police discovered that she died as a result of homicidal violence. The horrific nature of the crime became clear as details emerged. Zoe's clothing had been disturbed, her dress had pulled up above her waist, and her underwear had rolled down to her mid-thighs, indicating sexual assault. Zoe had several deep cuts on her neck. Throughout their investigation, the police thoroughly searched the area for evidence. All of the minivan doors except the driver's door were locked. They discovered a blood-covered knife at the top of the embankment, which they suspected was used to inflict Zoe's fatal wounds on her neck. So his phone, which has location services, provided a timeline for the investigation. It showed that her phone had been at the creek since 5 p.m. She remained there from Sunday evening until Monday morning, when her body was discovered. As the investigation progressed, it was discovered that after leaving her house, Zoe Hastings stopped briefly at a Walgreens on Garland Road to return a Red Box movie on her way to the Bible study. The Walgreens was so close to her house that she could see it from the parking lot. She returned the movie at 4, 42 p.m. However, authorities wanted to know what happened after that and why she didn't show up for the 5 p.m. Bible study. As the investigation into Zoe Hastings' tragic death continued, two key witnesses came forward. The witnesses said they saw a woman near a minivan in the parking lot outside the Walgreens store. 
One of the witnesses described seeing an African-American man approach the woman quickly. To their surprise, both people entered the minivan with the man behind the wheel. The second witness stated that the man appeared to be holding something in his hand during the encounter. After exchanging words with the woman, they both quickly entered the minivan, which drove away from the scene. The discovery of DNA on the knife found in the creek sparked a breakthrough in the case. The DNA evidence was linked to a man whose genetic profile had already been recorded in the law enforcement database. This individual was identified as Antonio Cochran. Antonio vehemently denied being involved in Zoe's murder. Nonetheless, based on DNA evidence and witness statements, he was charged with capital murder. The charges were based on the belief that Zoe's murder occurred during a kidnapping or attempted kidnapping or attempted kidnapping. The prevailing theory among law enforcement was that Zoe's abduction and subsequent murder were random, with no prior relationship between her and Antonio. When Antonio Coltrane's trial began, he pleaded not guilty. The prosecution's case centered on the theory that Zoe Hastings was kidnapped from the Walgreens parking lot while returning a red box movie just across the street from her house on that fateful Sunday afternoon. This theory was supported by the testimony of two key witnesses who appeared in court to give their versions of events. The first witness, Lester Lee Clark, identified himself as a tattoo artist who worked near the intersection of Garland Road and PV Road in East Dallas. He testified at around 4.45 p.m. As he approached the Walgreens, he noticed a woman, presumably Zoe, near the red box kiosk. She appeared to be returning or retrieving a movie as she entered her minivan. A short, heavy-set African-American male quickly approached her and grabbed the car door, sparking an animated but brief conversation between the two that lasted no more than five seconds. Lester stated that he couldn't hear what they were saying, but he did notice that the woman at the driver's side door had moved to the passenger side. The man got into the minivan and quickly drove away. The second witness, Gary Whitman, was homeless at the time and stated that he was across the street from the Walgreens around 4 or 4 p.m. On Sunday afternoon, he described a stout, heavy-set African-American man who stood about five feet, eight or nine inches tall and walked aggressively but discreetly. He thought the man was trying not to draw attention to himself. Gary reported that the man approached the woman in a minivan in the Walgreens parking lot from behind as she attempted to enter it. He claimed that the man extended his arms to block her path and appeared to pull something from his pocket. Although he couldn't see the exact object, Gary saw both people get into the minivan, with the man taking the wheel and driving away. Gary's immediate response, according to the court, was to seek help because he did not have access to a phone. He approached an employee at a nearby convenience store and asked them to dial 911. The court heard testimony from several researchers who carried out the tests. Gloria John Dimmick, a mitochondrial DNA analyst, told the court that several hairs were discovered at the scene. While mitochondrial DNA does not provide a unique identifier, it can be used to exclude people. According to the analysis, the hair found on Zoe's left arm could belong to Antonio Cochran. There was more evidence against the defendant. Copeland's DNA was discovered on the handle of a knife, which had been covered in Zoe's blood. The prosecution claimed that after abducting Zoe Hastings from the parking lot, Cochran drove her to a creek where he raped and killed her cell tower. Data confirms that Cochran's cell phone pinged on Sunday near the location where Zoe's body was discovered. Prior to Zoe's abduction, Cochran sent several text messages to various people. At 1.48 a.m., the first text message was sent to Gillis Pina Cochran's neighbor, Antonio, who stated that he intended to leave the house he and Gillis rented together. At 2 p.m., he messaged his ex-girlfriend, Angie Simon, informing her that Raina, who had been like a mother to him, had died the day before. He also messaged someone named Mimi at 2.25 p.m. and 3.19 p.m., telling her that he had been crying, drinking alcohol, and driving aimlessly around town. At 4.34 p.m., Antonio's cell phone communicated with a specific transceiver on a Dallas radio tower, which covered the Walgreens store. Antonio sent another text message from his smartphone. This time, it was addressed to Frank Torres, Gillis Pina's brother. I really need you, brother. I'm not sure what's wrong with me, Frank. A lot has happened. I need you, brother. Antonio, according to the court, began working as a checker at a Fiesta Mart grocery store just two days before Zoe's murder. He was supposed to work the day after Zoe died, but he did not show up for his shift, 
The prosecutor also informed the judge that a detailed search history was conducted on Cocker's cell phone between October 13 and October 13 and October 23. He searched for local and crime news 32 times, five of which were about Zoe's death. Prior to that, Antonio had shown little interest in crime stories, having only opened the news once in the previous month with a report on local gang crimes. The defense presented a compelling case, attempting to cast doubt on the prosecution's claim that Antonio Cochran was responsible for Zoe Hastings' murder. They questioned the DNA evidence's validity, as well as the witness's reliability. Paul Johnson, Antonio's defense attorney, stated that at the time of Zoe's murder, Antonio was assisting a friend in presenting an alibi that placed him in a different location. He challenged the testimony of two key witnesses who claimed to have witnesses who claimed to have witnessed Zoe's abduction. Lester's timeline and description of the man involved were called into question, raising concerns about the veracity of his story. The defense also questioned the credibility of the second witness, Gary, who had a criminal record and a history of illegal substance use. Paul Johnson questioned how Gary could have witnessed the events from across the street and suggested that his testimony might be suspect. Despite the potential consequences for himself, Gary insisted that he had come forward to do the right thing and was later apprehended due to an active arrest warrant. The defense's challenge included the DNA evidence. They acknowledged that Antonio's DNA was discovered on the knife handle, but proposed an alternative explanation. They speculated that his DNA could have been on the knife from a previous occasion, possibly while working at a local movie theater and coming into contact with it. Furthermore, the absence of fingerprints on or inside the minivan called into question the witnesses' claims that Antonio grabbed the door during the alleged abduction. The defense also pointed out that the medical examiner found no evidence of sexual assault and that Antonio was not charged with sexual assault, implying that this information was used to incite the jury. Finally, Paul Johnson urged the jury to find Antonio not guilty, emphasizing the importance of making a decision based on the evidence presented rather than reacting to popular sentiment. He encouraged the jury to do what they thought was right. The prosecution disagreed and urged the jury to find Antonio guilty. The jury deliberated for nearly 23 hours over several days. During this time, they requested additional information and clarification from the judge on three specific issues, including a photo of the Walgreens store, mitochondrial DNA, and the timeline of police interviews with the two witnesses. Ultimately, the jury convicted Antonio of the lesser offense of murder, rather than capital murder. Antonio was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, with a $10,000 fine. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In this video, we'll talk about a story that happened in England. On Sunday, November 14, 2020, one surveillance cameras caught 34-year-old Alexandra Morgan at a gas station near Cranbrook, Kent. Nobody has seen her since. Four days later, her parents reported her missing to the police. The investigation revealed many secrets that were hoped to remain hidden. The truth turned out to be far more terrifying than anyone could have anticipated. Alex Alexandra Morgan, as she was known to her friends and family, was a single mother with two children ages 4 and 11. They lived in Wellesley, Cranbrook, and Kent. She did not maintain relationships with her children's fathers. It wasn't easy for her to raise them alone. According to some sources, Alexandra was a dog groomer. People described her as a dynamic and ambitious woman who wanted her children to have everything they required. She wanted a better life for them and took several steps to make it happen. Alexandra arranged a meeting with her parents on November 13, 2021. She left her two children with them, claiming she was going on a spa vacation with friends. She said she'd be back in three days. Alexandra's parents became concerned on November 17 when she failed to pick up her children. She did not respond to any calls or texts. It was not like her. After several unsuccessful attempts to locate their missing daughter, the parents were forced to contact the police. Kent police said Alexandra Morgan's disappearance was suspicious, so they investigated it as a possible crime. At the start of the investigation, the police attempted to determine which spa Alexandria planned to visit. 
She told her parents she was going with friends, and the police wanted to know who they were. At the time, the investigators had no idea what they would face while searching for Alexandria. While searching for the woman, police obtained video footage from a gas station in Cranbrook. That was the last place anyone saw her. Her white Mini Cooper was the key to determining her location. On November 14, she refueled her car, purchased some items, and left. At first glance, there is nothing unusual about this video. Rose McCauley, the gas station manager who has been friendly with Alexandra for 17 years, was present when she purchased 10 pounds of gas and ordered a coffee and snack on the morning of her disappearance. Rose believes no one knows what happened to her or where she went. Her car hasn't been seen since then, which is a complete mystery. My friend and I looked around Hastings for it, but couldn't find anything. Alex never feels embarrassed. So I don't think she's afraid to come home. I'm just hoping nothing bad has happened to her. I just hope she is okay and shows up. It's very worrying. Alex arrived that Sunday looking very well, dressed, with a full face of makeup, her hair done, and nice clothes on. She was more dressed up than I had ever seen her before. And she arrived unusually early in the morning. Alex appeared to be in a good mood, smiling as he interviewed Alexandra's friends. The detectives discovered that in 2018, she posted information on social media about a stalker who followed her every move. In another post from 2019, she shared an image with the words, Hello, stalker. Alexandra wrote, Stop stalking my page. Lovelies. It's rather sad. Not only that, but you're making it clearer by the day, as we're not even friends on Facebook. There is nothing to see here, pal, unless you continue. Oh, please share your antics for all to see. Have a beautiful day. Investigators were now looking into whether these messages had anything to do with her disappearance. According to a police spokesman, Alexandra's failure to contact her family is completely out of character, and the case is now being investigated as a possible murder. While we conduct our investigation, I urge anyone who has seen Alexandra or her white Mini Cooper with a black roof to contact us. If you think you saw Alexandria or something suspicious but are unsure, please call and let us know. Alexandra was described as a slim woman with brown shoulder-length hair and a height of about five feet, six inches. She was last seen wearing a green knee-length quilted coat, a black top, ripped blue jeans, knee-high black boots, and a silver necklace. People can disappear without leaving any traces or clues for the police for the police. Many missing person cases remain unsolved. But this time, things were different. Alexandra Morgan left a digital trail that eventually led the police to discover what happened to her. Furthermore, it revealed some shocking information. Alexandra hoped to improve her financial situation. To accomplish this, she began working as an escort and advertised her services on the internet. However, her family and friends were unaware of it. Women working as escorts are among the most vulnerable groups of people. Everyone, including the police, is aware of this. They never know who their next client will be. An ordinary person who, for whatever reason, has decided to pay for such services or a maniac looking for a target. The investigators discovered that Alexandra had scheduled a meeting with her regular client prior to her disappearance. They arrested this man. At the same time, the police representative's statement made it clear that Alexandra had died. According to a Kent police spokesperson, detectives from the Kent and Essex Serious Crime Directorate are investigating the disappearance of a woman from Sissinghurst and arrested a man on Thursday. November 25, 2020. 1. A 40-year-old man from Est Leonard's on Sea has been arrested on suspicion of murder. Kent police officers with assistance from Sussex Police are conducting searches in three locations in Hastings and Stee Leonard's on Sea. As part of their efforts to locate Alexandria, residents can expect a heightened police presence in the area as investigations continue. They arrested Mark Brown. He was a construction worker who married and had a son. His family was unaware that he was leading a double life. Before she disappeared, Alexandra had met him several times. According to Sussex police, he intends to buy her a Mini Cooper. Their first meeting occurred on June 8, 2020, one, after Brown discovered her on an adult website. It happened at her home in Sissinghurst, near Cranbrook, Kent. Everything went well at the time, and they saw each other occasionally on June 21. Almost two weeks later, they met again. Alexandra went to a small bridge farm near Hastings, Kent, 
that Brown rented for meetings with women and other purposes. Throughout August and September, they met seven more times and Alexandra had no idea she was falling deeper into a trap. On October 23, 2021, Brown texted her to see if she was interested in a risk, free business transaction he was offering. The proposal was for 100,000 pounds for three to five days at a hotel where he would guard a new ID, a straight car, and shopping money. All he needed her to do was go out for a cigarette, grab some cash, and buy some things. This is a testament to her character. Alexandria's online searches following this proposal demonstrated her desire to improve her children's lives. One of the searches was for the minimum deposit on a house in 2021. A variety of other searches revealed Alexandra's desire to start new businesses with the money she would make. Among the internet searches were, how much can you make running a sunbed shop in the UK? How much tax would I pay on $100,000? Alexandra told her parents she was going to the spa with her friends, but she was actually going to meet Mark Brown on the farm. She left the house on November 14, and CTV footage showed her buying gas in Cranbrook at 7.20 a.m. She arrived at Little Bridge Farm at about 8 a.m. She arrived at Little Bridge Farm at about 8 a.m. Three days later, on November 17th, Brown relocated Alexandra's car to her home on Hearst Lane in St. Leonard's having previously replaced her license plate with a fake one. Alexandra's mother contacted the police on November 18 after her daughter failed to pick up the children and stopped answering calls and texts. On November 23, the police discovered CCTV footage that showed Alexandra's car following Brown's Jaguar on the road to Little Bridge Farm. Kent police blocked access to the farm and began questioning Brown. He admitted he had met with Alexandra. However, he stated that she left after 45 minutes. He stated that the police could take his fingerprints in a DNA sample two days later, on November 25. They arrested Brown, the primary suspect in the Alexandra Morgan case. But before we go any further, and before I tell you what happened to her, let us go back to when Alexandra had no idea Mark Brown existed. Lee was 33 years old and a mother of three, but she didn't have custody of her children. Leah was an animal lover who cared for a horse, three goats, two dogs, a mastiff named Duke, and a Pomeranian named Lady. On March 25, 2018, Mark Brown contacted Leah through an escort website where she advertised her services. Brown and Alexandra Morgan met on the same website. A few years later, at the end of 2018, Brown and Ware had begun dating and renting an apartment together. When her lease expired six months later, she moved into Brown's yard at Little Bridge Farm and lived in a shipping container. Brown compared their relationship to a roller coaster. As it turned out, Leah led a chaotic lifestyle. She was a benefit claimant who received weekly payments into her account, which Brown frequently withdrew for her. She had a history of illegal drug use and mental health issues. However, many people claimed she was working hard to obtain custody of her children. While describing her daughter, Leah's mother claimed she was an angel. She added that, while Leah had never enjoyed school, she had always preferred her animals. Brown and Ware had a three-year relationship before she vanished without a trace in May 2020. One, Leah spent the evening of May 5th. In the early hours of May 6th, I was with a friend and convicted drug dealer, Jack Tyler. They took the substances together. That evening, they had an intimate relationship. This was the last time anyone saw Leah. Her last outgoing call was on May 7 at 8.55 a.m. The police believed she died that day. Two weeks later, Mark Brown returned to the website and met Leah on June 8, 2021. A month later, she vanished without trace. Alexandria met Brown for the first time in her home. The meeting went well. She regarded Brown as a reasonable and generous man, but Alexandria had no idea that just a month before, another woman in a relationship with Brown vanished without a trace. During the investigation, detectives discovered extremely revealing messages sent by Brown. He sent them to his high school girlfriend five days after meeting Alexandra Morgan. However, the messages were not about Alexandria. They were discussing Lee. This is what they said. I'll be very careful how I word this. It happened again not long ago, while disposing of something. It's an extremely unpleasant task. An old oil drum, five liters of diesel, and there's not much left. It gets extremely hot and glows almost white. My heart, mind, 
and soul are heavy with the consequences of my actions. I'm a psychopath with a conscience. It's a joke, actually. Thus, investigators began to suspect Alexandra Morgan's death, and more frighteningly, that she was not Mark Brown's only victim. A spokesperson for the Sussex Police Major Crime Team stated that despite extensive investigations, we have not found Leah or her body and are asking for the public's assistance in locating her or anything related to her disappearance. After Brown was arrested on November 25, 2021, police searched his farm. They discovered a barrel inside which someone had recently burned something. Experts examined its contents and discovered bone and tooth remains. The laboratory examination confirmed that these were Alexandra Morgan's remains. In a joint statement, Neil Kimber of Kent Police and Andy Wollstenholm of Sussex Police said, Our thoughts are with the families of Alexandra and Leah during this difficult time. While we have located Alexandra's remains, we have yet to find Leah and our investigations are ongoing. We urge anyone with information about Leah or Alexandra to contact us immediately. Leah is described by police as a slim white female standing 5 feet 6 inches tall with very long black hair and blue eyes. They suspected she had tattoos of a dragon on her right leg, Chinese writing on her right leg, Chinese writing on her right hip, and a fairy sitting on a flower above the name Ryan on her right leg. The search at Brown's farm lasted approximately a month, concluding on January 7, 2022. The police discovered the bones of a Pomeranian in the pond, along with a weight tied to its collar. Investigators believed it was Leah's dog, which Brown cruelly abandoned following Leah's death. Although police were unable to locate Leah Ware's remains, Brown was charged with her death on February 1, 2022. They had previously charged him with the murder of Alexandra Morgan. Throughout the interrogation, Brown denied the charges against him. However, when they informed him of the evidence that showed he had burned Alexandra Morgan's body, he admitted her death. Yet, Brown insisted that Alexandria had died as a result of an accident. The trial of Mark Brown started on October 17, 2022. During the court proceedings, new details about these two cases emerged. The jury discovered that Brown withdrew money from Leah Ware's bank account on a regular basis following her disappearance. Following Leah's disappearance on May 7, 2021, Brown collected her prescription medication and withdrew money from a cash machine every week using her new bank card. They delivered the card to his sister Cheryl's address. He would then place the cachet and medication in a horse box belonging to their pet. Birdie's prosecution lawyer, Duncan Atkinson, detailed several times in the weeks following Leah Ware's disappearance how Brown took 200 pounds from her account, the maximum allowed in a transaction. This resulted in Leah's balance dropping from over 2,000 pounds to 45 pounds. In July 2021, jurors were informed that Brown withdrew 200 pounds from Leah's account twice shortly after transferring 200 pounds to his own account. When asked why he did this, he explained that he probably used her 200 pounds and then replaced it. At the time, someone owed me 430 pounds, so they most likely paid me back. Atkinson stated that the withdrawals from Leah's account had nothing to do with her and everything to do with you. Is this a coincidence? She died after receiving her new bank card, Brown responded. I'm not sure what you're getting at because as far as I know, she is not dead. Atkinson asks if we're running away. Ms. Where's the money? Were you? You knew Leah was in a situation where money wouldn't help her, Brown responded. I'm not sure what planet you live on. Leah wished Brown would leave his wife for her. This was stated by one of her friends during testimony at the trial. Perhaps it influenced Brown's decision to commit the crime. During the trial for Alexandra Morgan's death, Brown stated that her death was accidental. He claimed Alexandra slipped and fell on a tool, injuring her head in the workshop he rented at Little Bridge Farm. He claimed he ran over to her and discovered there was a lot of blood. As a result, he grabbed a towel and attempted to stop the bleeding from her head. When he moved her head to place the towel underneath, there was more blood. Prosecutor Duncan Atkinson objected, claiming that when you first saw her, she had collapsed on her back. There is already a lot of blood on her head. So before you do anything else, it's clear that she's hurt, needs assistance, and requires a doctor. That is absolutely obvious, Brown responded. Yes, but I was panicked and the first thing I did was grab a towel to help stop the bleeding. She had already left by that point, 
and I made it a priority to perform CPR because I couldn't find a pulse. I did not call an ambulance because my first priority was to stop the bleeding and then check for a pulse. There is no point in calling an ambulance. If it is not going to arrive on time, the first priority is to stop the bleeding. Brown stated that he was certain Alexandra Morgan had died after performing CPR and holding a mirror to her mouth and nose to check for breathing. In the five minutes that followed, he used jumpers to keep blood from flowing out from under the workshop door, went outside to vomit, and grabbed his phone from either his car or jacket pocket to call the emergency services. He then decided to cover it up, saying I wrapped Alex in a sleeping bag and wrapped a towel around her head to keep more blood from coming out. I had a dead escort on my workshop floor. How would it look like? How would I prove she had an accident? It was a foolish thing to do. It was the worst mistake I had ever made in my life. Brown then decided to dispose of Alexander's body with an incinerator he had built out of an old oil drum earlier that year and used on a regular basis to burn waste. He said I'd heard urban legends about people burning bodies and I didn't want anyone to find a body dumped somewhere. Thus, Brown claimed that he had nothing to do with Lee's disappearance and believed she was still alive. Alexandra's death was allegedly accidental. However, during the trial, the court heard testimony from Brown's boss, Alan Downs. The man claimed Brown warned him that the police might come for him and arrest him. The conversation took place on November 24. When Downs asked what the police might arrest him for, Brown said it was a double murder, and this was a critical point. With this response, Brown implied that Lee had died and that Alexandra Morgan had not died in an accident. However, Brown denied using such language. He responded, No, I said I was going away for 25 years. I'm not sure where he got the double. I stated that I would be arrested for one murder. I did not say double. When asked who he had killed, Atkinson responded, Who? The answer should have been no one. Brown responded, The answer should have been yes. But that was not what I expected to happen. I can't prove I didn't kill Alex, and I didn't expect anyone to believe me. This is why I did what I did. They were both mothers and daughters, among other things, to their families and friends, and they died in the most tragic of circumstances. Both fell into the clutches of an evil maniac. They abandoned children and devastated families throughout the murder trial in Hove Crown Court. The jurors learned about Leah Ware and Alex Morgan's lives, including their upbringing, children and relationships, work and passions. Jurors also heard attempts to change their names from Brown to, as the prosecutor put it, black, creating a false picture of the women. People should remember Lee and Alex Morgan for smiling and enjoying life. Both deserve to be remembered by their loved ones for their many qualities. On December 1, 2022, a jury of 10 men and two women convicted 41-year-old Brown on all counts. Judge Nicholas Hilliard stated that this is clearly a serious case with devastating consequences for the victim's families. He stated that the court would sentence Brown to life in prison and he would have to decide on the minimum prison term or whether he would ever be eligible for parole. The judge also stated that if Brown decided to reveal what he did with Leah or his body, he would consider it during sentencing. However, Brown passed up this opportunity. Before the judge handed down his sentence, Rebecca Martin, Leah Ware's mother, delivered a victim impact statement. She claimed Brown is continuing his sadistic torture of our family's lives by refusing to tell us what happened to her. She died because Mark Brown sought to satisfy his depraved desires. He dominated and manipulated every aspect of her existence. When he'd had enough, he discarded her like a piece of dirt. The court also heard from Alex Morgan's parents, who described her as bright, energetic, and determined to succeed. She faced challenges, but she was overcoming them and looking forward to the future with her two children, whom she adored, on January 13, 2023. The court sentenced Mark Brown to two life sentences. He will be eligible for parole in 49 years. Judge Hilliard, who sentenced Brown in his absence, after he refused to appear in court, stated, No sentence I pass is any measure of the lives lost. Nothing can correct what the defendant has done. That's not possible. His conscience is unaffected by what he has done. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys. Welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. 
In this video, we look at the events that occurred on January 13, 2019. Surveillance cameras caught 17-year-old Augustina M. Winkelried leaving a bowling club she'd attended with her friends. Several hours later, it became clear that Augustina was missing and her family began searching for her. Shortly after, she became the talk of the small Argentine town of Esperanza, where she lived, and word spread quickly throughout the country. Augustina was born on June 6, 2001, in Esperanza, where she lives with her large family. As the youngest of her parents' five children, she was always given preferential treatment. It is common knowledge that the youngest child in a family receives more attention due to their age. Augustina was described as friendly, caring, and always smiling. She, like most young people, enjoyed spending time with friends, whether at the movies, bowling alleys, discos, or simply playing the ukulele. Esperanza is a small town with slightly more than 40,000 residents, the majority of whom know one another. Because of the town's limited entertainment options, all of the young people there met and knew each other in some way. As a result, Augustina's parents became concerned, but we are not afraid for her, allowing her to go out and spend time with her friends, with the only condition that she stay in touch and send us her whereabouts. On Saturday afternoon, January 12, 2019, Augustina's father dropped her off at a friend's house where a group of about six people had planned to meet. The girls had planned to go to Teos, a nightclub and bowling center after everyone had gathered. Augustina told her father that she would spend the night at a friend's house after leaving the club and return home the next afternoon. She was dating a man named Now. They appear to get along well and their families know one another. That night, about an hour before midnight, Augustina messaged him and asked him to go to the club, but he declined, saying he was tired. Later, the young man came to regret staying at home that night. Augustina and her friends were having a wonderful time at the club. They had a good time, danced and enjoyed the music. By five of them, the friends decided it was time to leave. However, Augustina ran into another group of her friends at the club and decided to stay longer. As a result, the group split up and headed home leaving Agostina with a different group of friends. At 5.40 a.m.m., a surveillance camera caught Agostina walking out of the venue with a cell phone. After leaving the building, she went to a fast food restaurant. Agostina waited her turn, received her order, spoke briefly with an acquaintance, and then proceeded to the road. The friend's house, where she planned to spend the night, was not far away. So Agostina decided to walk there. The day was getting brighter, and she appeared to be confident in her safety. As you can see, there were no sidewalks, so one could only walk along the side of the road. It's unclear if Augustina drank that night, but the footage shows that, despite wearing high-held platform shoes, she walked steadily. She veered slightly to the side as she approached the driveway, but this is not surprising given that the site is an unpaved road with rocks. She could have simply tripped. In addition, it should be noted that the Club Teos has an age division, one zone is reserved for those under the age of 18, so no alcohol is sold there. Agustina eventually failed to arrive at either her friend's or her own home. Her parents were always aware of her location because she had always aware of her location because she had always told them this time. However, when morning arrived, they noticed that their daughter had not texted to let them know she had arrived at her friend's house and was fine. So they became concerned and attempted to contact Agustina but were unable to do so. Her phone number was unavailable. The parents were aware that she was expected to spend the night at a friend's house. So they contacted her friend, who informed them that Augustina hadn't returned from the club. The friend also informed the concerned parents that Augustina had stayed at the club with another group of people. After contacting all of his daughter's acquaintances and discovering that no one knew where she was, Augustine's father called the police and began searching for her on his own. Daniel M. Winkelried was a well-known figure in town having served as president of a local soccer club and owning a small furniture manufacturing and sales company. When they discovered he was in distress, many locals volunteered to help with the search, and Christina's friends were able to raise awareness of the case through social media, resulting in coverage on television news programs. After beginning the investigation and learning that Augustina had been at Taylor's Club all night, police officers went there to speak with potential witnesses and examine the surveillance camera footage available at the venue. Aside from footage of Agostina walking towards the road, this revealed nothing new. 
When the officers realized which direction she had gone, they began questioning people who lived along the road, as well as employees from various businesses in the area. It was possible that someone had seen or heard something, and any indication was significant. Agustina's friend Brian was among those who learned of her disappearance through social media. I noticed the large number of posts about finding Agustina. Brian contacted her father, Daniel, and informed him that he had seen Agustina outside the Tios Club around 6 a.m. He was driving along when he noticed her standing by the roadside. I was talking to the driver of a silver car that had stopped next to her a few hundred meters from the club. Brian continued down the road, but he quickly grabbed his phone and called Agustina. He asked if she was okay and if she needed a ride home. She said she was fine and that the man driving the silver car had stopped to warn her that it was dangerous to walk on this road because she could be hit by traffic. She accepted Brian's offer of a ride and explained that she was going to a friend's house. There was a gas station a few hundred meters from where Brian spotted Agustina, so we decided to stop, wait for her, and fill the tank. When Agustina didn't arrive at the gas station 15 minutes later, Brian decided to go get her himself, but she was nowhere to be found. His attempts to contact her were also unsuccessful, as she did not respond. He hadn't given it much thought at the time, assuming that Egg, Agustina, had gone directly to her friend's house, forgetting that he was waiting for her. Given all of this information, the main clue was a silver car. Brian couldn't say for certain which brand and model the car was, but, according to him, it was quite old. Demand, sitting in the driver's seat, may have been the last person to see Augustina. The possibility that he was involved in her disappearance was not ruled out. When the police attempted to locate Augustina's cell phone, they discovered that the last time it received a signal was from a tower in the same neighborhood as the club. Because the club was on the outskirts of town, there were numerous vacant lots and fields where the search teams focused their efforts. Augustina was walking along the road and noticed that only this gas station had surveillance cameras. Daniel had arrived to examine the footage and determine whether or not his daughter had reached that location. Given the location of her friend's house, Augustina was bound to pass by the gas station. Daniel explained the situation to the gas station attendant and asked for assistance. The attendant, who is a father himself, showed him the footage the camera captured that morning, almost losing his job as a result. Later, the gas station owner fired him for allowing an unauthorized person to watch the footage without permission. When the town's residents learned of this, they banded together and began refueling their vehicles elsewhere. This quelled the gas station owner's rage, and he reinstated the employee and apologized to him at Esperanza's home. Daniel reviewed the footage captured by the gas station cameras, but did not find his daughter. It appeared that Agustina never arrived. However, the footage revealed the same old silver card that Brian had previously described. It had passed the gas station around the same time that Agustina was walking down the street. It was a Renault car, and Daniel determined who the owner was. Pablo Trionfini, 39, is a municipal employee, or more specifically, a garbage man who lives less than a kilometer from the gas station. He had no prior criminal record but had drawn police attention on several occasions. The first time, his ex-wife reported him to the police for beating her. This resulted in a court order prohibiting Tryon Feeney from contacting his ex-wife. He was arrested a second time for violating the order. Both of these incidents occurred in 2017. Police officers arrived shortly after Daniel reviewed the footage from the gas station security cameras also wanting to see the footage, but unaware that Augustina's father had already done so. They were able to identify the silver car after reviewing the surveillance footage. When they discovered that Daniel had watched the video before them, they became concerned the lynching would occur and went straight to Pablo Trianfini's home. When the police arrived, they discovered that people had gathered in front of the house and were shouting, but Augustina reported that the crowd dispersed after the police arrived and one of the people present informed the officers that Trionfini was inside the house. When he heard the shouting, he looked out, but when he saw the hostile crowd, he fled inside and bolted the door. The officers lacked probable cause to justify an unauthorized entry into the man's home, so they requested a search warrant. While awaiting the warrant, the house was cordoned off to deter the suspect from attempting to flee. Around midnight, one police officer decided to investigate the yard and discovered that Pablo Trionfini had died. The police officer rushed to help, but it was too late. Trionfini had died. Such a turn of events revealed his involvement in Augustine's disappearance. 
but despite searching his home and car, the police discovered no evidence. Pablo Trianfini used the rope to free himself from further trouble and proceedings. As the police were searching the house, Finna's neighbor approached them and said that Pablo had stopped by during the day and asked to borrow a shovel, allegedly to dig for earthworms because he was fishing. A half hour later, he returned the shovel and told his neighbor that he had noticed something strange. Tron Feeney thanked the man and said tentatively, Thank you. I am not sure if I will ever see you again. Witnesses saw Try and Finney leave leave the house several times on Sunday while riding his bike and holding a shovel. This could indicate that Augustina had passed away. On Monday, January 14, 2019, a search began at dawn with the assistance of drones and police dogs. Augustine's half-stained body was discovered about 500 meters from his club at 9, 15 a.m. It had been hidden in a ditch filled with dense vegetation. As word spread about the discovery of Augustina in Winkelried's body, her friends and family began to send her heartfelt farewells on social media. This included a touching post from her boyfriend who, well, posted two photos of himself with Augustina on his Instagram account and wrote, I wish I could wake up and this was all a dream. I'll miss you so much. My love will never leave my heart. Fly hello, my queen. I know we'll see each other again. The forensic examination revealed that Augustina fought desperately for her life. Her hands were covered in defensive wounds, with pieces of her attacker's skin under her fingernails. A DNA test confirmed that the man who assaulted Augustina was Pablo Trianfini. Forensics determined that the cause of death was strangulation. We may never know how Augustina ended up with Pablo Trianfini, whether he forced her or simply offered her a ride. We can only speculate because only two people knew the truth and we'll never be able to speak about it again. The police searched the tree on Finnis's phone and found no evidence that he knew Augustine. Hundreds of people came to the funeral to say goodbye to Augustina and Winkelried. Meanwhile, according to Argentine media reports, Pablo Tryon Finney's relatives did not attend his funeral. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The family of a well-known Australian businessman was found dead in their family mansion. From the very beginning of the investigation, detectives faced a nearly complete absence of evidence and suspects. However, soon unexpected details emerged in the investigation, altering the course of the case and revealing a truth that not only shocked the relatives of the deceased but also stirred public outcry. The Minin and Yun lines had immigrated to Australia from China to pursue higher education. They met during their time at the University of Sydney and later got married, establishing their permanent residence in Newcastle. In 1994, their daughter Jun Lin, commonly known as Brenda, was born, and she was soon joined by two sons, Henry and Terry. In 2002, the Lyne family opened a kiosk on Rose Street, selling various news publications, newspapers and magazines. Gradually, their small business began to prosper and generate a substantial income. The family was highly respected within the community, known for their hard work as their store operated seven days a week, and they were seen as loving and caring parents. Their eldest daughter Brenda grew up to be beautiful, intelligent, and kind. Henry was very sociable and had a strong interest in sports. While the youngest Terry kept up with his older siblings, the strong family bonds were reflected in their outward success as their business thrived. The family's income from the store had already reached around $1 million per year, making the Line family one of the most prosperous and respected in North America. Having achieved success in their business, Min Line and Yun Line assisted relatives from China in relocating to Australia. Lily's sister had been living in the same house as her sister and her family since she moved to Australia, helping to raise the children. Mineline organized the relocation of his parents, and the elderly couple settled in Maryland, located a 30-minute drive from North Ephesus. He also helped his sister Kathy and her husband Liam Bin Ai, known as Robert, with their move. Kathy and Robert, after an unsuccessful attempt to start their own restaurant business, settled in North Epping, living just a few minutes' walk from the Line family's home, and both of them worked at Minline's store on the morning of July 18, 2009. The store's regular customers were alarmed to find it closed without any prior notice. This was highly unusual since the store had always been open seven days a week. 
Concerned about this, one of the store's loyal patrons contacted Kathy to inquire about the reason for the store's closure. Kathy was unaware of why her brother hadn't shown up for work and failed to notify anyone suspected that Min Line might be ill. In response, Kathy and her husband went to her brother's home upon approaching the house. They discovered the front door unlocked inside the house. When they reached the second floor, they were met with a gruesome crime scene involving the Line family. Kathy immediately reported the discovery to the police, leading to the revelation of the Line family's demise. Police swiftly arrived at the scene and found the lifeless bodies of 43-year-old Yun Line, commonly known as Lily, her two sons Henry, aged 12, and Terry, aged 9, as well as her 39-year-old sister Yan B, known as Irene. Blood splatters were discovered throughout the house from floor to ceiling. In the initial hours of the investigation, the police became suspicious of Manlin, the head of the family, as his body was not found during the examination of the house. Investigators also noted the absence of another family member, the eldest daughter of Jun Lin, known as Brenda, upon inspecting the crime scene. It became apparent that the assailant had not entered her room as there were no traces of blood and the room remained untied. Two hours after the police arrived at the scene, a man's body was discovered under a blanket on a bed next to Lily, indicating that Lin's family's head was not a fugitive but had become a victim of the attack. To ascertain the identities of the deceased, Investigators had to turn to forensic examination as their faces were so disfigured that their relatives could not identify them. The police began a thorough examination of every corner of the crime scene, but at that point they had no leads regarding the motive for the crime or the identity of the perpetrator initially upon examining the bodies. Investigators believed that the assailant had shot the victims in the face from close range. Given the extent of their disfigurement, however, later, the results of a forensic examination revealed that the victims had been brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt, heavy object, likely a hammer. Additionally, four out of the five victims exhibited signs of asphyxiation, indicating that they had been strangled before succumbing to their injuries. The time of death was estimated to be between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Police learned that on the evening of Friday, July 17, 2009, a large family dinner had been organized at Min Lin's parents' home attended by the entire family, including Kathy and Robert. According to the parents' accounts, the dinner proceeded in a warm and pleasant atmosphere, with everyone enjoying their time together. The only family member absent was Brenda, who was 15 years old at the time she had left on a school trip to study the French language in New Colonia with Cheltenham Girls High School and had learned about the brutal murder of her entire family through Facebook. This incident created a media frenzy and shocked the community. Many North Eping residents were personally acquainted with the Line family and were deeply saddened by their tragic demise. The public funeral for the Line family took place at Olympic Park on August 8, 2009, with over a thousand people coming to bid farewell to the family after the funeral, despite M. Land's parents offering Brenda to live with them. Kathy and Robert insisted on taking custody of the girl, citing their advanced age and swiftly formalized guardianship. Brenda returned to school and Kathy and Robert took over the management of the store. The police continued their investigation, which was filled with rumors and speculations. One theory suggested that the initial intention of the perpetrator might have been a robbery gone awry. Another theory implied a connection to the Chinese mafia, as a few days prior to the murder, Minin had witnessed an armed robbery of a cash and transit vehicle near his store. It was believed that he was killed to prevent him from testifying, and the rest of the family became unintended victims. However, the investigation could not find any evidence linking the crime to the robbery witnessed by mine. The idea of a home invasion was also swiftly ruled out as there were no signs of forced entry and nothing had been stolen from the house during the investigation. It became evident that the murders had been meticulously planned, and the absence of any foreign fingerprints in the house, except those of the family members, led investigators to believe that the killer likely wore gloves given that the murder weapon was not found at the crime scene. Investigators concluded that the perpetrator had carefully planned the crime and had taken steps to dispose of the murder weapon. Detectives hypothesized that to maintain control and prevent the hammer from being dropped during the attack, the assailant likely had it attached to their wrist in some way at the crime scene. 24 bloody shoe prints were discovered, which were determined to correspond to a shoe size of 9.5 in American measurements, indicating that the assailant acted alone. Investigators speculated that the crime was most likely committed by someone close to the family, 
who had access to the house was familiar with the layout of the rooms, knew the location of the circuit breaker and alarm system, and was aware of Brenda's absence from the house. This idea was supported by the fact that the killer did not enter Brenda's room as no traces of blood were found in there. The brutality of the crime led investigators to consider that it was driven either by intense hatred or overwhelming passion. Despite their suspicions, investigators still had no concrete idea of who might be involved in this crime. Extensive interrogations of potential witnesses yielded no valuable information. Mel's parents, as well as Kathy and Robert, were questioned multiple times, but no significant information regarding potential wrongdoers was obtained. Kathy and Robert held a press conference organized by the police, urging the public to share any information they might have about the case. However, for several months, the investigation seemed to be at a standstill. The immense public pressure on the police demanded a swift resolution to find and punish the perpetrator. Consequentially, a special task force was established within the police department, consisting of the most experienced investigators. Investigators they decided to re-examine all the evidence in the case that had not been thoroughly analyzed before. During the review of a recorded phone call between Kathy and the emergency services operator, towards the end of the call, the police noticed some unintelligible muttering in the Cantonese dialect. This recording was quickly translated, revealing a woman pleading with her husband not to leave her alone in the house, because she suspected the perpetrator might still be inside. Investigators found it peculiar that Robert had left his wife alone at the crime scene without checking whether the s was still in the house or not. This raised suspicions that he might have known for certain that she was safe and that the s had already left the premises. As a result, investigators decided to scrutinize Robert more closely, shifting the focus of the investigation in this direction and searching for additional evidence during their investigation. Detectives discovered that Robert had unrestricted access to the Lyne family home as he had a key to it. Furthermore, he had a motive for committing the crime after moving to North Epping. Robert struggled to establish himself in a business and had to work as an employee for Mine Line. Following the Line family's death, all of their assets were transferred to Brenda, but as she was only 15 years old at the time, the legal guardianship of the girl meant that Kathy and Robert had control over all the family's assets and business police learned that almost immediately after taking custody of Brenda, Robert pressured Min's parents to vacate the house that Minlin had purchased for them. Police suspected that Robert, humiliated by his own failures and driven by jealousy, harbored a plan to seize the fortune accumulated by the Lynn family through years of hard work. Despite Robert being the primary suspect in the case, the police only had suspicions against him in the hope of obtaining more substantial evidence. Investigators installed surveillance cameras in his residence as part of a covert operation that continued for six months in May 2010. During another round of questioning with Kathy, investigators intentionally broached the topic of the bloody shoe prints found in the house. She disclosed that Robert wore a six shoes in size 9.5. This revelation was a breakthrough for the investigation because the A6 shoe model was rare as it had been discontinued in 2005, and these shoe prints were discovered at the crime scene. Just a few days after this, Robert was caught on hidden cameras inside his home, cutting up several AAC boxes, moistening the torn cardboard bits in a bucket of water, and flushing them down the toilet, armed with this information from the surveillance cameras. The police obtained a search warrant for Robert's house. During the search, investigators discovered a stain marked as number 91 on the garage floor beneath a chest of drawers. Subsequent laboratory analysis revealed that this stain was human blood containing a complex mixture of DNA, including at least four out of the five victims. Experts also determined that the composition of this stain matched the blood found in the victim's house on May 5, 2011, almost two years after the crime was committed. Robert was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He was remanded in custody without the possibility of bail. His trial did not begin until May 2014, and he pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. The prosecution presented a wealth of new evidence against Robert. One of the most crucial pieces of evidence in the case was the testimony of an informant from prison, who revealed that while awaiting trial, Robert had confessed to him. He admitted that on the night of the murders, he left his house without his wife, noticing he had given her a large dose of sedatives. Additionally, he shared that he had purchased the murder weapon, a hammer, from a budget store in town, knowing that the store had dummy surveillance cameras, ensuring there would be no evidence of the purchase. Robert also confessed to a cellmate that he had struggled to dispose of the hammer for a while, fearing he might be caught on surveillance camera recordings. 
Robert's defense attempted to convince the jurors to disregard these testimonies, suggesting that the witness may have had ulterior motives, such as reducing their own prison sentence in exchange for their testimony. In the end, the entire body of evidence came down to the informant's words against Robert's consistent denials. Denials despite the compelling evidence in the case, it seemed like the trial might fall apart and the court would not reach a verdict. However, a sudden and unpleasant revelation during the trial changed the course of the investigation. Brenda confessed to her attorney that Robert had subjected her to sexual abuse for many years, starting when he and his wife moved to Sydney and her family was still alive. When the girl moved into his home after her parents' deaths, his venance only intensified. Intensified revelation led to the suspension of the trial for further investigation and the uncovering of these newly disclosed facts. Several months later, in August 2014, the second trial began. The prosecution now argued that Robert was driven not only by jealousy and greed, but also by a sexual obsession with his niece. Despite all the evidence against Robert, the defense continued to assert that he was the victim of public pressure on the police. They also cast doubt on the nature and timing of the garage bloodstain, suggesting that it could have entered the garage floor after Robert and Kathy discovered the bodies at the crime scene, and Robert might have accidentally stepped on blood while wearing the same shoes. Ultimately, this trial was postponed due to the judge's illness. In February 2015, the third trial began, which again led to no conclusive verdict as the jurors failed to reach a unanimous decision. In December of the same year, Robert was released on bail after spending nearly five years in prison without a conviction. The fourth trial began in June 2016, and once again, the jurors could not reach a unanimous decision. It wasn't until January 12, 2017, during the fifth hearing of the case, that the court delivered a guilty verdict, sentencing Robert to five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole in June 2020. Robert filed an appeal, which was denied on February 21st. He is currently behind bars but has never admitted his guilt in committing this crime. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The case of Sabrina Queter, a heinous crime in an affluent London neighborhood. Compulsive thoughts are a mental disorder defined by the occurrence of ideas and actions that occur against a person's will and from which they are unable to break free. In some extreme cases, these thoughts can literally take over the mind, and when combined with a complex manipulative nature, innate cruelty, and a manic desire for dominance, the result is a time bomb. Sabrina Queter, a British woman, had every opportunity to live the fabulous, wealthy, and carefree life she had envisioned since she was a child, but it was never enough. No partner was good enough for her, and she always felt like she was born for fame, attention, and luxury. Her unrealized ambitions and obsessive fantasies eventually led to delusions and violent outbursts. Unfortunately, Sabrina discovered a defenseless man on whom she vented her rage. This case became one of the most notorious and high profile in British history. An innocent girl who cared for her children was the victim of a deranged situation. Sabrina Kuwait her early years. Sabrina Queter was born on December 5, 1982 in a London suburb with a distinct blend of French and Algerian heritage from her parents. This unique combination most likely contributed to her striking appearance and fiery personality. Sabrina, the eldest of four children, was the family darling, constantly praised and held up as a role model for others. Her family moved to France when she was two years old, settling in Paris where she spent the majority of her childhood and youth. Sabrina's complex personality began to emerge during her school years. Her former classmates later described her as arrogant, domineering, self-absorbed and exceedingly selfish. She had few friends, both at school and among her neighborhood peers, and she considered everyone around her to be unworthy in comparison to other bright and outgoing girls her age. She was especially hostile, seeing them as competitors and enemies. With her stunning appearance, a striking brunette with brown eyes and an impressive physique, Sabrina could have pursued a modeling career if she could connect with people instead of manipulating them. As a child, during her youth, she participated in sports and expressed an interest in music. However, her inconsistency, impatience for quick results, and lack of effort hampered her success in all fields. 
Years later, Sabrina claimed that she was treated harshly by her maternal relatives in France during her childhood. However, these claims were never supported or proven. In contrast, her family insisted that she was indulged and constantly sought attention. Sabrina suffered a back injury while participating in sports as a teenager, which led to her dependence on prescription painkillers. She attempted to obtain these drugs illegally, resulting in her arrest and a police warning. Sabrina was always hyper-focused on herself and her appearance, craving constant attention. She was confident that her future held a wealthy, glamorous life filled with celebrity interactions and her own stardom. Her fantasies seemed to overshadow her reality at times, as she believed she had earned her place in Hollywood. Sabrina holds an English and French literature degree from the Sorbonne. However, since 2006, she has claimed various fashion industry professions such as stylist, makeup artist, fashion designer, and designer, despite her lack of actual expertise in these areas. Complex relationship with Wissam Maduni, Sabrina, 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 Queter is known for her stunning appearance and a penchant for captivating men and exploiting their affection, but she never considered any of her suitors to be worthy of a serious relationship. She was literally waiting for a prince who would fully obey her. Sabrina was still unsure of her life goals after graduating from school, believing she was entitled to everything without effort. Nonetheless, she enrolled at the prestigious Sorbonne University while also working at a sweet shop for financial support. At the age of 18, she met Wissam Maduni, who was six years her senior, worked as a manager at the headquarters of a major French company, and attended one of Paris's most prestigious universities. Despite not being particularly attractive, he wished to pursue a master's degree in order to advance his career in the celebrity world. He fell deeply in love with Sabrina and was willing to satisfy all of her desires and fantasies. Sabrina found Maduni appealing, seeing him as someone she could manipulate as well as a ticket to a wealthy life. He was ambitious, capable of great professional success, and eager to pamper and spoil her. The couple started dating in 2000 and decided to live together after a few months. Sabrina quickly revealed her true nature, attempting to control my duties in every way. If her demands were not met, she resorted to tantrums, threats, and even physical violence. Furthermore, she soon began openly cheating on Maduni, with no attempt to hide or justify her actions. She could have flings with anyone, from a random acquaintance to Maduni's best friend or colleague. Despite numerous attempts to end the relationship and leave her, Maduni always returned, unable to let go of his deep love for Sabrina. Maduni received his master's degree and a significant promotion in 2001, and he began earning a substantial income, which he lavished on Sabrina's expensive clothing and entertainment. Its family owned several properties in Paris, and he managed them, giving Sabrina all of the rental income. Maduni, who also had Franco-Algerian roots, saw Sabrina as a kindred spirit. According to some reports, the couple married in a special Muslim ceremony in the fall of 2001, as evidenced by a certificate issued by a mosque in Argentina. However, the religious ceremony was insufficient to establish the union as official and legal. The couple had a son, whose paternity Madonia officially acknowledged. However, years later, a Frenchman named Anthony Francois claimed to be the child's father, and a witness in Quitter's trial described her as volatile, unpredictable, promiscuous, and manipulative during her relocation to London. The global financial crisis hit hard in 2008, causing the company where Uisem Maduni worked to go bankrupt, costing him his high-paying job. Around this time, Sabrina Quitter developed a strong desire to move to London. She made the decision without consulting her partner, leaving her with few options and hoping for a new career in one of the world's major financial hubs. Maduni followed her to London, where he found employment in a major English bank. However, Sabrina has struggled to establish herself in the fashion industry. Her ambitions to be a designer, model, or makeup artist were stifled by a lack of skills, experience, and formal education in these areas. Consequently, she had to lower her expectations. She worked in a variety of positions over the years, including nanny in a call center, cafe, and even network marketing. Sabrina Queter's search for love took an unexpected turn when she rekindled her teenage passion for music, adding the titles of musician and composer to her resume. Despite her enthusiasm, Sabrina struggled to secure professional opportunities in the music industry. 
She attended a number of auditions and social events in the hopes of making valuable connections. Sabrina was fortunate to meet Mark Walton, a well-known musician, songwriter, and one of the founding members of the popular Irish boy band Boyzone. After leaving the group, Mark went on to become a successful producer and music mogul, working with Jennifer Lopez, Jessica Simpson, and Lady Gaga. By 2016, his net worth had surpassed $1 billion. Mark was exactly the type of person Sabrina had hoped to meet on her way to a life of fame and luxury. She impressed Mark with her beauty and charisma. He was captivated by her and openly admitted to falling in love at first sight, unable to think of anyone but the beautiful woman. Their relationship grew quickly, and Sabrina worked hard to remain pleasant and endearing, eventually ending her relationship with modernity because she saw a bright future with Mark. His previous relationship and child did not deter her. Within weeks, the lovers had moved in together to a luxurious home in an affluent area of London. Mark covered all of Sabrina's expenses, including the rent for the lavish house she chose for several months in order to bring and live the opulent life she had long desired, which included socializing with celebrities, attending elite events, wearing couture clothing, and even appearing in glossy magazines. Sabrina found it difficult to manage Mark because she was afraid of losing him. She couldn't control her nature for long and soon began to be jealous of every woman around Mark. Sabrina's demands grew over time, requiring more gifts and luxury. Mark spoiled her with designer clothes, jewelry, and trips to upscale restaurants and clubs. But it wasn't enough for her. The couple's home had a high turnover of staff and nannies, as Sabrina's paranoia led her to believe they were either stealing or trying to seduce Mark. Her irrational behavior eventually. Mark was driven to his breaking point. In 2011, he ended the relationship and moved to California, leaving Sabrina with nothing. Losing Mark also meant losing the luxurious lifestyle she had enjoyed. Sabrina began conducting interviews, accusing Mark of cruelty, violence, and substance abuse. She called him crying, begged him to return, and even threatened to commit suicide. But none of these tactics brought him back. Who is the father of the second child? After realizing she had lost Mark Walton, Sabrina Queter contacted her ex-partner, Wissam Maduni, who was a successful bank executive and immediately forgave and accepted her back, despite still having feelings for her. They resumed living together. Sabrina discovered she was pregnant shortly after her reunion with Maduni. She quickly notified Walton, who, through his lawyers, expressed a willingness to provide for the child and Sabrina by offering a monthly allowance. However, Walton insisted on a paternity test after delivery to confirm his fatherhood. Sabrina's refusal to take the test, which could have resulted in substantial regular payments, indicated her uncertainty about the child's paternity. Instead of agreeing to the test, she demanded that Walton double the proposed allowance. After his refusal, she declared war on the musician. Sabrina took to social media to spread false claims that Walton was obsessed with her, insanely jealous of modernity, and physically threatening them. She accused Walton of breaking into their home, assaulting Maduni, frightening the children, and sexually assaulting her in an unnatural manner. However, she was unable to back up her claims because Walton had a solid alibi and had been in the United States since their breakup. Sabrina temporarily stopped accusing her ex-boyfriend after Walton filed a defamation lawsuit and the police threatened her with legal action. She settled in Wimbledon, southwest London, with Maduni and their two children, leading a seemingly peaceful existence as the conflict appeared to be resolved. Sabrina Queter, a French nanny who was used to handling household chores but found it difficult to manage two children, decided to hire a nanny who could also help with housework. She advertised a job online and conducted interviews in person. The majority of candidates failed to meet her expectations, and those who did did not last long in her household. Sophie Leonette, a young French woman, responded to the advertisement. At the time, Sophie, 19, was in her provincial hometown in France, so the interview was done via video call. This modest, unassuming provincial agreed to all terms including childcare, housework, and cooking, in exchange for a symbolic weekly salary of 50 British pounds, which included full board and lodging with the employer. Sophie was born on January 7, 1996, in the small town of Troy, near Alex, and her parents, Catherine and Patrick Leonette, were simple workers with a modest, if not poor, lifestyle. 
Sophia graduated from school with a diploma in childcare but did not want to work in her province, preferring to relocate to a larger city, known for being shy, quiet and unassuming in appearance, but extremely kind and open-hearted. Sophie was loved by those who knew her despite her poor vision. She wore glasses, which she was slightly self-conscious about, and their conversation made her realize that Sophie, the plain gain, would be an ideal target for her manipulations. Furthermore, Sophie was eager to gain experience and good references, so she was willing to work for the minimum wage. Sophie thought Sabrina seemed like a serious and reliable employer, which she told her parents before leaving for London. Kind employers rose to a sophisticated status. Initially, Sophie Leonette seemed to be doing well, believing that working for the tweeters would be a great way to start her nanny career. She quickly bonded with the children, completed household chores as required by her contract, and had enough time and resources to improve her English and explore city attractions. This peaceful period lasted several months, and everything seemed fine. Maduni lost his job, and the family's only reliable source of income became Walton's monthly child support payments. To bring it back, Walton was asked to pay more money, which prompted him to request a DNA test to confirm his paternity. The family faced serious financial difficulties, including high rent and basic living expenses. Of Sabrina, unwilling to cut back on her luxuries and desperate to maintain her socialite lifestyle, she became irritable and aggressive, frequently venting her frustration on the young nanny. The couple tried to start a bakery with their last funds, but it failed. Sabrina then turned to Walton and asked for a large sum of money to start a clothing line, only to be met with a categorical refusal resulting in tears and complaints about poverty. Sabrina frequently complained to Lynette about her ex-lover, and the nanny attempted to console her employer. What happens next varies according to the source. According to one version, who either devised a scheme to use Sophie as a weapon to blackmail Walton. She intended to portray Sophie as Walton's, an accomplice and lover who was allegedly planted in their home to disrupt their lives and endanger the children. Sabrina claimed that the provincial fool was in love with Walton and used her as a tool for vengeance. She believed that recording and presenting the nanny's confessions to the police would be sufficient evidence to seek restitution from Walton for his heinous act. Sophie refused to make false statements on camera. Another version, as argued by Quitter's lawyers in court, suggested that Sabrina believed in her conspiracy theory because of her mental illness and saw Sophie as an enemy and a threat to her family. She allegedly did not force the nanny to give false testimony, but she truly believed Sophie was Walton's accomplice who infiltrated their home to harm them, regardless of the truth. Sophie's life quickly devolved into a living nightmare, a torture chamber in the basement of a wealthy home. Sophie Leonette, a young French woman, was initially burdened with extra work that did not correspond to an increase in her meager salary. Eventually, she was engrossed in endless chores from dawn to late night, with no personal time and effectively imprisoned within the house walls. Sophie's pay was soon halted entirely, preventing her from fleeing or returning to France. Her employers seized her passport, making her a captive. Her interactions with family were strictly monitored. The situation worsened. Sophie was barely fed and constantly pressured to make false statements about Walton, whom she had never met or known. She was only communicated with through screams, insults and threats and was accused of stealing money and valuables. She was threatened with imprisonment if she didn't comply with their demands regarding the musician. When screaming and blackmail became ineffective, the Sabrina Coiters used more brutal and sophisticated methods. Sophie was effectively relocated to a cold basement where she spent all of her time when not working, eating scantily once or twice a day and becoming emaciated and weak. However, the cold and hunger were not her worst experiences Physical abuse became the most traumatic stage. It began with slabs and hair pulling, but quickly escalated to Sabrina breaking Sophie's nose and a violent assault. The sight of blood seemed to enrage Sabrina, making beatings a daily occurrence for Sophie. Every day brought new methods of cruelty intended to cause unbearable pain and suffering. The basement of this wealthy house in an affluent London neighborhood became a true torture chamber for the lioness, with no hope of rescue. In late summer 2017, Sabrina Queter brought the unfortunate Sophie Lioness to a police station, claiming Sophie was ready to testify against Mark Walton, with whom she allegedly had a romantic and criminal relationship, and who had allegedly sent her to their house to abuse the children. However, 
Sophie remained silent and refused to say what Sabrina demanded, so the police decided to speak with her privately and take her to a separate room. Sabrina was furious, fearing Sophie would reveal the horrors taking place in their home and implicate her and her husband. Sophie mysteriously chose not to reveal anything or seek help. The police's reaction was also peculiar. Despite seeing a malnourished, scared, and weakened young woman, they did not contact a doctor or psychologist to ensure her health and safety. At that point, the 21-year-old man weighed less than 40 kilograms, had lost some of her hair, was missing a front tooth, and was limping noticeably. Despite this, the officers remain unconcerned and simply allow everyone to leave. A disturbing phone call and a funeral pyre. Sophie Lyonette sobbed as she made her final call to her mother in mid-September. Sophie told her mother that she wanted to return home but didn't have any money. Catherine, without going into detail, simply told her daughter that she would buy her a ticket and that she should pack her bags immediately. This was the last time she heard Sophie's voice. A few days later, on September 20, 2017, in the evening, the cougar's neighbors called the police. They were alarmed by a fire in the yard, not so much by the fire itself as by the nauseating, sweetly greasy odor it emitted. A neighbor reported that it smelled like burning flesh and hair, as well as something identifiable, and that the six smoke clouds that stretched half a block immediately impregnated clothes and skin with a stench. Firefighters and a police car arrived on the scene. The house owners, who appeared calm and unaware of the reason for the emergency services visit, met them after extinguishing the fire. What appeared to be a charred human hand was discovered among the ashes. The couple was immediately apprehended and severely burned human remains were recovered from the fire. The deceased's gender and age were indeterminable, but the body was quickly identified as Sophie Leonette, as evidenced by the melted metal frame of the glasses embedded in the skull, which Sophie always wore. The cause of Sophie Lionette's death was difficult to determine because her body had been almost completely burned. Forensic experts discovered multiple rib fractures, jaw cracks, and evidence of blunt force trauma on her skull and limbs, indicating that she sustained these injuries while alive. In addition, she had several missing teeth and a severely damaged nose. Sophie had suffered prolonged and brutal beatings, resulting in broken bones and knocked out teeth. However, the extent of the fire damage made it impossible to assess the state of her internal organs and identify any penetrating wounds. The discovery of horrific video recordings in the house depicting Sophie being tortured and coerced into confessing collusion with Walton and intent to harm the children exposed her captor's true sadistic nature. Sophie was brutally beaten with an iron cord, a golf club, and even electric shocks. She also faced humiliations, such as being forced to submerge her head in the toilet until she suffocated. Experts believe Sophie died of asphyxiation before being burned on the pyre, sparing her the agony of being alive during the burning trial and sentence. Sabrina Queter and Uisem Maduni denied guilt and expressed no remorse for their heinous crime. Following the murder, Maduni calmly went to a nearby supermarket to purchase firelighter fluid for burning the body and dinner for his family, as if nothing had happened. The first court hearings against the sadistic couple started in March 2018. Sabrina attempted to portray herself as a victim, blaming Mark Walton for driving her to a pathological state with his constant torment. Sabrina was diagnosed with mental disorders, but she was not insane and could understand her actions. We were physically healthy but psychologically dependent on Sabrina and blindly obedient to her. Sabrina's former lover, who testified in court, described her as a cunning manipulator rather than a madwoman because she planned her move so carefully. Another witness stated that she always made up enemies, but did so rationally and for selfish reasons. On June 26, 2018, the court found the couple guilty of torturing, humiliating, and murdering their nanny in aggravated circumstances. They were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years and neither admitted guilt despite ongoing appeals to reduce their sentence. Sabrina attempted to sane insanity, hoping to be transferred from prison to a hospital, but was unsuccessful. Mark Walton testified at the trial that he felt guilty about his ex-lover's actions because he committed these atrocities to gain his attention and financial compensation. He expressed his heartfelt condolences to the victim's parents and voluntarily issued a large check to assist the bereaved families who had lost their beloved daughter. 
share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. This story occurred in 2002. During her summer vacation in Kansas, 19-year-old Alexandra Kemp, also known as Allie Kemp, worked at an outdoor swimming pool. Her brother also worked there, but on different shifts. When he arrived at work one day and was unable to locate his sister, he contacted his father. The guy couldn't believe Allie was closer than he thought. Alexandra Elizabeth Kemp was born on October 11, 1982, in Lawood, Kansas, which is on the border with Missouri. She was the eldest of three children and her parents' only daughter. Alexandra graduated from high school with honors and attended Kansas State University. She had big life plans, including taking a trip in 2002. After finishing her first year of university, she returned to Leewood for her summer vacation. There was an outdoor swimming pool close to her parents' house. Her younger brother, Tyler, works there. Alexandra, too, decided to work part-time over the summer to supplement her income. It was not a busy place. The pool was primarily intended for the neighborhood's residents. By the way, this pool is still operational as of June 18, 2002. Alexandra was at work. The day was cloudy, so there were fewer visitors than usual. Tyler arrived at the pool around 5 p.m. to start his shift, but his sister was not present. Her phone and purse were on the table, where she usually sat. Confused, Tyler called his parents and informed them that Alexandra had disappeared. Their father, Roger Kemp, rushed to the scene. The first thing he did was look in the pool. Roger exhaled with relief as the pool was empty. Roger then went to a small pump room near the pool, which contained various water purification equipment, a ladder, and other items. Once inside, the man looked around but saw nothing suspicious. But then he noticed a leg sticking out from beneath the tarp running up and lifting the tarp. Roger saw his daughter brutally beaten. She was naked from the waist down, with numerous bruises on her face and body. The man immediately dialed 911. While speaking with the operator, he cried and begged Alexandra not to abandon him. When the ambulance arrived, Roger was administering CPR to his daughter. They transported the girl to the hospital. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, Alexandra did not survive. She was pronounced dead immediately after arriving at the hospital. Alexandra died from strangulation despite having suffered numerous severe injuries. Although her body was partially naked, experts discovered no evidence of someone forcing her into intimacy before her death. The police cordoned off the pool while they awaited the results of an analysis of the DNA samples taken from Alexandra's body hoping to find clues that would help them identify the perpetrator. There were obvious signs of a struggle in the room where Roger discovered Alexandra's body. Her flip-flops were in two different locations. The police also discovered an open antiseptic gel with a cap inside. A few days later, while police were desperately searching for the perpetrator, Alexandra's family and hundreds of caring people said their goodbyes at a funeral ceremony. The first suspect was Phil Howes, whom Alexandra had been dating since high school. Phil also worked as the pool administrator. Alexander died while working the morning shift, and Alexandra arrived at noon. Her shift was scheduled to last five hours. Phil used to stay after work to spend more time with his girlfriend Alexandra, but this time he left immediately after his shift because they had planned an evening eight. As previously stated, Alexandra's brother arrived at work to find her already under a tarp in the pump room. However, Phil had a solid alibi, so the police quickly removed him from the suspect list. Speaking with detectives, he stated that Alexandra disliked being alone. Lawnmowers frequently stared at her and attempted to flirt with her. The police interrogated the mowers, but all of the men had an alibi. However, it was not an absolute dead end. Several men reported seeing a strange man sitting in the bushes with a video camera, lie liking the girls in swimsuits. They saw this man near the pool the day before Alexandra died. Furthermore, Someone claimed that he left in an old Ford pickup truck to investigate the activity on the girl's mobile phone. Experts discovered that she communicated with a friend named Laurel on the day she died. They even agreed to meet, and Laurel reported to the police station for questioning. She told investigators that Alexandra invited her to sit with her until her shift ended. The weather that day was not ideal, so no one came to the pool, which made Alexandra feel better. 
According to Laurel. According to Laurel, she arrived at the pool around 2.30 p.m. I parked a few yards from the fence, but Alexandra wasn't present. Laurel began honking, hoping that Alexandra would respond to the sound, but instead of her friend, she saw a man emerge from the pool house. The latter gave her a smile and waved. Laurel was unfamiliar with this man. She assumed it was Alexandra's boss and decided to leave so as not to cause any additional problems for her friend. At the time, she believed Alexandra would be in trouble if the boss discovered she was talking to friends during work hours. But that man was not Alexandra's supervisor or co-worker. The police were almost certain that Laurel had seen the criminal based on her description of the forensic artist's sketch of the suspect. The police were looking for a 30-year-old white man with stocky build, short brown hair and driving a Ford pickup truck from 1980. The authorities received numerous clues. One person stated that the man named James was straight, looked very similar to the suspect's sketch, drove an old Ford pickup truck, and worked as a mechanic about 20 minutes away from the pool. When the police found the man and took him to the station, they were astounded by his resemblance to the sketch based on Laurel's description. James denied being involved in Alexandra Kemp's death. The man's employer confirmed his alibi, stating that James was at work on the day Alexandra died. As a result, they let go more directly. Meanwhile, the police received a report from the laboratory, which revealed male DNA on a tube of antiseptic gel found at the crime scene and on Alexandra's body. However, it was ineffective because the police discovered no matches in the databases when they searched for these samples. Alexandra's friends, family and boyfriend were officially excluded from the suspect list because their DNA did not match the DNA samples discovered on her body. Alexandra's father, Roger Kemp, was the driving force behind this investigation. Losing his beloved daughter stripped him of the meaning of life, but he regained it by setting himself the goal of finding the person who killed Alexandra. In an interview, Roger stated that you have two choices. Stay in bed and pull the blanket over your head, or go out and fight. I decided to fight. Roger's perseverance and tenacity impressed the police department, so he was given his own space at the police station, where he collected all of the information he received and shared potential leads with the investigation. After reviewing all available clues, Roger and the investigators contacted the producers of the television show America's Most Wanted and requested that an episode about Alexandra's death be produced. The creators agreed. It was once the longest running television show, lasting 24 seasons. After the Alexandra story aired, the police began receiving hundreds of calls containing information. They investigated all the clues but none of them led to a breakthrough. The investigation ended in a dead end. In February 2003, eight months after Alexander died, there was a new, seemingly solid clue. As a result of the search activity, a man has been arrested in Utah. They received three statements about this person over a span of several days. Two women and a 114-year-old girl who are unrelated to each other told the police that a man forced them into intimacy. The criminal fled but was eventually apprehended in Utah. This man turned out to be James Strader, the same man the Kansas police had previously interrogated. Strader's facial features were very similar to the sketch of the suspect. For some reason, no one collected his DNA sample at the time. Perhaps no one did this because Strader's boss convinced the police that he was at work on the day of the crime and had not left. Everyone thought the Alexandra Kemp case was about to be resolved, but Strader denied any involvement in her death. He admitted that he looked very similar to the suspect's portrait, but claimed he had not been by the pool that day. He provided a DNA sample for analysis. However, the outcome disappointed everyone. His DNA did not match that found on Alexander's body, and the antiseptic gel tube ended up in prison on unrelated charges, and the Alexandra Kemp case investigation was once again stalled. Alexandra died a year ago and the police still have no suspects. Roger Kemp and Phil House, the man Alexandra was dating, continued their fight for justice. Phil, president of the student community, distributed the suspect's portrait via email to students at other universities. He also requested that students at other educational institutions watch an episode of America's Most Wanted featuring Alexandra Kemp. However, despite the best efforts of her relatives and the police, nothing was accomplished. Another year has passed. Roger Kemp refused to give up and continued to fight for justice for his daughter. He contacted America's Most Wanted again, this time requesting that the episode about Alexandra's death be rerun. 
When the creators asked Roger if there was any new information in the case, he replied, no such determination of a father who lost his daughter impressed the show's creators. Therefore, the episode was shown again. Following that, the police received a high volume of calls. Roger offered a $25,000 reward for any information that could help identify the person who killed Alexandra. The city of Leewood increased it to $50,000. Roger also published an image of his daughter's sketch of the suspects along with information about the reward in newspapers. One day, he was driving down the highway and noticed the billboards. At that point, Roger realized that a billboard was an excellent way to draw attention. He began calling advertising agencies to see how much it would cost to place the necessary information on one of the billboards. One of the agencies Roger contacted was Lamar Advertising Company. When the company's owner learned that Roger Kemp wanted to rent a billboard, he refused to take his money. Instead, he told him that he could post information for free on multiple billboards. Roger decided to post a sketch of the suspect and information about the reward on billboards near one of the state's busiest highways. The police received hundreds of clues that took time to investigate. At the same time, some clues referred to the same man. Two unrelated individuals reported on Teddy Hoover, the owner of an old Ford pickup truck. The man worked in pool maintenance and resembles the suspect sketch. This many matches could not be a coincidence. So the police began looking for a man named Teddy Hoover. They found out his address in Kansas and went there right away. Hoover opened the door. He was surprised and visibly nervous, but it was not his fault. Many people become nervous when the police knock on their door. They inquired about his whereabouts on June 18, 2002. As expected, the man responded that he couldn't remember because it had been two years. Few people will recall where they were on a specific day several years ago. Hoover also denied any involvement in the pool's maintenance, where Alexandra worked. Nonetheless, the detectives asked him to voluntarily provide a sample of his DNA in order to eliminate him from the list of suspects. Hoover responded that he needed to consult a lawyer before proceeding. He stated that he would call the police himself after consulting with a lawyer. About a day later, Hoover's lawyer contacted investigators, stating that his client was concerned about his sample ending up in the database. Teddy allegedly believed in a variety of conspiracy theories. In other words, he believed the police would use it against him. In other cases, the investigators promised not to enter Hoover's DNA into any database and would only compare it to the DNA found on Alexandra Kemp. The lawyer said he'd speak with his client and call back while waiting for a call. The police searched through the materials for the hundredth time and discovered a piece of paper with a familiar name in one of the folders. On the day Alexandra died, detectives interviewed bystanders gathered by the pool, hoping to learn if they had witnessed anything suspicious. Ted Hoover was one of the people the police spoke with by the pool. It indicated that he was at the crime scene. Despite his claim that he had never been there, the police became increasingly convinced that Ted Hoover was the man they had been looking for for two years. After several days of waiting, the investigators contacted Hoover's lawyer and asked if his client was willing to provide a sample of his DNA. The lawyer's response surprised the investigators. The man stated that his client refused his services and stopped contacting him. Police immediately went to Hoover's house, but their main suspect had already escaped. They added the 29-year-old man to the national wanted list. However, he was able to cover his tracks quite successfully. Billboards featuring the suspect's image remained in place, and detectives had been searching for Hoover for months without success. In September 2004, a man called the police and claimed to have information about the suspect. He claimed to know the name of Teddy's girlfriend, with whom he lived in Kansas. Detectives decided to identify this woman, but they discovered that she left the state around the same time that Hoover fled. The woman's name was Laura Barr and the U.S. Postal Service informed the Kansas State Police that she was receiving mail in Litchfield, Connecticut. A man named Benjamin Appleby also received mail at that address. The house where they lived was in a remote rural area. The police were certain that Benjamin Appleby was either a pseudonym or Teddy Hoover's real name. In 1997, detectives contacted the Connecticut State Police and asked them to assist in the search for Appleby. The man had legal issues in Connecticut and a warrant for his arrest was issued. The man exposed himself in front of a schoolgirl. However, Benjamin fled the state, and the police were unable to locate him. With an arrest warrant, the detectives went to Benjamin Appleby's mail delivery address. They discovered the man at home and arrested him immediately. 
as the Kansas detective suspected Benjamin Appleby and Teddy Hoover were the same person. In 1997, Appleby got into legal trouble in Connecticut. He fled the state and lived as Teddy Hoover. But when detectives in Kansas wanted a sample of his DNA to determine his involvement in Alexandra Kemp's death, he returned to Connecticut, began living under his real name, and attempted to maintain a low profile, assuming that everyone had forgotten about his wrongdoings. Appleby refused extradition to Kansas, so the Leewood detectives traveled to Connecticut, assuming he will again declare his innocence. The detectives tricked him. Before bringing the man to the interrogation room, they hung crime scene photos, as well as Alexandra and Appleby's pictures, and placed folders on the table with his name on them. The police went to great lengths to give him the impression that the investigation was thorough. When the man arrived in the interrogation room, he was speechless. One of the detectives inquired, what do you think will happen after we get a sample of your DNA? Appleby burst into tears and claimed responsibility for Alexandra's death. He recounted the events of the cloudy June day. Benjamin noticed Alexandra, and she appeared attractive. He decided to hit on her, and when she entered the pump room, he followed her and locked the door, preventing her from leaving. Appleby touched the girl, and she hit him back. He beat and strangled her out of humiliation. Alexandra lost consciousness, and Appleby decided to satisfy his lust by partially undressing her. He took a tube of antiseptic gel from the first aid kit and intended to use it as a lubricant. Alexandra's friend, who was sitting in the car behind the fence and beeping, stopped him from carrying out his plan. He was afraid of being caught red-handed, so he covered his body and left the room. When he saw Alexandra's friend, he smiled and waved. Then he got into his pickup truck and drove off. A few hours later, he returned to the crime scene and joined the crowd of onlookers gathered by the pool. The DNA analysis confirmed that the DNA found on the gel tube and Alexandra's body belonged to Benjamin Appleby. Thus, after more than two years, and largely due to Roger Kemp's efforts, the police discovered the man who killed Alexandra. Appleby told investigators that he was willing to fully admit guilt in order to quickly close the case and spare Alexander's family from another emotional ordeal. But at the first court hearing, he declared his innocence, claiming that he confessed under pressure. You can say a lot, but disputing the DNA analysis is pointless. There was only one DNA sample on the victim's body which belonged to Benjamin Appleby. Realizing this, his lawyers attempted to persuade the court that their client had no intention of killing Alexander. They said Benjamin admitted to killing Alexandra Kemp, but denied doing so on purpose. However, forensic experts reminded everyone that the criminal had been strangling the girl for approximately 10 minutes. He could have stopped, but chose not to. According to the prosecution, he came to the pool for one reason, to watch her. Unfortunately, on June 18, 2002, the pool was cloudy and empty. Appleby took advantage of the situation. In December of 2005, a jury found him guilty. The court sentenced him to life in prison with the option of petitioning for parole after 50 years. He received an additional 19 years for attempting to force her into intimacy. Appleby appealed the court's decision in 2019, and his life sentence for first-degree deprivation of life was upheld. The Court of Appeal ruled that an attempt to establish intimacy with Alexandra was considered when the first sentence was passed. Thus, Appleby was sentenced twice for the same crime. Based on this, the court reversed the second conviction. Even if released on parole, Appleby will be 80, one years old at the time. The investigators admitted that Roger Kemp's perseverance helped them find the criminal. When Appleby was in prison, Roger and his wife started a self-defense class for girls, through which tens of thousands of girls and women across the country learned basic self-defense techniques. Billboards were not a new concept in 1991. Following the death by strangulation of 34-year-old Kathy Page, her father began placing billboards criticizing the police, and this story inspired the filmmakers three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. However, after Roger Kemp posted a sketch of the suspect on billboards, people began using this method across the country. Furthermore, many people continue to use it today. Roger's persistence in the investigation, as well as his subsequent efforts to benefit society, were not unnoticed. At the White House, he received the Presidential Citizens Medal from President Barack Obama. Roger Kemp, 77, passed away on March 1, 2022, until his death, he worked for a foundation named after his daughter. He stated that he would consider his efforts successful if they saved at least one person.
Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On November 16, 2012, the dispatch center in Lake County, Ohio received a distressing 911 call. The caller, a highly agitated adolescent girl, struggled to communicate due to her distress. It soon became clear that she was reporting that her older sister was attacking their mother. Law enforcement officers quickly arrived at the residence where they encountered the frantic caller. She explained that her older sister, Sabrina Zunich, 18, had stabbed their mother. When they arrived, Sabrina emerged from the house, clutching a bloodied knife. The police demanded that she drop the weapon, and she complied. They were met with a gruesome scene inside the house. Lisa Marie McIntosh was born on May 20, 1971. Lisa, the daughter of William and Rita McIntosh, was a single mother who had a daughter from a previous relationship. She married Kevin Noefell in 2006, and he has a son from a previous relationship. The couple had their daughter in 2009. Lisa, a social worker with the Department of Children and Family Services who specialized in child abuse cases, had a strong desire to help others, demonstrating their dedication to assisting children. Kevin and Lisa have decided to become foster parents. Lisa's friend commented that when she had foster children, she treated them as if they were her own. She made a point of going above and beyond as a parent. Sabrina Zunik, 16 moved into their home in the summer of 2011. Sabrina Zunik was born on October 27, 1994, somewhere near Cleveland, Ohio. Her upbringing was difficult, as both of her parents struggled with alcohol and substance abuse, resulting in a highly unstable home environment. Sabrina's early experiences were marred by her parents' criminal troubles, and even as a baby she was exposed to substances like vodka in her bottle to induce sleep. These circumstances aided Sabrina's development of behavioral and mental health issues such as adiched, oppositional defiance disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety, and depression. Sabrina went to live with her grandmother after being removed from her parents' custody. Unfortunately, her grandmother's declining health coincided with Sabrina's adolescence, and her rebellious behavior became difficult for her grandmother to deal with. Sabrina entered the foster care system at the age of 14, living in a variety of homes and group settings before being placed with Lisa and Kevin Nofel. Sabrina made significant progress in changing her life in 2011, thanks to Kevin and Lisa's care. She began attending school on a regular basis, excelled academically, and aspired to be a massage therapist. Sabrina has seamlessly integrated into the family, making positive connections with the two girls and actively participating in school. Sabrina chose to stay with Lisa and Kevin to complete her education after turning 18 and becoming eligible to leave foster care, expressing her happiness in their home. Nonetheless, a tragic question arises. What drove Sabrina to stab her foster mother to death in front of Lisa's two young daughters? Lisa was at home with the children on November 16, 2012, while Kevin was working as a truck driver. During the night, the teenage and three-year-old daughters heard their mother's screams and discovered Sabrina stabbing Lisa multiple times. In the midst of the terrifying scene, the younger child sought refuge in a closet, while Lisa's teenage daughter pleaded with Sabrina to stop the assault and immediately dialed 911. The situation was described as completely chaotic, with the distraught caller informing police that her sister had fatally stabbed their mother. Lisa Nofell was pronounced dead on the scene. Sabrina was arrested, and the murder weapon, a 15-inch knife with a 9-inch convex and serrated blade without a hilt, was found in the house. Notably, Sabrina accepted responsibility for the act, admitting that she was the one who stabbed Lisa to death. Despite the disturbing nature of the murder, police were concerned about the brutality of the attack on Lisa Noah Fell, who had opened her home to care for a teenager. The assault resulted in almost 200 stab wounds, indicating a vicious and violent act. The police informed Lisa's husband, 42-year-old Kevin Nofel, who worked as a truck driver and was away in Michigan at the time, about her death. Kevin called 911 to inquire about the girl's well-being and was advised to pick them up from the police station. Kevin got them at 5 a.m. that morning. Over the next 10 months, law enforcement worked hard to piece together the puzzle surrounding the crime. The investigation's findings indicated a shift in the Nofel household dynamics around December of 2011. Sabrina Zunik, who was initially content in the home, 
began to have conflicts with Lisa. Jealousy emerged as a significant factor, with Sabrina expressing resentment toward Lisa and accusing her of favoring Haley and Megan, the family's two younger girls. The inquiry loomed. Could these tensions have pushed Sabrina to commit the heinous act of murdering Lisa? Several months after her arrest, Sabrina offered to cooperate with police in exchange for a 30-year parole possibility rather than a life sentence without parole. Sabrina made a shocking disclosure in her statements. She claimed to have had sex with her foster father, Kevin. Sabrina stated that this relationship began in the spring of 2012. Following Sabrina's arrest, she claimed that it was Kevin's idea to plan and carry out Lisa's murder. Kevin Nofell was facing charges for the murder of his wife, Lisa. He was charged with conspiracy to commit aggravated murder, complicity in aggravated murder, and six counts of sexual battery. During the trial, Kevin entered a not guilty plea, and the focus was solely on his charges. Sabrina, who had previously pleaded guilty, agreed to testify for the prosecution against Kevin. The prosecution argued that, while Sabrina was the one who physically stabbed Lisa to death, Kevin was aware of and involved in the murder. The prosecution claimed that Kevin wanted to end his relationship with Lisa, as evidenced by statements to friends about a possible divorce. They also claimed that Kevin stood to benefit financially from Lisa's death because of the existence of multiple insurance policies. During the trial, the prosecution presented evidence indicating a change in Lisa Nofel's behavior preceding her tragic death. Lisa's co-worker testified that in the months leading up to her murder, Lisa appeared distracted and made an effort to focus. She also mentioned delivering food to Kevin the day after Lisa died, noting that his demeanor seemed normal and seeing a picture of Sabrina on the refrigerator. Kevin's apparent lack of emotional response was accentuated when she saw him at Lisa's funeral and described him as emotionless. Another co-worker stated that Lisa underwent a significant change in 2012. Lisa began taking private phone calls away from her desk, which appeared to upset her. When she spoke with Kevin the day after Lisa's murder, he mentioned that recouping Lisa's $50,000 salary would be difficult. The prosecution called witnesses to testify about Kevin's behavior after learning of Lisa's death. Kevin was described as calm by the police officers involved in the case. Patrolmen who met Kevin in the police station lobby a few hours after Lisa's death reported that he appeared relatively calm during the encounter. Detective Brian Jackson of the Willoughby Hills Police Department testified during the trial recounting an interaction with Kevin the day after Lisa's murder. Kevin expressed a desire to enter the house, but Detective Jackson advised against it, explaining that the scene had not been cleaned. Despite the gruesome circumstances, Kevin showed no emotion and insisted on seeing the scene for himself, claiming that he had been in similar situations before. The prosecution presented evidence about the insurance money, revealing that Kevin had collected insurance funds following Lisa's death, Testimonies focused on Kevin Swift's actions on the morning of Lisa's murder. Kevin called Lisa's workplace to inquire about the paperwork required to file a claim on Lisa's life insurance policy with the union. Jill Reynolds, a benefit specialist at Gordon Food Services where Kevin worked as a transit driver, testified that on the day Lisa was killed, Kevin contacted her to report Lisa's death and stated that he planned to file an insurance claim. This information was critical in establishing a timeline of Kevin's actions and decisions in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, which helped to shape the prosecution's narrative about the financial implications of Lisa's death. The prosecution informed the court that Kevin filed several insurance claims on November 16, including a $250,000 life policy for Lisa No. This policy, which was issued on May 16, 2012, provided coverage for her life. According to Christopher Eddy, a team leader at Guardian Life Insurance Company, which provides insurance for Cuyahoga children and family services, Kevin received a $250,000 check as payment for the claim. Farmers Insurance paid Kevin $150,000 for his term life insurance policy purchased in 2009. This is for Lisa. After Lisa died, Kevin changed the property's insurance policy from renters to homeowners and added a swimming pool. Kevin also purchased auto insurance for a 2013 cruise a 2011 Malibu, and two campers using the funds not only to pay off his mortgage, but also to buy new cars and a home in Florida, as well as funding flying lessons. Lisa owned nearly $800,000. The prosecution called Sabrina as a witness in life insurance policies, which Kevin collected throughout the trial, and she testified that her relationship with her foster father Kevin began in the spring of 2012. 
Sabrina testified in court that Kevin typically drove her to Willoughby South High School and that they engaged in sexual activities during these rides. She claimed that Kevin explained that he couldn't divorce Lisa because of concerns about sharing custody of Haley. According to Sabrina, the idea of killing Lisa started as a small thought. Kevin would occasionally text her, expressing his dislike for Lisa and suggesting that once Lisa was gone, they could buy their own home and live together and Sabrina could attend college while acting as the children's mother. Sabrina told the court that she approached her friend Autumn Pavlik in early October to find someone to kill her foster mother. Autumn testified asking me if I could get her a hitman. She declared that they were getting a divorce and that she was worth more dead than alive. However, Sabrina eventually decided to handle the situation herself. She testified that on November 15, 2012, Kevin drove her to school but started crying after parking. Sabrina claimed that Kevin revealed that they had a heated argument with Lisa the night before and that he would consider suicide if Lisa wasn't dead. Sabrina told the court that I was scared for him because I had fallen in love with him. Sabrina responded by assuring Kevin that she would take responsibility for killing Lisa and Lisa died less than 24 hours later. The prosecution called Dr. Joseph Andrew Philo, a forensic pathologist at the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office, to testify about Lisa's severe injuries. Lisa's autopsy was overseen by Dr. Philo. According to Dr. Philo's testimony, Lisa died as a result of a mandible jaw injury that penetrated deeply enough to sever the carotid artery connecting the brain. Another lethal wound was discovered in her breast, which penetrated and collapsed the underlying lung. Dr. Philo described several cuts on Lisa's body as intricate and complex, implying that either the knife was twisted upon entry or the body was in a twisting motion. One of Lisa's fingers and one thumb were almost severed. Lisa's body also showed signs of defensive wounds. Dr. Philo concluded that the death was caused by at least 178 stab and incised wounds to the head, neck, torso, and extremities, along with musculoskeletal, vascular, and visceral injuries. The brutality of the assault was highlighted by the fact that the knife used had bent as a result of the extreme violence inflicted during the attack. The defense argued that Kevin was not guilty and that Sabrina bore sole responsibility for Lisa's death. They emphasized the lack of physical evidence supporting Kevin and Sabrina's Sabrina's sexual relationship, as well as the prosecution's reliance on Sabrina's testimony, which they argued was untrustworthy given her agreement to a plea deal in exchange for a reduced sentence. The defense claimed Sabrina's motive for killing Lisa stemmed from a conversation two weeks before the tragedy. According to their case, Lisa informed Sabrina that she had to vacate by January 1, 2013. Kevin decided not to testify at the trial. The court was informed that, despite the inability to recover text messages or phone call records between Sabrina and Kevin, official records revealed a significant amount of communication. 1491 texts or calls exchanged between their cell phones from November 1 to November 16, 2012. Notably, there were 78 recorded calls or texts beginning at 7 to 12 p.m. From November 15 to 12.48 a.m. on November 16, half an hour before Lisa's tragic death. After nearly 10 hours of deliberation, the jury found Kevin guilty of all 11 counts. The charges included six counts of sexual battery, three counts of complicity in aggravated murder, and two counts of conspiracy in aggravated murder. Kevin was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Sabrina, who pleaded guilty to aggravated murder, was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. The legal proceedings concluded with both individuals facing substantial penalties for their roles in the tragic events. As a result, Kevin's currently incarcerated at the Lake Erie Correctional Institution in Conanat, Ohio, with a parole date of 2043. Sabrina is currently incarcerated at the Dayton Correctional Institution in Dayton, Ohio with a parole date of 2042. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Mom is an important figure in each of our lives, across all languages, 
This word sounds warm and tender because it conveys only goodness and understanding. In times of pain, fear, or joy, a person's only words are mommy. Unfortunately, children are not always the most important part of a mother's life. A high-profile crime committed in one of the nation's largest states, Texas, has spread across the country. Christy Sheets, a young and successful 42-year-old woman, shot and killed her two adult daughters in her own backyard. But why? Let's start at the beginning and try to figure out what possessed a loving mother to commit such a cruel act. Christy Bird was born in Decatur, Alabama in 1974. Rebecca Bird's parents separated when she was very young and her mother Christy had to work hard to provide a poverty-free existence for her child. Christy was raised primarily by her grandfather. The girl adored her grandfather because he spoiled her and taught her unusual skills, such as how to handle a gun. The retired officer had an impressive collection of weapons the two of them would lock themselves in a semi-dark basement room and spend hours looking at the treasures hidden beneath her grandfather's intriguing stories. From early childhood, a person seeks to understand his place in life, learns to form relationships with others, and receives education for the purpose of applying what he has learned in real life. Christy, however, did not strive for knowledge. Despite attending one of the best schools in the state, the study was uninterested in the young rebel frequent clashes with peers severely traumatized her childhood psyche. As a result of repeated attacks and conflicts with classmates, Christy barely finishes school. It's after school. Christy relocates to Lawrence County in North Alabama to attend university. She begins working as a secretary for a transportation company, where she meets Jason Sheets, a young and promising specialist. The young people walk for hours around the city. They hike together, take a vacation to Christy's hometown, and form a strong and lasting bond. After a few years, they married and moved to Kathy's hometown, located on one of the city's quietest streets. On April 19, 1994, the young family purchases a house. Taylor, their first daughter, was born. Jason was overjoyed because he had always wanted a small daughter. The Sheets family was very well done and pleased. Jason has successfully worked as a consultant for a large oil and gas company. Christy raised her daughter and was an outstanding housewife. On October 21, 1998, Christy and Jason welcomed their second daughter, Madison. Family life proceeded in a calm and measured manner. Jason was at work. Christy was caring for the children until tragedy struck, forever changing the family's way of life. When Christy's grandfather died in 2012, she loved him as if he were the father she never had. The woman had a difficult time dealing with such a significant loss. Psychologists and antidepressants took the place of family idols. However, even two months later, she had not fully recovered from her grandfather's death. Christy's mother dies another tragedy morally kills her, and she enters a mental health clinic for the first time. One clinic is replaced by another, and antidepressants are substituted for hard alcohol. Christie's internal state has been unstable and vulnerable for a long time. Husbands and daughters have long tried to help a loved one in any way they can. After a while, they appear to be successful. Christie returns to her former life. She gets a job as a manager at a laser cosmetology clinic that specializes in tattoo removal. Work consumes all of her time, while her beloved husband and daughter have attempted to occupy her heart and thoughts. Christy shared a photo of Taylor and Madison on Facebook on September 25, 2015, her daughter's birthday. She captions it with a statement of maternal love. Christy summoned her children. These girls are incredible, sweet, kind, beautiful, and intelligent. You have no idea how much I love and cherish you. Christy wrote at the time to her daughter, in January of that year, she wrote another strong post in support of her right to bear arms, a post with a photo of a polished gun on a table next to seven bullets. I own 10 guns. Obama wants eight of my firearms. What number of guns do I have? Responding to her comments. That is right. I own 10 guns. Christy Sheets has been a vocal supporter of legislation that would make firearms more widely available to the public. She was particularly opposed to the Democratic Party's initiative to prohibit the free trade of semi-automatic handguns. Christie claimed that it would violate her family's right to self-defense. It's ironic that Christie Sheets' love, admiration, and staunch defense of guns, as well as her belief in the right to bear arms, ultimately led to the tragic loss of her two daughters and her own life. On Jason's birthday, June 24, 2016, Christie invited her daughters over for dinner. That night, the whole family congregated in the living room. 
Instead of a celebratory dinner, Jason wanted to inform his daughters about his upcoming divorce. Christy had overheard their conversation. In the living room, there was an uproar. She was yelling and cursing. Then she departed. Jason tried to calm the girls down. I promised that things would get better. But Christy returned with a gun in hand. Jason covered the children and panic spread throughout the house. Madison hid behind the couch and made a discreet call to 911. When the dispatcher answered, the girl had been overtaken by her mother. Mommy, please do not shoot. A wheezing, moaning, and silenced voice was heard again. Don't shoot. There are kids. I'll do whatever you want, don't shoot. The call was cut short. Taylor, 22, is unable to speak or relay information to the dispatcher during her second phone call. She was completely perplexed by the incredible chaos that was unfolding in the family home. Taylor was shot twice by her mother, who fired the fatal shot while her daughter lay dying on the ground outside the family home. At 5 p.m., Christy simply fired several shots at Taylor and Madison. Police responded to several 911 calls near Christy and Jason's home. Police discovered the bodies of Madison Sheets, 17, and Taylor Sheets, 22, on the ground. Christy was standing over Madison's body, holding a gun. She was clearly about to take another shot at the girl. The police officer, unsure if the victim was still alive, ordered her to drop the weapon immediately. Christy ignored the officer's demand, and they opened fire at point-blank range. The woman was killed on the spot. An examination of the victims revealed that Madison, 17, died instantly from her injuries, while Taylor, 22, was injured. She was transported to the hospital via helicopter. Unfortunately, she was unable to be saved. As a result, the injuries inflicted by their mother proved fatal to both daughters. Jason Sheets, 45, was the massacre's only survivor. Christy also shot him, but he was able to seek refuge in the home of neighbors who asked him to call the cops. The neighbors overheard him pleading with Christy, please do not hurt them. There are kids. Christy, however, did not heed those words. Instead, she fired a few bullets at Jason. Only a lucky break saved his life. However, the police were unable to question Jason about the incident's circumstances right away. When the police arrived, he was immediately taken to the hospital in a state of deep shock. The area around the house where the family tragedy took place was cordoned off. Surprising neighbors and random witnesses were repeatedly questioned. As the interviews began, it was most accurately established that there were initial sounds of bickering coming from the house. Then, according to witnesses who were concerned, Christy began beating the girls before grabbing a .3, caliber shotgun. She fired at Madison and then Taylor from point-blank range. The bleeding girls ran out of the house. Madison managed only a few steps before collapsing in agony. The mother saw this and fired another shot in Taylor's direction. Christy went inside the house, reloaded the shotgun, and shot her dead at point-blank range. According to witnesses, Christy acted coldly and without movement. They returned to their home's living room after the first shots were fired. All family members dashed outside. A family argument turned into a shooting, but we're still trying to put everything together. That was the first version of what happened, told to TV news crews who arrived on the scene of the tragedy. What drove Christy Burns Sheets, 42, to commit such heinous crimes? The detectives are unsure of the exact reasons all they have are dry facts. According to police, there was trouble in the Sheets family home for several years due to disagreements among family members. Police have called Sheets over a dozen times. In the end, Christy's father and husband were both female. Jason Sheets, 45, couldn't take it anymore and left his wife. But he recently returned to her. On the day of the tragedy, Christie's invitation brought the entire family together for dinner. Taylor, a college student who recently had a fight with her mother, returned home to celebrate Jason's birthday with her family. What happened astounded observers and family acquaintances alike. How and why did a mother murder her own daughter's neighbor, Gino Hernandez, according to the Sheets family? I've known both girls since they were 10 years old, the man said, wiping away tears. They were always pleasant. When outgoing girls passed, they would always wave and say hello. Then there's Christy. She refused to attend the barbecue. It was always as if she were one of her own wonderful girls, and Jason was a good guy to another neighbor who voiced their concerns. We are completely focused on Christy. The investigation also supports the neighbors. Christy's previous conflicts with both daughters have already been revealed. 
Furthermore, official authorities have already stated that Christie suffered from a mental illness on June 29, 2016. Sheriff Troy Nils told reporters at the first press conference that the 42-year-old mother was depressed and had attempted suicide multiple times because she was about to divorce her husband. According to the police spokesman, the couple's marriage began to fall apart in 2012. Just then, Christy Sheets' grandfather committed suicide in order to kill family members. Mrs. Sheets used a gun that she inherited from a deceased relative, one of the possible causes of the family's serious discord. The sheriff referred to Christie's refusal to put up with her eldest daughter Taylor's upcoming marriage. A couple of days before the shots were fired, Christie Sheets had an argument with her oldest daughter, Taylor, and attempted to place her under house arrest and prohibit her from seeing her fiancé. Nels observed that Jason disagreed with his wife on whether house arrest was an appropriate punishment for a 22-year-old girl. Juan Sebastian Logo, 23, and Taylor Sheets, 22, were in the same art department during their college years. The two young people had been dating for four years through social media. They demonstrated how much they loved each other and how they were planning their wedding. A small wedding ceremony was set for June 27th. It has been suggested that Taylor's mother objected to his marriage to Sebastian, who was of Hispanic descent. Jason Sheets disagreed with his wife and insisted that incarcerating their eldest daughter was inappropriate punishment for an adult. Later, Jason Sheets would testify, telling investigators that his wife had called their daughters to inform them of their divorce. She had been informed of it, but instead of explaining it to the children, she pointed a gun at them and shot them several times. But she didn't shoot her husband. As Mr. Sheets stated, the wife's motivation was to make him suffer. According to Jason Sheets, his wife's downward spiral began in 2012, when she lost her grandfather, and continued two months later when she lost her mother. Apparently, the gun she used to kill her daughters was a gift from her grandfather. Jason Sheets revealed that his wife applied for a gun permit but was denied due to her mental illness. This begs the question what did Christy Sheets believe triggered the need to punish and torture her husband? Was it a breakdown in their marriage? The feeling that she had lost control and valor in her life. Christy alluded to this in a series of Facebook rants where she discussed protecting herself and her family. Or could Christy Sheets' decision to kill her daughters have been influenced by medication or a deterioration in her mental state? Jason Sheets admitted to the police that his wife suffered from depression. She was taking her prescribed pills by the handful and seeing a therapist. She had been to a private psychiatric hospital three times in recent years after attempting to commit suicide. Sheriff Nels made a report, Christy Sheets had enough time and opportunity to murder her husband. But she did not. Jason realized Christy wished him to suffer. Sheriff Nell echoed Jason Sheets, who was recounting the incident for the first time. Mr. Sheets revealed that Christy was aware of how much he loved Taylor and Madison, as well as their love for him. Nels continued, possibly exacerbated by the complete schism in the family and the realization that she would be losing not only her husband but also her daughters. Christy was already in a difficult emotional state when she grabbed a gun, foreshadowing her tragic end. Madison Davey, a close family friend, gave an excellent interview discussing family relationships. He was the absolute best father in the world. I used to hang out with them, and he enjoyed being around us. They were so funny together that you would expect the sisters to fight. But no, Davy responded. They were deeply in love with each other. And we are always laughing. Davy went on to say that both daughters were very close to each other and their father. Jason was willing to do anything to protect them, and he tried. However, Christy planned to kill that day, according to Davy. Christy, perhaps only intimidating, pulled out a gun and screamed and cried as she said goodbye to her family in an attempt to commit suicide. But she did not get the desired result. Jason answered differently. If you just want to shoot yourself, don't come near us. Shoot yourself. But Christy said, no, that will be your punishment family, friends, and acquaintances. We're certain that something had to happen in this family. But no one could have predicted that a woman would kill her daughters. Christy was doing harm to her family. She lacked mental stability. The sheriff's department stated that police officers were repeatedly dispatched to Christy and Jason's home, where they were having violent arguments. Since January 2012, police have received 14 requests for service. Christy, who had previously been diagnosed with mental health issues, threatened to commit suicide on three occasions. Sebastian's heartbroken sister Maria described the Sheath sisters as some of the sweetest, most sensible, 
and kind-hearted girls she had ever met. Maria found it difficult to believe that not long ago, she and Taylor were having a good time at a party and planning her wedding to Sebastian. You've already joined our family and will remain so, she speaks to her friend. You were a beacon of light in this crazy world. We'll always remember you. The brutal crime that took the lives of young girls with everything ahead of them has long sparked public outrage. People shared Jason's grief. Taylor Sheets attended school, worked as a caregiver for Care.com, and hoped to live a long and happy life with the man she loved. Madison studied in school while also working as a nanny. The entire city mourned on the day of the girl's funeral, and social media and television news channels covered the tragedy once more. Is it possible that the availability of firearms contributed to such a horrific tragedy? The failure of states to finally address the issue of firearms sales has resulted in yet another tragedy. Christy Sheets, an ordinary Texas woman, shot and killed her own two daughters in a domestic dispute. Such cases are not surprising in the United States. People will die as long as Republicans and Democrats continue to pull the cat out of the bag and refuse to compromise. The exact causes of the conflict that resulted in such tragic consequences will be unknown. However, the fact that the police visited this house multiple times due to frequent conflicts is sufficient. That is, it was already obvious that the family was dysfunctional, but they were still left with guns. To summarize, I would like to return to the beginning of this story. A mother is the closest and most important person in her children's lives. Christy Sheets' case is an exception rather than a reality. Amidst her internal heartache, her maternal instinct appears to have completely shut down and no one could stop her. Christy's plan, however, has been fully realized. Jason Sheets will be haunted by the memories of his daughter's murders for the rest of his life. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The Amato family case illustrates how obsession can transform a quiet person into a monster, like many serious addictions, which can be compared to severe illnesses with psychological, biological, or social underpinnings. This case involves a destructive habit, such as an urge for alcohol, prohibited substances, gambling, or or an obsessive need for a specific activity or interaction with a specific person or group. It is tragic when addiction affects not only the individual but also their loved ones who sincerely want to help. The once prosperous and happy Amato family faced a dilemma head on. Because all of the family members were healthcare professionals, they felt confident that they could handle the situation on their own. It was too late for them to realize how serious the situation was. This isn't a story about addiction, but of a young man's intense obsession with a woman he'd never met. His addiction to illegal substances, combined with the pathological proclivity for theft, exacerbated the situation. The situation devolved into a horrific outcome. Let's look into this case to see if there was a way to change the course of events and avoid the tragedy. On January 25, 2019, a concerned man called Seminole County Police in Florida. He reported that his close friend and colleague, Nurse Cody Amato, failed to show up for his shift at the hospital, which was highly unusual for him. The day before, Cody had left work about 15 minutes early due to urgent family matters at home, leaving so quickly that he forgot to collect his pay for the day. Attempts to reach Cody, 31, by phone were unsuccessful. He was simply not responding. Cody's girlfriend, with whom he had recently lived, stated that he went to his parents' house the day before at his father's request but never returned to her place, and she, too, was unable to contact him. All of these signs triggered alarming thoughts, prompting the dispatch of police officers to the specified address. The Motto family home, located in a suburb of Orlando, had a large adjoining area with a stable and a horse walking area. Cody's car was parked in the driveway, and lights were turned on in several rooms of the home. At first glance, everything appeared normal. There were no signs of forced entry or struggle, and the doors and windows were intact. When the sheriff's deputy knocked, there was no answer, and calls to the landline went unanswered. The police then requested permission to enter and, once granted, cautiously unlocked the back door with a knife to slide the bolt. Inside, an eerie silence filled the lit room, implying that someone was present. Indeed, the homeowners were present. 
The officers found the lifeless body of 59-year-old family patriarchs Chad Amato on the kitchen floor in a pool of his own blood, with close-range gunshot wounds to the chest. Cody was then found curled up on the staircase opposite the main entrance, dead in a large pool of blood. Finally, they discovered 61-year-old Margaret Amato sitting at her computer in the home office. At first glance, she appeared to be sleeping with her head resting on her arm, if not for the blood splatters on the monitor and the large spreading stain beneath her head. The murder weapon and Iowa Jericho 941 pistol discovered next to Cody's body were later determined by forensic experts to have his fingerprints, with no signs of breaking or external presence, and no items missing from the home. Cody appeared to have ended their lives and then shot himself in the chest, possibly as a result of a family dispute. However, smeared blood on the front door indicated that it was locked by someone leaving the house following the incident, implying that the perpetrator was not one of the deceased family members. Few people questioned the likely suspect. Those who knew or were connected to the Amato family mentioned their youngest son, Grant, who had gone missing since that evening. His car, a white Honda, and some personal belongings, including a laptop from Grant's room, were missing, implying that the owner had taken them. Grant was declared a person of interest, and a search was launched for his whereabouts. What is known about the Amato family Margaret? Ann Amato, Ne Wade, and Chad Robert Amato got married in the mid-1980s. Margaret, your senior Chad, was already raising a three-year-old son named Jason from a previous marriage. Chad was undeterred by her having a child. Instead, he was prepared to raise Jason as his own. In 1988, on May 20, 1989, the couple welcomed their first child, Cody, followed by their youngest son, Grant Tiernan Amato. The brothers had a close relationship since childhood. They grew up in a wealthy family and rarely faced denials. To earn certain privileges, they had to follow family rules, perform well in school, assist with household chores, and demonstrate good behavior. They strive to be the pride and support of their parents. Both parents had advanced degrees in healthcare. Margaret was a senior operational manager at a prestigious private clinic. Chad began his career as a clinical pharmacist but later specialized in software. The family was quite wealthy, living in a large suburban home and raising their own stable bred thoroughbred racehorses as a hobby. Jason left home at the age of 18, went to university, and began his own life. He married, raised a family, and relocated to another state while maintaining close ties with his parents and younger brothers. Cody and Grant were almost inseparable they went to the same school, played on the same sports team, and spent weekends at the shooting range with their father. The Amatos had an impressive firearm collection, including rare pieces that were only accessible to the family patriarch due to safety concerns. Grant, the family's youngest son, received the majority of everyone's attention and admiration, as is customary. As a child, he was frail and sickly, so everyone tried to show him love and care. He grew up to be a modest and shy boy who struggled to connect with his peers and relied solely on his brothers for friendship. Grant became especially close to Cody after their eldest brother. Jason grew up and left the house. Following high school, the brothers pursued medical degrees together and eventually became anesthesiologists. Cody excelled in his studies, becoming the top student in his class, whereas Grant struggled and received low grades. Nonetheless, both were able to find jobs in their field at a hospital. Cody built a reputation as a dependable professional, but Grant was prone to making mistakes and needed his work double-checked. Grant's hospital career came to an abrupt end in the summer of 2018, when he was caught stealing strictly controlled sedatives that caused euphoria and hallucinations and were rarely used for anesthesia. The discovery prompted police action, and Grant was arrested. During interrogation, he admitted to the theft, claiming that he gave the drugs to patients who, in his opinion, were undertreated. Many people believed Grant was using or selling drugs illegally. Even though there was no direct evidence, he was immediately suspended and later fired. His criminal case for theft was eventually dismissed, reportedly due to parental intervention. He was unemployed and relied heavily on the internet. After losing his job, the 29-year-old man, who was already a loner, became even more isolated. He spent weeks indoors glued to his computer, primarily browsing adult websites. Grant had no girlfriends and struggled with social interactions with women, making him feel inadequate. He watched adult content and frequently interacted with webcam models on specialized platforms, attempting to fill the void of an absent personal life. 
This private interaction, of course, cost money. Grant could easily access funds from his parents' and older brother's accounts for these activities. This obsession quickly developed into an addiction, exacerbated by irregular alcohol consumption. But Grant seemed content with his lifestyle, relying on his family and spending their money without contributing anything in return. Eventually, his father issued an ultimatum find a job soon or leave home and lose all financial support from his family. Grant promised his father that he would resolve the issue, but he had no intention of seeking employment. He stated that he would become a streamer, earning money by broadcasting video games. His parents, seeing this as preferable to nothing, agreed to set up a streaming station for him. Once everything was in place, Grant pretended to be streaming, requesting privacy. But in reality, he was locked in his room, indulging in his favorite pastime browsing adult-only websites while on a trip to Japan. Cody took a vacation from work in August 2018 and decided to travel around the world for a change of scenery with the goal of visiting Joe Han. He invited his younger brother Grant and his best friend Jeremy. Cody and Jeremy had saved up for the trip on their own. Grant's vacation was funded by their parents. However, instead of giving the money directly to Grant, they delegated it to Cody, who was more responsible. Grant appeared disengaged throughout the trip, which lasted nearly two weeks. He showed little interest in tours or landmarks, instead focusing on his smartphone screen. He often stayed at the hotel and used his brother's laptop. On the day the group visited Lake Kawaguchi near Mount Fuji, Jeremy accidentally left his credit card in their hotel room. Seizing the opportunity grant, he hacked into Jeremy's account and withdrew thousands of dollars, which he spent entirely on private sessions with his favorite webcam model. Jeremy discovered the theft later but had initially suspected fraud. He was unable to identify the perpetrator and continued to investigate the incident after returning home, unaware that Grant was involved. Sylvia releases his lava. Now, Sylvie, let's get to the most intriguing part, the identity of the mysterious webcam model. Grant became obsessed with a website where Grant paid for private online interactions with various women. He met the stunning Sylvia and expresses his love for Ova from Bulgaria, also known as Sylvie, she captivated him with her striking appearance, confidence, charisma, and passion. Sylvie made Granfield special, loved, desired, and distinctive. He began to believe that her feelings for him were genuine and that they could form a real relationship. Brand was convinced they were in a relationship and he needed to separate this fiery brunette from her other admirers. He spent hours and thousands of dollars every day to make sure she didn't have time for other men. Grant also showered her with gifts such as expensive lingerie and jewelry, which she wore during their video calls. Desperate to impress Sylvie Grant, she constantly made up stories, losing touch with reality. He claimed to live alone in a large house, own a profitable business, and could afford to lavish her with money. He supported his claims with money transfers, initially sending a couple of $1,000, $10,000, and even $100,000 as birthday gifts. Naturally, his parents were aware of his lavish spending because he was using their accounts. At first, he explained that it was an investment in his own online project to build an audience. However, Chad and Margaret soon realized their son was lying. A scandal escaped the rehab clinic, and a serious family feud broke out at home. The patriarch demanded that the youngest son pack his belongings and leave right away, but his mother and Cody stood up for him. The family recognized Grant's severe internet addiction. However, they were perplexed as to how he had spent nearly $200,000 from their accounts. A thorough search of his room revealed vials containing potent substances. Grant explained that he used them to avoid going insane. The parents announced that they would deactivate his accounts and send him to mandatory drug and internet addiction treatment. Grant responded by declaring that he was tired of everything and wanted to end his life. He then dashed out of the house, jumped into his car, and drove off at high speed in an unknown direction. Later, it was discovered that Grant had gone to his aunt and uncle's house, crashed through their fence, and hit the garage wall. Knowing about the turmoil in the Tomato family, his relatives sympathized with him and offered him a place to stay until things settled. He readily agreed, but the next day he robbed his kind-hearted relatives, taking thousands of dollars from their accounts to pay for interactions with Sylvie. When Grant's aunt and parents met, they asked her not to contact the police, promising to resolve the situation and return the stolen money. That same day, Chad personally went to their house and took Grant, who desperately needed help. Chad, Margaret, 
and Cody realized that reasoning with him was pointless, and if he left home he was likely to commit theft again. They then presented the grant with a different ultimatum either go to a rehabilitation clinic for addiction treatment or face jail time for theft. Grant reluctantly agreed to enter the clinic, where he would spend two months free from temptation. He was admitted to the medical institution near the end of December 2018. A grown man's little secret. While Grant was in treatment, his parents checked his computer and discovered that he was spending thousands of dollars each day from their family accounts. They discovered the profile of Sylvie, the woman who had a profound impact on their son. After reviewing their correspondence and discovering hundreds of recordings of their intimate private online interactions, which were treasured and frequently revisited, the comatose decided to inform Sylvie that her admirer, who had showered her with money and gifts, was not a businessman but an ordinary unemployed man suffering from drug and internet addictions. They also stated that the funds transferred to her were stolen, potentially exposing him to criminal charges. However, Sylvie remained unconcerned for her. It was simply a job, and she had no intention of returning the money. Grant abruptly returned home on January 5, 2019, only a few weeks into his treatment, having completed less than a quarter of the required rehabilitation program. He had fled the clinic, where he was known for his complete lack of cooperation. Grant tearfully promised to change his life and find work, but he threatened to commit suicide if forced to return to the rehab facility. His parents agreed but imposed strict rules. Grant was prohibited from using the computer he had to adhere to a strict schedule, and all of his earnings were closely monitored. He was also given a part-time job at a local grocery warehouse. For about three weeks, Grant appeared to comply, leading his parents to believe he had matured and overcome his addictions. However, everything changed on Thursday, January 24, 2019, when Grant persuaded his mother to let him use the laptop briefly to check his email and post his resume on the internet. He hopes to find a more challenging job than his current warehouse position. Margaret trusted her son and let him use the laptop, making a fatal mistake. Naturally, Grant attempted to contact Sylvie, only to discover that his parents had already written to her, revealing the truth about him. He saw it as a betrayal. Furthermore, his parents had humiliated him in front of the only woman he loved, and they had to pay the consequences. The brutal dismantling of the family. Remember the previously mentioned home firearms collection? Chad had kept it in a large, special safe with a key he didn't trust. However, Grant was aware of another gun stored in his parents' bedroom, which his father always kept loaded, and he chose to use it. His mother was working on the computer in the home office when her youngest son quietly approached her from behind and shot her in the back of the head. Her body position indicated that she did not have time to turn around or understand what was going on. Next came his father, who was about to return home from work. Chad was confronted with Grant as soon as he entered the kitchen and was shot twice in the chest. Grant tensely considered his next move, devising an even more monstrous strategy. He decided to frame his own brother Cody, the only person who had ever defended him, assisted him, and been his best friend. Cody had already moved out of the family home and was living separately with his girlfriend. To bring Cody home, Grant used his now deceased father's phone to send several messages requesting that he return immediately, because something terrible had occurred. He didn't elaborate, knowing that this information would be enough to make his brother rush home from work. The Grant calculation was correct, and Cody did arrive, even leaving work early. When he entered the house, he only made it to the bottom of the second floor staircase before being shot and collapsing. Cody did not die instantly. He had time to recognize the horror of the situation but was powerless to change it. After killing his family, Grant wiped his fingerprints off the pistol, placed it in his brother's hand to leave his prints, and then left it next to the body, making it appear as if Cody had shot their parents and then himself. The killer spent the rest of the evening calmly packing his belongings, downloading video files of his conversations with Sylvie from the computer, and even texting her. After completing his tasks, he loaded his belongings into the car and drove away. Arrest and trial. It took police just over a day to find and arrest Grant, who was hiding in a small roadside motel in Orange County. He was not surprised, rather disappointed that he had been discovered so quickly, but he vehemently denied any guilt. During his interrogation at the station, he told unbelievable stories about his father's extreme cruelty, alleging mistreatment of his mother and brother. Grant also discussed his father's attempts to separate him from his beloved girlfriend Sylvie, 
with whom he claimed to share true and pure love, following the events at their family home on the evening of January 24, 2019, his account was unclear and inconsistent. He suggested that his father and brother got into a fight. Cody grabbed a gun and killed Chad, with Margaret being an unintentional victim. Grant claimed he could only guess the chronology of these horrific events because he was not a witness, and that he spent the night in his car with his belongings after his father kicked him out. In the morning, he claimed he simply drove away, unaware of the tragedy that had occurred at home. His story seemed disjointed and unbelievable, and the evidence indirectly pointed to him as the sole perpetrator. As a result, Grant was arrested as the prime suspect in his family's triple homicide. He was held on a $750,000 bond and was unable to post it, so he remained in custody awaiting trial. The trial began on July 15, 2019. Notably, almost all of the witnesses in court testified against Grant, including his older brother Jason, relatives, and Cody's friend Jeremy, from whom Grant stole money during their trip to Japan. Those who knew the defendant personally described him as a pathological thief, a liar, and someone who struggled with addictions. The main evidence against Grant was a large bank transfer from Chad's account to his younger sons. This transaction took place late at night, when all family members had already died. To confirm the transaction, the defendant used his deceased father's finger as identification. The prosecution advocated for the death penalty, while Grant's defense claimed that he was ill and needed treatment. The final verdict was issued on August 12, 2019. Amato, 30, was convicted of first-degree triple homicide and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Jennifer Cave has a generous heart. Why do bad things happen to good girls? Because bad boys attract them like moths to a flame kind. Often naive, they idealize their partner and completely ignore the obvious red flags. Sometimes these destructive relationships last a long time, while other times the realization occurs quickly. Sooner or later, there is a choice leave or continue to be burned until the moth is reduced to ashes. Jennifer was nowhere to be found during one of the most heinous and undoubtedly didactic incidents in Austin, Texas, USA. Jennifer Cave, Michael Rodriguez's new girlfriend, last spoke on August 16, 2005, late in the evening. Throughout the night, Michael awaited her call. However, exhausted from work, he unintentionally fell asleep. By morning, there had been no missed calls from her. Concerned, Michael remembered Jennifer's promise to call him back after dropping off her friend Colton at home. He was concerned that she would have to go out of her way because Colton had not arranged for his own ride home. In general, he did not trust Colton or his lifestyle. Meanwhile, Jennifer's roommate discovered her absence from home. Her alarm clock was blaring and there was no one to turn it off. It appeared that Jennifer had not spent the night at home. Her friend became concerned. They usually informed each other about their plans. She tried calling Jennifer, but there was no response, which was unusual for her. Jennifer begins her first day of work today. It's unlikely she'd leave without changing. The roommate thought Jennifer's office clothes were neatly hanging on the rack, as if she hadn't taken anything with her. On August 17th at 8.30 a.m., the director of the law firm was informed of the new employee's tardiness during her internship. Miss Cave had left a positive impression. It seemed odd that she would allow herself such behavior on her first day of work at 9 a.m. Jennifer's colleagues called, but she did not answer. Around 11 a.m., the employer dispatched one of the managers to check on her at home. Persistent knocks went unanswered. They then attempted to contact the secondary contact number listed on her resume. Sharon Sedwick, Jennifer's mother, answered the phone. The call caught her off guard and left her feeling disappointed. She said she'd try to find her daughter. Sharon was also unable to reach Jennifer. She began to feel increasingly concerned and suspicious. She appears to have dropped everything again for that irresponsible young man. She came to a conclusion. Nobody in Jennifer's circle liked her ex-boyfriend, Colton Pitanyak. Regardless of his intelligence and financial status, he always seemed to bring her down. Mrs. Sedwick called Colton. He stated that he hadn't seen her daughter in quite some time. 
He seemed unconcerned about Jennifer's disappearance. For some reason, her mother did not believe him. More than 12 hours passed without any news. After all, Austin hospitals were checked but no results were found. Sharon called the cops. She reported her daughter missing and expressed concern that she was in danger at Pitniak's house after calling the police. Sharon and her husband, Jim Sedwick, visited Colton's home to speak with him in person. However, he refused to open the door for them or the responding officers, claiming he didn't want to talk. And they didn't have a search warrant. He was well aware of his rights, so the police were forced to leave. However, the situation appeared suspicious. Jennifer's car was discovered near Pitniak's home. Despite the fact that the car was empty, its mere presence in the parking lot prompted thought. Jennifer appeared to be inside the house. Sharon and Jim were convinced something had happened to her. The police decided not to waste time and inspected Jennifer's home. However, they discovered nothing of interest. The only leads came from Michael and Sharon, as well as Jennifer's car near Coltrane's house. Michael described how Jennifer went out with friends on the evening of August 16th to celebrate landing a job. She called him several times. One of the friends was her ex-boyfriend Colton, who was with her at the time of the call. Jennifer did not appear scared or worried during the conversation, but she did mention that Colton was acting strangely and she needed to take him home after losing contact with her. A grisly discovery. All of the clues point to Pitignac's home. While the cops hesitated, Sharon and Jim decided to take matters into their own hands. They drove back to Colton Place. When they arrived at the apartment complex, they knocked on the door but received no response. The girl's parents, sensing something was wrong, called a locksmith to open the lock. However, Jim discovered a better way. He decided to enter through one of the apartment's open windows. Inside, everything was disorganized. It was clear that no one had kept the house in order and the apartment itself looked more like a den. The man was hit by a foul odor that immediately triggered his gag reflex. He covered his mouth with his hand. Jim moved to where the odor was stronger. The house was empty. Jennifer's stepfather noticed clutter in the bathroom. He looked closer and discovered a dismembered female body with the head and limbs severed. Trash bags and a sports bag can be found nearby. Jim, horrified, began to examine their contents. Inside were the body's remaining parts. The deceased's legs were freckled like his stepdaughter's. However, the corpse was so mutilated that it was impossible to determine who it was. The man hoped until the very last moment that it was not his stepdaughter. After regaining consciousness, he contacted emergency services to save Jennifer's life. Jennifer Cave was born in March 1984 near Bishop, Texas. Her family resided in a modest farmhouse. Sharon's mother was in her second marriage, which added three more children to the family. Jennifer, Lauren, and Clayton, Vanessa from Sharon's first marriage, were the three oldest siblings. Jennifer's father works as a welder. He was a good husband and father until alcohol turned him mean and uncontrollable, hurling insults and causing trouble. When sober, he was composed and respectful. Despite their unstable home environment, the family remained close. Sharon worked as an accountant in a chemical plant while also caring for her home and children. Jennifer, unlike her more sociable brother and sister, was shy. While they made friends quickly and played outside, she preferred the company of books, which sharpened her intellect and provided her with an excellent memory. Her love of reading had an impact on her vision, necessitating the use of glasses in conjunction with the braces in her mouth. The glasses did not improve her self-esteem. Our heroine lacked confidence but she still actively participated in school social and athletic activities. Eventually, her father's destructive habits caused the family to split up. Jennifer and Clayton chose to remain with Charlie following their separation. They backed him up with great compassion, hoping to prevent his downfall. Jennifer was so determined to help her father quit drinking that she overlooked his unwillingness to fight. Years have passed since the divorce in 1999. Sharon met Jim Sedwick by chance. Jennifer transformed as she approached adolescence, removing her braces and replacing her glasses with contact lenses, transforming her into a true beauty. However, her character began to shift. Along with her appearance, she began socializing with children from troubled families. Nonetheless, due to her high intelligence, she graduated near the top of her class. Jennifer later enrolled at Texas State University to major in finance, but she quickly became disillusioned with her studies and dropped out after the first semester. 
She attended a community college in Austin and worked part-time at a city restaurant to help support herself. During this time, she dated Mark, a nice young man from a respectable family. Their relationship could have led to marriage, but Jennifer became engrossed in the nightlife. She began attending parties and drinking. Perhaps influenced by her father's genes and negative example, her love of alcohol grew alongside the introduction of marijuana into her life. Sharon attempted to influence her daughter, but to no avail. Jennifer and Colton Pitanyak met on one of these nights out. Jennifer Cave's life was tragically cut short by a gunshot wound to the right arm. The bullet passed through her entire arm and into her chest, striking her heart. The injury to a vital artery caused rapid blood loss, which resulted in her untimely death. What happened to her body afterwards was horrific. Forensic experts discovered multiple stab wounds on her body, with the chest and neck being the most damaged. In total, the attacker caused 18 post-mortem stab wounds. The perpetrator then decapitated her and fired a shot through her throat into her head, intending to dispose of her body quietly by severing her upper limbs. He packed them into a prepared bag and trash bags. Her torso was left in the bathtub, covered with a saw. Something thwarted the assailant's initial plan, forcing him to change his tactics. Evidence was uncovered. When Jennifer Cave's body was discovered and police arrived, they did not yet have a warrant to search Colton Pitanyak's apartment. Initially, all the officers could do was observe the victim's body and secure the scene. After obtaining the necessary permission, a thorough search of the apartment was conducted. They discovered 3.38 caliber shell casings. The firearm was found in Pitanyak's car, which was parked in the garage. A large, blood-stained machete was taken from the dishwasher. Toxicology reports revealed that the victim's bloodstream contained alcohol, marijuana, and methamphetamine inside one of the rooms. There was a road atlas with pages torn out that highlighted routes in southwest Texas. This clue revealed the apartment owner's absence. Colton Pitanyak fled. Law enforcement immediately issued a warrant for his arrest. His name is Colton Pitanyak. Bryant, Arkansas is where Colton originated. He grew up as a sharp-witted boy with attractive looks who was popular with girls during his adolescence. His father operated a successful agricultural business that grew year after year, allowing the family to live comfortably. However, the abundance spoiled Colton. On the one hand, he was ambitious and goal-driven. On the other hand, he may become aggressive and irritable. Colton was an avid skateboarder and guitarist. He attended a Catholic boys' middle school in Little Rock, where he excelled academically and was frequently on the honor roll. He was also a National Merit Scholarship finalist. Pitniak was one of seven senior finalists at his school in 2000, out of 166 across the state. By his senior year, he was dealing with alcohol and fights, owing to his membership in a group of local affluent kids who lived a leisurely lifestyle, frequently throwing parties with the attendant consequences. Nonetheless, due to his high graduation scores, he was easily admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. Rather than concentrating on his studies, he maintained his erratic lifestyle, losing friends and earning a reputation as a heavy drinker and marijuana user. He could have had a promising future if not for his proclivity for self-destruction. After being expelled from a university indefinitely, he began distributing controlled substances. His parents fought to help him overcome his addiction, even taking him back home. It's a fateful encounter. Jennifer and Colton first met at a party in the spring of 2004, and they were immediately drawn to each other. Jennifer, who frequently idealizes others, chose to give a potentially dangerous relationship a chance rather than abandon it. Their friendship gradually developed into love. Jennifer eventually began using illegal drugs with Colton. His opulent apartment gradually transformed into a den of excess, and using illegal substances together became a household rule. As a result, Jennifer's addiction grew worse. Parents tried repeatedly to break her free from these addictions. They even gave her a car in the hopes of encouraging her to spend more time at home. However, each time she returned, her promises were quickly forgotten. Golden's condition deteriorated, he became increasingly paranoid and began carrying a gun and knife in an attempt to project the image of a gangster. Pitanyak was arrested in 2004 for possessing illegal substances. He even went through a rehabilitation program once, but Colton demonstrated no genuine desire to overcome his addiction, separation. Jennifer's parents decided to pay her a visit. However, the visit ended in disappointment. 
Jennifer had broken her promises, lost a significant amount of weight, and appeared generally unwell. Her family suggested she get treatment at a rehabilitation center, but she flatly refused. Sharon and Jim were upset and stopped providing her with financial support, believing that this tough love approach would motivate her to take control of her life. Jennifer, however, had no choice but to move in with Colton due to a lack of funds. What happened in his apartment is difficult to say, but after a month of living with him, Jennifer decided to leave. Her friend offered her a room and support. Miss Cave expressed her fears. She no longer felt safe with Colton but did not go into detail. Something obviously scared her as she refused to reconcile with her ex. One day, he approached her and asked her to return. Jennifer remained firm, particularly when she saw the knife Colton had brought with him. She asked Colton to calm down and suggested that they stay friends. Surprisingly, he agreed that contact with him would be limited, and she also began reconnecting with her parents. Finally, her life appeared to be getting back on track. In early 2005, Jennifer began a new relationship with Scott, a single father who appeared to be quite decent. His lifestyle was the complete opposite of Bolton's. Scott worked as a waiter at a restaurant, played keyboards in a band, and was an excellent singer, all while maintaining a sober lifestyle. As a result, Jennifer's self-esteem improved. Even though she appeared healthier by his side, she took on the role of a homemaker and mother figure to his daughter. She was still willing to leave at a moment's notice if Colton requested the arrival of Laura Hall. Colton eventually moved to a new apartment complex with a pool near the university called Orange Tree, which became a popular spot for daily parties. His behavior continued to be erratic, with some friends reporting seeing him play Russian roulette by himself. During one of these phases, he met Laura Ashley Hall, who was a frequent attendee of these parties and became obsessed with him, displaying jealousy towards any female in the Colton circle, particularly Jennifer. Laura was perceived in a variety of ways by their peers, with the most common description being arrogance and the ability to put anyone in their place. Laura, like Colton, came from a wealthy family. Miss Hall was athletic, competing in a variety of competitions, and academically successful, indicating great promise. After high school, she enrolled in university but dropped out, preferring a job in a more leisurely lifestyle. Colton and Laura soon became romantically involved. She, like Jennifer, felt a strong attraction to him. When he was sentenced to 60 days in jail in June 2005, Laura sent him all of her earnings, even going into debt. Friends reported that she had changed for the worse, becoming bold and neglecting her job and personal care. Many people believed she had also begun using illegal drugs. Unlike Jennifer Colton, she ignored her feelings, even putting out cigarettes on her. A new chapter starts and ends. During this time, Jennifer ended her relationship with Scott. She felt unworthy of his family and didn't want to cause them any problems. Jennifer communicated with Colton, who remained infatuated with her. However, she did not renew their previous relationship, keeping their interactions strictly platonic. Jennifer only wanted to get a job, so she returned to college. In August, a promising opportunity arose in her life. She started a new relationship with Michael Rodriguez and, most importantly, found a great job. After a few days of training at a law firm, she performed so well that she was offered a consultant position with a competitive salary. Jennifer was filled with self-confidence and happiness. On August 16th, she chose to celebrate the beginning of her new life with friends. That evening, they visited a bar before heading to a club. According to a friend, the bouncer refused to let Colton in due to his appearance, which may have prompted him to seek out controlled substances. The investigation continues. In order to shed light on the events of that fateful night, investigators interviewed Carlton's neighbors. They discovered intriguing information around 3 a.m. On August 17th, Nora Sullivan heard a knock on her door. She opened it and saw Colton standing there, looking suspicious, with blood on his face and a pistol visible at his waist. She was startled and inquired about what had happened. Colton told her that he had gotten into a shootout with some people. Nora did not hear any gunshots and assumed he was lying as usual. She closed the door and peered through the crowd to see him walk away. Neither of the neighbors interviewed heard any gunshots that night. Detectives also discovered that Colton had communicated with Laura twice that night. The morning of August 17th, he went to a hardware store and purchased several masks and gloves, as well as a large amount of cleaning supplies. Using these, he dismembered Jennifer's body and intended to clean the apartment to remove any evidence of the crime. 
It's possible that Sharon and Jim's unexpected arrival startled him and caused him to be nervous about flying. A critical discovery in Cohen's apartment led investigators right to his trail. Colton, along with Laura Hall, was discovered in Mexico. They had crossed the border in Laura's car. Cotton's photograph was distributed throughout the country by local authorities. During this time, the couple entertained themselves by going to movies and restaurants. They stayed at a hotel in the border town of Negres, where an employee identified Colton as the desired individual. The employee took his photograph and forwarded it to the police. Pitniak was arrested by us officials after the duo was apprehended by Mexican law enforcement and transported to the border. Laura Hall was released. Laura caused a scene with the Border Patrol prior to her release, protesting Coltrane's innocence and obstructing the arrest process. Later, she admitted that her trip to Mexico was the best she'd ever had. They spent approximately five days abroad. On August 23, 2005, Colton Pitniak was charged with a crime involving Jennifer Cave. A month later, Laura Hall was arrested and charged with tampering with evidence and obstructing justice. The prosecution presented evidence discovered in the apartment, such as a videotape from the store and a receipt listing items purchased. Colton claimed he had no recollection of the night of August 16th, blaming it on excessive drinking and illegal drug use. Initially, he did not deny hurting Jennifer but insisted he had no memory of it. He claimed he woke up to find his ex-girlfriend's body in the bathroom. After finding the body, he contacted Laura, who advised him to purchase a saw and cleaning supplies. She helped dismember the victim and conceal the body parts and bags. The prosecution claimed she was responsible for Jennifer's post-mortem injuries. Colton later hinted that she may have been motivated by jealousy, implying that she participated in an act of revenge against her rival. Nevertheless, both defendants pleaded not guilty. Nonetheless, the evidence supporting his involvement was overwhelming. Jennifer's body was discovered in Coltrane's apartment. His fingerprints and DNA were discovered on the machete saw and firearm recovered from the crime scene, and the weapon in his car was identified as the crime weapon. In addition, he was the one who bought the cleaning supplies at the store. The jury had no doubts about his guilt. On January 29, 2007, Colton Pitniak was sentenced to 55 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after serving at least half. His earliest release date will not be until 2060. Laura Hall's case was complex, and the prosecution suggested she may have acted out of blind love for Colton. Laura's DNA was discovered on one of the victim's shoes, a store towel, and the firearm used. The defense argued that this only demonstrated her involvement in disposing of the body, not in the original act. They were unable to prove she was the one who fired the first shot to Jennifer's head after her death. There was no evidence that she was present at the scene when the crime occurred. Laura insisted she only learned about the crime from Colton, who claimed he forced her to flee to Mexico with him. However, witnesses from their trip to Mexico reported that the couple appeared to have a good time. Laura Hall was convicted of obstructing justice and tampering with evidence in 2007 and sentenced to six years in prison. A subsequent trial in 2010 resulted in a maximum 11-year sentence and a $14,000 fine. Laura was granted parole on March 15, 2018, with GPS monitoring, and completed her sentence in August of the same year. Her whereabouts thereafter are unknown she was apprehended and framed. Colton Pitniak remains incarcerated. He has filed several appeals, all of which have been unsuccessful. In these appeals, he repeatedly stated that he had no memory of the tragic events of that night. However, he revealed that witnesses claim Laura confessed to Jennifer's death, he claims that the prosecutors were aware of this information during the trial but did not disclose it to his defense team, implying a possible setup. Although Pitniak's legal motions were denied, the revelation raised public concerns. Furthermore, Jennifer's parents felt that Laura's punishment was insufficient they believe she played a larger role than she admits. Unlike Colton Hall, she has never expressed sorrow or regret over Jennifer's death. She only referred to Jennifer as that girl or the dead girl occasionally using derogatory language. To this day, the exact events of that fateful night are unknown. Only Jennifer knows the truth, which is silently concealed by Pitniak's residence walls. Unfortunately, the dead cannot speak. Jennifer's life was cut short during her prime. Unfortunately, she discovered an important truth too late. Staying away from certain people and ceasing communication with them may mean saving oneself. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.
Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, doomsday spouses. Religiously motivated crimes are common in criminal practice. According to statistics, religious fanatics kill over 100,000 people each year around the world. Frequently, these victims do not share the fanatics' traditional beliefs. The case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, a deranged couple, shocked the world a few years ago and has yet to be resolved. The story has been covered by media outlets in multiple countries, shocking and perplexing people. It's a story about corrupt passion, belief in one's own superiority, greed, and a complete lack of moral principles. This couple harmed five members of their own families, two of them children. The legal proceedings against the so-called spouses from hell are still ongoing. They face the death penalty for their heinous actions. However, they not only deny their guilt, but they also sincerely hope to avoid punishment or receive lenient sentences. But let us begin at the beginning and try to unravel this horrifying and complex story in order to understand how people who claim to have discovered God have completely lost their humanity. Who is Chad Daybell? And how did he become the head of a religious movement? Chad Guy Daybell was born on August 11, 1968, in the small town of Provo, Utah, 18 miles south of Salt Lake City. He grew up in a simple, even modest family and was a quiet, shy child. Chad was an average student at school with no notable talents or athletic accomplishments, and he was self-conscious about his weight. Chad not easily enrolled at Brigham Young University by U in Utah after graduating from high school, and he earned a bachelor's degree in journalism in 1992. During his college years, he married a modest woman named Tamara Douglas, or simply Tammy. The couple quickly had five children, sons Seth, Mark, and Garth, as well as daughters Emma and Leah. After finishing his studies, the young father worked as an editor for a local daily newspaper. However, due to the family's constant financial difficulties, he also worked as a night watchman at a small church and a gravedigger at the cemetery next door. Tammy did not work outside the home and was solely responsible for household chores and raising their children, so the family struggled to get by. Chad decided to use his journalism background to write his own religious-themed book. His debut work, published in 1999, resembled a collection of religious stories or religious stories or religious themed fantasy. Surprisingly, the book was a success and he made a good living from it. Chad immediately left his jobs at the cemetery and the newspaper to pursue his writing career. A year and a half later, he released a book called One Foot in the Grave. This was a popular science book in which he described his experiences as a grave digger and discussed death, the afterlife, and soul reincarnations. Daybell founded Spring Creek Books in 2004, through which he self-published his works. These works discussed his beliefs regarding the impending end of the world, Judgment Day, and other topics. According to some, Chad's religious beliefs have become increasingly extreme over time. Chad Daybell has written dozens of fiction and popular science books with religious themes. He began giving podcasts, audio, and video lectures to help people prepare for Christ's second coming. Chad referred to himself as an apocalyptic writer and claimed to be able to see into the future, hearing voices of the dead deliver prophecies intended solely for him. Lori Ryan Vallow Nickox was born on June 26, 1973 in the beautiful city of Loma Linda, California. She grew up in a big family with two older brothers and three sisters. Her parents, Denise and Barry Cox, worked tirelessly to provide for their numerous children from a young age. Lori was especially close to her brother, Alex, with whom she had a trustworthy relationship. He always stood up for and protected his younger sister. Lori developed into a true beauty with many admirers as well as an attractive, charismatic blonde with a slim figure and a captivating smile. She enjoyed being the center of attention and was an outgoing and adventurous person. Lori married Nelson Giannis, her high school sweetheart, in the spring of 1992 when she was 18 years old. However, the young couple quickly realized they had rushed into marriage and were unprepared for family life, resulting in the dissolution of their marriage in less than a year. They did not have children together. Lori remarried in the fall of 1995 to a man named William LaJoya. A year later, the couple welcomed a son, Colby, but their marriage ended in 1998. Only two years later, the boy remained in his mother's custody. 
Lori married Joseph Anthony Ryan for the third time in early 2001, and he officially adopted her son from her previous marriage. A year later, the couple had their daughter, Ty Lee, but this marriage too ended in 2005. Notably shortly after her divorce from Joseph, an incident occurred when her ex-husband arrived to see the children. He was assaulted by Lori's brother Alex, who claimed in court that he was defending his sister's honor after Ryan insulted her. As a result, Cox was sentenced to a fine and a short-term prison marriage with Charles Vallow. Lori met Charles Anthony Vallow shortly after divorcing her third husband, and the two married in February 2006. He was 17 years her senior, but their age difference was not an issue. Charles had been married before and had two teenage sons from previous relationships, Zachary and Nicholas. The couple initially lived in Nevada with Lori's children from previous marriages, with Charles and his sons visiting on holidays and weekends. Charles owned a small business that provided a steady income for his family. Lori, who had not pursued further education, did not work, and her husband never approached her about it. Charles' grandnephew, Joshua Jackson, or simply J.J. Vallow, was officially adopted by the couple in 2014. J.J. had autism and needed expensive therapy, which a relative could provide. Toward the end of 2014, the family decided to relocate to the Hawaiian Islands, specifically the island of Kauai. By this point, Colby and Charles' older children were adults living independently, so the Vallows relocated to the island as a group of four. Lori, Charles Ty Lee, and JJ settled in a popular tourist area and decided to open their own beach bar that served fresh juices, smoothies, refreshing drinks, and non-alcoholic cocktails. Despite their best efforts, the availability of raw materials and Charles' experience in trade, the business failed quickly due to fierce competition. Lori developed an interest in religious literature around this time, and she was particularly drawn to Chad Daybell's Standing in Holy Places series of books. She became fascinated by the occult writer's ideas and became almost obsessed with them. She bought all of his works and read them every day. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met. In 2016, the family was forced to leave Hawaii and relocate to the mainland. They settled in Arizona, and while Charles worked hard to provide for the family, his wife Lori became increasingly involved in religion, drifting away from reality. Lori and her close friend Melanie went to a neighboring town for an event called Preparing People for the Second Coming of Christ, which was led by Chad Daybell. Lori, a devoted fan and follower, jumped at the chance to meet him in person. Lori sat in the front row, her gaze fixated on Chad. He also noticed the attractive blonde, and when the writer and religious speaker decided to personally interact with his followers, Lori, as expected, stayed behind. She hung on his every word and asked to touch his hand. After that, Daybell looked into her eyes and revealed that they had been husband and wife in seven previous incarnations. Chad and Lori exchanged contact information. Chad and Lori exchanged contact information and started communicating every day. Lori's husband went to Nevada for work a few weeks later, so she invited the preacher to a gathering at her home. That day, about a dozen people gathered at the Vallow's house to discuss God's judgment day and the second coming. Lori and Chad also agreed to work together to prepare people for the dreadful judgment. The pair began producing podcasts about the event, as well as leading sermons and writing articles. Lori became increasingly detached and hatched from reality in her family, but Charles did not notice the change. He expected it to be a passing fad. It was too late when he realized how far things had progressed. Lori soon began discussing dark spirits and zombies, telling family and friends that God had chosen her for a special mission. Part of this mission entails eliminating the spirits of darkness, demons, and all evil. Charles' attempts to bring his wife back to reality failed, and she began to see him as one of the evil entities that needed to be destroyed. Charles Vallow's tragic end by the end of 2018, Lori and Charles Vallow's marriage was about to collapse. Lori changed all of the locks in their shared home in February 2019, while Charles was away on business for a week. When Charles returned, he found himself locked out of his own home, his personal car, and the family truck missing, and a significant amount of $35,000 had been withdrawn from his account. Charles loudly called out for his wife and attempted to enter the house. Lori stormed outside, hurling threats and curses. She screamed that her husband's soul had long died and that his body had been possessed by a demon, repeatedly saying, I don't know who you are or what you've done to my husband. 
Without hesitation, Charles went to the police station and reported Lori for theft and interference with his home and children. He expressed concerns about Lori's threats of physical harm against him, which resulted in the issuance of a protective order prohibiting her from approaching him. The statements made by Charles that evening were recorded in accordance with standard procedure. He discussed his wife's excessive religious zeal, her belief in the impending end of the world, and her tendency to categorize people as light or demonic beings. While asking clarifying questions, the officers openly mocked him, but issued the protective order. The following day, Charles filed for divorce and changed the beneficiaries of his $1 million life insurance policy from Lori to his mother and sister. His lawyer stated that Charles was concerned about JJ's well-being as he required special care. He was confident that his mother and sister would handle the insurance payout responsibly and care for the boy in the event of his death. Tylee's stepfather had not legally adopted her, so the documents could not include a legally unrelated minor. A few months later, Mr. Vallow made the fatal mistake of revoking the protective order, hoping to reconcile with Lori and save their marriage. He began paying visits to his ex-wife's home, missing the children, and hoping for a family reconciliation. On July 11, 2019, Charles arrived to see his children and was fatally shot twice in the chest. Lori's brother, Alex Cox, called emergency services and admitted to the shooting. He claimed self-defense, alleging that Charles had attacked him first with a baseball bat. In response, he drew his pistol and shot twice without aiming. The homeowner and children witnessed the incident. Their testimonies were somewhat consistent, and the court ruled that the killing was unintentional and in self-defense. Notably, Alex's head injury was minor, despite Charles's previous experience as a baseball player capable of inflicting serious harm with a bat. Lori threw a party at her house with music, many guests, and a poolside disco on the same day Charles' body was taken to the morgue, right where her husband had been shot, and where traces of blood could still be seen. She did not arrange for his funeral or tell anyone about the incident. Charles, his son's mother, sister, and other relatives learned of his death only a week later when his unclaimed body was still in the morgue, the latest in a string of mysterious disappearances and fatalities. Lori sold their Arizona home shortly after her husband's death and moved with her children to Rexburg, Idaho, near Chad and his wife Tammy's home. Lori's brother, Alex Cox, relocated with his sister and settled in the same housing complex. Lori enrolled her son in a special needs school, but her 16-year-old daughter, Ty Lee, never went to school. She was rarely seen outside. So many neighbors were unaware of her second child's existence. Lori described her daughter as a dark entity to a friend over the phone around the same time. On September 8, 2019, the children, their mother, and Uncle Alex traveled to Yellowstone Park, where Chad Daybell joined them. Tylee appears in a number of photographs from that trip. After that day, she was never seen alive again, on September 24 of the same year. Lori withdrew her son's documents from school, claiming he would now be homeschooled. The seven-year-old boy was also not seen again. Less than a month later, on October 19, Chad's 49-year-old wife Tammy died suddenly. Chad claims she had a cold and cough before passing away in her sleep from respiratory failure. Her death was ruled natural, as there were no signs of violence on her body. Chad categorically refused an autopsy to determine the exact cause, an odd decision that raised no suspicions. Following his wife's unexpected death, Chad received approximately half a million dollars in insurance payouts. Two weeks later, Chad and Lori traveled to the Hawaiian Islands to marry in a beachside ceremony. Daybell's children, who were still mourning their mother, were completely taken aback and unable to understand their father's actions. When the couple returned to Arizona, they lived together and misled others by claiming Lori's children were with relatives or that she had no children at all. They also rented a small unit at a local storage facility and later moved all of the children's belongings as if they had never existed in the house. Another month later, on December 12, 2019, Alex Cox died unexpectedly at home. The cause of death appeared to be a heart attack, but due to his sister's insistence, no autopsy was performed, and the incident was ruled a natural investigation, arrest, and horrific discovery. As time passed, more people continued to question Lori about the whereabouts of her children. She deceived neighbors and acquaintances with ease, but lying to relatives proved more difficult. Her eldest son, Colby, who had little contact with his mother after moving away, 
made an earnest attempt to contact his younger sister. Lori initially answered from her daughter's phone, pretending to be Ty Lee. But Colby quickly realized something was wrong. Meanwhile, Charles' family members demanded access to GJ. They wanted to take the boy on vacation or weekends, or just talk to him on the phone. But Lori consistently refused or made absurd excuses. Eventually, the boy's grandmother reported his disappearance to the police. Colby then approached the police to find his younger sister. When law enforcement officers knocked on Lori's door and asked her to bring the children for a conversation, she lied, claiming they were visiting relatives. This information was proven false, and the police returned to her home. They gave her one week to appear at the police station with the children. Instead, she and her husband fled to Hawaii. Lori was arrested on the Hawaiian island of Kaiwai on February 20, 2020 and returned to Arizona. A search was conducted in her and Chad's home, but no children or signs of their presence were discovered. Her husband, Chad, who had been defending her and insisting she had no children, was now under suspicion. On June 9, police discovered human remains buried in the couple's backyard. The bodies of the missing Tai Lee and her younger brother, JJ, were identified through forensic analysis. Chad was immediately arrested for concealing evidence and complicity. The authorities then decided to exhume Tammy Daybell and Alex Cox's bodies to determine the true causes of death. In both cases, traces of chemicals capable of causing heart failure were discovered, implying that these people did not die naturally. The trial process. The trial of the spouses began in January 2020. One, they were accused of conspiring to commit first-degree criminal acts, grand theft through deception, and insurance fraud. Furthermore, Charles Vallow's death was reclassified as premeditated criminal action rather than self-defense. According to witnesses in court, Lori referred to her children as dark entities and promised to save their souls. There were suspicions that the deaths of Ty Lee, 16, and GJ, 7, were ritualistic in nature. Specifically, the adolescent girl's body was partially burned. Weeks before Chad sent Lori an email rating people, he assigned Ty Lee A as a dark spirit. Given the totality of the charges, both spouses face the death penalty. However, in May 2021, Vallow's defense team was successful in having her declared incompetent, which halted the trial process. Simultaneously, all five of Daybell's adult children maintain their father's innocence, believing he was framed by Lori and Alex in 2022. After receiving treatment in a psychiatric facility, Vallow was deemed fit to stand by her and answer for her actions. In March 2023, the judge ruled that the woman would not be sentenced to death, a decision that the prosecution is still contesting. In July of the same year, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Chad's trial continues, and he still faces the death penalty. This story inspired the book When the Moon Turns to Blood by investigative journalist Leah Sottle as well as the Lifetime Movie Network's 2021 television film Doomsday Mom, The Lori Vallow Story, starring Lauren Lee Smith. In addition, Netflix will release a three-part documentary series called Sins of Our Mother in 2022, with one episode dedicated to Lori's eldest child, her son Colby. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Cape Town is 400 miles away from the city of Port Elizabeth, which is at the western end of Algoa Bay, on the southeast coast of South Africa. This city is a major seaport and also has the sixth most people in South Africa. When Chris Panayotu, then 18 years old, graduated from high school in this city in November 2004, he went to work for his dad's trading company. In the city and the areas around it, his father owned a large chain of stores and restaurants. Chris had always wanted to work in his dad's business, even when he was young. He was also very interested in running retail chains and growing the retail services industry. He was very active and determined, and his goals went far beyond being an executive and skilled worker under his father's supervision. Chris wanted to open his own fish restaurant near a five-star hotel on Marina Drive and a big grocery store close to Kings Beach downtown. While Chris was helping his dad at a small diner on Market Street in the afternoon, 
he ran into an old high school friend. The friend invited Chris to a party on Friday night at Barney's Tavern, a popular beach spot for young people. Chris saw a pretty young girl drinking lemonade from a tall glass while sitting alone at the bar in a wicker bamboo chair and drinking beer from the establishment's specialty mug. Chris got up from his seat and went to meet her. She was 18 years old and her name was Jay Dinks. They hit it off right away and they quickly found that they had a lot in common. Chris and Jade started dating after that party. They had no idea that their meeting at Barney's Tavern on Friday night would be the start of a terrible love triangle story that ended in tragedy. The girl named Jade was always happy and friendly and she wanted to make other people feel good. Because she wanted to make a difference, she decided to become a teacher and started college in 2005. While Jade worked on her schoolwork, Chris started his own business. He started with a grocery store and then opened Infinite, a restaurant and bar in the neighborhood. Even though both Jade and Chris had a lot going on in their lives, their relationship grew stronger, like the roots of a young tree going deeper into the ground. They each made their own happy place where love and kindness seemed to last forever and where days were full of smiles and hope for a bright future. Things started to go wrong in their relationship over time, mostly because Chris was seeing another woman. At first, Chanel Cooties was just working at the store that Chris owned and their relationship was strictly business. But as time went on, their interactions turned into a secret love affair that they tried to hide with mysterious smiles and small movements. They met in secret in hotels in the area and Chris even let Chanel stay with him while Jade was away. Chris and Jade seemed like a happy and successful young couple to their family and friends, especially after they got engaged and then married in 2012. Jade finished college and got a job at an elementary school, and Chris's business looked like it was doing well. However, Chris's relationship with Chanel continued, which made things difficult in their marriage. When Costa Panayotu, Chris's father, found out that his son was having an affair with a sales clerk, he was very upset and angry. He couldn't understand how Chris, who had been seeing Jade for eight years and knew she was smart, kind, and moral, could act so badly. Costa confronted Chris at Infinite while he was celebrating his engagement with friends, which turned into a heated argument. Costa told Chris that he would lose his inheritance if he kept seeing Chanel. Chris told his father that he was ending his relationship with Chanel, but they were still seeing each other behind his back. During this time, Jade didn't know that her fiancé was cheating on her. Chris's finances got worse as he tried to balance his two different lives. He spent a lot of money on gifts for Chanel, fancy hotel rooms, and other unnecessary things. While Chris was away from Jade more and more over the next three years, it hurt his business and his family. Jade started to feel more and more alone and ignored in her marriage. She told her friends how upset she was, and how she had tried but failed to get them back to getting along. In September 2014, Jade was at the point of losing her mind. She wrote a very emotional letter on September 21st about how much she wanted love, a normal marriage, and a caring partner. She also told him how annoyed she was with Chris's secrecy and the distrust and uncertainty it caused. Three big men in a rented car pulled up to the gate of Staring Glad Village on April 20th, 2015, in the early morning. This is where the young Panayotu couple lived. They saw a young woman who was well-dressed and impatiently waiting by the road. Two of the men got out of the car, but the driver told them to stay inside. A black BMW pulled up next to her and they watched. When she got in the car, it took off quickly, making the people who wanted to take her hostage angry. Like every other day, Jade left her house at 6.15 a.m., waiting for her friend and co-worker Cheryl to pick her up in her BMW for their daily trip to work. Cheryl was running a little behind, and she saw the car from the day before with tinted windows at the curb. When Jade reached for her phone to call Cheryl, she saw two people coming from the bushes next to the road. Cheryl was only 10 minutes late, but Jade wasn't there. Cheryl tried to call Jade's cell phone and knock on her door, but got no answer. Cheryl finally called the police and by 10 a.m., Jade Panayotu was officially reported missing. This led to a large-scale search that included police, a K-9 unit, and volunteers from the community. The search for Jade went on, but on the first day, nothing was found. 
The search started up again the next morning, and there was a reward for anyone who could help find her. Around 10 a.m., Angel, a K-9 officer, found Jade's dead body in a bushy ravine close to Quano Bushley. Even though she was fully dressed, a medical exam showed that she had been shot three times in the back and fatally in the head. Her jewelry and bank cards were missing, making it look like the people who killed her were trying to hide why they did it. JD's family and friends were shocked and couldn't understand what had happened. Her co-workers and students were also very sad. The news of her death spread all over the city and people were sad and confused on social media. On October 22nd, Jade's family held a memorial service at a Catholic church. This was followed by a funeral that was attended by a huge number of people from Port Elizabeth. People who knew and loved Jade were deeply saddened by her death. South African police service officers were also at the city cemetery. They thought Chris Panayotu's behavior during the funeral was strange and staged. As suspicions grew, the court later found that Chris's farewell speech looked a lot like a dedication on the internet by Charles Atkins to his late wife. Even though it wasn't direct proof, this discovery made people think that Chris may have been involved in killing his wife. The authorities decided to keep a close eye on him. Several other strange events also pointed to Chris's involvement in the murder of his wife. Luthando Sioni, a security guard at Chris's nightclub, was arrested by the police the night before the funeral because they thought he might have worked with the killer. Luthando said Chris had asked him to hire killers for his wife and that Chris had already found three friends to carry out the plan. There was proof that someone tried to use Jade's bank cards on the day she was killed, and surveillance footage showed two men that Luthando identified as the hired killers. As a reward for his help, the police let Luthando go on the condition that he gather more evidence, including Chris's confession to killing his wife. Because he was told to, Luthando called Chris for a private conversation that was recorded. During the conversation, Chris said something that led to his arrest. After that, three more suspects were caught and the crime's details were put back together. Hit men were sent by Chris to kill Jade Panayotu in the early hours of April 20th, 2015. But because of an unplanned change in her plans, the execution was moved to the next day. On April 21st, Jade was taken hostage and taken to a remote area and brutally killed. The thieves took her valuables and ran away. They tried to take money out of her bank cards but couldn't because the PN they were using was wrong. The trial against Chris and the two mercenaries began on October 11, 2015 and was widely watched and reported on by the media. The prosecution said that Chris killed one of the women because he was having money problems that were made worse by his double life and his desire to kill one of the women. At the trial, different types of evidence were shown such as Chanel Coutis's testimony, call logs, ATM videos, and photos. Along with the two hired killers, Chris was found guilty by the court and given a life sentence. On December 9, 2019, Chris's father, Costa Panayotu, died in a mysterious accident. This added another sad turn to the story. This made the story even more complicated and left a lot of questions unanswered. If Chris had anything to do with his father's death, it made an already scary story even scarier. Overall, Chris Panayotu's actions showed how far some people are willing to go to put their own needs ahead of the lives and well-being of those they care about. People are angry and upset about what he did, which led to the brutal murder of his wife, Jade. It's still not clear if Chris had anything to do with his father's death but he is now facing the consequences of his horrible crimes, which means he will never get away. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Wedding travel, also known as a honeymoon, is a significant event in the lives of young families it can leave vivid memories of an unforgettable adventure or, for example, provide a long-awaited escape from the mundane life somewhere on the Azure coast, under the shade of palm trees. But what if you go on a wedding trip and end up committing or being accused of a crime? Would the honeymoon be as bright and carefree in that case? I don't think so. 
unforgettable, of course. Hellman, whose real name is Isabella Rodriguez, was born in 1975 in Colombia, a country where everyone speaks Spanish. But Isabella really dreamed of the American dream. She read English books and listened to English songs on the radio to learn the language as quickly as possible so she could go to the north of Europe. Even though she was able to learn the language, she would always have a southern accent. This didn't stop the young woman from moving to Florida, where she worked as a real estate agent for people who only spoke Spanish. Isabella married William Hellman in 2002, even though her previous relationships didn't work out. They were married for 10 years, but their whole relationship was marked by constant fights and problems at home. Finally, when neither partner could take it any longer, they filed for divorce. The process took a very long two years. Isabella even found a new man during this time, and she hoped to be happy with him. Lewis Bennett was the name of the new lover. He was born in Great Britain but moved to Australia as a child and had dual citizenship. He went back to his home country to finish his education at the prestigious Camborne School of Mines. Lewis, on the other hand, never got a job in his field. He eventually went back to Australia and started his own business making solar panels. After four years, he went into the American market. His main office was in Florida, so the young and promising Lewis started using the internet to look for a wife there. Lewis tried to meet someone online for a long time, but had no luck. He looked at the profiles of women, but didn't pay much attention to them. The women who wrote to him first either turned him off or didn't interest him. But when he saw Isabella's picture, he thought she looked a lot like Jennifer Lopez, so he wrote to her. They wrote to each other for a long time, and Isabella talked about her hopes to move to the United States from Colombia, how hard it was for her to learn English, and her job search. She eventually told him about the men she dated in the past. Bennett didn't care at all about her past, because she knew Isabella and William were going to get a divorce soon. In order to meet Lewis in person, Isabella made plans to go to wherever he was, whether it was England, Australia, or even Thailand. Lewis bought a catamaran to show his new girlfriend Isabella how much he liked her. He planned to take her on a trip around the Caribbean Sea. He dreamed of doing this since he moved around a lot as a child and found it hard to make lasting friends. In his spare time, he read adventure books by authors like Jules Verne and Robert Louis Stevenson. Treaser Iceland was his favorite book and it would become an important part of his life. When Isabella had free time, like on vacation or over the weekend, she always went on trips with Lewis. She saw that Lewis almost forgot about work while on these expensive trips, though it could be said that his company's processes were highly automated, which gave him time to relax. When Isabella tried to talk to Lewis about his work-life balance, he either laughed it off or said that he had a big inheritance and didn't need to worry about anything. Isabella was happy with his answer. The couple celebrated the birth of their daughter Amelia in July 2016. It was a big deal for both of them, and that's when the fight started. Isabella had a hard time deciding how to raise their daughter, or even which country would be best for her upbringing, because of things that had happened to her in the past. Lewis wanted Amelia to grow up in Australia with his parents but Isabella wanted to stay in the United States. As a compromise, they finally moved to Florida. In 2017, even though they already had a child together, they decided to get married. Isabella asked her husband to take her on a honeymoon on his catamaran because she thought that being on the water would bring them back together. Lewis agreed, but the date was pushed back. They finally left on their romantic cruise at the end of April 2017. At first, their social media posts made it look like everything was going as planned for Isabella. Photos of them smiling and having a great time sailing around the Caribbean islands gave her hope. However, after the first photos from the honeymoon, there was silence for two weeks. When Isabella went online again, she told her family that they were in Cuba and were planning to go back to Florida but they didn't know the exact plans yet. She also said that their internet connection was slow, which meant that they might not be reachable for a few days. In the middle of the night on May 15th, Lewis called the Coast Guard to say he was lost and alone on a raft out at sea. Right away, the rescuers started looking for Lewis, 
They found him near the Bahamas on a raft that was full of food and other supplies. Lewis told a story about how he had asked Isabella to rest for a few hours after a long day and then given her control of the catamaran. A heavy thump from below woke him up after he went to take a nap in the cabin. He thought Isabella had been thrown overboard when he couldn't find her and saw that the catamaran was taking on water. He got his things together and moved to the rescue boat, thinking that her life vest would keep her safe. It was strange that he didn't use a beacon or a satellite phone to call for help. The Coast Guard didn't understand what was going on. They looked around and saw that there were no underwater rocks or reefs that could have sunk the boat like Lewis said. The boat also had open escape hatches, which is against safety rules, and suggests that someone was trying to sink the ship on purpose. It was proven by divers that the holes in the catamaran's bottom were made from the inside. The condition of the boat did not match Lewis's account of hitting rocks in the water. Another strange thing about the case was that Lewis only put his things on the life raft as if he didn't think he would find Isabella alive. He even brought silver coins that are hard to find that are hidden in aluminum tubes. Later, investigation showed that one of Lewis's friends had stolen these coins in 2016. Lewis was charged with smuggling because of how he behaved. The fact that there were open escape hatches and other suspicious circumstances. While the person was being held for smuggling, the investigation went on and more evidence came to light. In the house where Isabella and Lewis had lived, recording devices were found that had recordings of Lewis making death threats against Isabella. Isabella told her friends about these threats and how she wanted to leave her husband, but she also wanted to give their marriage one more chance. Debts, real estate, electricity, and credit cards were the main things that made them fight. Lewis had a lot of debt but didn't. He declined to deal with his money problems and instead chose to travel instead of working. Even told Isabella she had to get a job to help him pay off his debts while he kept traveling. The investigation also found that between 2014 and 2016, Lewis sent money to other countries worth a total of $160,000. These transfers had something to do with the stolen collectible coins that Lewis had on him. Lewis was facing more charges of involuntary manslaughter as the evidence grew. Lewis Bennett took a plea deal in November 2018 and pleaded guilty to both smuggling drugs and manslaughter by accident. He went to prison for eight years and couldn't get any of Isabella's insurance payments or property. The court told Lewis that he had to give his daughter Amelia money because she would have to deal with the emotional pain of losing her mother as she grew up. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Samantha Fraser's case shows that a monster can't be re-educated, not even by a trained and experienced psychologist. When someone shows signs of being cruel, they should be left alone right away. People like that don't change, so they don't deserve a second chance. They are capable of the worst crimes and think they can get away with them. The terrible events took place in the summer of 2018 on Phillip, a quiet island in Australia close to Melbourne. But let's read the story in the right order. Adrian Basham was born in 1973 in Australia, where he grew up. The boy grew up in a family with a police officer. While he didn't do anything wrong in the eyes of the police in his early years, many people now believe that his cruel and violent attacks are linked to his family and childhood. When Adrian's father, James Basham, found out that his son had killed someone badly, he did not only not condemn him, but based on his experience as a police officer, he told him how to act to try to avoid getting in trouble. Samantha Fraser was born in the suburbs of Melbourne in the summer of 1980. Her parents, Janine and Travis Fraser, were friendly and loving, and they did everything they could to help their only daughter. They worked hard to help her learn and show off her skills. Samantha worked hard in school and played sports, and she consistently won awards for her outstanding performance. The girl then went to a well-known university and graduated with a red diploma from the psychology department. She kept doing sports like acrobatics, gymnastics, and dancing while she was in school, which helped her lead the student cheerleading team. After going to college, 
Samantha got a job as a psychotherapist at a large medical facility. Her co-workers and patients quickly came to respect and trust her. Samantha really loved what she was doing, and this job was her calling. Sam and Adrian met for the first time in late 2005. First, they were just friends, but soon, things turned romantic between them. Friends and family of this couple didn't understand what the two young people, who were so different in every way, had in common. Samantha was friendly, open, and nice, and she could always solve a problem in a peaceful way. Adrian, on the other hand, was very rude and harsh when he talked to people. He was also very angry and hostile. In spite of this, the couple made their relationship official a year and a half after they met. They bought a house in the suburbs of Melbourne, not far from where Samantha's parents live. Not long after, the man got a job with a big company that worked to develop mineral deposits. Because his job required him to go on business trips all the time, he wasn't at home very often. There's no doubt that this is why he and Samantha stayed married for so long. Adrian became a real tyrant at home and tried to control his wife in every way. He not only expected people to obey him without question, but he also did some strange things that might have been signs of a mental disorder. For instance, he insisted crazily that the house was always in perfect order, and this included both how clean it was and where everything was. It's small things like where the books are on the shelf or where the toiletries are in the bathroom. Any change could make him angry and violent right away. Samantha was a psychologist, so she knew how to make things better between people who were fighting. She hoped that her husband would change over time and become more calm and consistent. Along with that, they had three children together, two daughters, Jemima and April, and a son, Rex. But Adrian's character didn't change even when heirs showed up. In 2014, family problems led to physical abuse in another case. She then didn't say anything, didn't call the police, and didn't tell anyone what happened. People she cared about and her co-workers had no idea that her husband had put his hand on her. She was naive enough to think that this would not happen again. After a year though, the same thing happened again. Adrian hit his wife. Samantha chose that this time it was the last straw. Samantha was also going crazy because her husband was throwing temper tantrums all the time and wanted to control her every move. She told the police in writing that her husband had beaten her and then she took the kids and moved in with her parents. They got a divorce in the spring of 2017 and Samantha and their kids were given the family home by the court. They soon went back there. But Adrian had no plans to leave his ex-wife alone. He kept after her, making her life miserable. The young woman was always afraid for her life and the lives of her children because she didn't feel safe. She went to court and got an order that her ex-husband couldn't talk to them or try to get involved in their business in any way. But that didn't stop Basham. He stayed nearby and did everything he could to bother Samantha. At least one of Adrian's friends said that he promised to take away from his ex-wife everything she cares about, from the house to the kids. He also openly threatened to hurt her physically. The man told his friend again not long before the tragedy that Samantha would soon pay for everything. He also seemed dangerous, but the friend didn't take what he said seriously until he heard that the woman had died. Because Samantha was always scared and tense, she put bars on her windows, put an alarm system in her house, and put surveillance cameras outside her house. The woman told him that she was scared that her ex-husband would break into her house and hurt her or the kids. Samantha started to think that her ex-husband had calmed down a bit about a year after they got divorced. He disappeared from her view less often, which made her feel safer. Samantha even started an affair and made plans for a better, happier life. For Fraser's 38th birthday on July 22, 2018, she spent the day with close friends and a man she loves named Wayne. People who spent the holiday with her remember that she looked happy and in good spirits for herself and her family. A few days before the wedding, the man had proposed to the woman. After the wedding, they were going to take a long vacation and travel to forget about their problems. Samantha had already taken her kids to school the next morning and was on her way to work when she got a call from a friend telling her that Adrian was nearby. Samantha was worried about this, but she chose not to freak out and instead decided to be more careful. 
Her ex-husband was due to appear in court in a couple of weeks on charges of domestic violence. She was afraid that he would hurt her in some way because of the lawsuit. The woman told her best friend about her worries over the phone, but her friend reassured her. Samantha was never seen alive again after that talk. Samantha wasn't there to pick up her kids from school that day, so the teacher, who knew that things were tough in Samantha's family, called the police. The police went to their house right away to check on everything. At first, it looked like the mistress hadn't come back yet. But when the police of... The police chose to check the garage next to the house, which showed a very bad picture. The homeowner, who was 38 years old, was found dead hanging from the garage door chain. In general, the picture might have made it look like the young woman had killed herself, but Samantha looked like she had been hit by a truck. Samantha had not a single living thing on her, and the hair on her head was wet and falling over her face. She wasn't wearing the clothes she had on when she left the house in the morning, and she didn't have any shoes on. It was clear that someone else had been in the garage, and they had tried to make it look like Samantha had died on her own. It did a lot of wrong things, though. Say, a broken-down stepladder was lying next to the body, but the rope was so long that the woman's feet were touching the ground. Samantha had deep bruises under her eyes and on her temple. She had scrapes and hematomas all over her body, from falling down and hitting things. The forensic medical examination later showed that the deceased had a serious head injury, which means that she was either already unconscious or dead when she was hanged. Experts in forensics found blood and epithelial particles under the victim's fingernails. This means that she desperately fought back and scratched her abuser. A lot of blood and small splatters of blood had been washed up on the floor, walls, and body of the car in the garage. In later tests, Blood was also found on the rope that the body was hanging from in several places. Adrian Basham rode his motorcycle to his dad James's house in the evening of the same day. He looked stressed, and there were new scratches on his face. When his father asked him about it, he dodged the question. And when asked about the cuts, he said that he got them from riding his motorcycle without a helmet and scratching himself with tree branches. Then he got a big pack of wet wipes and began wiping down his car saying that he wanted to get rid of the gnats that had stuck to it during the ride. As a former police officer, his dad knew right away that something wasn't right, and his professional instincts were right. When police came to James's door the next day with questions about his son and said he was the main suspect in the murder of his ex-wife, James knew what was going on. In the beginning, Basham Sr. said that he had not seen his son, to buy some time, he then told the heir what he should say and do in order to, if not get out of jail, at least get less time. Adrian did what his father told him to do, and listened quietly as the charges were read to him. He then went to the station with the help of the lawyers his father had already hired. At first, Adrian flatly refused to help with the investigation. He didn't say he wasn't guilty, he just didn't say anything and ignored all the questions. Still. The evidence that was gathered was enough. The investigators saw that the man had fresh scratches on his face and thought that Samantha had scratched him to protect herself. Blood and epithelial particles were found under her nails. There were also sweat marks on the rope that his ex-wife's body was hanging from. When Adrian's motorcycle was looked at, washed up blood from the dead person was found on it. A bloody woman's blouse was also found in a trash can outside his dad's house. It looks like he tried to get rid of that proof but didn't have time. Samantha put up cameras outside her house not long before the terrible event, and they caught a man leaving the crime scene quickly on the day of the murder. There was no doubt that it was Adrian, even though his face was hidden by a hood pulled over his baseball cap. Piece by piece, the events of the victim's last day were put back together, and the picture that was made was shockingly violent. Basham broke the lock on the garage door while no one was home and went inside. He waited for his ex-wife to come home for several hours. She didn't know it, but Samantha drove into Adrian's garage and he attacked her before she could get out. The scratches on the attacker's face show how hard Fraser tried to fight back, but the two sides were not equal. He beat the woman until she passed out. To hide his tracks, he took off her bloody blouse and put on a black t-shirt he found in the house. He then poured water over her head to clean the blood out of her blonde hair. He then hung his ex-wife from the garage door with a rope around her neck. 
He put a stepladder on the floor next to the body just to be sure, but he didn't figure out how long the rope was. Adrian cleaned up the blood spots, but he didn't get the small splatters that were all over the place. This blows my mind. A young mother of three who was loved by all was found dead in her own garage. Killer tried to make it look like the person died of their own free will, but there were many signs that it wasn't true. Samantha's body was also in a state that showed she had accepted martyrdom. The worst part was that the victim had been living with this man for a long time, put up with his emotional and physical abuse, and raised his children while hoping that he would change. Adrian changed his plan when he realized that neither denying nor staying quiet would help because all the evidence pointed to him. Basham said that he was at his ex-wife's house that day, but he only wanted to talk to her and persuade her to drop her domestic violence lawsuit. People say that the conversation went badly and that fists were used, but he said he left afterward and Frazier was awake and aware at the time. Lawyers for the defendant insisted that their client was only guilty of battery and that Samantha turned her life over after that. But Samantha's family says she would never do that and did not leave her kids. She also had big plans for her life and was going to get married again soon. The murder case didn't start until the end of 2022. Older children of the divorced parents went to the sessions and spoke out against their father and asked for a fair punishment. The youngest son didn't show up to court. He chose not to subject himself to unnecessary stress. Besides that, the boy was scared and panicked about his father. And the defense tried to show that the defendant did what he did because he was feeling bad, but this didn't work because Adrian planned the crime, waited several hours for his victim, and tried to get rid of evidence. The court didn't give its final decision on this case until February 2023. Adrian was found guilty of beating someone to death on purpose and given a life sentence without the chance of parole for at least 30 years. The children of Travis and Samantha Fraser were given to Jeanine and Travis Fraser as guardians. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. This is exactly what Kanyong's story is about. You might ask, is this really possible? How could a simple family dinner lead to a brutal murder that will shock everyone in Malaysia? The law will even be looked at by the local government. Let us look at this case. Princess Kani Ong Lake Yang is her full name. She was born in 1974 in Ipoh, Malaysia into a big family. People from all over the world visit the city, but Kani had her sights set on something else, a better job and traveling. What else could a girl want? That being said, she knew that she had to work for her dream and that nothing good could just happen. First, Kani got a gold medal in high school. Then she went to the University of Hawaii and got a degree in economics here. After the start, more work had to be done to make things better. She went to Los Angeles and got a job at an advertising agency. She was already living on her own. The city of dreams helped the girl see herself as an expert in her field. In 2001, Kani met Brandon Ong there. He was born in Singapore, like her father, but moved to the United States with his family when he was a child and was now legally an American. Young Kani and Brandon quickly got married and moved to San Diego, which is right next door. But after only two years together, something bad happened. Kani's dad got liver cancer. The surgery her father was going to have in Malaysia was very serious and it wasn't clear if he would live or die after it. She quickly packed her things and flew to her father on June 1st, leaving her husband in the United States. The surgery went well, the disease got better, and the doctor said that Kani's dad, who they called b Jen, would live a long time and definitely have grandchildren. Kani let out a sigh of relief. At last, she could go back to her husband and her favorite job. In the morning, she took a plane to Los Angeles. That night, Kani invited her whole family to a farewell dinner at Montes, their favorite restaurant that they used to go on vacation when Kani still lived with her parents. During dinner, Kani's mom got sick out of the blue and her sweet daughter offered to drive her home. She spent a long time looking for a parking ticket in her purse in the parking lot. When she couldn't find it, she realized she had left it in her car and forgotten about it. Kani then ran to the car and told her sisters to watch her mother. 
She wasn't seen for a long time. Her mother went to the car to check on her, but neither Canny's nor her daughters were there. When one of the sisters tried to call Canny's phone, it was even scarier to see that it was turned off. Her family knew her very well. She couldn't just disappear, and she would always call to let them know what had happened. But what could have happened in a parking lot that was locked up, only 300 feet from her family? The father of Canny asked the security guards to show him the video footage. His daughter was walking toward the car and checking her pockets and purse for her keys. At first, there was nothing strange about it. When they looked back, they saw a stranger moving behind Canny. He was speeding up and slowing down, just like Canny. The guards and Canny's worried father watched her car leave the parking lot from a different camera. There was a man behind the wheel, most likely the one who had followed her in the parking lot. It was strange that Canny was sitting in the passenger seat. The family called the police right away because it looked like someone was taking their child. People should praise the Malaysian police for starting to look for the missing woman as soon as they learned that the car had been stolen. After a few hours, a highway patrol officer saw a car on the road that fit the description. The police stopped the car to look at the papers so as not to scare the possible kidnapper. At the time, they weren't sure if it was a kidnapping or not for sure. The driver of the car stopped and gave the police officer his license, even though he looked tense. He tried to show the policeman some signs while sitting next to him, but the officer was busy checking the driver's license. He didn't understand, which is a shame. Kidnapper, on the other hand, paid attention, stepped on the gas, and drove away from the police car. The police shot at the car, but it got away. They still had the kidnapper's papers, though. His name was Ahmad Najib bin Aris, and he was 27 years old. Let me give you a short history of this person. They were born in 1976 and raised in Muar, Malaysia. He was the second child in a family of four. Ahmad Najib went to secondary school until the third year, but then he quit. He didn't go to the last two years of secondary school. In Malaysia, secondary school lasts for five years. He had to work to feed his family, and he worked hard. He went from Muar to Kuala Lumpur in 1998. In the end, Ahmad Najib got married and had two kids. Ahmad Najib was a good man who did his job well, according to people who knew him. Now let's get back to our case. After some time, it became clear that the shooting at the car had an effect. A young man went up to the police and told them a strange story. He told the story of a stranger who approached him at a roadside cafe while he was eating dinner. The stranger said that he was on vacation with his wife but had a flat tire on the way and could not go any further. The young man was happy to help the stranger. He got a jack from the trunk and gave it to the traveler when they got outside. But he saw bullet holes in the car, and in the front seat, he saw a scared woman who didn't look like a wife taking a carefree vacation with her husband. But the so-called husband didn't change the tire himself. He just played around with the jack for a while, complained, and then gave it back. The police knew right away that it was canny, and that Ahmad was the one who took her. But that was the last time anyone saw Kani alive. Not long after on the third day, Kaniong, or rather her body, was found in a sewer manhole near a construction site. It was almost completely burned to the ground. The autopsy will show that the woman was stabbed several times in the stomach and then choked to death. Another thing that was found nearby the construction site was Kani's car, which had a shot tire and blood on the back seat. Even though the police had the killer's paperwork, they didn't go to Ahmad's house until after the body was found. For some reason, really interesting thing about this story is that the killer was at home, acting like nothing had happened, like he had. It was like he hadn't stolen someone else's car, kidnapped a woman who had come to see her sick father, and then driven away from police officers who were shooting at him. After Ahmad was caught, Forensic tests showed that the car also had Ahmad's DNA in it, along with Canny's blood. To be clear, we want to say that murders in Malaysia are very uncommon, especially ones that are so violent. According to the criminal code, someone who kills someone deserves the death penalty, not even life in prison in this case. Ahmad knew that the police had all the information on him, so it's not clear what he was hoping for. He admitted everything 
and even agreed to help with the investigation because he thought that would keep him from being put to death. Of course, the cruel criminal hid his identity at the trial by pretending to be a sheep. In the parking lot that night, he said, he was looking for a different woman, but thought he saw the wrong woman. He didn't realize it until he was in the car with Canny. He even said that they laughed about it together, and he later tried to get her to have sex with him. Again, he said that Canny wasn't even against it, and the marks on her neck from being strangled were just part of the woman's sexual fantasy, which is why she died. Ahmad, who was scared, decided to get rid of the body by setting Canny on fire. From beginning to end, Ahmad's lawyers made up this story because if they had been proven true, they would have only been found guilty of abusing the dead or, in the worst case, negligently killing Canny during the sexual encounter. If this isn't true and the defendant's crazy thoughts are all this, the lawyer said, then why didn't the captive run away while her captor changed the tire? If the person hadn't been stabbed in the stomach, this story might even sound plausible. The defense fell apart like a house of cards at this point. It was clear because the investigation had a different, more reliable account of what had happened, which was backed up by the autopsy. Ahmad saw a woman by herself in the parking lot outside of Monty's and followed her. When Canny opened her car door, he pointed a knife at her and told her to sit in the passenger seat. He then got behind the wheel himself. After the incident with the police and the failed attempt to fix a flat tire, he took the car to a place with no one else around, put Canny in the back seat, and used her more than once. When Canny tried to fight back, she was stabbed several times in the stomach and then strangled with a coat belt. Ahmad took her already dead body outside, threw it into the first manhole, and then put tires over it so no one would find it. His plan was to finally hide the evidence of the crime when he came back to this manhole the next day with several gas cans, he put gasoline in Canny's body and set it on fire. It turned out that Ahmad had also raped four women, luckily none of whom died. They did not report it to the police because they were afraid of being caught, though. After what seemed like years, the court finally found the murderer guilty on February 23, 2005. Among other things, they gave Ahmad ten lashes. Was this any better for the parents who had lost their daughter for good? Ahmad tried to appeal his sentence while he was in jail. He even wrote a letter to Selangor, the head of state, asking him to release him, but he was turned down. Ahmad got what was coming to him just 13 years after killing Canny. He was hanged in his cell on September 23, 2016. As I already said, this case got a lot of attention in Malaysia. People in the area were scared not so much by the brutality of the murder and Ahmad's seemingly false belief that he would not be caught, but by the fact that it is not hard to kidnap someone in a busy shopping center, even if it's in a parking lot. To make sure this didn't happen again, the Malaysian government started to put up as many CCTV cameras as they could all over the country. They also hired more security guards for shopping malls and even made parking spots just for women. For these reasons, it is very sad that the life of an innocent woman who flew from tens of thousands of miles away to be with her father for two weeks had to be sacrificed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.